Preface of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Preface. On the 29th of July, 1853, His Excellency Lieutenant Governor Latrobe addressed a circular letter to a number of early settlers, nearly all of whom have now passed away, requesting information as to the time and circumstances of the first occupation of various parts of the colony. At least fifty-eight letters or papers detailing the personal experiences of the pioneers of Victoria appear to have been placed at the service of Mr. Latrobe, who at the time contemplated writing a history of the colony. These papers remained in the possession of His Excellency until 1872, when, writing on the 19th of March to the Honourable James Graham, M.L.C., he said, I have this day addressed a small parcel of some interest to be forwarded to you when occasion offers. As I am in the prospect of a move, as you know, in the course of the autumn, so taking time by the forelock and attempting to put my house in order, I have collected a number of documents addressed to me in 1854 by old colonists to whom I applied for information respecting the early occupation and settlement of our colony. I intended to have made a certain use of this information myself, but from circumstances was prevented doing so. The day may come, however, when it may be considered of too great interest to be lost, and I therefore propose that the parcel should be deposited somewhere where it will be accessible when that day comes, say, the public library or other public archives. On this point, perhaps you will consult those who ought to be consulted. I think it may be a little early to make unrestricted use of the contents of these letters. In sending them to you, however, I am securing their being deposited where they ought to go. These documents, Mr. Graham, in the judicious exercise of his discretion, in due course presented to this institution, and they are now, by the direction of the trustees, given to the public in the present volume. The letters record events which will recall to many persons still living old Victorian memories, and will have a great value for the future historians of Victoria as narrating the experiences of actual movers in the early scenes of our colonization, while they will also possess interest as incidental contributions to the biographies of men who half a century ago began to encounter the hardships and perils which beset the pioneer in every part of this continent. These papers also contain interesting contributions to our knowledge of the Aborigines, their customs, languages, and conflicts with the white men, and although some of the incidents narrated have found their way into print before, they are now for the first time given in their entirety to the public. It cannot be claimed for these papers that they are infallible records of our early history in every point, but they do contain the first impressions of those who had ample opportunities of learning at the fountainhead what could be learned amid the hardships of the early colonial days. The short paper contributed by Mrs. F. A. Davenport of Hobart was presented to the trustees on the 21st of May, 1884, and will not be uninteresting as coming from the pen of a lady who had special facilities for studying the Aboriginal language so far back as 1842. T. F. Bride, Librarian End of Preface Section 1 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas, Victoria, Australia. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Section 1. J. M. MacLeod. Tahara, August 18, 1853. Dear Sir, in answer to yours of the 29th of July, only just received, I send you the following information, which I hope may be what you require. I landed on indented head from Van Diemen's Land with sheep in July 1837. In September, I went with a party to explore. We went round lakes Colac and Karangamite. We were the first who went round the latter. The farthest out station at that time was Mr. Ricketts on the River Barwon, 40 miles from Geelong. He had only been there about three weeks. The blacks had robbed him and were constantly driving his shepherds in with their flocks. As we came along the banks of Lake Karangamite, a great many parties of natives ran off into the stony rise, leaving everything behind them. They were on the mouths of small creeks which run into the lake fishing. The stony, scrubby rises came so close to the lake they could not see us. We were within a few yards of them. We were stopped by the Piranyaloke. 
At night we could not find a ford, so we camped in the centre of a small plain, tethering our horses close round us, and kept a watch about all night. There were seven of us. The natives were talking close to us the whole night, within a hundred yards. At daylight two men came to us, when we made signs that we would not harm them. They came to ask for the black boy, Billy Clark. As it was about three weeks after Dr. Clark had taken him, they wished to know if we had eaten him, and said his mother was very sorry and cried very much. In October I took up my station on the river Moorabool, bore Honeygurk, thirty-five miles from Geelong. Mr. George Russell then lived on the Moorabool, twelve miles from Geelong, but had an outstation on the Lee, where his house now is. But about November the natives drove three men, two shepherds and a hut-keeper, from their hut, notwithstanding the men having shot two of them. They robbed and burned the hut to the ground, so that Mr. Russell vacated that river for some months. In January 1838, G. F. Reed took up his station on the River Lee. Next came the Learmonths, Henry Anderson, occupying what is now John Winter's station, and the Yules near Buninyong, I think about March or April. About the same time, Stead, Cowie, and Robert Stiglitz came above me on the Moorabool, and about twelve months after, John Wallace and Egerton. In October 1846, my brother Hugh and I took up Benio on the South Australian boundary, where he now resides about a hundred miles from Portland, on the border of the Mallee Scrub. There were never many natives in that part. What few there are have been very useful, but they are dying off fast, as in all parts. There seldom a child is born, and when such a thing does happen, it soon dies. The first natives I saw after taking up my station on the river Moorabool was a party of about twenty. I was shepherding my own sheep at the time, as all my men were shearing. I was two miles from the hut, but, as I had my double-barrelled gun with me, I signed to two of them to come and speak to me, as I wished to tell them that they must not come too near the hut. And it was many months before I did allow any to come, but sent their provisions to them when they worked for me. I have counted three hundred and forty together at their meetings in 1843 and 1844. Since I came to the Wannon, I have never seen more than about seventy together. I know of twelve quite young men who have died in this district within the last two years. I had two young men with their wives all last winter nursing them, at least three of them. One of the women, or rather, she was quite a girl of about thirteen, got the provisions and cooked for the others who could hardly move, and appeared in great pain indeed. From being in the summer fine strong young men, they became perfect skeletons, and they are now perfect wrecks, although quite recovered. You are perhaps aware that I had one constantly with me for nine years. His father and mother gave him to me when about ten years of age, and he, as well as his parents, appeared to at once consider him my property. He followed me wherever I went, was in Sydney and Van Diemen's Land, and was very much attached to me. He grew a very fine man, and his tribe forced him to leave me. Fearing you may be in a hurry for an answer, I send this as it is, having received a kick in the hand from a colt today. I hope you will therefore excuse the roughness of it. Your most obedient servant, J. N. MacLeod. To His Excellency, C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. End of Section 1《セクション2 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas, Victoria, Australia. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter number 2 From Hugh Murray, Colac, 18th August, 1853 Sir, I had the honour, on the tenth instant, to receive Your Excellency's letter, dated 29th July, requesting information as to the time and circumstances of the first occupation of the Colac country, etc., and have now the honour briefly to give Your Excellency what information I possess. The Colac country was first occupied in September 1837 by myself, accompanied or immediately followed by Messrs. G. F. and A. Lloyd and William Carter. My flock consisted of a hundred ewes, and theirs jointly of five hundred, which we joined together for mutual protection. These sheep were brought from Van Diemen's Land, at a cost of about three pounds per head, the price there at that time being two pounds. We were the only occupants of the country for about six months, our nearest neighbour being Mr. Thomas Ricketts, who occupied a station on the River Barwon, about ten miles distant, at the point where Jellybrand and Hesse were last seen. Early in 1838, Mr. Pollock, Dewing, Bromfield, and Mr. Briggs, for Captain Fyans, took up the unoccupied land around the banks of Lake Colac, 
They were followed by Misters Watson and Hamilton, and after them the Misters Manifold stretched out to the west, and towards the end of that year and the beginning of 1839 the squatters spread rapidly over the western district. All those persons I have named came from Van Diemen's Land, and brought their sheep from there, except Captain Fyans, who brought cattle from Sydney. I first heard of the Colac country from a party who were in search of Jellybrand and Hesse in August 1837, under the guidance of the Reverend Mr. Naylor, and I believe they were the discoverers of it. It may be interesting to state that this party, consisting of fourteen men, fitted out by Mrs. Jellybrand for three months, at an expense of seven hundred pounds, when arrived at Lake Colac, allowed some of the Barrabool tribe of Aborigines who were with them to murder an old man and a child of the Colac tribe, whom they found on the banks of the lake, and afraid of retaliation from the tribe, fled back in haste next morning, having passed the night without fire for concealment, and gave up the search. The blacks brought with them, on the end of their spears, portions of the man and child they had killed, which I saw them eat with great exultation during the evening. They stayed at our tent in the Barwon on their return. The Colac tribe of natives was not numerous when we came here, men, women, and children not numbering more than thirty-five or forty. From their own account, they were once numerous and powerful, but from their possessing a rich hunting country, the Barrabool, Lee, Wardy Yalloak, and Jancourt tribes surrounding made constant war upon them, and the tribe, from having been the strongest, became the weakest. The extent of their country was a radius of about ten miles from Lake Colac, except on the south, where in the extensive Cape Otway ranges there was no other tribe. We had very little intercourse with them for the first eighteen months, their demeanour towards us being always treacherous and dishonest. They never lost an opportunity of stealing our sheep, at first by night carrying off a few from the fold, but afterwards became more daring, and drove off a score or two in the daytime from the shepherd. These they would take to some secure corner and feast upon them, breaking the legs of those they did not at once kill to detain them. In such cases the settlers assembled and pursued them, and when their encampment was discovered they generally fled, leaving behind them their weapons, rugs, etc., which together with their huts were destroyed. I am happy to think that they met with more forbearance here than in many other parts of the country, and to be able to state with certainty that never upon any such occasion or at any time since their country was first occupied was one of their number shot to death, with one single exception, when I believe a man died of a shot wound he received after having thrown a spear, and while in the act of throwing another, at one of a party in pursuit of his stolen property. After about two years, our acquaintance became more friendly, and they began to be employed upon our stations. I have, etc., Hugh Murray, to His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. End of Letter 2 Section 3 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 3 from J. H. Patterson, Moraby Moraby, 15th of August, 1853 Dear Sir, I only received yours of the 27th Ultimo last week, which will account for it not being replied to sooner. It will afford me much pleasure to give Your Excellency any information in my power on the subjects upon which you require it. In November 1836 I had shipped six cargoes of sheep from V. D. Land to Port Phillip, and landed myself early in December at Williamstown, and finding the country almost totally unoccupied, I took up the Green Hill Station about twenty-five miles north, and posted an outstation at what is now called Bacchus Marsh then without a white inhabitant. Soon after my occupation, say, early in 1837, Messrs. James Clark, Bacchus, White Brothers, and, I believe, Messrs. Powlett and Green, took up country beyond me to the west, called the Pentland Hills, and in an exceedingly short space of time that whole country was stocked with sheep from V.D. land, as the arrivals at Geelong with sheep pressed up the Morrible till they came in contact with the pioneers of Williamstown. In 1838, the White Brothers travelled west with their stock in search of another run, and took up a country about the Wannon, but met with great difficulties for the determined ferocity of the Aborigines, 
which ended in a conflict and great loss of life to the latter. The Messrs. Wedge, the same year, took up a run called the Grange, south of the Whites, and also, like them, experienced great annoyances from the natives. In 1839 they sold to William Forlong, who sold to me in 1840. At that period the country between that and Geelong was very thinly peopled, many parts being unoccupied, and that that was taken up was thinly stocked. The aggressions of the Aborigines in that quarter at that time were such as to call for the interference of the Crown Lands Commissioner, Captain Fiance. In October 1843 I took my family to a station on the north of W. Mollison's, which was taken up by Messrs. Dutton, Simpson, and Darlot in 1841 or 1842, who sold to Rule, a builder in Melbourne from whom I purchased, and called it Turbury, after the aboriginal name of a large hill there. This station was in a state of nature, and on it I erected very considerable improvements, which are now used as an inn called the pick and shovel. The country down the Camp Asp to the Murray and down that river was first, I believe, settled in 1840, but I cannot speak positively, as I did not visit it till 1846, when I selected some unoccupied country, which I named Pine Grove from the number of pines in that locality, on the plains to the south of the Murray and east of the Mount Hope Creek. At that period the country round was but lightly stocked. Moraby, the station on which I now reside, was taken up by Captain Hutton about 1838 or 1839. He sold to Daniel Jennings, who sold to C. H. Ebden, who only held it about three months when I purchased it in August 1851 at a very high rate, under the firm conviction that the orders of Her Gracious Majesty would be carried out in the fullest integrity towards the occupants of Crown land termed squatters. The Aborigines have invariably shown themselves hostile to the settlement of new country, but became more reconciled as their intimacy increased with the Europeans. I have always been favorably disposed towards them, and tried to encourage those that visited my stations in habits of industry by rewarding them well when they did exert themselves, and I would have been most pleased had I succeeded in ameliorating their condition." But I regret to add I found all my endeavors fruitless, and extraordinary to say, with civilization they are so fast decreasing from a constant warfare kept up amongst them, together with disease, that in an extraordinary short space of time I believe the race will become extinct. Should the foregoing remarks prove of any service to Your Excellency, it will afford gratification to Your most obedient servant, J. H. Patterson. To His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. End of section three. Section four of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter four. From H. Norman Simpson, Charlotte Fields Charlotte Plains, 24th of August, 1853 Sir, your favor of the 27th July I only received by last post. I do not exactly understand what you require me to state, but the following is a brief sketch of the circumstances attending my settling in Port Phillip. Any superfluous matter I hope you will excuse— and anything wanting I shall be happy to supply at any time you may require me to do so. In November 1839 I arrived in Melbourne by sea from Sydney on my way to South Australia, and made a tour through a considerable portion of the province and wrote to my brother, who was then collecting a large stock in Manoroo, recommending the Portland Bay district, for which place the stock accordingly started, under the charge of Mr. J. M. Darlot. I may mention that it consisted of 13,000 sheep, 4,000 head of cattle, and 100 horses. When they arrived at Mount Alexander, my brother, who had come by sea to Melbourne, met them, and after exploring to the northward, decided on taking up the country on the Loddon instead of proceeding to Portland Bay, 
heavy losses from Qatar and Scab, and the use having commenced to Lamb, being the cause of his doing so. In about June 1840, he took up the station now known as Cairn Curran, and in the occupation of Mrs. Bryant, and during the year the stations now known as Charlotte Plains, Jane Vale, Langy Corrie, and Glen Mona, comprising all the country from the range to the west of the Porcupine Mount to the Pyrenees. I returned to Sydney in January 1840, and did not again visit Port Phillip till June 1841, when I arrived overland and shortly afterwards purchased the whole of my brother's stock and stations. On my arrival on the Loddon, I found my neighbors were Messrs. Campbell and McKnight on the stations now Mr. William Campbell's, and on which the Forest Creek and Friars Creek diggings are, Mr. Lackland McKinnon on the station now belonging to Mr. W. M. Hunter, Mr. Colin McKinnon on the station now Messrs. Joyce's, Mr. Donald McKinnon on the station now Mr. Bucknell's, Mr. McCallum on his present station, Mr. Jazz Hodgkinson on his present station, Mr. Cato on his present station, and Messrs. Heap and Grice and Mr. Chas Sherratt on the stations now occupied by Messrs. Gibson and Fenton, all the rest of the country to the northward being unoccupied. I almost immediately after my purchase sold the station now known as Cairn Curran to Messrs. Cole and Langdon, and shortly afterwards the station of Glenmona to Messrs. McNeil and Hall. In about May 1842, I took up the station now occupied by Mr. Morton, below Mr. Cato, and sold it shortly afterwards to a Mr. Sellers, on which then the lowest permanent water in the Loddon existed. In about twelve months afterwards, Messrs. Bear, Booth, and Argyle, Brain and Williams, and Thorpe took up extensive stations on the Loddon and Serpentine Creek, and the remainder of the Loddon down to its junction with the Murray was taken up in 1845 by Messrs. McCallum, Kerr Lewis, Cowper, and others. From the time of my arrival on the Loddon, the Aboriginal natives were concentrated under the charge of Mr. Parker at Jim Crow Hotel, Mount Franklin, and with the exception of murdering a Mr. Allen, who had a small cattle station, which I afterwards purchased, between Mr. Cato and me, committed no depredations of any consequence, and were very useful to the settlers in cutting bark and at sheep washing. In the latter end of 1842, Messrs. Gibbon sold a small station they had taken up below Glenmona, on the 14th Mile or Bet Bet Creek, to Messrs. Foster and Stowell, who shortly afterwards occupied a large scope of country on the east side of the Pyrenees and Mr. Colin McKinnon, having sold his station on the Loddon, took up a station to the northward of them. In April 1843, I started with some stock to this station with the intention of taking up some new country, either on the Avoca or Wimmera. I passed the north end of the Pyrenees, crossing the Avoca, Avon, and Richardson, all of which were completely dry for from fifteen to twenty miles to the north of my course, so much so that only for a timely shower I would have had to return. I made the Wimmera abreast the Mount Zero, the north point of the Grampians, and not liking the then parched and dusty Wimmera plains, I crossed over to the head of the Glen Elk, and in June took up the station now known as Glen Isla, my nearest neighbor being Mr. Fairbairn, about thirty miles down the river. Mr. Chas Sharrett, who accompanied me, immediately returned, and in the course of a month or two brought his stock from Mount Alexander, and took up the country between me and Mr. Fairbairn. Immediately afterwards, Mr. P. D. Rose took up the country between me and the Grampians. At this time the whole of the country on the Avoca, Avon, and Richardson was vacant, as also was the whole of the Wimmera below the Leadcourt station, then owned by Mr. Benjamin Boyd, now by Mr. Carvray. But in a few months, Messrs. Taylor and McPherson, Darlot and McLechlin, Splatt and Pinsent, Wilsons and Major Firebrace occupied the Wimmera down to Mount Arapiles. In 1844, I left Glen Isla in charge of my overseer and returned to the Loddon. Consequently, from personal knowledge, I can't enumerate any further particulars as to the occupying of the country. 
During my residence at the Glenelg, the Aboriginal natives were very troublesome, constantly taking sheep in large lots by force from the shepherds or stealing them from the fold at night. I had to follow them three different times driving my sheep away, but each time overtook them, after several days harassing tracking, and took from them all the sheep they had not eaten or destroyed, but not without running considerable risk in doing so, and having received several wounds from their spears and boomerangs. The last time in particular they broke the legs of about sixty of my sheep, leaving the poor animals to lie in a heap in a small yard in, of course, the greatest agony, and whilst I was examining them my horse and I were both severely wounded by a discharge of spears from a body of the natives in ambush. The whole of the country about the Pyrenees that I had passed thus on my way to the Glenelg was, in 1844, taken up by Messrs. Ellis, Elliot and Shore, Mr. James Campbell, Mr. Cottus, and others and although it has been several times very nearly dry, it has never been completely so, as in 1843. In 1846, having purchased a station near Albury, I took up a large amount of country, on the Billabong Creek, about thirty miles northwest of Albury, but finding it impossible to dam the creek sufficiently full to ensure a permanent supply of water, I gave it up to Mr. Charles Hewan, who I believe now holds it. I have had other stations in my possession by purchase, of which I know the particulars of occupation, but as you have most likely received these particulars from other sources, I do not consider it requisite for me to send them. I am, sir, your most obedient servant, H. Norman Simpson. To C. J. Latrobe, Esquire, Melbourne. End of section 4《Section 5 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Letters from Victorian Pioneers》Letter 5 from John Carfrey, Ledcourt Ledcourt, September 1st, 1853 Sir, I have the honour to acknowledge Your Excellency's circular of the 29th of July, requesting information connected with the taking up of this station, also with the habits and customs of the Aborigines. In reply I have to inform Your Excellency that, having been a resident on this station for only five years, I am unable to give you any authentic account of the first settlement. This, combined with all the original occupiers having left this district, must plead my apology in not going into any detail. Mr. P. D. Rose of Rosebrook has taken a wide circuit, including Ledcourt, and in his report has entered fully into this station. Therefore anything I could write on the matters would be merely repetition. I have given Mr. R. various little gleanings I have picked up since my residence here, which he has embodied in his report. Trusting my explanation will be a sufficient excuse for not entering into particulars, I have the honour to remain Your Excellency's most obedient servant, John Carfrey. To His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. End of section 5 Section 6 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter number 6 From David Fisher Roslyn, Geelong, September 21st, 1853 May it please Your Excellency, I have to apologize for my apparent delay in replying to Your Excellency's circular of 29th July, requesting information upon the subject of the first settlement of Port Phillip, now the colony of Victoria. In this my reply, I have the honor to state that my remarks upon this subject will be confined to matters in which I was personally concerned, or what came under my own observation. In the year 1835 I was a resident of Van Diemen's Land, when the rumor of this fertile land reached that place, and induced many of my fellow colonists to make a voyage to spy out the land. 
Their report being favorable to Port Philip as a grazing land, a number of persons formed themselves into a company under the style of the Van Diemen's Land Association, who, with some sheep, started for Port Philip. With this party were the Messrs. J. and H. Batman and J. Faulkner. Mr. J. Batman and Mr. J. Faulkner settled at Doutagala, now Melbourne, while Mr. H. Batman returned, and by his flattering accounts I was induced to forward to Port Phillip a flock of seven hundred fifty sheep, with six freedmen as shepherds, under the charge of Robert Moody, Esquire, in the ship Adelaide. Mr. Moody, having settled the flock with the shepherds, returned, and again sailed in the Norval, with five hundred sheep and five shepherds. And on the next voyage, of the same vessel, I sent eleven hundred sheep and seven men. On this voyage, they encountered a heavy gale, and were compelled to run into what is now called Western Port, where it was deemed necessary to land the sheep, and in doing so, my good friend Moody lost his life by the upsetting of the boat in a heavy surge between the ship and the shore. With the exception of seventy-five sheep which were recovered, this large flock became a prey to the natives and native dogs. On this voyage, Messrs. Gellibrand, W. Robertson, and one or two other gentlemen visited Port Phillip. On their return I was made acquainted with the melancholy loss of my friend Mr. Moody, and then set about making arrangements to come over myself, and took my passage in the ship Caledonia, having Mr. Strachan, Anstey, Gattenby, G. Russell, Dr. Thompson, and a few others for fellow passengers. We landed, after a pleasant voyage, at what is now called Williamstown, where Dr. Thompson pitched his tent, the others proceeding to Douta Gala, Melbourne. Here we found a house of entertainment where we could not get entertained. This building was of turf or sods with a portion of wood, and comprised six apartments of a very primitive order, occupied by Johnny Faulkner as a public house, and was, of course, the Royal Hotel, it being the first and then only public house in the district of Port Phillip. Here we could get a glass of bad rum and plenty of water by paying a good price for the same, but we could get nothing to eat nor a place to sleep in. This celebrated hotel stood on the site now occupied by the Custom House in Flinders Lane or Street. Mr. Batman, having built himself a hut about the spot where the Clarendon Hotel now stands, hospitably invited us to share his home, for which we were exceedingly grateful, and dined, supped, and next morning breakfasted on a schnapper fish and damper, our host being a bit of a fisherman as well as occupying the proud situation of high constable having been appointed by the Van Diemen's Land Association, under whose auspices Mr. Batman was thus the first, and then the only man, who wielded the baton of authority. The mansion-house was a mud hut, about twenty feet long and twelve feet broad, the one side of which was occupied by the family of our host, whilst our party, consisting of Dr. Cotter, Mrs. Anstey, Mager, Gattenby, G. Russell, my working overseer Ferguson, and myself, seven in number, pigged on the other side in the best manner we could, and were thankful for the shelter. On the following day we got our luggage, provisions, etc., from the ship, and on the next day we started to find our way to Western Port, in hope of recovering the remains of my lamented friend Mr. Moody. We took an aboriginal for our guide, but he, being of a tribe near Sydney, was little acquainted with the Port Phillip district, and consequently no more used to us than to afford us a good deal of amusement by the antic manner in which he managed to roll himself over the soft mud creeks. On coming to a large creek or river which we could not ford, and not being over-sure of our course, we considered it prudent to retrace our steps. Having spent two days and slept two nights in the bush, we were again grateful for the shade of Friend Badman's Hut at Douta Gala, Melbourne where we were again hospitably received, and availed ourselves of our host's kindness for two days by way of resting. We then started for the western district, some of my men having taken up a station on the river Werribee. Having found matters there to my satisfaction, we made our way downwards to the junction with the Barwon, which we followed to the station, which had just been taken up by Messrs. Cowie and Stead, on the ground afterwards the racecourse, now a cultivated farm, the property of Joseph Griffin, and known as the old racecourse. Here we were kindly received, and passed the night. On the next morning we started for Indented Head, which had also been taken up by my men as a station. Here I found two of my men were missing, and was informed that they had been killed by the natives. Having seen the stock, etc., all correct, we spent five days searching for the remains of the poor fellows without success. 
about twelve months afterwards, their bones were pointed out to me by an old aboriginal named Woolmorgan, who described the manner in which they met their deaths as follows. The men were on their way with a pack bullock laden with provisions for the Werribee station, and were met by a tribe of aborigines near the Muradock Hill. The men were both armed with fowling pieces, which caused the wary tribe to entrap them by a stratagem thus. By persuading one that he could shoot an emu, they got him to accompany a portion of their party to the one side of the hill, whilst, under the pretense of having shot at a kangaroo, they prevailed upon the other to go in a contrary direction. Having thus managed to separate the men, the latter became an easy prey to these heartless savages, who also killed the bullock, and made themselves masters of a plentiful supply of provisions, and all the property in possession of their unfortunate victims. I had their bones gathered together and decently interred. After resting a day, we took a tour into the bush, following the course of the Barwin River to the sea, and much enjoying the romantic and picturesque scenery, particularly the Lake Conawera. Returning by an angle across the country, we made Corio, Geelong, where we were struck with the magnificent scene which burst upon our view as we reached the rise, now the center of the town, known as Church Hill. The splendor and magnitude of Corio Bay, the gentle rise from the bay to where we stood, about three-quarters of a mile, and the like gentle fall to the River Barwin, the Yu Yangs, Station Peak, the Barabool Hills, with all the varied scenery of hill and vale around, clothed in the beautiful verdure of nature, seemed to proclaim this spot as the site of a great mercantile city. Lost in contemplation, we were overtaken by night and had the satisfaction of finding the shelter of a gum tree near the place now called La Trobe Terrace. Here we camped for the night. Next morning we made Messrs. Cowie and Stead's, where we were entertained with a comfortable breakfast, and likewise got our provision bags replenished. We then crossed the Moorabool River, and afterwards the bar went at the place now known as Pollock's Ford. We tethered our horses in the valley and walked to the top of Mount Morier, from which elevated spot we had a beautiful prospect of this delightful district, and with the assistance of a good telescope we were able to trace the various windings of the rivers Lee and Barwin. Also from this mount we had another view of beautiful Corio and its lovely bay. In imagination we could picture a splendid city with the bay covered with ships of all nations, which fancies I have lived to see in part realized. This year, 1853, whilst yet under our first governor, a commencement has been made to remove the only impediment to the navigation of the bay. The town has been beautified by the erection of many elegant buildings, both public and private, and many more have been projected, some hastening to completion, whilst we have also had the pleasure of seeing the foundation stone of the first railway in the colony of Victoria laid in Geelong. Having thus far digressed from my subject, I must return to Mount Morier, where, having taken our bearings, we descended to where we left our horses, and there we encamped for the night, and next morning started across the country and made the River Lee at its junction with the Barwon, where I afterwards formed my home station. We then followed up the Lee River for about six miles to the place where Mr. Russell's station now is. Here we crossed the country in a direct line towards the Anaki Hills until we came to the Morabool River, where we halted for the night. In the morning we ascended the highest of these hills, from which we had a most magnificent view of nearly all the hills, valleys, creeks, and rivers comprised within that portion of the country, now the county of Grant. We then proceeded to Station Peak, where our view was extended over the waters of Port Phillip, to the mountains on the opposite shore. From thence we took our course to the Werribee Station, which we reached with much difficulty, and next morning we started for Dutagala, Melbourne, intending to return to Van Diemen's Land, but finding that our ship had sailed, we had to content ourselves until her return. To fill up this time, we employed ourselves in building a house for Dr. Thompson near the spot now occupied by St. Paul's Church. In this we were engaged about three weeks, and our vessel having returned, we took our passage to Van Diemen's Land, with the full determination of returning to Port Phillip, having all been greatly delighted with this beautiful country. Being now satisfied that sheep farming would prove a profitable speculation in the new land, as Port Phillip was then called in Van Diemen's Land, we entered into a co-partnership to carry it out extensively. In this we were joined by Mr. Swanston, Mercer, and Learmonth, and purchased up the shares and interests of the Van Diemen's Land Association. We took the style and title of the Derwent Company. In the latter end of the year, 1836, I returned to Port Phillip for the purpose of forming the different stations, afterwards occupied by the Derwent Company, 
and pitched my tent at the south side of Geelong, on the north bank of the Barwon River, near where a bridge was afterwards built, communicating with the western district. Here I built the first house in Geelong worthy of the name. It is built of weatherboards of Van Diemen's Land timber, which house yet stands, and is still rather an ornament to what is now called Barwon Terrace. In this house I had the honour of receiving His Excellency Sir Richard Bork, who had come hither to spy out the nakedness of the land, and with his suite encamped on the banks of the Barwon next to my house. It is worthy of remark that on the night of Sir Richard Bork's arrival the district was visited by an earthquake, the shock of which was felt all over the district. Such a phenomenon has never occurred since that time, but I was informed by a very old native, King Muradoc, that such had been felt before, but it was long, long ago. In the month of September, 1837, having finished my house and got all things comfortable for the reception of my family, I proceeded to Van Diemen's Land to bring them over, taking my passage by the James Watt, the first steam vessel that visited these shores. In the month of March following, 1838, I returned with my family, and having got them settled at Barwon Terrace, I proceeded to inspect the stations already formed, and also formed new stations at Mount Mercer and the Wardy Yalloak, and then— accompanied by Major Mercer, Mr. George Mercer, and our overseer named Anderson, started upon an exploring expedition to the interior, on which occasion we formed the station at Mount Shadwell, which was the farthest out station from Geelong on the eastward of Portland. During this tour I undertook a new occupation, Major Mercer and myself being occupied in shaving, which operation, being observed by some of the natives, afforded them much amusement, and one of them signifying a desire to be trimmed, I undertook the task, which I accomplished amidst the yells, shouts, and laughter of some fifty savages with their lubras, who enjoyed the affair very much, and thus I believe myself to be the first that shaved an aboriginal of New Holland, and that aboriginal the first that was shaved." Nor do I think he ever was shaved again, for his beard was very hard, and the razor none of the best, rendering the operation anything but pleasant, and I much doubt if he would ever again submit to the ordeal. This was nigh being my last joke, as soon after, Major Mercer's servant, in taking a loaded piece from the luggage, by some means caught the trigger upon something, which caused the piece to explode, the ball passing under the Major's arm, striking a tin pannikin out of which I was drinking, and carrying it clean from my hand. The full details of this tour were kept by Mr. George Mercer, a copy of whose journal I beg to annex for Your Excellency's information. From this time settlers were pouring into the district from Van Diemen's Land and New South Wales with their flocks and herds, and the land began to get peopled by mechanics and tradesmen. Stores sprung up in every quarter, and the whole country began to wear the aspect of prosperity. I here conclude this poor but correct account of what came within my own knowledge, and I feel assured that in most parts it will be corroborated by others, more able for the task than I am, in their returns to Your Excellency's circular. But, should there be any particular transaction upon which Your Excellency may think I can afford further information, I shall be most happy to furnish the same to the best of my ability. I have the honour to be Your Excellency's most obedient servant, David Fisher. His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. Mr. George Mercer's Journal of a Tour into the Interior of the Port Phillip District in the year 1838. First Day, 22nd March, 1838. Started from the Wardy Yalloak S.W. to Elephant Hill, 22 miles through Tea Tree Scrub. Second Day, 23rd March. Course, south to Manifold's Creek on the Saltwater Lake, 23 miles. Third Day, 25th March. Course, west to Mount Appen, twelve miles tea tree scrub. Bearings. First, Mount Marathon, northwest half north. Second, Mount Elephant, northeast by north. Third, Warrion Hills, east. Fourth, Mount Kate, southwest. Fifth, Mount Mary, north. Fourth day, twenty eighth March, northwest one half north to Mount Marathon, about twelve miles. Bearings from Mount Marathon, first, Mount George, west by north, second, Mount Janfron, west, third, Mount William, Grampians, northwest. Fifth day, first of April. Course, west by north to Freshwater Creek, fifteen miles. Sixth day, second April. Course, west by north to Mount George, twelve miles, no water. Bearings from Mount George, first, Mount Janfron, west, 
Second, Mount Alexander, supposed, northeast by north. Third, west end of Grampians, due north. Fourth, east end of Grampians, northeast by north. Fifth, Mount William, north-northeast, supposed. Sixth, distant hill, east by north. Seventh day, third April. Course, about north-northwest to native well, twelve miles. Brackish water. Eighth day, fourth April. Course to southeast end of Grampians to river, twelve miles. Bearings from southeast hill Grampians. First, Mount Alexander, supposed, east by north. Second, Mount Elephant, east by south. Third, distant range of hills supposed to be the Victoria, northwest. Ninth day, fifth of April. Course, northeast about ten or twelve miles, no water. Tenth day, sixth April, course, northeast to native well near the hill, ten miles, good water, but little. Eleventh day, seventh April, course, northeast to creek near hill, Pyrenees, three miles. Twelfth day, eighth April, course, about east-northeast, to near the further end of the supposed Pyrenees, fifteen miles, no water. Thirteenth day, ninth April, course, for about six miles east by south, for other five miles southwest by west, two miles southeast, distance direct, about six miles east by south, a little rain water. Fourteenth day, tenth April, course, south-southeast to bottom of low tiers, twelve miles, no water, crossed river and passed Stony Hill. Bearings from Stony Hill, first, Mount Elephant, south by west, second, Mount Marathon, supposed, southwest, half-west, third, Mount George, supposed, southwest, fourth, end of Grampians, west by south. Fifteenth day, eleventh April. Course, east-southeast to creek, crossed tier and thick scrub. Much time lost in cutting round for the cattle. Distance, twelve miles. Sixteenth day, twelfth April. Halted this day. Seventeenth day, thirteenth April, 1838. Course, southeast to creek, five miles beyond our wardy Yalowick station, now Mr. McMillan's. Good water, distance, thirteen miles. Eighteenth day, fourteenth April. Course, about southeast to station at the Barwon. Distance to the weatherboard house, twenty-five miles. D. Fisher. End of section six. Section seven of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 7 Letter from T. H. Pike, Upper Werribee, Ballon 12th August, 1853 Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of yours of the 29th of July, requesting information as to my first occupation of the Werribee country, etc., etc., I succeeded Mr. John Gray, who was the first person on this run. I purchased from him in July, 1842. The adjoining station, Balleny, I purchased from Mr. Kinnear, who had purchased six weeks previous from Mr. John Steiglitz, who was the first person that occupied it, having come into the country the same time as Mr. John Gray. The Morton Plain station, in the Wimmera district, I purchased from Mr. Joseph Raleigh in March, 1850. He took the run-up two years before, and was the first occupier of it. My brothers at the Penny Royal Creek, now the township of Melton, took that country up in 1838. They were the first persons that remained on it, several others before them having left it as useless. The aboriginal natives here are very few, and have always been harmless and useless. At the Morton Plains they are in considerable numbers, but have always been, as far as I know, perfectly harmless, and in many instances very useful. I shall be always pleased and happy to render you or your government any information when it is in my power to do so. I have the honor to remain your Excellency's obedient, humble servant, T. H. Pike, His Excellency, the Lieutenant Governor. End of Section 7 Section 8 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter number 8. Edward Dryden, Macedon 
August 1853. To His Excellency Charles Joseph Latrobe, Governor of the Colony of Victoria, etc., etc. May it please Your Excellency, in compliance with the request made by Your Excellency to me, I gladly avail myself of the earliest opportunity of endeavouring to give the information required in answer to the various queries contained in that request, and trust it will prove satisfactory. I arrived in Melbourne land from V.D. land, accompanied by Mr. Charles Peters, with sheep, in the year 1837, and immediately after took possession of a run for them at Kilimane, where I remained only two years, leaving it in the possession of Mr. Robert Aitken. In 1839 I took possession of the Mount Macedon station, which I have occupied even until the present hour, depasturing sheep and cattle. It is situated to the northeast of that mountain, and had not been previously occupied by any other. At this period all the district was but thinly inhabited, and still more so as you advanced into the interior northwards, few having reached beyond the river Coliban. To the north of my station were two settlers, jointly depasturing sheep and cattle, the one a Mr. Ebden, the other Judge Donathorne, who became occupiers of their run in the year 1838. Mr. Mollison, in the same year, took possession of a station to the blank of the Coliban. Also, Messrs. Monroe, Yaldwin, and Jennings took possession of stations on the river Campasp. To the northeast, Blankney sat down, and to the east, Messrs. Jardine and Fulton followed the same example. All those parties were depasturing blank. First two mentioned and preceded me in the district about one year. Of the Aborigines at my time of locating there, there was one tribe consisting of about 150, including adult male and females and children of both sexes, who camped from place to place in their Mia Mias, between Mount Macedon and Mount Alexander, generally calling at the various stations on their way for the purpose of soliciting food. They were unable to converse with Europeans, but made signs as the means of communicating their wants or desires. They were exceedingly simple in their manner, and perfectly harmless in their bearing to strangers, possessing none of that sanguine temperament which characterized many other tribes. I never heard of a single outrage committed by any one of them upon any settler, not even on any of their servants, unto the present hour. As to those who followed me in extending the settled districts around, I cannot say anything definite, otherwise it would give me pleasure to do so. All I can say is that during the years 1840 and 1841, several individuals settled the Mount Alexander and the Laudan districts. In answering the queries, I have confined myself to the facts which came within my own knowledge only, without adopting another person's account. Should it prove to be what Your Excellency required, I am most happy in subscribing myself, Your Excellency's most humble and obedient servant, Edward Dryden. End of section 8 Section 9 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter number 9 from John G. Robertson, Wando Vale, 26th of September, 1853. To His Excellency C. J. La Trobe, Esquire, Lieutenant Governor Victoria. Dear Sir, I am in receipt of your circular by last post, and I am afraid I can give you but little information connected with the settling of our district, but if a few extracts from the store of recollection will be of any use to you, you are welcome to them, with part of my own personal narrative. I arrived in the neighbouring colony of Van Diemen's Land in the year 1831, and, like many of my countrymen, with a light purse. One half-crown and a sixpence was all my pocket contained when I landed at Hobart Town with a few fellow passengers. After walking through the streets for some two hours, they proposed having something to eat and drink, which I could not refuse joining. After Bill was checked, the little now I was left with only sixpence, I found it would not do for me to keep company any longer, so I left under the pretense of seeing a friend, but in reality to look for employment, which was easily found. Next morning I left the ship for my work, and I never saw any of the passengers again. I remained for nine years in Van Diemen's Land as overseer with two different masters on their farms, and at the end of 1840 I'd saved about three thousand pounds from hard work. 
About this time I learnt that one of my sisters had been recommended to come to the colony on account of bad health, and that another of them would come with her. I determined to form a home of my own, and owing to the extravagant price of land and stock in Van Diemen's land, I looked to this colony as the place where I ought to invest my little all. In January 1840, I bought 1,000 ewes for 1,800 pounds, a team of six working bullocks, two cows and a horse for 195 pounds, freight, stores, tools, etc., etc., cost 311 pounds. With four men at a wage of 175 pounds, I left for Portland Bay on the 17th of February 1840, and had to wait near Portland for the return of the vessel. I had previously agreed with a Mr. Corney to take half of the vessel for fear of a bad trip, so as to divide the risk. But we were fortunate, by care and attention and fine weather, we only lost ten sheep, and a working bullock of mine had its neck broken, to replace which I had to pay thirty pounds for another. I had no difficulty in finding a run, as the Messrs. Henty were applied to by my former employer to forward my views, and by doing so they would be conferring a favour on him. They pointed out their boundary, and I took possession of the land adjoining, as there were but three settlers here before me, Messrs. Henty, Winter and Pilau. The latter had no sheep, but had taken up a run. White brothers from the Pendland Hills near Melbourne came on to the Wannon country the week before I arrived, following in the track of the Wedge brothers who stopped at the Grange. Passing all that fine sheep country from Fiery Creek to the Grange for permanent water. Mrs. Addison and Murray arrived on the Glenelg River from Portland the same day I came on the Wando, and they ran about putting up frames of huts thinking to secure country by that means that would have kept two hundred thousand sheep, if they had got leave to keep it, with seven hundred sheep. The same week, the second in March, 1840, Mrs. Savage and Dana took up Nangila on the Glenelg. Mrs. Rentmore and Butcher took up Warwick Station on the east bank of the Glenelg, and Mrs. Corney Brothers occupied Kashmir on the east and west bank of the Wando River. Thomas Tuller, The Wannon Falls. In April following, Mr. Thomas McCulloch put himself down between Anderson and Murray, Mr. Corney and Self, taking part from each, but most from me, from fear of going outside where there was plenty of land, from fear of the natives. The same week, Mr. Perprick took part of White Brothers, Pillows and Tullers. As we had all arrived from Van Diemen's land direct, we knew nothing of the squatting regulation, and by the end of April we were all quarrelling about our boundary, and as we had no communication with Melbourne but by water occasionally, we all looked forward to the arrival of the Crown Lands Commissioner, and his duties seem at that time very ill-defined, and owing to the conflicting testimony of the witnesses, he had a most difficult task to adjudicate. Although I had contented myself with about 12,000 acres, as there was a sort of natural boundary, by the end of June, when Crown Lands Commissioner Fyans arrived, I was left with less than 2,000 acres, and even the place where my home station was formed was not secure. Although myself and my neighbour, Mr. Henty, decided on a boundary when he pointed out the land to me, he, Mr. Henty, procured a letter from the Crown Lands Commissioner for me to remove my home station, as it was too near his boundary, which letter was not presented to me until the Commissioner had left the district. I was exceedingly anxious to get on with my improvements, and I liked the spot I had chosen. I did not consider myself justified in going on with the improvements until the return of the Commissioner six months afterwards, for fear I should have to remove my head station. By this time, my quarter was about the best in the district. I had a paddock with plenty of hay and corn for a hungry horse. When I learnt that the commissioner was in the neighbourhood, I waited on him about twenty miles off, invited him to my place, 
and held out the bait of hay and corn to his horses, knowing some little of human nature. I did not forget the man as well as the horses. It had the desired effect. He promised my place the site I had chosen, told me I had been misrepresented to him, and after seeing his horses next morning, offered to extend my boundary in order to put my place in the middle of my run, which offer, to his astonishment, I declined. And by this second visit, I was put in possession of my original boundary. I may here observe that the Crown Lands Commissioner made my place his quarters for nine years afterwards, and I saw a good deal of the wrangling among the squatters in this part of the district. And I may remark he had a most difficult task to perform. There was no possibility of his seeing the boundary of the different lands, and if he had, it was through thick forest, where each tried to lead him astray, and where he had never been before. His district was large, which did not admit of the time. The land was taken up so rapidly. The most conflicting evidence was given by unprincipled men, and often, I'm sorry to say such matters, so that there was no getting at the truth who was the first to occupy the land. From what I have seen, the Crown Lands Commissioner's office was no sinecure, in this district at all events. Numbers of the young gentlemen who came out to this colony about that time with a few hundred pounds took up runs with three hundred, four hundred and five hundred sheep, clubbed together and expected to make fortunes in a few years from the way they spoke and the way in which they managed their sheep farms. Few of them knew anything of mechanics, and they were totally unable to make comfort for themselves or their servants, in consequence of which they fell back lower in morality and energy than many of their men, for dirt and filth were noticeable in places and persons, and their pride was who would rough it best. They even went so far with their indolence as to drop shaving themselves and it was no bad criterion to know how a man managed his station if the owner was seen looking out through a large wisp of hair on his face. The three eventful years, which will long be remembered in this colony of 1841, 42, 43, swept off most of these young gentlemen with their herds and all. About twenty of the squatters in the Portland Bay district that were fast men were sold off, Three or four, I know, compromised for less than half with their creditors, and three other large stations were so overwhelmed in debt that they are only recovering from it now, and there is not one station that I knew but my own and Addison and Murray's in the Portland Bay district that is occupied by the original squatter. Every station has changed hand, either by dissolving partnership, letting or selling, even that of Murray and Addison. This is the third brother of the Addisons two having died, so that I am left the only one now that I know of. I did not feel the effect of the three bad years like most of my neighbours. I had still five hundred pounds in Van Diemen's land to fall back on, which all went to carry on my station by the end of 1843. With the wool of that year, I bought for my cousin Warwick Station on the Glenelg, with two thousand five hundred sheep and a team of bullocks, and all improvements for three hundred pounds. This station had been formed by Messrs. Rentmore and Butcher and Mr. Wilmore in Van Diemen's Land, and cost that gentleman five thousand seven hundred pounds forming and keeping it for three years. Nangila was offered to me a few days after with the same number of sheep for four hundred pounds, which station had been bought by the gentleman who offered it to me at a sheriff's sale in Melbourne for two hundred and thirty pounds, the price of a dray and a team of six bullocks, with the expenses of bills and law added, that had been bought for the station in 1841, and paid for by bill at the time. As I have before said, in the three years from 1840 to 1843, I had invested three thousand pounds in my sheep station. It is true that in that time the station had fallen in value to three or four hundred pounds, but still the money was sunk. 
I did not come here as a sheep farmer with the intention of making a fortune in a few years and leaving. I came with the intention from the first to form a comfortable home for myself and two sisters and live by the way, making and having as many little comforts within ourselves as the country could afford with frugality and industry. As a leading feature with us, we kept only one house-servant and often none, so that the housekeeping expenses never reached three hundred pounds a year. I commenced with one thousand sheep. At the end of five years, there were seven thousand three hundred sheep on the run, and from eight thousand to ten thousand is the number I keep on it when full stocked. There are eleven thousand eight hundred and ten acres of land, a pretty little station well watered. I shall have been here fourteen years in March next, and all the cash I have taken out of the concern is five thousand three hundred and twenty four pounds, with expectations fifteen hundred more in wool now coming into the London market. It is true, if my stock and station just now was sold, they would bring with purchased land and improvements about thirteen thousand pounds, but if the government resumed the land or took it away for any purpose, the stock and station, that is, purchased land, would not be worth more than four thousand pounds, so that I have worked hard for fourteen years for eleven thousand eight hundred and twenty-four pounds and three thousand pounds of this sum was money invested. I may here mention that four thousand three hundred twenty-four pounds of the above money was given away, as it was saved, to relatives who needed it, so that I have never had money at interest since I came here. This eleven thousand eight hundred twenty-four pounds gives me somewhere about eight hundred forty-five pounds a year. Suppose my run to be required by government, and if you deduct interest on the £3,000 at the rate of 12.5%, which merchants charge for money borrowed on stations, that would leave me a clear profit of £470 a year for the last 14 years, and allow only for the keep of myself and wife, and for my labour, for which I received £500 a year and keep when I left Van Diemen's Land. The above is a true statement, which I can show data for at any time, and you may make such use of it as you think proper. There is not a station in the Portland district better managed for its size, both as regards economy and care of man and beast in it, and I have always endeavoured to live as a farmer should do with such an income. I have no doubt there are numbers here who make their stations pay better, but most of them live little better than my pig does and this kind of sheep farmer mostly when he goes to town does not like to return to his station and often spends a deal of money at taverns in town because he has such a comfortless home in the month of june eighteen forty the station that is willis and swanston's glenelg pigeon ponds chetwind was taken up by thomas norris for a van diemen's land company of four gentlemen Mrs. W. and A. for long sold their farm of 3,000 acres in Van Diemen's land for 9,000 sheep, and William for long went into partnership with three merchants in Hobart Town. They were to keep all the female stock until they had 100,000 sheep, sell the male stock, the manager Norris to have 500 pounds a year, and 10% on the sale of stock. Two of the merchants turned out to be men of straw. The other, Mr. Thomas Winter, told me he had £9,000 in cash to keep the station going for two and a half years, and Mr. Winter came over in the winter of 1843 to try what he could do to recover his money. They sent 4,000 sheep to Hobart Town, but they hardly paid the freight. He then left to sell the place, when he found he could not carry it on for want of money, and the splendid run with 20,000 sheep was sold to the merchants in Hobart Town for nineteen hundred pounds, and it required all the purchase money to pay the liabilities, so that poor Mr. Winter lost all his nine thousand pounds. Mr. Forlong lost all his sheep. To show the reckless way business was managed in those days, William and Andrew Forlong were partners in some purchased land near Melbourne. 
William for long only in the sheep station above. William offered Andrew his share of this sheep station for the share in the land near Melbourne, which was accepted by Andrew, and it was not until Mr. Andrew Fulong arrived as far as my place to arrange with Mr. Winter that he learnt it was sold to pay the debts of the station and delivered only the day before he came here. This was partly to be attributed to the want of postal communication, as I have before remarked, for our letters were sent from here to Van Diemen's Land and from thence to Melbourne in those days. In October of 1841, Messrs. Jackson and Gibson from Melbourne came on the remaining unoccupied land on the right and left banks of the canal, between Warwick on the right and Nangila on the left, as far off as the company stations of Winter for Long and others, thus fourteen miles on both sides of the river. This was the farthest west station for two years. In the Gibson family there were two ladies on the verge of the wilderness, one of them an old lady of seventy years of age. Mr. Jackson left for Scotland, leaving his station in charge of a Mr. Bell, who occupied the Durgham station on the west bank, Mr. Gibson occupying Rose Neath on the east bank about six miles apart. The ladies, Mrs. Gibson and Mrs. Macfarlane, lived in tents for ten months. Mr. G. was but an indifferent manager and had indeed hardships to encounter. Soon after they arrived, they congregated a large number of natives about their place, whom they kept hanging about, doing and undoing, to keep them employed. The ladies were anxious to get a garden formed as they had a quantity of English seeds. They got the natives to work in the garden for them, but they were expensive labour. I have gone to the station and found as many as twenty natives round the place, and not one white man near the station, Mr. Gibson and his men being away splitting or doing something from home. I used to expostulate with them about the impropriety of allowing the natives to remain about the place when there was no one about but the two females. Mr. and Mrs. G. just laughed and said they were poor harmless creatures and the only precaution used was Mrs. G. carried a broken three-barrelled pistol in a leather belt which she wore around her middle. This formed part of her toilette. On one occasion, Mr. G. and his only available men were making hurdles, and they were in want of nails that were at Durgham Station six miles off. Mrs. G., who was fond of riding, offered to go for the nails as they were so much wanted, and to take one of the black men for a guide. They arrived at Durgham, the six miles, Mrs. G. riding, the black man Yarra walking. They got six pounds of nails in a leather bag, which Yarra had to carry. On the way back in a thick forest, Yarra, who was a little before on a dray cart, stopped suddenly, caught the bridle of Mrs. G.'s horse, ordered her to get off and walk, and he would ride. Mrs. G. had presence of mind to pull out her pistol from her belt under her shawl and presented it at the man who let go the bridle in a moment. With her whip, she struck her horse, which dashed off and saved her life. Some days after, Yarra brought home the nails, and they all laughed at the affair, which they told me some nights after that there was nothing there to laugh at. A few days after this, Mrs. Macfarlane was in the garden with some of her poor black creatures, as she called them, and she was reproving one of them for pulling up the young potatoes. Yarra came running at Mrs. Macfarlane with an uplifted rake, evidently to strike Mrs. Macfarlane. When Mrs. G. heard the scream and rushed out with the pistol in her hand, all the natives, nine or ten of them, leapt over the fence and were no more seen. In the evening... The shepherd at the home station did not come home. His dog brought about three hundred sheep long after dark. Mr. G., the only man about the place, next morning went in search of his shepherd and sheep. The poor dog went direct to the dead shepherd about a mile from home. Mr. G. had to walk about six miles to Bell's, 
for his own horses were away. Mr. Bell had one man, and Mr. G. tracked the sheep through the long heath towards the Wando, and there they found about five hundred sheep coming back again, which they had to return with. Mr. Bell rode twenty-one miles for me and two others. We all got to Roseneath about three in the afternoon. Mr. G. returned with the five hundred sheep about the same time, still seven hundred away. Five of us started, leaving Mr. G. to take care of the ladies, as they had been thus without the least protection all day, and now became afraid to stop by themselves all night with the dead shepherd. After a smart ride of fourteen miles, we came upon the main body of the sheep, but no natives. The sheep were nearly all dead. Such wanton destruction no one but those who saw it can imagine. There were six hundred and ten fine ewes just about to lamb, for which forty-two shillings a head had been paid the year before, all dead. Some skinned, others skinned and quartered, some cut open and the fat taken out and piled in skins, but most of them just knocked on the head with a stick. Meat, fat and all mixed up with the fine sand of the stringy bark forest. It was quite evident the natives had left in the morning, for all was cold, and we saw no cooking or cooked meat. We agreed to all ride back for two miles, taking the few living sheep with us and one man being left with the horses, to creep back after dark, and then all remain. But no natives came. We returned to Roseneath in the morning, buried the shepherd, and six of us started in search of the natives. I never found any of them for two days. I was out on the third night. Two of our horses got away. One of them was mine, and I had to walk home, which I was afterwards very glad of, for the party fell in with an unfortunate native and ran him down, and I believe shot him in retaliation. And I now have no doubt he never heard of Mr. G.'s sheep. On my way home I came to an outstation hut of my neighbours for a drink of water, and there was our friend Yarra, the native, chopping wood for the hut-keeper. I looked at him closely and saw a pair of Mr. G.'s old trousers he had on at the time, all smeared with blood, whether the poor shepherds or the sheep's I know not. I was only a mile from home, and there I found Mr. Gibson's bullock-driver with his team and two men splitters, returning from Portland on his way home. I told the bullock driver what had happened, and that I saw Yarra at the hut, and if he could take Yarra on with him in the morning in his dray, he might perhaps tell who had killed the shepherd. They called friend Yarra, and easily induced him to go with them, but when he came in sight of the station he got off the dray and was running away when one of the splitters shot him. So ended poor Yarra. After this, there was a constant war kept up between the natives and the two stations, Bells and Gibsons, and I regret to say a fearful loss of life to the poor natives by two young, heartless vagabonds Gibson and Bell had as overseers when they left. The first day I went over the Wando Vale station to look at the ground, I found old Maggie that Sir Thomas Mitchell gave the tomahawk to, fishing for mussels with her toes, in a water-hole up to her middle, near where the Major crossed that stream. Poor old Maggie died about fourteen days since, a dreadful sufferer from rheumatism. Nearly all her male relatives were killed three days before I arrived on the one day by White Brothers. Three days after the Whites arrived, the natives of this creek, with some others, made a plan to rob the newcomers as they had done with the Mrs. Henty before. They watched an opportunity and cut off fifty sheep from White Brothers' flocks, which were soon missed, and the natives followed. They had taken shelter in an open plain with a long clump of tea tree which the White Brothers' party, seven in number, surrounded and shot them all but one. Fifty-one men were killed and the bones of the men and sheep lay mingled together, bleaching in the sun at the fighting hills. It must have been a great relief to me in most of this part, 
for the females were mostly chased by men up the Glenelg, and the children followed them. This I learnt since from them. The man who escaped was afterwards known as Long Yarra, a very fine-looking man. He afterwards lived for some time with a Mr. Dash, a settler who had taken a fancy to Yarra's gin, Lewaqueen. There had been some very unpardonable conduct on the part of Mr. Dash, who I was of opinion was at times deranged. In the autumn of 1843, Mr. Dash and his man Larry went to strip bark, taking a bullock dray, Long Yarra and another native with them, about eight miles back on the Adelaide Road, intending to stop out all night. As soon as they were gone, Lua Queen went away, taking her child with her, and did not return. And on the third day, the shepherd put his flock in the pen and came for us. We went out, following the track of the dray, and came on the dead body of Larry, with two eagles pecking the remains of his skeleton, and at a short distance, Mr. Dash. They had been in bed when they were attacked, and a frightful struggle they must have had, for Mr. Dash was a very strong man. It was evidently a concerted affair, there being a number of natives, and Lua Queen leaving the shepherd's wife, which she had not done before. A Mr. Dash of Dash on the Glenelg run, near me, kept a harem for himself and his men. The consequence was he, like many more, had to sell out. All the men and masters got fearfully diseased from these poor creatures. They, of course, quarrelled with the natives about their gins, and the natives, to be revenged for some of the insults, took away forty-eight ewes and lambs. They were followed by some of the neighbours, and Mr. Dasher's own men. They rushed their camp, shot two of the natives, one of them a female, said to be Mr. Dasher's foremost black woman. All the sheep were dead, which they burned, and one of the neighbours who was out brought with him to my house for the night a native basket or beanak, with all the female paraphernalia of red and white clay to paint, a flint, two dead frogs, some shells, and a very neat female foot half grilled with a large mouthful taken out of the hollow part of the foot. My neighbour brought these to me as he said he knew I was curious about such things. In the end of 1843 I was passing through the run when I came on a black lad crying with his face fearfully scalded. I asked him how it happened. All I could get out of him was George had thrown a pot of tea in his face. I took him home with me and dressed his face with lime water and oil. He felt grateful for what I had done for him and he was the first I ever allowed about my place. He and his wife and child are the only ones ever employed by me. They have been with me ever since, and I give them twelve shillings a week and two rations. He is always very clean, but the woman Jenny is never clean. The native lad, Joe, told me he was defending his gin, which he had just got from the man George, a bullock driver, when he pitched the scalding tea in his face, and this man was the terror of all the fighting men on the Glenelg. About this time Mr. McCulloch parted with his overseer, who was too quiet and short-sighted and always lost himself in the bush. He was stopping with Mr. Corney until he had an opportunity of returning to Van Diemen's land. He went out gathering mushrooms about 800 or 900 yards from Mr. Corney's house. He had a red handkerchief gathering them in. When a native started up a few yards from him, asked his name, and he said, George. Immediately another rose behind him and spoke to the front native, who, dashing a spear at Mr. Lewis, struck him on the breast. He turned, and now another spear struck him on the shoulder blade, and about four inches of the spear broke off close in the wound, which we had to open up, and we took out the spear with a pair of pliers. The poor man was very ill afterwards, but I think as much frightened as hurt. He used to say in his sleep that the men were eating him, which he seemed to have a great horror of. He often used to say if he had called himself Lewis instead of George, 
the natives would not have touched him. This is the only outrage I have known of where the whites were not the first aggressors, or that the natives had not theft in view. In all my rambles, I have never seen but five natives in a state of nature. I have never thought them numerous. I am sure I have never seen five hundred all put together from the Grampians to the sea. I do not mean to say that there were not more, for if I were to believe what I have heard of as having been killed in different affrays with the settlers, they would amount to more than that number. I have on four different occasions when they committed murders gone out with others in search of them, and I now thank my God I never fell in with them. There is no doubt I should be like many others and feel that sting which must always be felt by the most regardless of the deed done to those poor creatures. And in twenty years more there will be not one in the Portland district. There are now but two settlers in the Portland district though know who have been severe on the natives, and they are doing little good. It seems strange none have done any good who were murderers of these poor creatures, either man or master. I will here change the subject, for it is too painful to dwell on. And I cannot see the way it could be avoided, for no law could have protected these poor people from such men as we had to do with at that time. When I arrived through the thick forest land from Portland to the edge of the Wannon country, I cannot express the joy I felt at seeing such a splendid country before me, where my little all that I was driving before me was to feed. The whole of the Warren had been swept by a bushfire in December, and there had been a heavy fall of rain in January, which has happened less or more for the last fourteen years, and the grasses were about four inches high of that lovely dark green. The sheep had no trouble to fill their bellies, all was eatable. Nothing had trodden the grass before them. I could neither think nor sleep for admiring this new world to me who was fond of sheep. I looked upon the thirty-seven grasses that formed the pasture of my run. There was no silk grass, which had been destroying our Van Diemen's land pastures, for I had watched its progress with uneasiness, and I wrote to my friends there, that I had never been able to detect any of this noxious grass. The fire had been so great that one could not get as much grass as would thatch our hut. We were obliged to take large cut tail grass out of the water holes. The sheep thrived admirably, and with a little care were clean from the scab, and I did not know that there was such a thing as clean sheep. The few sheep at first made little impression on the face of the country for three or four years. The first great change was a severe frost, 11th of November, 1844, which killed nearly all the beautiful blackwood trees that studded the hills in every sheltered nook. Some of them really noble, twenty or thirty years old. Nearly all were killed in one night. The same night a beautiful shrub that was interspersed among the blackwoods Sir Thomas Mitchell, called at Acacia glutinosa, was also killed. About three weeks after these trees and shrubs were all burnt, they now sought to recover as they would do after a fire. This certainly was a sad chance. Before this catastrophe, all the landscape looked like a park with shade for sheep and cattle. Many of our Herbaceous plants began to disappear from the pasture land. The silk grass began to show itself on the edge of the bush track and in patches here and there on the hill. The patches have grown larger every year. Herbaceous plants and grasses give way for the silk grass and the little annuals beneath which are annual peas and die in our deep clay soil with a few hot days in spring. Nothing returns to supply their place until later in the winter following. The consequence is that the long, deep-rooted grasses that held our strong clay hill together have died out. The ground is now exposed to the sun, and it is cracked in all directions. 
on the clay hills are slipping in all directions also the sides of the precipitous creeks long slips taking trees and all with them when i first came here i knew but of two land slips both of which i went to see now there are hundreds found within the last three years a rather strange thing is going on now one day all the creeks and little watercourses were covered with a large tussocky grass with other grasses and plants to the middle of every watercourse but the clonelg and the bonnen and in many places of these rivers now that the only soil is getting trodden hard with stock springs of salt water are bursting out in every hollow or watercourse and as it trickles down the watercourse in summer the strong tussocky grasses die before it with nil others the clay is left perfectly bare in summer the strong clay cracks the winter rain washes out the clay now almost every little gully has a deep rut when rain falls it runs off the hard ground rushes down these ruts runs into the larger creeks and is carrying earth trees and all before it over one in country is now as difficult to ride as if it were fenced ruts seven eight and ten feet deep and as wide are found for miles where two years ago it was covered with tussocky grass like a land marsh I find from the rapid strides the silk grass has made over my run. I will not be able to keep the number of sheep the run did three years ago, and as a cattle station it will be still worse. It requires no great prophetic knowledge to see that this part of the country will not carry the stock that is in it at present. I mean the open downs. And every year it will get worse, as it did in Van Diemen's land. And after all the experiments I worked with English grasses, I have never found any of them that would replace our native sward. The day the soil is turned up, that day the pasture is gone forever, as far as I know. For I had a paddock that was sown with English grasses in squares each by itself and mixed in every way. All was carried off by the grubs and the paddock allowed to remain in native grass which returned in eight years nothing but silk grass grew year after year and i suppose it will be so on to the end of time dutch clover will not grow on our clay soils and for pastoral purposes the lands here are getting of less value every day that is with the kind of grass that is growing in them and will carry less sheep and far less cattle I now look forward to fencing my run in with wire as the only chance of keeping up my stock on the land. I am, dear sir, your most obedient servant, John G. Robertson. End of section 9「Section ten of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter number ten from Charles Whale Sherrod Cresix Creek, tenth of August eighteen fifty three, my dear sir. In answering your letter of the 27th of July, I feel much pleasure in sending you all the information I can remember as to the original settlers in the Western Port District. Beginning at the eastern head of Western Port Bay and taking the route towards Melbourne with a few deviations, the first station was Massey and Anderson's Cultivation, known then as the Old Settlement Station, from the circumstance of there having been a settlement formed there some years previous, though not at the exact spot they occupied, and afterwards abandoned. At that period, namely 1841-43, to 43, a considerable quantity of wild cattle was running in the neighbourhood, supposed to have been the increase of some that were left when the original settlement was abandoned. About two miles from them was Armstrong, who succeeded John Tom, 
who succeeded Massey and Anderson. About five miles from Armstrong were Cuthbert and Gardner, original settlers, whose cattle I piloted myself from the Red Bluff, I believe, in 1842. About twelve miles up the bay, Fitzherbert M. Mundy, original settler, Red Bluff. About seven miles from him, Martin, who succeeded Robert Jameson. About four miles from him, Robert Jameson, original settler. These were all the stations at that time on the eastern side of the saltwater inlets. On crossing them, about three miles on, was Manton's original settler, cultivation and cattle station. About eight miles from him, Charles Dodd, original settler, on the south side of the creek, the name of which I forget. On the north, Turnbull and Reock, original. Two miles from them, on another creek, was Dr. Jameson, original. Two miles from him, on the same creek, Captain Howey, I forget whom he succeeded. Three miles from him, same creek, Captain Minton, original, who was killed by a tree falling on him. To return to the road to Melbourne, from Dodds, about three miles, were Bath and Perry, original, three miles from them, north of the road, O'Connor, original, and about the same distance on the other side of the road, the Ruffies, original, three brothers, about eight miles from them, and three from the road, Bacchus and Woolley, original, next, Dandenong, Dr. McRae, original, up the creek, the Blacks Station, Thomas, Protector. Next, I believe, the Reverend Mr. Clough. Next, Mrs. Scott, on the same creek. Seven miles from Dandenong on the Melbourne Road, the No Good Damper Inn, kept at that time by De Villers, and five from that, the Man Station, which was the last station I knew towards Melbourne. I must apologise for sending you such a vague account, it is now some time since I was in this country, and since my return I have never visited Western Port, and consequently I do not know by whom these stations may now be occupied, and the original names of stations and creeks I have forgotten almost entirely. My chief residence while in that district during the years 1841-43 to 43 was at Robert Jameson's. I never had a station in Victoria myself. The natives seldom visited the country on the eastern side of the inlets except on war excursions. Robert Jameson's station was attacked by blacks, but it was before I knew it. They were supposed to be Gippsland natives. In conclusion, I beg to state that all goes on well here with the gold miners, and the yield of gold continues steady. I beg to subscribe myself yours very truly, Charles Wailed Sherrod. To His Excellency C. J. La Trobe. End of section 10. Section 11 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter number 11 from Thomas Lemonth. Sir, Bunning Yong, 11th of August, 1853. At Your Excellency's request, I have the honour to forward the following memoranda regarding the first occupation of the country in the districts of the Barwan, Murabul, Bunning Yong and Mount Emu, in which my brother and myself were personally concerned. The narrative is very brief and meagre, but may at least serve to mark dates. Early in 1837, a fleet of small vessels, perhaps fifteen or twenty in number, and each carrying from three hundred to one thousand sheep, was employed in conveying stock from the Tamar, on the opposite coast of Van Diemen's Land, from January to the middle of May, during the prevalence of the easterly winds in Bass's Straits. The vessels were much crowded, and the sheep were generally on board for seven or eight days, so that from want of a proper supply of food and water, or from stormy weather, whole shipments were sometimes almost entirely lost on the passage or shortly after landing. The average loss, however, on these importations was probably about 15%. The sheep were purchased in Van Diemen's Land at prices varying from 
twenty shillings to thirty-five shillings each, and the freight and expenses were about five or six shillings a head more. The original stock being composed entirely of breeding sheep, the first settlers lived exclusively on salted provisions during the first year of their occupation, the purchase of which, and the large expenses necessary incurred in forming their stations, added to the small increase, and the loss of wool from the fever engendered by the crowded vessels, entirely absorbed the profits of several seasons, and in some cases ruined the adventurers. The first stations were commenced with flocks varying from 500 to 1,500, and one or two such as the Clyde Company and Derwent Company, under the management of Mr. George Russell and Mr. D. Fisher, had 3,500 ewes, respectively. In the month of April of that year, 1837, my brother and I landed three cargoes from Van Diemen's Land, or about 2,000 ewes, and we purchased 1,000 more at two guineas a head. These we drove up the Barwon River to a place about 20 miles from Geelong, and occupied a run on each side of the river and another on the native creek to the eastward of the Lee. About a month previous to this, news had arrived of the loss of Messrs. Gellibrand and Hess in the country towards the sources of the Barwon or towards Colac, and as the Aborigines were committing depredations within fifteen miles of Geelong, which at that time had not even a hut to mark its present site, settlers were afraid to penetrate into the interior in order to take up runs, and a line drawn at little more than twenty-five miles from the shores of Port Phillip Bay comprised nearly the whole of the sheep stations at that time and for some months later. In the occupation of the country, there was a tacit understanding that no one was to take up a station nearer than three miles to another person, the intervening ground being equally divided. And this regulation in general was sufficient to secure harmony among the adventurers as they arrived, there being no Crown Commissioner, however, at that time, nor any recognised authority but that of the strongest, feuds and quarrels with regard to boundaries did take place, which in some cases resulted in blows, though in general more good feeling and consideration for the rights of others were observed in the then lawless state of the infant colony than might have been expected. As it may be interesting in a record of this kind to give the names of the earliest adventurers, I enclose a rough map of the country on which the stations occupied at the date I arrived, May 1837, are noted in red ink. Those of which I shall now speak, and which were occupied in the following year, that is up to May 1838, are marked in black ink. In August 1837, a party consisting of Mr. Darcy, a government surveyor, Mrs. C. Hutton, G. Russell, Anderson, Fisher, Dr. Thompson and myself, took a horse cart, and with a tent and provisions and one of the aboriginals as a guide, in order to explore the country in the neighbourhood of Bunanyong, the only hill that breaks the horizon to the northwest of Geelong. We reached the hill on the second day, ascended it, and being disappointed by the thickly wooded and inferior nature of the country, and suffering from want of food for two days, having separated from the cart, the party broke up some returning down the Moorabool to the settled district, while the remainder, on getting on the track of the cart, followed it, and continued their exploration, till led by the native to Lake Burrumbeet, twenty miles to the northward of Bunanyong. The water of the lake was at that time brackish, and the country was thought to be too distant for occupation. The party therefore returned. On our return home, we learnt from a person who, with others, had been in pursuit of a tribe of natives to the west of Lake Colac, in order to recover some property that had been stolen by them from Mr. Ricketts, the furthest settler, that a large sheet of salt water had been discovered, that they could not see across it in one direction, and that there were shells and the appearance of the rise and fall of the tide on its shores. As soon, therefore, as we could arrange a second party, we again started to explore this place, which, from our informant's account, seemed to be an arm of the sea. 
We were six in number, Dr. Thompson, Mrs. C. Hutton, G. F. Reed, W. Scott, my brother and myself, and set out in September 1837. We travelled by Mount Gellibrand, crossed the water Yalloak near its mouth, reached a hill which we named Mount Elephant, a name which it still bears, and descended it. Observing the magnetic influence on the rocks on the summit, which was so great that our pocket compasses were useless when laid on the ground, and would only traverse when we mounted one of our number on the shoulders of two of his companions, so as to get the bearings of different points on the horizon. From thence we went to the Cloven Hills, and to the country subsequently occupied by the Mrs. Manifold, and returned eastward by the Pyrrhon Yalloak having thereby convinced ourselves that the sheet of salt water was really an inland lake, and that the appearance of a tide which had deceived our informant was nothing more than the action of high winds on its shore. At the mouth of the Pyrrhon Yalloc we came upon a large tribe of natives who seemed to have been the plunderers of Mr. Ricketts' station, as they possessed some of the stolen property. We came upon them so suddenly that they had time only to set fire to their miamias as a signal of danger to the other tribes. We rode up to them, but without firing or injuring any of them, and encamped at a short distance off. Here we were in some danger, and had to keep a strict watch all night, for we saw by the smoke rising in different quarters that the signal had been observed and answered, and that the other tribes were on the alert. After much shouting and answering one another in the forest around us during the night, the savages decamped before daybreak and our danger was over. Near our encampment we found a fishing weir of the natives, in which were small conical nets of good workmanship. Nearly a bushel of delicious little fish-like white bait was in the nets, part of which we took and faithfully remunerated the owners by giving provisions in return to a couple of men whom we induced to approach us. In the beginning of January 1838 we set out on another exploring excursion, the party consisting of Mrs. John Aitken, A. Anderson, W. C. Ewell, my brother and myself. From Mr. Aitken's station we went to Mount Macedon, at which Mr. Ebden then resided, and thence to the Colliban, where Mr. A. F. Mollison had just taken up stations with stock from the Middle District. This was the farthest station at that time in that direction, but within twelve months the Messrs. Coghill, Captain Hepburn, and others had pushed on farther. From Mr. Mollison's station we passed by Mount Alexander, followed the Loddon down over the localities lately rendered famous by the gold mines of Forest Creek and Bendigo, and crossed the plains at the Deep Creek to the Mount Beckwick Ranges, where being in great distress from want of water, we passed a most uncomfortable night under the highest point of them, which we called Mount Misery, a foolish name, which it has unfortunately continued to bear ever since. I may be allowed to pause for a moment here to remark with regard to this mountain that it is one of the most conspicuous peaks in the country, and that it is seen as a landmark perhaps further than any other single elevation in the colony, being the culminating point from which rivers that flow into the basin of the Murray on the one side, and into the sea to the westward of Cape Otway on the other, take their rise. I cannot but regret, therefore, that it should continue to bear a foolish name, that originated in a thoughtless moment. If I may be pardoned the liberty of doing so, I would suggest the propriety of your excellency bestowing a suitable name upon it before leaving your present government, and further that that name should be your own, as a record of one who assumed the reins of government when Port Phillip was the weakest of the British possessions, and who is now about to leave it the fairest colony annexed to the British crown. From this mountain we came to the northern side of Lake Burrumbeet, then covered with a few inches deep of intensely salt water, the more tantalising to us as both ourselves and horses were suffering much from thirst. One of our party, Mr. Anderson, had already seen Burham beat on the occasion of the first excursion I have spoken of, but he did not recognise it, 
and we left it on our right, returning home by way of Darling Forest, the Bunanyong Ranges, and the Moorabool River, at the head of which we found the newly formed stations of Mrs. Cowie instead, and of Mr. R. Steiglitz. Immediately on our return from this exploring tour, my brother and I removed our flocks from the Barwon River, where we originally settled, and which we already found to be too confined, and pitched our tent at our present homestead at Bunanyong, and in the course of the same year, 1838, extended our runs to Burrumbeet and the Maiden Hills, which we still occupy. At the same time, February 1838, Mr. Yule occupied Ballarat, which has lately proved to be so rich a goldfield, and within a year the station of Mr. Clark at Darling Forest was taken up, and those of the Messrs. Coghill Birch and Captain Hepburn, and also of Mr. Bowman on the northern side of the Maiden Hills, which latter was purchased by us in the following year. In 1839 the Messrs. Donald took up their runs, and also Messrs. Kirkland and Hamilton, that now possessed by Mr. Goldsmith. The Mount Emu country was occupied by Messrs. Bailey, Wright and Montgomery, and Mr. Urquhart and in 1840 the country to the westward towards the Grampians was being rapidly filled up. The remaining point on which Your Excellency desires information is with regard to the Aborigines, their number, and their demeanour towards the first settlers. The anxieties and labour connected with the forming of our sheep establishments were so great and urgent at the time of which I write that I never bestowed the attention requisite to form a correct estimate of the numbers or habits of the natives. They never were numerous at Bunningyong or in the neighbouring district, though I remember hearing of a gathering of them at Mount Emu, which was estimated to amount to five hundred, but I think this statement would be much overrated. I should consider myself to be nearly correct if I set down the whole Aboriginal population in the district around Bunningyong at the time of its settlement, taking a radius of thirty miles from the mountain as a centre, at three hundred souls. Now probably there are not three hundred. In looking at this rapid disappearance of the native tribes in our own district, it is a pleasing subject of reflection that, notwithstanding our having had a servant killed, others attacked, and sometimes our sheep destroyed, we have never been brought into personal collision with them nor have we been instrumental in taking the life of a single individual. And moreover, I am free to confess that, considering the wrong that has been done to the Aborigines in depriving them of their country, they have shown less ferocity and have exhibited the desire to retaliate less than might have been expected. I consider the disappearance of the native tribes in this district to be owing not to the result of encounters with the stockmen and early settlers, but to the vices introduced by the white men among them, and to the change in their habits, by which the active exertion of the hunter's life was exchanged for the idleness, and commonly the plenty, they enjoyed in their new condition of beggars, thereby inducing diseases and catarrhal affections to which they were not subject before. For I believe that there is no surer way of extirpating a race of savages like the Australian native than by supplying them freely with food, and thereby taking from them the necessity for personal exertion. If there are any other details which Your Excellency may desire, and which it is in my power to give, I shall be happy to furnish them. I am Your Excellency's obedient servant, Thomas Lemont, to His Excellency Charles J. La Trobe, Esquire. End of Letters from Victorian Pioneers, Letter Number 11《Section Twelve of Letters from Victorian Pioneers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter Number Twelve from John Hepburn Smeaton Hill, 10th August, 1853 Sir, in accordance with Your Excellency's circular, I have used my poor endeavours to furnish Your Excellency with such information as I possess, which I am sorry to say is very limited. 
with respect to the Aborigines and the settlement of this interesting country of my adoption, such information as Your Excellency requires will no doubt be supplied by a man of talent and education, and I trust Your Excellency will find plenty able and willing to contribute, and from better authenticated sources than I possess. What I have written is nearly all from memory. Consequently, I am not to be strictly relied on, having little memoranda to refer to. I must beg Your Excellency will pardon me for introducing many of my personal affairs, as they are quite foreign to the nature of Your Excellency's requirements, but I trust that some of the ups and downs of a squatter might be of interest to some of Your Excellency's friends, and might serve for a laugh at my ignorance, if no information can be extracted from my observations. I must also beg Your Excellency will favour me with plenty of latitude for my orthography, my education being a very limited one, and no improvement ever having been made until required step by step in my profession, which I acquired by perseverance only, having no friends but those I made from my services. I have been a mere adventurer cast on the world since I was thirteen years of age. For want of education, my progress was slow, and a knowledge of astronomy with other sciences belonging to my profession was necessary, and for want of a good foundation I built on a very slender one. In fact, I began where I ought to have left off. Under those circumstances, I trust Your Excellency will grant me the latitude required. I have the honour to be Your Excellency's most obedient servant and sincere well-wisher, John Hepburn. To His Excellency, the Lieutenant Governor. It may be necessary here to state my inducement to become a settler in Australia after being about twenty-one years at sea in all capacities from cabin boy to master. In the year 1833, on my voyage from England to Van Diemen's Land and Sydney, I took from the former place to the latter a passenger named John Gardner, who had then been some twelve or fourteen years in Van Diemen's Land, and who was determined to leave that colony and try his fortune in New South Wales as a squatter. After some weeks travelling in New South Wales, he returned to Sydney, and from the flattering description of the country in the neighbourhood of Yass and Malongolo Plains, Mr. G. persuaded me to invest a small sum of money, and held out hopes of a good return. By this time I had formed a very high opinion of Mr. G.'s integrity, etc., which opinion, I am happy to say, has been fully realised and continues to this day, 6th August, 1853. I was never seasick but had been for years sick of the sea, and was beginning to think seriously of turning settler. In the year 1835, my good ship, the Alice, was sold in Sydney. I was favoured by the merchants of that place with the command of a fine steamer, fine in those days, running between Sydney and the Hunter River. I then considered my fortune made, getting a much better salary than I had ever before, viz. £300 a year, with other means of making money. After being in command of the steamer Cerise for a few months, I found not only the duties of the vessel, but the whole duties of the board of directors fell on me, and this was more than I could do, being worked completely off my feet. Mr. Gardner, seeing the change, strongly advised me to give up this situation, which I could not do in justice to my employers, who treated me in the most liberal manner. However, I knocked myself up from overexertion, Another master was put in, until I recovered, about the first week in August 1836, and on the 29th of the same month lost the vessel, two masters then being on board, Martin and Livingston, neither of whom would take the credit of losing the Cerise on the coast between Sydney and Newcastle. Everything was lost, and nothing was insured, not even the ship. Previous to this I had joined my friend Gardner and Mr. Joseph Horden, in a Port Phillip speculation, to take a number of cattle to that place overland. From the time I was left on shore sick, everything went wrong on the steamer, and when my creditors met, I paid twenty shillings and was left with seventy-two pounds to commence the world, with the exception of the sum invested in the above speculation, which was two hundred pounds. Mr. Gardner strongly urged me to accompany the expedition to Port Phillip, which I did, I had sent to England for my family when I got the command of the steamer, and I saw clearly something must be done to provide for them. So now I determined to leave the sea and do something on shore. Neptune, having given me my discharge, 
would have nothing more to do with me. To relate what took place in the first part of the journey would be most injurious. I tumbled twice off my horse in the first eight miles, very much to the amusement of my fellow travellers, who had all the sport at my expense. In the month of October 1836, the party met at Howe's Station on the Murrumbidgee by appointment, Mr. Horden having mustered the cattle and brought them to the above station. Howe's being the starting point, some delay took place which it is not necessary to mention. I took little interest in all that was passing. Mr. Howe was a squatter and kept a few sheep and a dairy station, distance about 180 miles from Sydney. I saw something of the management of sheep, etc., while there, and thought the whole very simple. I have no data beyond this point, having kept no journal. We started with the cattle down the Murrumbidgee. The whole river at that time on both sides was taken up as squatting stations. It must be observed that was the first expedition in which stock, either of sheep or cattle, started from the Sydney side. On our arrival at Gundagai, we met a part of Sir T, then Major, Mitchell's expedition, who had come direct from Portland Bay in charge of a Mr. Stapleton. He gave us some useful information respecting the route. We kept down the river to Guy's Station, then the farthest down, and of course the outside squatter. This was a cattle station, with only two men residents and about a thousand head of cattle. From this station we took our departure from the river and kept nearly a southwest course. Nothing particular occurred in the journey worth notice. We reached the Murray River in about fourteen days. When the Major crossed the country it had been very wet, but many places where we had encamped were destitute of water when we passed, although the lapse of time was short. The tracks of the drays were deeply cut, and ours, which was moderately loaded, did not make a mark. The Murray was running bank high, and much discussion took place about the crossing. We first got the cattle across with a great deal of trouble, tied the tarpaulin round the body of our dray after the wheels were taken off, and got all safe across, taking a little of the load at a time. In getting the horses over, mine was drowned. This was a serious loss that could not be replaced for love or money, and, what was most annoying, I was compelled to walk or ride on the dray when tired. We kept the Major's track for the whole of the next three weeks. Black Dog Creek is named for Mr. Joss Horden, shooting a black native dog there. On our arrival at the Ovens River, we had the misfortune of breaking the axle of our dray, which delayed us some time. Here a number of natives made their appearance, and I must confess I was much surprised to see the alarm it caused among the men. Nothing but guns and pistols was in requisition, and at one time I was left to fish the axle by myself. Mr. Horden followed the blacks, who were very shy, but one who had seen white men before allowed Mr. Horden to prevail on him to come to the camp. After a short time he made quite free. We saw nothing of the tribe afterwards. This black caught several tortoises in a swamp close to where we were encamped, and cooked and ate them. This man showed me how the natives procured fire by friction. This was the only instance which has come under my notice. It was very simple, but required a quick action. This man continued with the party until we crossed the Goulburn, when he took his departure without ceremony. He was no use to us, with the exception of assisting to lighten our stock of provisions, which was not overabundant. After leaving the ovens, we had much difficulty in getting across what is now called the Broken River. I named it the Portage Creeks, there being five in number where we crossed, and so soft was the ground that we had to carry the whole load across on our backs to save the fished axle tree for the remainder of the journey. On our reaching the Goulburn, we saw many symptoms that induced us to think the number of natives was considerable, but we never saw one. Still keeping the Major's line on a creek running into the Goulburn, we came on a very large encampment, about seventy Mayamayas, but all the natives fled on our approach, leaving their fires burning, etc., etc., also a specimen of their knowledge of naval architecture in the shape of a canoe about twelve feet in length, cut rudely from a half round of a box tree, which was bent, and gave the canoe a good spring at both ends. This sheet of bark would carry four men easily. At this encampment there were some small fragments of bottle glass. 
This was the first sign since leaving the Murrumbidgee of anything like a product of civilization. After crossing the dividing range that divides the Goulburn River and the Campaspe country, a council was held about our route, and from surveys taken from the most elevated spots, a dispute arose about the route. I wanted to go round the south part of Mount Macedon, and then take a more easterly course, but was overruled by Horden and Gardner to shape a course across the ranges in a straight line for our destination, which was done. After some rough travelling through the ranges, we came out on the upper part of what is now Dr. Bainton's run. Here we took a day's rest, admiring the beauties of this interesting spot. I was so much delighted with it that I cut my initials on a large tree, and said this will be my abode at some future period. This we considered the commencement of the Port Phillip country. We then took a southeast course across the Mount Macedon ranges, and a very tough journey we had. After surmounting all difficulties and getting safely through the range, the PP country opened to our view, very much to the satisfaction of the whole party. We came on the upper branches of a creek, now Deep Creek, east of Mount Macedon, and from the top of an elevated spot discovered the bay, and with the aid of my glass saw a ship at anchor. We continued our course from one eminence to another, and at last saw the smoke rising, as we supposed, from the settlement. We here determined to take the cattle no further for the present. The next day, Gardner, Horden, and myself started for the settlement. The horse I rode was quite done, being one of the stock horses. Horden, who travelled too fast for Gardner and me, left us about noon. We arrived about 4pm, but Mr. H. having overshot the mark, did not arrive till 9pm, his horse being quite done up. There were only a few huts in the settlement. Buckley was the first man I saw. One hut was occupied by a Mr. Batman, one by Dr. Thompson, somewhere near where the Prince of Wales Hotel now stands. The other huts were only slabs stuck in the ground, forming a roof and covered with earth. One little wooden box belonging to Strachan stood where the Western Market is now, and the old Lamb Inn was building, but no accommodation was to be had for money. This was in December 1836. There were several horses and fifteen head of cattle in the settlement. We were looked on by most of the people in the settlement at the time with great jealousy, and many would not believe our report. Horden and Gardner started next day for the cattle, and brought them into the settlement while I amused myself in looking out for a run for them. My first object was to get an interview with Buckley, thinking I might get such information, but found him what he had been represented, a very stupid fellow, not possessed of any knowledge of the country. Before taking leave of Buckley, I may be allowed to observe that all writers on this to be a great empire have lost sight of this man who laid the foundation stone, if it may be considered so, of this interesting colony. Buckley built chimneys of bricks imported from Van Diemen's land for Mr. Batman. This, I consider, constituted the foundation of the capital of Victoria, which seems to have been entirely lost sight of, but nevertheless is true. A staff of government surveyors had arrived previous to our arrival with the cattle, and I believe Captain Lonsdale was commandant, but I do not remember having seen Captain Lonsdale. Provisions were very high during our stay, and we killed a bullock, one of the best, of course, for the good colonists to keep Christmas in good English style. The next step towards settling was making a station, which was done. We crossed the Yarrow River at the only ford we could find, just at the point above where Dyke's Mill now stands, and took up the ground on the south side of the river, where Mr. Pinnock's house now stands, and what is known as Gardner's Creek. This was the first cattle station in Australia Felix. There were a few wretched sheep up the Mooney Ponds, and a few about the settlement. The farthest out stations were Mount Aitken and the Werribee. The number of sheep, I suppose at that time, did not exceed 4,000 in the whole country, the fame of which began to attract attention both in Van Diemen's Land and Sydney. Mr. Gardner and myself purchased Mr. Horden's share of the cattle and some six months after, Mr. Gardner purchased mine, so that he became the sole owner. The station was left in charge of a Mr. Hitchcock. Mr. Gardner went to Van Diemen's Land. Horden and myself hired a boat of about ten tons, and took the stockman back to his brother's station on the east coast in New South Wales. 
On the 1st of January, 1837, I landed Mr. Horden in a small canoe opposite his brother's place, called Bergalia, and then proceeded with the men to the small harbour of Brulee. Some days after I took this boat, the Hope by name, into the Maru River. This was the opening up of the navigation of that river, which is still continued. I shall now leave a blank in the time, as my overland journey to Sydney could be of no interest beyond the first day's journey. John Horden's son, John, then a little boy, was to accompany his uncle and me to Sydney. We started early in the morning from Begalia, forgetting all about the tide in the river, which was full tide or high water when we came to the bank. Mr. Horden said, What is to be done? Shall we go back? Answer, No, we must proceed. So we both stripped off our clothes for a swim. Horden took the lead, and when about the middle, the horse rolled over him. He extricated himself from the horse and got hold of his head, and would have drowned him only for my advice. So he and the horse both struck out for the shore, and he landed safe with his clothes tied behind his neck, of course well drenched. We had arranged that the little boy was to be carried over behind me on my horse. After seeing what had happened, I would not attempt to cross with the boy, but to our great relief one of the stockmen came down at the time and took the boy across. I was assured the horse I had was a first-rate swimmer. I was stripped, ready for the worst, with my shirt and all my underclothes with Horden's watch, and my own all stuffed into my boots and slung around my neck. So in I go. This horse had been in the habit of crossing here at low tide, and as soon as he found that he would have to swim, he began to plunge up and down, reaching the ground at each plunge, first with his fore and then with his hind feet, and dipped me up to the neck. However, I kept my seat and landed safe. We then set about drying our clothes and preparing for our journey. The Maroora River was at this time the southern boundary of the colony of New South Wales. Mr. John Horden at this time was a squatter, and the only one between the boundary and Twofold Bay. On my arrival in Sydney, I found Port Phillip was attracting much attention, and to keep up the excitement, I addressed a letter to the editor of the colonist newspaper, stating the possibility of running a post. I laid down all the stages from the Murrumbidgee to the settlement, with estimated distances, and showing how easy it was to provide hay. Grass then was so abundant almost at any point. The governor, then Sir R. Burke, took up the matter. No questions were asked, tenders were issued, and taken by Horden after much delay. This was, however, an advantage. Before the post was started, the line of road was considerably shortened from the Goulburn to Melbourne. I believe to this day the originator of the Overland Post was never known. About the middle of the year 1837, a perfect mania took place. The price of sheep advanced to 60 shillings per head. In consequence of this, I was long before I could make final arrangements for my settling, my exchequer being too low to meet the prices. However, I met with another old tar, and also an old colonist, and we entered into a partnership. I then proceeded to a station of his to gain information and await the arrival of my family, determined to take them with me at all risks. My share, my partner putting in an equal share, was 700 ewes at 55 shillings, 1,925 pounds, 25 rams, 150 pounds, 100 weathers for use, 100 pounds, Supplies, drays, bullocks, etc., etc., £575, so that my debt to my partner amounted to £2,750 without interest for five years. No man in his senses would have undertaken to pay such a debt from 700 ewes, which was all the producing stock when the partnership terminated. Not one fraction of the debt was paid. I then saw my way a little better and made an offer to my partner either to take the whole stock and station at a valuation made by myself, to take or give. My partner then sold to me, not wishing to have anything more to do with sheep. I had many difficulties to surmount with such a debt, for all was credit. However, I paid all in time with interest, so I may safely say I never fingered one shilling I could call my own for nearly ten years, but after the debt was paid, I found I could not save much money for a long time. I suppose the rigid economy was relaxed, and my family increased my expenses. This is quite foreign to the matter now intended, and I trust will be forgiven. 
On the 15th January 1838, I started from Strathallan, County St. Vincent, New South Wales, with 1,400 ewes, 50 rams, 200 weathers, 2 drays, 18 bullocks, 10 men, all prisoners of the Crown, 1 cart and horse, 1 saddle horse, 2 brood mares, private property, and Mr. Horden and 2 children. In travelling I found the greatest hospitality from the settlers. Mr. William Coghill had mustered his sheep on the Murrumbidgee to accompany me to Port Phillip about the end of the month. After joining Coghill's party, one of my drays broke down, which caused some delay. In this delay, Mr. William Bowman overtook us, and arrangements were entered into for the three parties to keep company until all were satisfactorily settled in the new country. After leaving the last settlement on the Murrumbidgee, we took a route more to the eastward than my former track, several parties having preceded us on this route, Ebden, Howie and Hamilton. We crossed the Murray at the point where Hovel and Hume had crossed many years before, and where a tree with the name of Hume still stood to mark the spot. We now were out of reach of all stations, Ebden's cattle station being the last. At this point we overtook Mr. W. Hamilton, who had been eight days crossing his sheep and had suffered some small loss. Mr. Bowman had about 5,000 sheep, Mr. Coghill 2,000, making with my lot in all near 9,000. From our arrangements we crossed the whole of the sheep in two and a half hours without the loss of a single sheep. We followed the track of those before us, which was not difficult, and in a short distance came on to the Major's line, which was easily recognised at this time. My men, who had the lead of the party, refused to keep the advance, thinking their labours were more than the others but they were soon taught a lesson which they never forgot, and they behaved well for the remainder of the journey. We reached the Goulburn, surveying all the fine-looking country, and saw many beautiful spots, very beautiful spots, between the ovens and the Goulburn, but I was anxious to avoid what was likely to become a general road, and to get within a hundred miles of the settlement, and no large river between. At the Goulburn we met a large party of natives, Mr. David Coghill and myself, being in advance, came suddenly on them. In an instant, about one hundred spears were pointed towards us. We halted to consider what to do. We got boldly off our horses, took our guns in one hand and a bush in the other, and advanced slowly towards them. The women and children fled, but the men stood their ground. After a short parley, in which not a word was understood on either side, the natives began to lay down their spears and approached us without fear, put their hands on us and felt the horses' skins. After spending about an hour amongst them, my cart with Mrs. H. hove into sight. The day being far advanced, I determined to encamp on a favourable spot for that purpose. Shortly after, my sheep appeared. The men, my shepherds, were dreadfully alarmed at first, but this soon wore off. I had nets for my sheep, set them up, and pitched our tent, etc. I sent a man back to inform Bowman that we were come to an anchor for the night. In the evening I heard a strange noise of birds, which proved to be a large flock of white parrots, a bird I had not seen before on my former journey. Having my gun in my hand, I fired both barrels, and by good chance shot two. This occurrence gave alarm to my sable brethren. All disappeared, but only for a short time. They appeared in much larger numbers than we had seen before. They examined the guns with great curiosity and wanted to see me fire again, which I declined. However, Mr. Bowman gratified them. Next morning, March 2nd, 1838, we crossed the river all safe without any molestation from the natives. Here we overtook Mr. John Harrison and Mr. Hamilton, who had pushed on to get the choice of the country. We assisted these gentlemen to cross their sheep. Hamilton advanced, and we took a day's rest on this beautiful spot. Before advancing any further, I may now state what country was taken up and by whom. The station holders were A. Mollison, C. H. Ebden, Captain Brown, Harrison, Coghill, Bowman, and myself. No other sheep herds crossed the Goulburn up to the above date. A. Mollison, after crossing the Goulburn, kept the Major's line and took up the Colibell, afterwards sold to Mr. Orr. Mr. Ebden took up the Sugarloaf Creek, but abandoned that part of the country and took up Carl's Rue. 
Howie, about the same time, took up his run on the east side of the mountain, now Riddle and Hamilton's, and the township of Gisborne. This station was the first connecting the runs taken up by the VD land settlers. Captain Brown took up the spot described in my former journal. Now Dr. Bainton's station and Mr. William Hamilton took up the Shigalif. Footnote. The journal of his first trip to Port Phillip. See page 48. Editor. End of footnote. Now Dr. Bainton's station and Mr. William Hamilton took up the Sugarloaf Creek left by Mr. Ebden. About this time, or shortly afterwards, an old military officer named White took up the adjoining country. Coghill and myself started with Bowman, who took up the north side of Mount Bing, now Alexander of far fame, kept it a short time and sold the stock to Umpleby, who sold to Orr, in whose possession it now is. Coghills and my own stock we left on the Campaspe Plains, and we advanced to look for country suitable for our purpose, which we found. I took up Smeaton Hill on the 5th of April, 1838, having just been three months travelling. About ten days after, the Coghills took up their stations, Glen Derule and Glen Donald. Harrison, who was too wise to be advised by me, came nearer the settlement and took up a country I am not acquainted with, viz. the Plenty. After being some months on our respective stations, that is, Coghill and myself, we found to the south of us the country about Bunanyong, taken up by Limont, the Lee River by Ueli. Between the last-mentioned parties, Anderson took up a station, thus crowding the station so close that in a short time they found out their mistake. The same year, Pettit and Francis took up Dowling Forest, which would have been my run only for my ignorance, thinking it too rich for sheep. Messrs. Irvine and Birch made their appearance and sat down between Smeaton and Glen Donald and called the station Seven Hills. In 1839, the early part of this year, Mr. W. Kirk took up the run outside me, but abandoned it, and took up a large run west of Mount Cole, afterwards Ross and McGill's. Then came Captain McLaughlin and D. Cameron, who both sat down on Smeaton. McLaughlin, after much persuasion, took up the ground left by Kirk, and D. Cameron that left by Irvine, now known as Clunes. About this time, Simpson, Dutton and Darlot took up the Lodden. Then Bowerman took up the ground where Robertson and Skeens is, and all about Burnbank. In the meantime, Learmont extended his run in a direct line, purchased Bowerman's stock, and connected the whole line of country from Bonagnong to Burnbank, about 30 miles. He afterwards sold part to Dr. Griffin and Elms. After this, there were many subdivisions and parties surrounding, which did not come within my knowledge. I think in 1839, John Horden took up Mount Greenock, afterwards sold to McCallum's party. L. McKinnon took up the Lorden above Simpson's, now W. Hunter's. Chanside took up first Muckleford, then the Deep Creek, afterwards McKinnon's, and then Bucknell's. After subdivision of the Lorden run was to see McKinnon, now Joyce's. Next, adjoining Seven Hills, a station was taken up by Lyon Campbell, named Bullarook. About this time, I suppose in 1840, Jim Crow was taken up by Mr. Mollison, and all the available country between that and the Coliban. The Bow Yards and Strathlodden were sold to Campbell and McKnight, and then to D. Cameron of Clunes, then to Captain McLaughlin, then to William Campbell, and a portion to A. Kennedy. Forest, Barker and Friars Creeks have all got their names since those days. I may here state, on my first visit to Castlemaine, I was surprised to find the Church of England placed on or about that very spot that I had pitched my tent on, on the 12th of April, 1838, then in all its virgin beauty. I may be here allowed to make another digression from my story, which, by the by, is nearly spun out. On getting fairly settled, I wrote a long rigmarole account of all my journeys through these ranges to an old friend of mine who was a gold refiner. The reason of my travelling through those ranges was that I was compelled to divide my party and leave some ewes on the Campaspe Plains, they having commenced lambing. John Betts of Birmingham says, in answer to my description of the country, John, look closely into all the streams, dig and wash the earth, search diligently for gold, for I am sure your feet are passing over immense wealth every day. How true the prediction of my old friend, 
I believe this my letter might be had if thought worth while. It was like all my writing, badly written, and John Betts sent it to another old friend of mine, Rhodes and Son, Minori's London, to be corrected, and a clean copy written, which I believe was done, but whether in possession of Rhodes or Betts I do not know. On the brink of a waterhole at the junction of the creeks known as Barker's and Forest Creeks, I buried the skull of a prisoner of the Crown. He was murdered by his mates after absconding from the service of Mr. Ebden. It was dug up by the natives twice, and the third time I buried it in the dry deposit in the waterhole, which was dry at the time, but on my next visit full from a thunderstorm. If I had been unfortunate enough to have found gold then, I should most certainly have never acquired my present position, but I was not to be the Hargraves. With respect to the natives I can say but little, having had little intercourse with them. It will perhaps be necessary here to relate what took place with myself, to show that a hostile feeling did exist, although much blame might be attached to my men, who paid smartly for their impudence. One lot of sheep was left at the Camp Aspey, and another at the Loddon, three men having been left at each place, well armed for defence, and three men of Coghills having been left at the Camp Aspey for the same reason, viz, that the ewes were lambing. After taking possession of Smeaton, as before stated, I had to go between the three parties. I have not got dates for these perambulations. I left Smeaton for the Ludden, passed the night with the men, gave directions for their removal to a point where I should direct the others to join them. There was a man of the name of Knight, who was one of Bowman's party, a veteran. He had at this time been several days amongst the natives, perhaps weeks. He pretended he had lost himself. I took him back with me to Bowman Station and there left him. I arrived at the Camp Aspey Plains at night after dark, found all right. In the morning, I earmarked all my lambs, mixed them with cog hills, and started them for the Loddon, giving them their regular stages, and they were to be six days in order not to hurry the sheep. I wanted to see something of the country, went that day to Mollison Station, and started the next morning for the Loddon. I first took a southeast direction to the top of a hill about seven miles off, for the sake of having a view of the country through which I had to pass, and went regularly from one hill to another, Jim Crow being the last. I had then an open country to the spot where I directed the men to halt. It was after sundown when I got down. I saw the sheep and lambs, as I thought, all right. I cooed loudly, but there was no answer. This was only the third day from the time I left them. I then fired a shot. No answer. I had purchased two dogs on my journey, being kangaroo dogs. I coupled them with a strap and tied them to a tree for fear of their disturbing the sheep. I was very much troubled in my mind about the men, one of them being a very bad character. All I thought of was that the two had murdered the man in charge and made off with the cart and horse. I walked round the sheep all night, heard the howl now and again of native dogs, but not near. As soon as day appeared, I started off to the old camp, and found the fire had been out some time. I then returned to my charge. Seeing them all right, I thought I would make a circle, and try to discover what direction they had gone with the cart. But the country being so dry and hard, not a track was to be seen. I kept the sheep all this day, and in strolling about, I found part of the sheep nets and a dead sheep. I took a good sleep during the day, and mounted guard at night. The dogs got a good feed of the dead sheep, but there was nothing for me. I began to feel a little hungry, but, as the sailor says, I took in a reef by tying my neckerchief round my body. Next day, about sunrise, I began to think of driving the sheep to Smeaton, and I just rounded them up when I heard a cooey. This rather alarmed me. I put the saddle on my horse, took the cap off my rifle, saw the powder up and all right. I rode off in the direction I heard the cooey. Coming towards a bed of reeds on the river bank, knowing the men were alarmed and having, I must confess, little confidence, I was not inclined to put myself in their power. I made a stop and then cooed, which was immediately answered, and I saw a man crawling out from amongst the reeds. I made straight for him and saw, to my great surprise, one of Mr. Coghill's men. He exclaimed, "'Good God, sir, I am glad to see you alive.' I said, "'What's the matter, William?' "'Oh, sir, murder, murder!' This confirmed my opinion. I said, who is murdered? And he answered, Lee. 
This was still a further confirmation of my own idea, for I thought Williams or Trainer had murdered Lee and made off. I got quite impatient at the old man's slow answers. At last I said, Who has murdered Lee? He then replied, The blacks. This, of course, altered all my ideas. It appeared, when the three men had arranged to remove from the first camp, two were to take the sheep, the other the cart with the traps. The sheep started, and after travelling a short distance, the two men with the sheep were attacked and fled to the cart for their arms. But they soon found the cart was captured, and poor Lee, dreadfully wounded and left, no doubt, for dead. Williams fled first without injury. Trainer got a slight wound in the shoulder with a spear, but Lee was dreadfully mangled. He had on his body fifteen wounds and three severe ones on the head. While I stood talking to William Freeman, I saw the reeds moving and something in the shape of a man moving. I lifted my rifle, but heard a voice, For God's sake, sir, don't shoot me. To my great surprise, this was the man Knight. On being asked how he came there, he said he was lost. Only three days before, I left him at Bowman's camp. In about two hours, the cart with the sheep and men all made their appearance. All the weekly lambs had been killed and forced marches made. After meeting the cart which had gone back, I purposed going home with the cart and Lee, who was very near dead, but all exclaimed if I took the cart away with a man, cook, to drive, they would all leave the sheep and follow. Finding this would not do, I got some hot water, bathed the wounds, got a piece of bread and started home alone, giving directions how to come through the ranges, and I would meet them the next day. After all the delays, it was very late when I arrived at Smeaton. I said nothing to Mrs. H, but got a little lint and dressing for the wounds and started late, thinking the party would advance. I rode over range after range and gully after gully, but there was no appearance of the sheep or party until I arrived at the spot where I left them. I felt a little vexed at the men for not starting, but they declared that as soon as I left them the natives made their appearance and they were so paralysed at the sight they dared not move and also they said they heard cries as if of murdering someone, which appeared to be nothing but imagination. I got the wounds on Lee's body and head, which was the worst, dressed. He kept in good spirits after my arrival. He thought I was murdered, which had troubled him much. In the night they all kept up and kept firing their muskets at the wind. I am now drawing to a period which will perhaps throw some light on this mysterious fellow night. He kept in the camp all night with my men, but after starting the party in marching order, this man disappeared and took with him a young dog which was given him to carry. All the men got so alarmed that I was compelled to threaten to shoot the first man who flinched from the position given him. I closed the order of marching so that I had all within my own view. I made a search for night, but could not see either him or any of the natives. I learnt many months afterwards from a black boy that Knight was killed that very night by the blacks, and buried on a hill which I have designated Knight's Fall, known now by the name of Yanduit. I have no doubt of the truth of the murder, as the boy's story of the dog showed that the boy knew something of the matter, and since I have had further testimony of the fact. I have no doubt in my own mind that this man was at the bottom of all the mischief, but at the same time he did me much service by making the natives believe that I should kill them all, for from that day to the present, all the natives gave me a wide berth, at least when met in the bush. I am happy to be able to say I never injured one beyond thumping him with a stick. This was after they were protected, and he well merited the correction. Some few months after this, several parties of natives made their appearance, but always disappeared when I showed my face. On one occasion I heard two shots fired. I went to see what was the matter. The shepherds saw several blacks on a plain not far off. I went in the direction and saw a number of men all running off as fast as possible. I pursued and overtook two men and a woman. The men both took safe positions behind a tree and balanced their spears. I got off my horse, laid my gun down, showed them my bare hands. After a short time, the oldest man came out onto open ground, using his spear as a staff. The other kept his safe post. The old man began to talk at a great rate, and frequently pointed to the Loddon, of course relating all that had transpired there, which I could not understand. The old man perspired so, the perspiration dropped from his nose profusely. I left them and returned home. In less than an hour, two shots were again fired. 
The horse being ready, I started off to the shepherds, but could not find them. The two flocks were mixed, and I saw one sheep lying on the ground. I rode up and found a fine ewe with a long spear driven right through her. I pulled it out, she got up, but soon died. The shepherds all this time were watching my movements, and after a short time made their appearance and took the sheep homeward. We saw nothing of the natives. The men said they never saw them, even when the sheep was speared, although within a short distance. No more was heard of the natives for some months. The spear was newly scraped, no doubt for the purpose for which it was used. The next party that made their appearance were much bolder, and insisted on camping alongside of my folds. These were evidently natives from another quarter. They had a few iron hatchets, and began to strip the bark from the trees, and build their miamias. I took the trouble of carrying some of the bark to a distance, but this would not do. I then ordered them to remove, but no, all efforts were in vain. They had a dog which they tied up by the forepaw to the neck, showing they knew what sheep were. I had my double-barrelled gun and two useless double-barrelled pistols. I discharged all the four barrels, and they could see nothing and did not know from whence they were taken. I shortly after this left them, but intended watching their movements. I returned in an hour, found all the fires out, and the whole of the natives gone. Saw nothing more of them. In the latter part of this year, 1838, say November, for I only write from memory, I was sheep-washing, had always carried either a double-barrel gun or rifle, but this being the first day of washing, I did not take my gun. In returning home in the afternoon late, I saw the blacks had set fire to the grass closer to my home station than I liked. I began to fear something serious had happened. On approach, I saw one of the shepherds crouching behind a tree. I rode up and asked him where the sheep were. His reply was, the blacks have taken them. I asked which way they had gone. He pointed to the east. I made for the hut as quick as I could. The double-barrelled gun was loaded before I left, the rifle lying in the case out of the stock, but loaded and capped. Mrs. H. was in great fear, but had not given way until she saw me. I took both guns, and off I went. A man of the name of George Cook, a prisoner of the Crown, who was hut-keeper, had left his hut and come to Mrs. H.'s assistance. He now followed me on foot as fast as he could. The grass being long, I got onto the tracks of the sheep and presently saw them, with four men hustling them along. But the weather being hot, they did not make much progress. They kept at the sheep, expecting to get them into the timber. But I was too quickly on them, and they ran for the timber themselves, but made no resistance. I headed the sheep homeward and met Cook, quite out of breath. The poor fellow could not speak for some minutes. He brought the sheep back, and then the cowardly shepherd made his appearance. When sundown came, I found another shepherd did not come home. He also left the sheep, but not one was lost. He did not return to the station till morning, being lost in the bush all night. Now for Mrs. H.'s story. About noon, about thirty men mustered round the hut. They had a musket and wanted powder. Mrs. H. sent one of the children for old cook, who shut his hut door and answered the summons. He loaded all the muskets and carbines, placed them all in the hut, and covered them up determined to defend if required. While Cook was thus employed, Mrs. Hepburn took them some tobacco, but this weed was not known to them at this time, for they threw it all away. She then gave them some flour. Old Cook, being an old poacher, knew well the use of firearms, and, boldened by their peaceable, friendly appearance at the time, although suspicious of them, asked to look at the musket they had, opened the pan, and, unperceived, drew the point of his thumb across the pan, which act cleaned the priming clean out, which saved his life. For shortly after this act, the same black laid the musket on the top of a round post about thirty yards distant, took a deliberate aim, and snapped the musket at Cook. Cook, perceiving his danger, rushed into the hut. Mrs. H. made her appearance at the door with a brace of pistols. The natives then fled. Cook fired a ball over their heads, and it was in their retreat they took the sheep but they made a clean sweep of the men's blankets, etc. This was the only time any attack was made on the hut. There were several other times I turned out the men to drive them off the run. The number of sheep lost never exceeded ten on any occasion, and all the depredations were by natives belonging to other districts, which I learnt in the course of time. 
a friendly intercourse was first made in a very extraordinary way. I was from home, and the women visited the station. Mrs. H. treated them well, and shortly after this, about seven or eight of the women belonging to the tribe that claimed Smeaton as their beat, or as they called it, carooting, came to the station. They had left all their usual traps and fled to the huts for shelter. Nothing could drive them away, but no force was used for that purpose. They stopped about six or eight days, and after this we had many visits from them. But finding the men making too free with them, I gave them very little encouragement. So after all my residence among the natives, I never learnt a word of their lingo. Nearly the whole of the tribe belonging to this district is dead. I only know of one in existence that was born on my station, and he is about fourteen years of age, but looks quite a man in his prime. I do not now know of a woman that was on the station twelve years ago. If there be any at the protectorate, the fact is not known to me. I do not believe I have seen a native black, or a party of blacks, for these last four years that stayed a night on my run. I believe Mr. Robinson and Mr. Parker made their first appearance here in 1840, but I have no date, perhaps 1841. Their object was to form a station. I strongly recommended them to take up Jim Crow, now Mount Franklin, for an Aboriginal station, but this did not meet the views of the above-named gents, and of course it was not done at that time, although it was afterwards. For a time the natives appeared to improve much under the management of Mr. Parker, but of late years the number has been limited, and principally children have been kept. Some of the young men have turned out very well as bullock drivers on the station, and made themselves useful otherwise. All I can say about the natives only shows I know nothing about them, or at least very little. Some of my southern neighbours could tell better tales of them, but it will be seen that I have not cultivated their acquaintance much. With respect to the country generally, I know a few miles round. I shall commence at the River Loddon and come southward. On the upper Loddon, about Glen Leon and Holcombe, there is some good land, but most of it heavily timbered. The whole of the upper Loddon is volcanic, and where the earth has a reddish or chocolate colour, it is generally very good, but in this district it is so in small patches only. There is plenty of fine slabs of slate between Holcombe and Kennedy Station, with patches of good land the whole way down, but not to any extent. About Kennedy's and down to Hunter's, there are fine flats of considerable extent. On the government reserve for the Aborigines, there is also some good ground with a great deal of bad, much of which will be at no distant period trenched for gold. At Joyce Brothers, Bucknell's and McLaughlin's, there is but little that would be considered good land, although the flats on the creeks have produced crops of wheat much heavier than I could see on much better land. On my run, there is much good land to appearance, but the crop is below the average of my neighbours, which I can only attribute to the want of proper drainage, the land being very wet in winter. To get a good crop, wheat ought to be put in in the month of March or April, in order that the wheat may be well rooted before the wet weather sets in, which is generally about the latter end of May. The summer frost is also a great drawback, particularly for horticulture. Gooseberries, currants, cherries and raspberries do well, vines not at all. At only 20 miles to the north, vines grow well and produce good crops. The land on my run is very prepossessing in appearance, but in many places there is only a shallow soil, which lies on a bed of lava, which dries up early in the season. But this is not the case all over it. There is some very fine land, the Seven Hills is much the same, but all the best land on that station is heavily timbered. At Glendonald there is little good land, but it might be much improved. Clunes and McCallums perhaps have less good land than any other runs of the same magnitude in this part of the country. Glendarool, Cog Hills and Dowling Forest, with Wynham, have perhaps more prime land than any country of double the extent in this part of the country. On the Lee River there are many good spots, and through towards Burrumbeet and Burnbank, not to the township, which is poor, but as far as Robertson's and Skeen's, there is some beautiful country. To the southeast of Ballin, and much of the Pentland Hills, is a first-rate country for wheat or other grain. The average crop of wheat grown at Smeaton for twelve years does not exceed twenty bushels per acre. At Dowling Forest and Glendarool, about thirty has been the average, to the best of my knowledge. My information is very limited, 
and having no general knowledge of the qualities of land, it must therefore be taken for what it is worth. Nearly all this memo is written from memory. Before closing, I should state the result of my experience amongst prisoners of the Crown under the old system, more particularly those under my own charge in this part of the country. I brought from Sydney Francis Smith, Isaac Howe, William Butson, George Lee, George Carmichael, George Cook, all six men well behaved and useful. These men were paid thirty pounds per annum while in my service. They were the assigned servants of John Coghill. They are all in existence and have done well. Edward Trainer and Bartholomew Williams were both bad men and petty thieves. Dennis Walker and Joseph Woodford, two boys, turned out middling, but were troublesome while in my service. I forgot to state that Lee had, after his conflict with the natives, to be sent to Melbourne for surgical assistance and had a piece of a spear nine inches long cut out of his back by Dr. Cusson. One word more in favour of old hands. On our first expedition in 1836, Mr. John Gardner had a man named Doggerty, a prisoner of the Crown from V.D. Land, brought to Sydney by permission of Governor Arthur. That man has been in my service for these last ten years, has a family, and is a well-doing man. I do not make these statements as an advocate for prisoners, for I am not but it only shows that prisoners are sometimes painted in worse colours than they deserve. I may also add that I have had many other old prisoners in my service and have in general found them very good servants, the Pentonvilles being the worst without exception. English training avails little in this country. I trust I shall not be considered partial or egotistic in these memoranda, for I can only state what I know myself and what I have learnt from others to a very limited extent. The first Commissioner of Crown Lands for this district was Peter Snodgrass, Esquire, now MLC, the next H.F. Graham, Esquire, then Foster Fyans, Esquire, after him F.A. Powlett, Esquire, the new one I have not seen. I have had disputes about boundaries, settled by all the above gentlemen, and also by Mr. Grimes, and in all cases without favour or affection to any party or parties. So much for the officials. It may be considered I am some place hunter, or looking for some favour. This is not the case. I look for my rights as a British subject, and will maintain them too, as so far as my knowledge goes. I unfurled but one flag, and to that I will adhere, I trust, for the remainder of my life, however long it may be the pleasure of God to spare me. J. H. End of section 12 Section 13 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter number 13 from William Thomas. Brief Account of the Aborigines of Australia Felix. Their government is patriarchal, the head of each family having control over his household, nor is he accountable to the community for his conduct touching them, even after his children come to years of discretion, if they be unmarried. They, however, are by no means arbitrary nor cruel, and with the children are foolishly indulgent. It is only in passion that their conduct is revolting, and then they are generally checked by one or more powerful friends arresting the angered, while others try to appease him by reason. Although the head of the family is not accountable to the community, a mother will not tamely see her child ill-used, and when a son is grown up, if his mother is ill-treated, he will show fight. I have witnessed some dreadful phrase between father and son on the mother's account. Should one kill his wife, the friends or relatives of the woman will have satisfaction. When the tribes meet, the slayer must show himself naked among them, and unflinchingly await their anger. Each tribe has a chief, who directs all his movements, and who, wherever he may be, knows well where all the members of the community are. About once in three months the whole tribe unite, generally at new or full moon, when they have a few dances, and again separate into three or more bodies, as they cannot get food if they move en masse. 
The chief, with the aged, makes arrangements for the route each party is to take. In their movements they seldom encamp more than three nights in one place, and oftener but one. Thus they move from one place to another, regardless of sickness, deaths, births, etc. They will not wait for anything when they have an object in view. I have known instances of females having an infant at night, and compelled to tramp in the morning, and the men to carry their sick from one encampment to another. In each body are a few old men who take charge of the small community and give instructions in the morning where they will encamp at night. They seldom travel more than six miles a day. In their migratory moves, all are employed, children in getting gum, knocking down birds, etc., women in digging up roots, killing bandicoots, getting grubs, etc., the men in hunting kangaroos, etc., scaling trees for opossums, etc., etc. They mostly are at the encampment about an hour before sundown, the women first, who get fire and water, etc., by the time their spouses arrive. They hold that the bush and all it contains are man's general property, that private property is only what utensils are carried in the bag, and this general claim to nature's bounty extends even to the success of the day. Hence, at the close, those who have been successful divide with those who have not been so. There is no complaining in the streets of a native encampment. None lacketh while others have it. Nor is the gift considered as a favor, but a right brought to the needy and thrown down at his feet. In warm weather, while on the tramp, they seldom make a meum. They use merely a few boughs to keep off the wind. In wet weather, a few sheets of bark make a comfortable house. In one half hour, I have seen a neat village begun and finished. The harmony that exists among them when none of another tribe is in the party is surprising. I have been out with them for months without a single altercation. Wherever one is born, that is considered his or her country. They have no regular burial places. Their bones lie scattered through the bush. Over the men, according to their importance, an oration is delivered, the purport of which is that they, his survivors, will avenge his death, and begging the defunct to lie still till they do so. Over the women and children no ceremony is performed. After the body is interred, the encampment breaks up, leaving a fire at the east of the grave. Orphans are taken great care of. It is considered a great honor to have an orphan added to the family. They have many ceremonies on particular occasions, such as when a youth or maiden comes of age, installment of the bush, marriage ceremony, etc., etc. To give them in this brief account is impossible. One must suffice. Marriage. The men engross the right of giving the women away. The women have neither choice nor will in the matter. They are the property of the father. If he is dead, of the brother. If there is no brother, of the uncle. There is seldom a marriage without much fighting, as there is a great preponderance of males over females, and the old chiefs not being satisfied with less than two, and sometimes four, increases the value of the women. Most females are purchased. The general price is two large cougras, or opossum rugs, two or three dozen opossums, and other trifles. The woman is handed over to the spouse, who has scarce got her when some others, those who were desirous to obtain her, may be seen naked, discharging wangwims, etc., at the bridegroom. A general family fight takes place, and the bridegroom seldom gets off without a broken head. At night the dame is sulky, and when her spouse is asleep, generally creeps to her mother, and when he awakes and finds her gone, he claims her. Her father in a rage knocks the poor girl about with his bludgeon or tomahawk, drags her by the hair of her head to her coolin, where she gets another drubbing. This is often continued for two or more days, until the poor creature is regularly broken down. She resigns to her fate, and generally proves a constant and affectionate wife. Laws. 
Of laws they have three principal, that is, to punish murder, theft, and adultery. Murder is punished by the whole of the tribe, throwing a spear and a wangwim at the murderer. If he escapes without any material injury, the male who is the nearest of kin to the murdered may, with his bludgeon or leonile, strike at the murderer's head, no other part, till he is tired. During the punishment, the murderer is not allowed to throw a single weapon, but may ward off the spears, etc., with his shield. I knew an instance of a man having one hundred spears thrown at him, who warded them every one off. Theft is of a rare occurrence, and is punished by blows on the head of the thief by the party wronged. I never knew but one case of this kind. Adultery is a crime that keeps the encampment, when two or more tribes are present, in continued broils. The adulterer and adulteress are both punished, the latter awfully severe, but the former having, what the poor females have not, a way of warding off the weapons, comes better off. There is one particularly amiable trait in the aboriginal character, which is, that no animosity remains in their breasts, nor does any shrink from punishment. At the close of a fight or punishment, those who have inflicted the wounds may be seen sucking them and doing any other kind office required. Most tribes have intercourse with, or hold a kind of alliance with, three or four neighboring ones, with whom they barter for lubras, etc. They generally once a year at least, unitedly assemble. There are many disputes, imaginary or real, to settle which cannot be done without some fighting. When all is settled, they will corroboree night after night till they separate. All the tribes beyond the district of their friends are termed wild black fellows, and when found within the district are immediately killed. The blacks were formerly very superstitious. A most awful superstition is that they believe that man would never die unless he were killed, that the sick man has been opened, and his kidneys and fat have been taken out, which has caused death, and that nothing short of the kidneys and fat of another will appease the dead. They also believe that, as the kidneys and fat are the life of man, the eating of the same gives double strength and vigor to those who partake of them. Hence they never kill a wild black, as they term him, but they rob the body of that part. They also have another cruel custom of sacrificing the fruit of the womb till a male is born, so that, should a female have three or four girls, all are killed until a male is born. The poor innocents are put out of the way by strangling or smothering, and generally on the ninth or twenty-first day. To go into the various traditions they have of the creation of the world, man, woman, and animals, stars, etc., is impossible here. Suffice it to state that they are a people that have names for particular stars, as the Southern Cross, Magellanic Clouds, etc., and their traditions are not more ridiculous than those of other savage nations. They have also an idea of several imaginary beings, almost all of the dreaded class, also superstitious notions of certain birds, native bears, and extraordinary appearances in the heavens. Dances. They have various dances day and night, although a stranger, after seeing one, may think the whole alike and merely a monotony of sounds and motion, such is not the case. The song and words are to the motion of the body, like our country dances and reels. One ignorant of dancing would look upon the movements as monotonous. There is as much sense in the one as in the other. If the black's orchestra is inferior, their time and motion are better. Games. They have many, all admirably adapted to strengthen and expand the corporeal powers, as running, jumping, throwing, etc. But the most manual is wrestling. And certainly every one who has ever seen them at this exercise has acknowledged that it is equal to any description given of the ancients, and destitute of the brutality often resorted to by the ancients to gain the mastery. 
the aborigines is sheer, fair wrestling. They challenge each other by throwing dust in the air towards those they desire to strive with, which is answered by a return. They run towards each other. On approaching, each puts his hands on his antagonist's shoulder, and it is not till both are nearly exhausted that one is down. I should have stated that besides chiefs, they have other eminent men, as warriors, counselors, doctors, dreamers, who are also interpreters, charmers, who are supposed to be able to bring and drive rain away, also to bring or send plagues among other nations, and to drive away the same, as occasion requires. Although they have chiefs, doctors, counselors, warriors, dreamers, etc., who form a kind of aristocracy, yet these are in no way a burthen to the community. The chiefs govern, doctors cure, counselors advise, and warriors fight without pay. All alike seek their food, and he who is mindful of the ravens is not unmindful of these sable sons of Australia. Their war implements are, one, the wangwim, thrown in battle and useful in the bush to knock down birds. Two, kuruk, or throwing stick, with which a reed spear is hurled out with great force. Three, wara wara, a common club used in single combat. Four, leonile, the most dreadful hand weapon used in single combat only. Five, kudgerin, a thick club, very weighty at the end, used in close combat only. 6. Mulga, a shield used in single combat only, to defend the head from the hand clubs 3, 4, and 5. 7. Geom, a large shield used to ward off long spears. 8. Tirer, a reed spear used for distant objects. 9. Tare, a long spear pointed at the end used for distant combat. 11. Mongile, a double glass jagged spear, the most fatal of their weapons. 12. Wavoit, mostly used in play, it is thrown by the hand, the knob end bounds on the hard ground a considerable distance, as a stone would do when thrown on ice. He whose wavoit is the greatest distance is considered victor. Men Composing the Native Police on 1st January 1843 Billibulary was a chief of the Yara tribe. He stands foremost, and justly so, as ever having been the white man's friend, generous, frank, and determined as he was. Having received intimation that government was desirous of forming a native police, I consulted this chief who had often protected my life. I remember well the day I and the Captain Dana, on a huge gum log, on the 17th February, 1842, made known to Bolibolary the government's intention, and to further it stated that his influence was applied to first. He begged seven days to think. Night after night did this faithful chief address the encampment. True to the day, on the 24th he had the company together, leading the train. After stating the duties, he signed his name first, not, however, before saying, I am king, I no ride on horseback, I no go out of my country, young men go as you say, not me. Through his influence, the native police was first formed. This good man used often, after the first fortnight, to appeal to me on being ordered to march up and down for two hours. Nothing like command would do for him. I at length brought Captain Dana to consent that he be permitted to be on duty when he pleased. Regimentals, gun, etc., were at his disposal. Generally an hour before sundown the chief would dress himself and take it into his head to march to and fro from his lubra's miam to my tent, which invariably was adjacent. This good man died on the 10th of August, 1846. After preserving the lives of the first settlers, checking in the bud any jealousy or revenge in the precincts of Melbourne towards the whites, 
he was engaged with the Mount Macedon tribe in transferring the land to Batman, Simpson, Swanston, and others. Fostering all missionary and other exertions to better his race, he lamented much the deterioration of his people. He lived to see them become drunkards and refractory to their own laws. He was the last chief who was recognized as having any power. On his demise, missions, schools, and police began to totter, and were subsequently kept up, I may say, through pressing from distant tribes. Bug up, a fine intelligent young man. After two expeditions, he was made a corporal and received pay. He continued in the police till his death, had been on much arduous duty. From the effect of one very long day's ride, somehow his ankle was hurt by the stirrup iron, which was not considered of any consequence. However, after some months, it so affected his leg, then his thigh, that to save his life, amputation above the knee was required, which he consented to. He was one of the first in the colony who underwent an operation under the influence of ether, and did well. The operation was performed by Drs. Hobson, Thomas, and Barker. He lived a year after the operation, making himself useful at the police quarters till his death on the 2nd September, 1848, after nearly six years' service. Berbero This black remained but a few months in the service. His habits and disposition were too restless for restraint, and too immoral to be kept in subjection. He latterly was a notorious drunkard, and on the last meeting of the tribes was killed, while drunk, on Richmond Swamp, and shoved into a rut, 28th May, 1852. Benbu. This harmless man, like Bolibolary, was but a short time in the service. In fact, was not by nature or disposition adapted for the police. He, however, to the time of his death, was seldom seen out of uniform, which was generally that of a commissariat in full dress, except the cocked hat. Mr. Erskine used invariably to give him his left-off uniform, and Benbu never shrunk when he wanted uniform from asking for it. This good and inoffensive chief died on his way to Moody Yalloak, at Little Brighton, on the 5th July, 1852. His few subjects were drunk for three days previous, and neglected their king. Bearing this young black, who continued in the service for some time, was in two journeys. He subsequently went to the Devil's River, and has not been heard of since. Culpender. This fine young man was son of Billibellieri, but widely different in disposition and character. I think he went but two journeys. He was an awfully dissipated character after his father's death, and was eventually killed at the Goulburn in a drunken fray with the Goulburn blacks. Correct, correct. Remained but a few months in the police. Afterwards he was continually going to and fro to Gippsland, where he died sometime in 1848. Cunerdegum. I can't recollect or find in my papers a name in the least like this. Those enrolled on 24th of February, 1842, were all correct. I wrote their names down. Gallibrand was a faithful black, much respected by the whites, especially the gentry. He took his name from the unfortunate gentleman who was lost with Hesse. His real name was Baruke, a kangaroo rat. It is said that while he was being brought into the world, a kangaroo rat ran over his mother. The natives invariably consider such occurrences as omens for something, and he was named after the animal. He was one who accompanied the whites in search of Gellibrand. He remained in the police till his death, which was premature. Having come with the government dray from Nare Warren for a month's provisions, he drank to much excess, as reported to me by the blacks, at the clubhouse, that he died on his way back with the dray, and was buried near South Yarra Pound. 
he had been on duty in all parts of the colony, was a corporal, and had received pay for years. Jibberuk. This was a noble-looking black, but sullen, and in no way to be depended upon. He soon left the service, after his first orders to accompany Mr. Commissioner Powlett to Mount Macedon. He went subsequently to the Gilborn, and, for aught I know, is still alive. Murum Murum Bean A fine powerful black, next to Billabellieri, of the greatest influence over the Yara blacks. He, however, soon left the police. As they assured me afterwards, they only joined to set the example. He died on the 16th October, 1849. He was never addicted to drink, and endeavored, with his cousin Billabellieri, to stop this growing vice. Many and many times have the young men's heads been split by these two worthy men, that is, those who came in drunk overnight to the encampment. But all to no avail. The vile whites made others drunk daily. Had this man and Billabellieri the power, such was their determination, they would have summarily dealt with the case, and have taken a band with wadi and spears, and have discharged the contents of every spirit cask in Melbourne, and have felt no repugnance, if opposed, in shedding blood to accomplish their object, for with aborigines murder is no crime when for the public good. Mooney Mooney. This was a fine young man, who was sent to important journeys, and died in the service while at the Wimera in August 1845. Ningulabin, alias John Bull, a fine, powerful black, but no sooner were the police ordered upon distant duty than he and several others deserted. He being a man of importance, Captain Dana was awfully prejudiced against him, which prejudice on the captain's part had nearly been fatal to the life of Ningubalin, insomuch that the second in command, for giving evidence which I compelled him to give, of the native police, ever afterwards was under the displeasure of his superior. Ningubalin was afterwards tried for the murder of Booby, an aboriginal from the present colonial secretary's station. I was so convinced of his innocence, having daily intercourse with him at the time, that in spite of official opposition, which was truly unpleasant, I persevered in order to prove such, and at length, after four months, from circumstantial evidence brought forward, the jury, in spite of direct evidence, after a tedious trial, which lasted till eight o'clock at night, acquitted him. Nunuptun Remained but a few months in the force. He was a good-tempered fellow, but as restless as a hyena in confinement. He subsequently was, unjustly, accused of taking Mr. Willoughby's child at Western Port, which so frightened him that for years he scarce rambled further than along the coast from Mount Eliza to Point Nepean. He died under Mount Eliza, 11th of August, 1849. Nerimbinuk, brother to the unfortunate Windberry, shot by Major Letsom's party. He continued in the force for a considerable time. Getting tired of it, he left, and for some years rambled along the Gilborn to the Devil's River and Magulumbuck tribes. Like his unfortunate brother, by family connection he seems to pass safely through different remote tribes. He is still alive, and left some months back our encampment by the ranges for Bacus Marsh. He is a terrible drunkard. Pirup. There have been two of this name in the police. The one who was in the force in 1843 continued in it till 1847. After leaving it, he was scarce in his district for a month's continuance, going to and fro with others, purchasing or stealing Gippsland Lubras. He was subsequently, with two others, killed there in May 1850, on the Mitchell River, through the treachery of a knowing Gippsland black named Tyers. Perpine, better known as McNoel. An active, shrewd, able, and intelligent policeman. 
for two years highly serviceable. He had the boldness to be the first to fire at a white man, when with Commissioner Gisborne's police up the Yarra. On leaving the police, he, like most others, became a notorious drunkard, and was dangerous when so. In a drunken fray with two of his own tribe, he received a spear wound, from which he died four days afterwards, on 2nd May, 1850, at the encampment between the Mary and Darabin Creeks. Polygary, an able-bodied black, intelligent, and to be fully depended upon. He went through a routine of service for government, being selected for most of their important journeys. On leaving the force, he accompanied Mr. Bonney and others in an expedition, I think, in quest of the lost Dr. Lyhart. He is still living. In Bonney's correspondence, he is designated as Black Jimmy. Moon Moonginner, a fine and faithful black of good disposition and temper, had been out on three expeditions. The Wimera was the last, where he was taken ill and returned before his comrades. The black doctors recommended rambling through the district, which he did to no effect. He died at Mahoon, Western Port, on the 16th August, 1845. Tonmiel, a young, steady, and faithful policeman. He continued in the service till his death. He had been on duty the whole round of the colony from Portland Bay West to Gippsland East and the Murray North. He died at the police barracks, Nari Nari Warren, in November 1850. Tomboko. This black continued in the service for at the least three years. Captain Dana was particularly partial to him. His lubra was also of great service. She could wash, iron, and do needlework almost as well as a white woman. An altercation, however, took place at the police barrack, Nari Nari Warren. The sergeant brought Tomboko to Melbourne handcuffed and lodged him in the watch house. My blacks at the Mary Creek gave me information of it. I attended the police office next morning. No one appeared against him, and he was discharged. With all I could do, I could not get him to return. He was industrious and sober. He went a few trips to Gippsland after the death of his lubra, where he now is, and has been for the last eighteen months shepherding. Wowerong. This black continued in the service, I should say, at least four years beyond my expectation. So much so that, when Billibellieri presented him, I told Captain Dana it was useless to have his name. Neither he nor any of the Murray family could be kept for any continuance from the Yarra Ranges. He, however, was enrolled, and proved a faithful servant of government. But becoming at length constitutionally affected with the venereal disease, he left or had leave of absence. Dr. Jameson and others gave him medicines, his disease gained on him, and, like all blacks in great affliction, wandering seems the last recipe. He went rambling with a few Yarra blacks, and died in the Yarra Ranges. The date I cannot exactly give, but it was between 1849 and 1850. Wiggy Gulk, also a fine youth, was in the force nearly two years. After returning from the Murray River, he became tired of that kind of life, and though continuing in the force, was continually asking for furloughs, and would come to Melbourne, plant his police clothes, and get drunk with impunity. He subsequently was tried for larceny on 15th July, 1844. Since then, he has led a dissipated life. He is at present, if alive, in Gippsland. Yammer Book, an intelligent and faithful black, good-tempered, and no one on a bush excursion more to be depended upon, was a considerable time in the native police, and had accompanied most of the journeys through the district. On leaving the police, he commenced, with others, to go to and fro to Gippsland, and is, for what I know, still alive in Gippsland, but he has for years been a notorious drunkard. 
Yeptune. One of the coolest, commanding tempers that ever I saw in a black, but when drunk, the most determined on mischief. Captain Dana and other officers have assured me that for patience, perseverance, and other requisites in a long journey, no European could equal him. This was the black who, in the conflict with the blacks to the westward, had the full opportunity of shedding blood to no small extent, but would not on his race, although he received several wounds, two on his head being very severe, in saving the life of his superior officer, for which he received on his return the commendation of His Excellency, the present Lieutenant Governor. He was made corporal and received pay. However, since he left the service, and while in it when opportunity offered, he would get drunk, and to such excess that he was in continual trouble. The last time he was convicted with imprisonment. I advised him when I got him from the jail to keep to the bush, which he has done since. In every other respect, a more kind-hearted, feeling black could not be found. In the early history of the colony, his father, mother, and elder brother were shot by the settlers in a sheep robbery between the Gilborne River and the Ovens, which left him to the care of Billabellieri, chief of the Yarra tribe, to whom his aunt was married. He is still alive with the Devil's River tribe. William Thomas Pentridge, 6th April, 1854 Memo His Excellency will perceive that the names forwarded are strictly given, but when a material difference exists in the orthography, I have indicated in brackets the real name. Thus, Bella Bellary, etc., etc., etc. W.T. It will be seen that in all these cases, except Boar Turning, alias Billy, merge into drunkenness, that is, Calpendure, violently drunk, going to cut in two the rope at Richmond Punt, because the punt man in an instant could not convey him across. Bunger Bernanook, leaving a butcher's in Geelong, in whose service he had been for some length of time, upon a drunken spree, forgetting to return the knife in his belt, was had up for larceny. Yeptune, one of the best of blacks and most faithful of the police, when sober, and the worst when drunk, was figuring away among a mob of constables and with difficulty secured. The white man Gilmore was drinking hard when he fell in with three blacks, two of them belonging to the police. All were drinking hard together. A dispute subsequently arose about a bottle of rum. Gilmore became frightened and thought one was going to kill him. Gilmore shot at him, and he fell. Fearful of the others, as he said, he shot and wounded another. Boar Turning's case is more what I would call your attention to, as it is more important to my mind than the others, though there was no loss of life. It is from such cases the danger of the aborigines may be calculated. My impression ever was, and is still the same, that, from the blacks as a body, to Europeans there is no danger whatever. It is our damnable drink that has made them so nauseous even to ourselves, without our for a moment calculating the beam in our own European eye. But to proceed with Billy, his case was enveloped in mystery. From the child known in the neighborhood from eight years of age, with the native police, highly respected by every officer, from Mr. Dana downwards. Hurst, Lydiard, and others assured me that he must be innocent. All rested on the evidence of the girl, who subsequently being found to be of a most objectionable character, I lost no time in preparing a memorial to His Excellency for a commutation of sentence, which memorial was signed by the foreman of the jury, and by the whole, except two who had left for the diggings. More than one of the jury remarked to me that, had they known an hour before the trial what they knew an hour after, a verdict quite the reverse would have been given. My impression is still the same, that he is and was an innocent man, and as such 
I do not for a moment consider that the aboriginal character is in any way the least affected to its prejudice by this trial. The Guardian of Aborigines, 27 3, 54. Returns with Remarks 1. Return showing the number of aborigines in the Yarra and Western Port tribes, 1852 to 1853. 2. Return showing the number of deaths in the Yarra and Western Port tribes, 1850 to 53. 3. Return showing the number of births in the Yarra and Western Port tribes, 1850 to 53. Grand total in four years in both tribes, 2 and for three years previous in the two tribes there had not been a birth. However, these two both died or were killed within a month. 4. Return showing the number of aboriginal children under instruction, 1851-53. to 53. Deaths. It will be seen by this return that, from the end of 1851 to the end of 1852, there was a mortality of 18 out of a population of 77, nearly one-fourth. The mortality has been among the males principally, that is, 14 males, and but four females, one of the latter being an infant. Eight were murdered, and two of the murderers were subsequently arrested and killed. It is true sickness prevailed to a great extent among them, and, notwithstanding my continued attention, and the truly fatherly visits of the late Colonel Surgeon, Dr. Sullivan, eight died. Three of these, however, were, during the drunken freaks of May and June, almost perpetually drunk. Five only out of the eighteen may be said to have died by the visitation of God, the remainder by violence. This year of mortality was ushered in as satisfactorily as could be, the Yarra blacks were engaged with the farmers by the plenty, and most of the western port blacks in the country of Mornington were engaged at different stations. In February, some western port blacks returned from Gippsland, bringing about ten Warragal blacks with them. I tried to remove them. They promised day after day to leave. While engaged with them near Unwin Survey, south of the Yarra, some messengers were dispatched, and Melbourne had in a few days three encampments within ten miles of it. They begged very hard to remain, and said they would leave in three weeks and not come near the town. They had not met for years, and wanted to have once more some corroboree together. I got the three encampments at length to one spot in a government reserve on a bend of the Yarra, about twelve or thirteen miles from Melbourne, and addressed His Excellency upon the indulgence which was granted, and night after night, for fourteen days, did they enjoy themselves. From this time, however, they visited Melbourne, and scenes of the most awful dissipation ensued. As they were shifted from one spot, they would be found two or three miles nearer Melbourne in another direction, until, in April and May, from morning to night, there was naught but drunkenness. While I was taking one party off, two were murdered, and three were subsequently found dead, which, with the previous murder at Brighton, regularly disgusted the public. After, by the aid of police, I got the Gilborn, Barabool, Booning, and Gippsland blacks off, assuring them that never more should there be an assemblage. By the end of June, the Yarra blacks were settled at the ranges, and the western port near the coast. During this year, reserves were granted the two tribes, and provisions secured for them in the bush, so that they were now left without the least excuse. I may add that some important correspondence between the Guardian and the government took place, resulting from the awful outrages of the Aborigines inter se, touching their case. The difficulties, however, seemed to increase as correspondence went on, and the question receded to its former position, and justly so. The fact is that all must rest upon aboriginal evidence, to admit which, in their present state, would jeopardize the life of any they had a peak against. A proof of this is the murder of one Buller Bullop this year. 
I missed him for three weeks before any of the other murders were discovered. I made continual inquiries about him, received such evasive replies that I was far from satisfied. In fact, felt that he must have been killed by some of the number of strangers in the encampment. King Benbow, his brother, and another left for Williamstown for seven or eight days about the time. I was about getting a trooper or two to drive off the whole of the blacks, and said to a fine young man of the Yara tribe, formerly of the native police, I should like to know if poor Buller Bullop is killed, what tribe did it, and I would have the black, if possible, before I sent them away. He took me aside and told me, in as cool and deliberate a manner as a man could, that King Benbow, his brother, and another, had killed Burler Bullop on account of Yal Yal being killed at Brighton, and that they had buried him in a scrub near Williamstown. After a little further inquiry, this appeared substantiated, and I reported the deed to His Excellency. Benbow subsequently returned, and I felt thoroughly convinced, from his protestations, that he was innocent. Buller Bullop's murderer, after all, I found to be this very black and two others, and his body was found not at Williamstown, but mangled near Richmond Swamp. I lost no time in communicating to His Excellency how grossly King Benbow had been accused. W.T. Before I close, there are three documents transmitted to government, not noticed here, of some import, which will put His Excellency in possession of the whole of the history of Aborigines of the Melbourne tribes, that is, on 21st December 1852, particular statistics of Aborigines from 1836 to close of 1851, numbers, schools, etc., with notes. December 17th, 1853. Returns required by Legislative Council, 345 with notes. December 29th, 1853. Returns furnished to Registrar General, that is, 1336. The above, with the particular returns I left as appendices to my last report as protector, 31st December, 1849, will make all aboriginal matters complete as respects returns. The manners, etc., of them are too numerous for me to be able to supply. W.T. There are, however, a few, and but a few, lines I can furnish in a day or two, which are, nevertheless, necessary to make the whole complete. That is, those blacks who have been committed and tried since the end of 1849 and the whites who have been committed and tried for outrages on the blacks since the same date, all previous are in government returns. And though I had the honor of first compiling such a return, I must say it is a most important one. The more so, as the Attorney General at Sydney said, some years back, such could not be furnished. End of Section 13 Section 14 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Number 14. From William Thomas. There is not a more diffident subject to treat upon than the superstitions of savage nations, for in treating of their superstitions wrongfully, you may be an obstacle on the one side to their minds being enlightened, and on the other, place the people in the estimation of the world in a different light to what they should be. There is not a portion of the aboriginal character that I feel less confident in remarking upon than their traditionary and superstitious notions, not but that I am aware that they exist, and that to a considerable extent but to know their full import and meaning, I feel persuaded that one had need become an aboriginal native. And yet much has been written by individuals who have had little or no intercourse with them, 
which has materially bewildered the world touching the aborigines of Australia, as to whether they have not been so low in creation as to have no conception, judging from the vague accounts that have already emanated from different authors, of a deity. D. E., an intelligent writer, whose heart is warmly engaged in the cause of these poor heathens, remarks, in number two on aboriginal subjects, which appeared in the Gi Long Advertiser in 1844, quote, It is doubtful whether there exists among them any notion of the existence of a supreme being which contains the slightest analogy to revealed truth, end quote. And further, quote, that where any idea of a supreme intelligence exists, there have usually existed some outward indications thereof, as manifested in sacred relics, idols, rites, and ceremonies constituting religion. The entire absence of everything of this sort among the savages of Australia seems, therefore, corroborative of the utter loss of the knowledge of God. End quote. Equally, on the same ground of reasoning, may the conclusion be arrived at in this colony a few years since, by one travelling from Gippsland to the river Glenelg, and from the bay to the Murrumbidgee, for what outward indications would he have witnessed among the white people? And had he come from some strange land, of a strange tongue, not having any idea from whence we came, who or what we or our fathers were, as far as outward indications are concerned, what other impression would the traveller have than that we had altogether lost, if we ever had had any, all idea of an intelligent supreme, and upon the very same grounds adduced by this zealous writer, that there are no, quote, sacred relics, rites, or ceremonies constituting religion, end quote, to be observed among us. We should consider, moreover, that people may have notions of what perhaps their very superstitious laws enjoin perfect silence upon, and much of this mute solemnity is to be observed in the character of the aboriginal inhabitants of Australia. Mr. Assistant Protector Parker, of the Laden, has supposedly discovered, quote, in their ceremonies and superstitions, the obscure and nearly obliterated relics of the ancient ophiolatry, or serpent worship, end quote, and this from the Mindyi. The Mindyi is certainly considered by them as a visible and invisible being. According to their account, he is seen and not seen at one and the same time. But there is no ceremony whatever that I can trace among them that bears any analogy to what he supposes can give me any belief that they have any notion of the, quote, ancient ophiolatry, end quote, so prevalent formerly, and still known in India and Africa. The Mindy has its residence, and some old prejudices exist among the aged that a certain family has the power of enchanting or encanting this being. The smallpox brought forward by Mr. Parker is no more than any other epidemic occasioned by the Mindy. The being called the Mindy has no independent power. He is under the control of the Creator of all things, and, as they superstitiously believe, the family aforementioned. The term Manola Mindyi, as Mr. Parker has it, dust of the Mindyi, is incorrect. Lollipook Mindyi, which Mr. P. has as a further proof, scales of the Mindyi, is still more ridiculous. Lillipook means the cup which held the pock. The persons of the other deities or superior beings spoken of by Mr. Parker do not tally with accounts received by me. Although I am in possession of much of their mythology, yet I am so dissatisfied with my own belief of the real meaning, that I venture only to give you what I think you may safely commit to the press, worked up in your own superior style. What I give you has been tried over and over again from statements made by old and young of different tribes at various times. I have been so scrupulously doubtful of the accuracy, like Thomas the Apostle, I have done as much as could be done without becoming an aboriginal native to arrive at the truth. Australian Deities The Australian Aborigines believe in two principal deities, that is, Punjil, the maker of the earth, trees, animals, and man. 
Pungil, they say, had a wife named Boy Boy, but he never saw her face. She, however, bore him two children, one a son named Binbeel, the other a daughter named Karakaruk. To Binbeel is committed the sovereignty of the heavens, and to Karakaruk the incidental occurrences on earth, while great Pungil stalks like a big one gentleman in the clouds, on the earth, etc., always carrying a big one sword. The Australian's next deity is Palion, brother of Pungil. Palion made all the seas, rivers, creeks, and waters, also all the fish in the ocean, seas, rivers, etc. He governs the waters, was always in the waters, walking, bathing, and going over the seas. Creation of Man Pungil one day cut, with his large knife, two pieces of bark, mixed up a lot of clay, and made two black men, one very black and the other not quite black, more like dirty red brick. He was from morning till night making them. It was not bright day then, but the sun was like blood all day. He began to make man at the feet, then made legs, and so on to the head. He then made the other in like manner, and, smoothing them both over with his hand from the feet to the head, he put on one's head curly hair, and named him Kukinburuk, on the other straight hair, and named him Buruk Burn. After finishing the two men, Punjil looked on them, was pleased, and danced round them. He then lay on each of them, blowing into their nostrils, mouth, and navel, and the two men began to move. He bade them get up, which they did, young men not like pickaninnies. He told them their names. He showed his brother Pallion the two men he had made. Creation of Woman The next day Pallion was in a creek, paddling and beating in the water, in which he used to indulge. After some time the water got thick like mud, so that he could scarcely move. He plucked off a small bough from a tree that hung over the creek, and looked through the bough at the water, and said, Name you. He beat harder and harder, and he saw near him come up four hands, then two heads, and so on, till breasts, and two human figures complete appeared. Pallion exclaimed, Like my brother Pungil, me make two bagruks. He beat again the waters, and the two lubras came above the water and fell on the land, but they could not move. He carried one and then the other to his brother Pungil, who breathed into their nostrils, mouth, and navel, and Pungil gave them names, to one Kunawara, and to the other Kuuruk. They gave each Kulin a lubra. Pungil put a spar in each Kulin's hand, and Karakaruk, daughter to Punjil, put in each Lubra's hand a kanan, woman's stick. Punjil, Palian, and Karakaruk go out with them some days, showing them how to get their food. The two men were taught to spear kangaroos, emus, etc., and the two Lubras to get gum, roots, bandicoots, grubs, etc. One morning, when they awoke, they... No see Pungil, Palian, and Karakaruk. They had gone up above. The blacks say that all this took place very far, far away to the northwest, not where now blackfellows all about here sit down, alluding to their belief that man and woman were first created in other countries. All agree, I mean different tribes, in stating that that country was far, far away, beyond what they know to the northwest, overseas. If the point they direct to be correct, it tallies with our position of the western part of Asia. How Man First Came in Possession of Fire They say that, long time after Punjil made man and woman, blacks had no fire, were very cold, and eat all flesh raw. That some lubras went out to get food. They were with their kanan, digging up murar, pisant's eggs, when several snakes of all kinds came up out of the earth where they were digging, that they were terribly frightened, kept beating the snakes but could not kill them. To their relief came down Karakaruk with a large kanan, 
and two young men named Tort and Tarer. That Karakarook and the Lubras fought the snakes for a long time, when the end of Karakarook's stick broke off. From the piece broken off arose smoke. A bird, by their account of the same kind as a crow, only of a great size, as large as an eagle, flew down and ran off with the fire. Tort and Terror immediately flew up in pursuit of the crow, while Karakarook remained with the Lubras. The crow flew to a mountain named Noon Nuwoon, where it was overtaken by the two flying young men. Terror returned with the fire safe, having pulled off bark from one tree and another to keep it from being exhausted. Tort no more come back. He was burnt to death on a mountain named Munio, where he had kindled a small fire, lest what small quantity he had should be lost, and Pungil, for Tort's good deed, turned him into a large star that always looks like a fire. Karakarook showed the Lubras her stick, and, having examined the qualities of it, bade them never to be without fire. Terror afterwards directed them to where the stick might be found, and showed them how to make fire, disappeared and was no more seen. Notions of the Flood The blacks say that after they had fire they were all marnumuk, meaning comfortable, and increased to great numbers, and after many, many years, black fellows got very bad, wicked, when Punjil and Palian, big one sulky. Punjil came down with his big one knife and cut the earth all over like blackfellow cut up damper, and come up water, and Pollyon drive all big one water from sea on land, then like great guns come up Kureen, storms, and pull up all trees, and come up water everywhere, and very bad blackfellows drowned, and that great many not very bad, Punjil take up and make stars of, and that Punjil, when all gone water, send another very good man and woman, named Bearwool and Bobinger, and take and cut up one kangaroo and other animals into small pieces, and they become a great number. Karakarook and Terror, directed by Punjil, again descend and make Burwell and Bobinger acquainted with the way to provide themselves with food and fire, but stop only little time and then leave them. Tradition of the Dispersion of Mankind The blacks have also a tradition of the dispersion of mankind over all the earth. They say that mankind, after many years, got very many and again very bad, fighting, killing, and eating one another. No work, black fellows only beat and make lubras get em tunanen, victuals. Black fellows all sit down only one country. Punjil come down again with his big knife, big one sulky, and cut into pieces all men, women, and children, kangaroo, and all living animals, but they not die. Then come up a great storm, Kureen, followed by many whirlwinds, Pittering, and take up all the pieces and carry them everywhere, far, far away, and drop them in every country. Then black fellows in all countries. No black fellows in all countries till then, and black fellow no more see em pungil, he too much sulky. Black doctors sometimes dream of them. Tradition of the Origin of Wind Hurricanes and whirlwinds, as well as wind, the blacks have a tradition came from an immense flight of magpies, a larger species than those at present seen. The blacks say that they came in great numbers, like flights of cockatoos, that after they came, a rushing wind and a number of large bags like sacks appeared in the air, at first not full. They filled as they passed along, as you would blow full a bladder, and when full, they busted, made noise like gun, and then came wind. No wind before this. It is singular that this occurred also far, far away, and came from northwest. Thunder and Lightning Thunder and Lightning they believe to be the voice and fire from the eyes of Binbeel when he is sulky with the elements, and will be obeyed, and when he has silenced all, he makes the sun stand before him. 
Footnote. I should have stated in the Australian deities that Binbeal is a god that has a face that encompasses the earth and has a lubra that always accompanies him. Binbeal is the rainbow, and his lubra is the reflection which may be seen occasionally. End footnote. Mindyi. Of all the beings most dreaded by the blacks, the principal is the Mindyi. It appears to have no independent power, but by the command of Punjil is sent to destroy or afflict any people for bad deeds, that is to say, when they have done very bad things, or not killed enough wild blackfellows for their dead. Its form is that of a snake, but of great size, though it can contract itself into small compass, extend or contract as we would a telescope. The blacks give awful accounts of this being. It can make itself extend miles in length. They say that there are little Mindyi, that Mindyi inhabits a country named Lilgoner, to northwest in this district, and resides on a mountain named Bakr Bunel, and drinks at a creek named Kilkunun. That the ground for a distance round is so hard that no rain can penetrate it, Kulubik, that no wood but Mulin grows near it, and that the land is covered with hard, small substances like hail. A family named Muni Brumbrum, the blacks say, have been the only blacks that have ventured to put foot on this awful country where Mindy resides, and they are the only blacks that can stay the ravages of the Mindy or send it forth. It differs from a snake by having a large head and two ears. It has three fangs coming from its tongue, and when it hisses out its fury, the earth around is covered with white particles like snow, from which the blacks say the disease is inhaled. It often ascends the highest tree in a forest, and, like a ring-tailed opossum, secures its hold and stretches itself over a vast extent of twenty and thirty miles. When Mindy is in a district, the blacks run for their lives, setting the bush on fire as they proceed, and not stopping to bury their dead or attend to any seized. Many drop down dead on the road. When seized, pains seize them in the back, with violent retching. When they try to get up, they fall down. Those not seized are quite well. The celebrated Mooney Brumbrum, the blacks say, can arrest and stay the Mindy by a secret move with his hand or finger. Such is the nature of the attack of the Mindy. Any plague is supposed to be brought on by the Mindy or some of its little ones. I have no doubt that, in generations gone by, there was an awful plague of cholera or black fever, and that the wind at the time, or some other appearance from northwest, has given rise to this strange being. Superstition about consulting bears. The bear is a privileged animal, and is often consulted in very great undertakings. I was out with a celebrated western port black tracking five other blacks. The tracks had been lost some days at a part of the country where we expected they must pass. We ran down a creek. After going some miles, a bear made a noise as we passed. The black stopped, and a parley commenced. I stood gazing alternately at the black and the bear. At length my black came to me and said, Me big one stupid. Bear tell me, no you go that way. We immediately crossed the creek and took a different track. Strange as it may appear, we had not altered our course above one and a half miles before we came upon the tracks of the five blacks, and never lost them after. The bear, too, must not be skinned. The blacks have a strange tale of the bears having stolen their tarnook, buckets, and drained a creek of water, and so bewildered the blacks that Karakarook came down, and it was settled by Karakarook on the part of the blacks that they would no more take the skins from the bears' bodies, and on the part of the bears that they would no more in any way molest the blacks in supply of water and vessel. The wombat, or warren, is also a sacred animal, and must not be skinned. Many birds are also sacred. Some may be eaten by the aged only, others by the doctors only. Superstitious Notions of the Warmum 
The blacks have superstitious notions of many places, in which, no doubt, in bygone days, some awful calamity had befallen their forefathers. Warmum is a very high mountain northwest of Gippsland, and northeast of Western Port. The blacks have a superstitious notion that whoever looks on this mountain direct will first be struck blind and then dead. No one can look at it and live unless through some medium. The lubras veil their faces when they come within sight, or put boughs and twigs before their faces. The men, when prompted by curiosity to behold it, look along a stick, as white people would do through a telescope. The blacks say that Big One Pungil once sit on that mountain. Charmers or Enchanters There are characters among the blacks who are supposed to possess powers according to their various qualifications. When a continuance of rain is desired, the charmer is applied to, who sings, Wanner rur ngur ween barmwiar wanerer tinder book kudiyar ngur ween kudiyar tinder book karulin. During the time that this is sung, the charmer sits in his mia mia, and with a piece of thin bark about a foot or eighteen inches long, continues throwing hot dust from the fire into the air, alternately mumbling and singing the above song. In fact, all their charmings are in mumbling language, not known to the rest of the blacks. We have in the Western Port tribe a celebrated charmer away of rain, Old Bobinary. I have known this man to be kept singing for hours. The blacks say, when Bobinary was a child, that it had been raining for some days, and, black fellows all sad, their bellies tied up to keep off hunger that the child Bobinary began to sing, and that sun immediately came out, and no more rain, that ever since then he has been able to send rain away. Doctors. The blacks have various kinds of doctors, for eyes, bowels, head, etc., and, like white physicians, are noted in proportion to the remarkable cures said to have been wrought but the highest pitch of the profession is flying. Among the tribes who have visited the settlement, there has been but one that has come to my knowledge possessed of this power, whose name is Malcolm, of the Mount Macedon tribe. I have known this man to be sent for one hundred miles. The blacks say that he has power to soar above the clouds and to fly like an eagle. He also can, in some cases, recover the marmbula, kidney fat, when it has been stolen. I have a most singular account of one of his aerial journeys, together with the solemnity of the encampment during his two hours' flight, but cannot trace it now. This Malcolm, aboriginal name Ming Durar, is said to have inherited his power from his father, who was famous before him. Marina Kuding, or Strength Lost in the encampment south of the Yara, on the evening of blank, were Goulburn, Mount Macedon, Barabool, Yara, and Western Port Blacks. The Goulburn Lubras, quite naked, stole upon seven young men. No sooner had the women their hands on the heads of the young men than the latter appeared helpless. They cut from each young man a lock of his hair. As soon as the hair was cut, the young men fainted. The women took the ornaments from the men's heads and decamped. The young men's friends came about them to comfort them, but life apparently could scarcely be kept in them. Their friends sat with them the whole of the night. On the following morning the doctors assembled. A fire was made about a quarter or half a mile from the encampment, and the seven young men were brought, each borne by two friends bearing pieces of lighted bark in their hands, to the spot. The young men were placed round the large fire at some distance, and before each was the bark brought by the friends. The doctors, mumbling and humming, with a piece of glass bottle, commenced scraping off all the hair from the crown of the head to the feet, and then rubbed them from head to feet with wear-up, red ochre. The young men lay speechless during the whole of the time the ceremony was being performed, 
and every muscle of their faces seemed to be keenly noticed by the doctors. This ceremony lasted from sunrise to three hours afterwards. I understand that these young men would have died had not this ceremony been performed. Strength left them as the lock fell from their heads. Is not this some semblance to Samson's case? Native Encampment Although there may be 150 Mia Mias, native huts, erected on the formation of a fresh native encampment, no alteration, to my knowledge, has ever taken place touching site or trees to be barked. They know beforehand where the chief's Mia Mia is to be, and the distance required for his immediate connections, none asking his fellow permission or advice. They commence barking and building. In one half hour I have seen one of the most beautiful, romantic, and stillest parts of the wilderness become a busy and clamorous town, and the beautiful forest marred for materials for their habitation, and as much bustle as though the spot had been located for generations. Although to a casual observer a native encampment may appear void of arrangement, such is not the case. If the whole or most of a tribe be present, it is divided into small hamlets of about six mia mias each, distant from each other five or six yards, merely sufficient to prevent the fires of one from molesting the other. The hamlets are about twenty yards from each other, or more, according to the space of ground on which they are encamped. In each of these hamlets is one married man of consequence, whose duty it is to keep order, settle differences, etc. It often happens that one hamlet may have an altercation with another. A lubra may have been seduced or what not. The two hamlets will settle the dispute early on the following morning, the other hamlets no more interfering than if nothing was on the carpet, precisely as in some of our courts and alleys in England, when two neighbors quarrel, the others take no more notice than if nothing was the matter. I have often been much annoyed, when I have seen one knocking the other about, and blood flowing from the head, to see an influential black of the next hamlet, coolly sitting at his Mia Mia, smoking his pipe, merely looking on. They hold no animosity when the quarrel is settled by the magistrate of the hamlet. The combatants may be seen sitting together, sucking or cleaning each other's wounds, or smoking their pipes and eating together. Fight between Barabool and Buninyong Blacks, north of Melbourne When two or more tribes congregate, they are ushered in by the messengers, who have been previously dispatched with their diplomas, one of whom, some hours previous to the tribe's approach, will return and state the success or ill-success of his mission. The newcomers will sit down about a half an hour, when the principal males assemble. If their meeting be hostile, which is known for days before, the war cry is heard for a mile or more ere they arrive at the encampment. At length the party arrives. All males are seated together, their heads and faces daubed with clay. They look beastly and terrific. The one I shall describe took place 5th December, 1844, at half-past four. The Barabool blacks, close-lined, ten lines with eight and ten in each line, seat themselves west of the Boon and Yangs. After half an hour... King William, chief of the Barabool tribe, advanced and stated that charges had been made against his blacks of killing two of the Buninyongs and stealing lubras, that his blacks were not afraid of them, and had come down and were ready to have the accusers' spears thrown at them. While speaking, another advances, and brings charges against the Barabool blacks, and bids them to come forward. This rouses the ire of the opposite tribe, when two step forward and rebut or acknowledge the assertions, remarking that they also are ready, in the presence of the other tribes assembled, to stand foremost and receive the spears of their opponents, etc. A general bustle may be seen now in both parties, the parties more particularly accused prepare themselves, or if murder undisputed, perfectly naked, and in mourning from head to foot, squatted on the ground, 
without spear or any other weapon, save a shield to ward off the spears. In this case it is more a judicial proceeding, or the law being carried into effect, and though the tribes are all under arms, it is more to check any disturbance or interruption to the execution of what they consider the sentence. But if it be a disputed case, the parties accused on each side, generally two, three, or four, may be seen stepping forward, capering round and round, with small bunches of leaves round their ankles, as sometimes in a corroboree. Both parties are now on the general move, shaking their weapons at each other, which raises their anger, giving three yells, stamping, and making the most frightful grimaces, and with distorted gestures gathering up dust and throwing towards their opponents, which excites both parties the more. A fire is made, then kicking the fire about, they form themselves again into lines, and their chief leads them. They generally branch out and form a crescent, or extend into a long straight line. They may be seen now on both sides, capering in the strangest attitudes the body can be placed in, some running to and fro with long spears in their hands, with their noses almost touching the ground, others vociferating, lifting up their heels to their bottoms, some advancing even among their opponents, and as actively backing themselves, pointing and grinning their teeth, while others are dancing around and round like Jim Crow. Those with leaves round their legs are stationary. All the aforesaid moves and grimaces are merely flashes in the pan. The chiefs and other important characters keep on wrangling, pointing with their spears towards one party and another, till the word of command. Then each black is at his post, and Wang Wim's spears, etc., all beside each fighting man, and the real warm work commences with Wang Wim's, which are hurled apparently indiscriminately, but not so. You would be apt to doubt, seeing them five minutes after they commenced, to which side some belonged. There appears such confusion. But among them it is otherwise, each knows his work. The missiles are, in the first instance, hurled without intermission, directed to those who have the bows on their legs. Some soon hit others, who plant themselves, purposely, near their friends, which causes a general fight. When the Wangwims are all exhausted, then spears are used, and should, after all, the parties who should have received punishment escape, those with bows around the ankles, they are pounced upon with bludgeons, and at close combat seldom escape unhurt. If things get too serious, the chiefs of other tribes will interfere, for the blacks never fight but in the presence of two or three other tribes, aware of their own weakness or passions. And with leonile rushing between the contending parties, bringing the matter to a close, which is, like its commencement, ended in war, 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 as they call it, or high words. The fighting over, one after another may be seen moving off, grumbling as he goes and in half an hour all is the greatest harmony, and generally there is a corroboree at night. They seldom do much execution in their fights, a few wangwim and spear wounds in some not dangerous parts of the body. They are too adroit in warding off from the breast and other mortal parts. Arrangement in Encampment When Different Tribes Meet I have often been struck with the exact position each tribe takes in the general encampment, precisely in the position from each other their country lies according to the compass, of which they have a perfect notion. I have found this invariably the case, and latterly could form an idea on the arrival of blacks what part they came from. A particular instance of this I noticed when the greatest number of blacks, up to that time, that had ever visited the settlement, northeast by east from Melbourne about two miles, to witness the judicial proceedings against Poliorong and Warador, for killing the Waralim youth at Turidin, western port, Mr. Mantons. There were upwards of eight hundred blacks by the settlement, no small portion of seven tribes, that is, the Laden, Campus Bay, Goulburn, Mount Macedon, Barabool, Yara, and Western Port. 
the two undergoing punishment were two of the leading men and greatest warriors in the western port tribe. A bird's-eye view would look down upon the encampment thus. Generally speaking, there is not a more peaceable community than the blacks when but one tribe is present. I have been out with them for months with scarce an altercation, years back, when they were less corrupted and fewer settlers in the district. I should have stated, on the meeting of tribes, there is generally, in a short time, howling among the women. As the women are married from other tribes, they are permitted to go and sit down with the females. When they hear of one and another of their friends having died, they will anxiously inquire if their murder has been avenged, and if there is no flesh to assuage their grief, they mourn and mar themselves, as described by me in my burial of the dead, which I presume you have, though that was never finished. Ceremony of Tenderum, or Freedom of the Bush There is not, perhaps, a more pleasing sight in a native encampment than when strange blacks arrive who have never been in the country before. Each comes with fire in hand, always bark, which is supposed to purify the air, the women and children in one direction, and the men and youths in another. They are ushered in generally by some of an intermediate tribe, who are friends of both parties, and have been engaged in forming an alliance or friendship between the tribes. The aged are brought forward and introduced. The ceremony of tenderum is commenced. The tribe visited may be seen lopping boughs from one tree and another, as varied as possible, of each tree with leaves. Each family has a separate seat, raised about eight or ten inches from the ground, on which in the center sits the male, and around him his male children, and the female and her sex of children have another seat. Two fires are made, one for the males and the other for the females. The visitors are attended on the first day by those whose country they are come to visit, and not allowed to do anything for themselves. Water is brought them, which is carefully stirred by the attendant with a reed, and then given them to drink. Males attend males, and females females. Victuals are then brought and laid before them, consisting of as great a variety as the bush in the new country affords, if come edible. During this ceremony the greatest silence prevails, both by attendants and attended. You may sometimes perceive an aged man seated, the tear of gratitude stealing down his murky, wrinkled face. At night their mia mias are made for them. Conversation, etc., ensue. The meaning of this is a hearty welcome. As the boughs on which they sit are from various trees, so they are welcome to every tree in the forest. The water stirred with a reed means no weapon shall ever be raised against them. On Saturday the 22nd March, 1845, in an encampment east of Melbourne, near 200 strangers arrived. The sight was imposing and affecting, especially their attendance upon that old chief Kuller Kulup, the oldest man I have ever seen among the blacks. He must have been near 80 years. Female Coming of Age Ceremony of Murum to Rukuruk Murum to Rukuruk is the name of the ceremony when a female comes to years of maturity, which is generally about thirteen or fourteen years of age, though age is no criterion, but the blood in the womb. When the first discharge of blood ceases, which they say is about three moons, they are of age. There were, at the time I am describing, two large fires of bark made, no wood of any kind save the bark, at about a hundred yards from the encampment, at which was one aged Lubra sitting down pensive. Bungaruk, the young woman, daughter of the chief Billabellary, was brought forth in the encampment, covered all over from head to foot, with kunindure, charcoal powder, except white spots all over her face and body, which gave her a singular appearance. She was attended by her mother, and another who led her. Her mother aided her up on a log, where the young woman stood silent and sad, as though doing penance. She held a small branch in her hand, every leaf taken off, 
and on each twig was a piece of bread. About twenty young men went up to her slowly, each threw a little stick at her, merely a twig. The young men then drew near, and each bit off a bit of bread from the twig of the young damsel, and then spat it into the fire, and turned back and approached the second time, stamping and making the earth shake under them, as they do in corroboree, and raving and stamping about the fire. The same two lubras, who were her attendants, gathered the twigs thrown at her by the young men, and buried them deep in the earth. This was to prevent her kidneys from wasting and falling into others' hands. The twig held by the damsel was then demanded by the one who had charge of the fires, who gathers up the ashes and covers up the little twig when it is burned. She is then handed down from the log by her mother, who, with the other attendant, takes her to her father's Mia Mia. A corroboree, if it is a chief's daughter, as was this case, takes place at night, at which the father leads the dance. The young men before alluded to, alone corroboree. She is after this of age to have a coolin, not before. The purport of this ceremony is, on the part of the young men, that they will not defile her person without her consent, or suffer others to do so, but will protect her to their utmost until she is lawfully married. Ceremony of Tibboot, or Males Coming of Age This is altogether a beastly concern. The young men have all the hair cut close from their heads, save a narrow streak from the front of the neck to the forehead, which gives them a raw-headed appearance. This is performed by a married man, and one of influence. The hair is first cut with scissors, the head then scraped with glass. The head is then daubed over with mud, closely put on like plaster, the streak of hair being raised up, which gives the youth a still more beastly appearance. There are strips of old rags, string, slips of opossum skin, and old rope, and all the variety of stripes with which a fringed apron girdles his body all round, flapping round his bottom, his face and body daubed over with motley daubs of clay, mud, charcoal powder, in fact, every mess. To add to his beastly appearance, he is not allowed to have a blanket to cover him, or anything, night or day, and it is generally the winter season selected for this purpose. He goes through the encampment calling out, Tibobo butt. He has a basket under his arm which contains all the filth he can pick up, it not even omitting soil. In this plight, night and day, he is occasionally going through the encampment. He is not molested by any one. He frightens and bedobs all he meets with some of the beastly commodities contained in his basket, but must not touch any who are in their mia mias or lubras on the way getting water, but in every other case he is at liberty to annoy and frighten all he meets. The children are awfully frightened at him, and will fly screaming to their parents. He must, when he is on the move, continually cry out, T-bobo but, which is the only warning the poor creatures have of escaping him. I have often been struck at the fear created by him, though the encampment knows what it is, and think there must be more in the meaning than I am acquainted with. When his days are over, which last some time, till appearance of hair begins to show itself, he is washed, and the females stripe his face with certain charcoal streaks mingled with wear-up, red ochre, and dance before him. P.S. You have read what I wrote for his honor, Judge Jeffcott. These scraps will give you a better idea of the people. Time will not permit me to give others, and much that I have by me I cannot give you as yet, as I do not understand satisfactorily its purport. You are a married man, or I would not have stated what I have on the female coming of age. It will show you that these people have some respect for laws of nature. In fact, they are more delicate than white people in many respects. There is one black who had a child by his daughter, and he is looked upon as a regular beast. These accounts are quickly put together, but the purport is correct, though you will find grammatical blunders innumerable. 
William T. End of section 14「Section 15 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 15 from Reverend James Claw, Melbourne, 4th of August, 1853 My dear sir, Along with this note, I have much pleasure in forwarding a statement drawn up in answer to Your Excellency's letter of the 25th Ultimo, and I have to express my regret that I have not been able in all instances to give dates as I could have wished. Your Excellency will also perceive that the account of the occupation of the Dandenong district before I went to live in it is given only on the information of others i may not therefore be in every point correct i remain my dear sir very truly yours james claw j c latrobe esq lieutenant governor of victoria in the beginning of august eighteen thirty eight the reverend mr claw took possession of the cattle run corhan warrable which was so named after the mountain that formed its north-eastern boundary but his home station was in Tierhatman, that part of the run which is adjacent to the junction of the Narwong with the Dandenong. Before that period, the more eligible portion of the country beyond him had been kept up. Mr. John Highead, he has been informed, was the first settler that crossed the Dandenong with stock, and that he was followed by O'Connor and the Riffies, and that next after him came Mr. Joseph Hodden, who may be considered the first that settled in the Dandenong, as those who had preceded him had gone about eight or ten miles to the east of it. He transferred his right to the Dandenong run to Captain Loosdale, who had Mr. Alfred Langhorne for his overseer at the time Mr. Claw settled in Trahatian. Their head station was at the bridge over the creek, where the present township of Dandenong situated. They had one outstation, Eumering, and both of these were transferred to Dr. Macrae in 1839. Shortly afterwards, Eumering was transferred by him to the Fosters, and by them to Johnston and Wilson, and by them to Mr. Power, by whom it is still held. The Dandenong station was retained by Dr. Macrae for several years, and then became the property of its present occupant, Mr. R. C. Walker. The run which belongs at present to Mr. Charles Wedge, and which is generally known by the name of the Waterholes, was a part of country originally occupied by Mr. Hodden, and has been since then in the possession of various owners. Along with Dandenong on the east side, towards the mountain and adjacent to Emmering, was the Corhan Warrable run, which was occupied twelve years by Mr. Claw, and transferred by him to Mr. Bailby, its present owner. In 1840, he formed an outstation close to the base of Cornwallable, on one of three rivulets which fall into a swamp, and which, on issuing from it, at its southwest extremity, compose the Narwong Creek. These, on the side next the mountain, always continue to run, however hot or long the dry season may be. But in general, for two or three months after the first of January, the Narwong ceases to run. The water from the mountain being evaporated and lost in the swamp where it has no channel and is spread out over a large surface among long grass and rushes in dry summers the dandenong along its whole course also ceases to run for one two or three months and like many other creeks in australia it spreads out ere it reaches the sea into a swamp where a great portion of its water is lost and evaporated in the way that has just been described Throughout the period of Mr. Claw's residence in Tirhatjian, his family was very frequently visited by the aborigines belonging to the Yarra Yarra and Western Port tribes. They often encamped near his house. They were uniformly treated with kindness, and in return they always conducted themselves peaceably and honestly. While encamped on the Melbourne side of the Dandenong, till a bridge was made for crossing the cattle and dray, his party was visited by a number of blacks, 
but the day after he crossed about a half a mile from his tents an old man was found alone beside a crab hole in which was a little water but he was without food and shelter he had been left there by his tribe because he had fallen from a tree and was so lame that he was incapable of accompanying them on a hunting excursion to cornwarhabal he was removed to the tents for he could not walk and was taken care of till his people returned but as they did not do so in less than a week it was difficult to conceive how he could have survived so long had he not been removed to the tents and fed for the kindness shown him he was very grateful he appeared to be the oldest member of his tribe but lived many years after that time and often referred to the occurrence which first brought him to mr claw's acquaintance but never did so without the most evident satisfaction and thankfulness not very long after Tirhatian station was formed jack weatherly who was one of the finest looking and most intelligent of the natives was applied to by mrs claw in melbourne to carry some biscuits to her son as she was apprehensive that his provisions must have been expanded and as owing to the state of the country after a heavy fall of rain it seemed to be the best if not the only way she could send him a supply he readily agreed to carry four dozen of biscuits to the station a distance of seventeen miles on the very easy terms that he should have six to himself with evidently great delight he stowed away his own in his dress took up the bag containing the rest and the note which was to be delivered along with it and walked away apparently quite proud that he was trusted however a few miles before he reached Turhatian, he fell in with a hunting party and being one of the most athletic and expert of his tribe he could not resist the temptation to join in the chase but before he did so he handed over the note and biscuits to a young man with strict injunctions to take them on and deliver them immediately and accordingly they were so delivered contrary to the generally expressed opinion at the time weatherly was dispatched for it was well known that the aborigines were particularly partial to bread and biscuits and it was therefore inferred that the temptation to appropriate those which he had in charge would prove too strong for his moral courage to resist this trifling incident is a pleasing illustration of the trustworthiness of two of their aborigines and reflects favourably on the whole tribe for it is not unreasonable to suppose that there were others belonging to it who if they had been employed in the same way would have acted in a similar manner as to their honesty no instance to the contrary was ever detected by Terhatian. potatoes and melons were two articles of which they were very fond and were produced at the station and quite accessible but never was a single instance known of any of them being stolen by the aborigines they would not even go to a potato field that had been dug to look for potatoes without first asking and obtaining leave the principal annoyance resulting from their so much frequenting the run was occasioned by old murray's dogs that sable chieftain who never could be induced to adopt any part of white fellow's dress always travelled with a large pack and as necessity compelled him to train them to the principle of self-reliance for a livelihood they were very ready to hunt the cattle and if possible make some little calf their victim at the time the Tirhatian station was formed some of the natives expressed a determination to be vengeance on one of the servant men as soon as they saw him there they recognized him as one whose conduct towards some of their women before he came into mr claw's service had given them great offence he confessed that he had been to blame and asked for his discharge which was immediately given him and he was safely returned to melbourne it is probable that had they had an opportunity they would have murdered him but in doing so they would have done more than has been done by many europeans though in a more refined way like other savages they are naturally revengeful but it is to be feared that on too many occasions their atrocities have not been committed without grievous provocation the next settler on the dandenong was mr thomas napier who now resides in the parish of juta gala his run which he took up about october eighteen thirty nine lay along the western side of the creek and extended to the terhatian bridge to scotts bridge both 
About a year afterwards he sold it to Mr. Scott, who died in Melbourne before he went to live there, but it was occupied by Mrs. Scott and family for two or three years, when they formed a small station on the other side of the creek, and sold the other to a family of the name of Drew. It was afterwards subdivided and occupied by a number of small settlers who were principally employed in taking timber from that neighbourhood to Melbourne and other places for the purposes of building and the enclosing of purchased land. Two brothers of the name of Rook, who were in the first instance sawyers on Mrs. Scott's original run, formed the station which the elder brother took holds near the sources of the Dandenong. The aboriginal station of Nere Nere Warren was formed by Mr. Assistant Professor Thomas, and it is so well known that it is unnecessary for me to give you any account of it. The first settlers below the Dandenong Bridge, and beyond the run belonging to Messrs. Lonsdale and Langhorn, were Mr. Solomon and Major Fraser. The former had a station above the swamp, through which the Dandenong passes, and the latter had his below it on the bay of Port Phillip. About six miles in a north-easterly direction from Jerhatchian, on the south side of the principal stream which descends from the mountain of Korhan Warhabal, and which mainly contributes to form the Nariwang Creek below the swamp, is the sheep station of Mombolu, which was first occupied by Monsieur's Kerr and Dobe. It is small and scrubby, and has passed through many hands since its formation. On the south-east of Monbolly is a small cattle station of Will Will Rock, originally formed and still possessed by Mr. Farquhar and his family. About the month of January 1850, during one night and a part of the succeeding day, an unusual noise, somewhat resembling that of a bush fire at a distance, was heard at Turhatchian, and at an night station about three miles off, situated near the gap in the ranges behind Nere Nere Warren. At the former place it was heard by Mrs. Claw and others living there. She rose in the night time and looked out to see if any of the huts was on fire, and during the day she went repeatedly into the veranda in front of the house to listen, and as the noise seemed to come from the rises on the west side of the creek, she sent two persons as far as the bridge, with a view to ascertain what it was. On their return they said they could not tell, but that, when they were at the bridge, the noise seemed to be at the house. The overseer happened to come, and she spoke of it to him, but he said that he had not noticed any unusual sound, neither did he then perceive any. He was in a hurry and went off immediately, but, happening to go to an outstation at the mountain gap, he was asked by the two men there, both of whom had resided in the colony, only a short time, and were therefore perhaps more liable to be easily alarmed, whether the fire was coming that way. He said he did not know of any fire. They told him that they had not slept during the night, for they had heard a noise as of a great fire at a distance, and were afraid it was coming in that direction, and that they could still discern it. He was thus forcibly reminded of what he had just before heard, and though going a little way to arise, he listened and acknowledged that he could distinctly hear a noise similar to that which had been described, but could not tell what occasioned it. As heard by Mrs. Claw, the noise was not always the same, but rose and fell, and after dying away for a little, would begin again and gradually increase. To some it seemed to be in the air, but the prevailing impression on her mind at the time, and that to which she is still inclined, is that it was subterranean. It will perhaps be considered corroborative of this opinion that, on two previous occasions, an earthquake had been distinctly heard and felt there. The first was experienced in February or March 1843. It occurred at midnight when the moon was full, the sky cloudless, and the wind still. To me and others who heard it at Terhatian, the sound was as if a light conveyance making a sharp rattling noise passed rapidly between the house and the kitchen these buildings being about eight yards apart the tremor though distinctly felt was not great but at the outstation near the base of the mountain both the shock and the noise were very considerable the two men sleeping in the hut were instantly roused and ran out to ascertain 
what was the matter. But neither seeing nor hearing anything unusual, they conjectured what had happened. And as the shock was experienced in the same manner at Rook's station, about five miles off, it would appear that it was severest along the base of the mountain. The second shock was felt in 1847 at the same season of the year. It occurred at four o'clock in the afternoon and was experienced at the same time in Melbourne and other adjacent places. Those in the house of Terhatchian, when they felt it moving, ran out in alarm, not doubting for a moment what it was, and a party that were out riding in the direction of the mountain heard it, and were struck with the noise as an extraordinary one. But, instead of ascribing it to an earthquake, they thought it was caused by horses galloping in the bush. Although the sound which has been described is not likely to have been produced by the action of wind on the forest, as the weather at the time is said to have been calm and settled, and although Mrs. Claw was then and still is of opinion that it was subterranean, yet perhaps it is possible that it was occasioned by currents of air in the atmosphere, but so elevated as not to disturb any objects on the face of the country, at least not in that immediate neighbourhood. It had often been observed that the wind blew very partially in that locality. Narrow belts of the forest, scarcely a quarter of a mile broad and several miles long, might be seen on the run, strewed with fallen branches and uprooted trees, showing that a hurricane had swept along that tract, whilst the forest on both sides remained uninjured, and it was no uncommon thing for one to witness the top of trees bending and tossed about in wind in wild commotion, though not broken down although only a narrow strip, and to hear the sound thereby occasioned, as then, on the surface of the earth, and within very circumscribed limits, so at some elevation above, very partial and very powerful currents of air may sweep along, and if they sometimes fly, with increased and sometimes with diminished speed, as in a hurricane or typhoon, the swelling and subsiding of the noise which was heard might be thereby occasioned. No doubt it is difficult, if not impossible, to conceive how currents of wind in the atmosphere alone could make a noise, as in order to produce it. Something opposing or retarding the current of air seems to be absolutely required. End of section 15. Recording by Chad Horner. Section 16 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter number 16 from J. M. Clough, Jr. Pine Plains. On the 23rd of August, 1847, the application for this run was accepted and registered in favor of J. Clough, Jr., by the commissioners of the Wimera District. Owing to the scarcity of water between it and Lake Kindmarsh, the distance being 50 miles, no stock was put upon it until the month of May, 1848. As the scarcity continued, the sheep were removed in November of the same year. In April 1849, the right of station was sold to Andrew Russell, Esquire, Merchant, Melbourne, for fifteen pound. It has been used as a winter outstation by him. The Womera River, however, has at last forced its way through the desert, and along a former channel, into this tract of country, and inundated it to such an extent that it is doubtful whether it was not more valuable in its former state than now. The water obtained there in 1848 was from a well twenty feet deep. It was sunk chiefly through the old red sandstone formation, and the spring of water fallen in with underneath it appeared to be a very strong one. The pasturage, on the beds of the present lakes and on the slopes of their banks, was of the best description, consisting much of salsolaceous herbage. Some of the Lake Kinmarsh tribe 
having been taken to assist in driving the stock hither, and in finding water for us on the journey, it obtained for us a friendly reception from the aborigines of this isolated track. For months afterwards it existed, until the overseer, one night about eleven o'clock, fired at what he supposed to be a wild dog rushing the sheep in the yard, but which, unfortunately, turned out to be a black fellow. The aim was fatal, the ball the pistol going through his head. This tract of country was frequented by both the Murray and Wimera River blacks. The Murray is distant sixty miles. I am given to understand that this run, which contains or did contain sixty square miles of good pasture land, was sold about a month ago for fifteen hundred pound. This was solely for the right of station. J. M. Clough End of Letter 16section seventeen of letters from victorian pioneers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo letters from victorian pioneers letter number seventeen from J. M. Clough. About thirty miles to the westward of Lake Hindmarsh lies the large sandy desert, through which the boundary line between the Victorian and South Australian territories runs, the most northwesterly tract of pastoral country in the Wamira district at that point, and forming a bay on the edge of this desert, was first occupied under pastoral lease by me in the month of may eighteen forty seven it is of the finest description of sheep country very openly timbered but scantily watered it is dotted with swamps of no great depth but the bottom being of tenacious clay they except in the droughty seasons now contain sufficient water for the wants of the stock since they have been when dry well trodden by the sheep grazing on them. I found the sole aboriginal occupants of that isolated tract to be one man of great muscular strength and proportions, his three women and two children, the custom of each head of a family being by inheritance or conquest the acknowledged proprietor of a certain tract of the territory of the tribe to whose chief he owned allegiance, over which the others were understood to hunt by sufferance from him. I found to prevail amongst the Wimera and Lake Hindmarsh tribes. What I took up as a run was his portion of it. Although this native, whom I shall call Geordie, his English name, as I forget his aboriginal name, was apparently on the best of terms with his tribe. Yet they hinted that it was his prowess, not right, that maintained him in possession of such a large tract of their territory, and more than his share of the women, when there were so many without one. Whereby hangs a tale of the deep treachery which they exercised a few months after my arrival to dispossess him of both, and all was so well planned that he did not seem to have the least apprehension of any impending danger. One evening, some fifteen or twenty men of the tribe arrived at my station from the direction of Tatiara, whither they stated they had been to procure the rods of a water plant, with which they formed the heads of their spears, bundles of which they had with them, in their crude state, and they were on their return to the lake. They appeared to be very much fatigued with their day's journey and very soon encamped, about three hundred yards from our huts, having first prevailed on Geordie, who was encamped within fifty yards of us, to join them at their encampment, which he did without reluctance, as they showed him a good deal of deference, more from the position of Lord, which his prowess had acquired for him, than as vassal to their chieftain, who was amongst the number. When I saw them lounging round their fires that night, 
they counterfeited their intentions so completely by laughing and joking with each other that i was quite unprepared for the tragedy of bloodshed which i witnessed on the following morning the first shades of daylight were just dawning when the shrieks of the women rang through the forest on reaching the outside of the hut i heard that peculiar sound which the men utter when engaged in fighting when in the act of throwing any of their rude instruments of warfare as the hour was the one usually chosen by a hostile tribe to make their onslaught of revenge i concluded that they had been attacked by the tatiara blacks who had perhaps followed them up quickly to square a debt of blood with them by the time that i had dressed sufficiently to go and see the fight all was hushed except the low wailing lamentations of some women a sure indication that there lay a corpse it being yet too dark to see in one tableau their camp and surrounding forest i made for the wailing on reaching the group which consisted of two of geordie's wives and two or three men who were winding a blanket round a corpse which was lying about halfway between their camp and my hut the men preserved a determined silence to all my inquiries and it was from the women that i ascertained the corpse was their late husband and that he had been murdered by some of the men who had been encamped with him he had been attacked by nine or eleven men at once who springing from their fires poured their spears into him as he lay awake at his he jumped from his lair they said and made for our huts snapping the spears which were in his body close by the flesh as i found to be the case on walking from the corpse to their camp where the remnants lay on either side of his track he had got about halfway before he received the mortal wounds from two jagged mallee spears which now lay alongside of the corpse and were covered with blood from point to tip from their having been drawn through his body to get them out as the two spear wounds did not cause instantaneous death they rushed in with their waddies and gave the finishing stroke to the deed of blood by the time that the day had dawned the murderers had decamped and were then many miles on their way to the lake impatient to recite to the council of war which had deputed them to the task the successful termination of the stratagem those who remained maintained that they had neither previous knowledge of what was to take place that morning nor participation in the murder and the testimony of the women corroborated the statement that they took no part in it in the small open plain where the corpse lay we interred it my men dug a grave and having secured the top well with stones to prevent the wild dogs disinterring it crowned its summit with a murdered man's spears and other instruments of war which remained there till some sacrilegious white hand removed them the three women and the orphan children left immediately afterwards the men told me that it was the custom of their tribe for the women after the death of a husband to secrete themselves in the bush for a week or two and that after a certain time a week or two they become the wives of the first man who finds them my informant i saw afterwards in possession of one of them the aborigines in this tract of country subsist chiefly on a variety of roots which are very abundant possums small kangaroos called kama which frequent the edge of the mallee scrub an occasional emu the fruit or flower of the stunted honeysuckle very prevalent in the desert and mana in the autumn when the hot weather prevails birds are easily caught by them in the following manner they conceal themselves in an arbor of boughs close to the small remnants of surface water or at wells and snare the birds by laying a gin attached to the end of a rod where the birds must or are most likely to stand when they come to drink having secured their victim they draw the rod in and by having the same snare attached to the end of the rod they can set it again without leaving the arbor or frightening other birds away by showing themselves while at this station i made several excursions into the large desert 
with the view of discovering new tracts of pastoral country. We first went in a westerly direction. After proceeding about fifteen miles into it, from the side next my run, we came to a steep ridge of sand hills, about two hundred or three hundred feet above the adjacent desert. The surface of them was composed of nothing but loose drift sand, and they were covered with a few stunted bushes. When on the summit, they appeared to be a chain of hills running from where we ascended them northerly as far as the eye could reach. To the westward, we saw nothing but an unbroken expanse for the next twelve or fifteen miles of the same dreary wilderness that lay around us. Some months afterwards, when seventy miles further north, on the course of the Wamera, we again struck a westerly course and encountered the same chain of hills, still possessing the same features and bearing in the same direction. Interspersed but very distant from each other on this desert are oases of a few acres, where the eucalyptus and other trees grow with a fair sprinkling of grass. As the soil of them is very clayey, it was only on them that we found surface water to drink. The whole eastern extent of it is a loose white sand, covered chiefly with a very prickly grass, which grows in large tufts and is so stiff in the blade that it causes the horse's legs to bleed as they travel over it. Also, with stunted mallee and a very diminutive species of the honeysuckle tree, the flowers of which the natives crush and steep in water, in order to obtain what is to them a sweet and nourishing drink. The emu and the loan are the only birds of size on it. The former frequents the open desert, the latter the mallee thickets. A remarkable feature of the small portion of country I observed to be that it blew a strong fresh breeze both day and night, below which it seldom moderated, but occasionally increased to a tornado. One swept along with devastating fury in the month of December the same year. It passed over an outstation, snapping even trees of two and three feet diameter in two, about five or six feet from the ground, and lopping off the boughs of those it did not carry down. The tent in which the men were living was carried off into the swamp about half a mile, and few of the pannikins and plates were found again. It seemed to be confined to about half a mile in width. Owing to the constant current of air, I never saw any dews while there. As most of the Wimera district was settled the year before I went there, I cannot give a correct statement of the deportment of the aborigine to the squatters when the latter first took possession of the territory. With regard to Geordie's behavior on the occasion of my taking up the run, he attempted a day or two after our arrival to disarm one of the hut keepers while in the hut with him, but failed, and luckily the man had presence of mind not to shoot him. We saw no more of him for two or three weeks. When he came back, he seemed ashamed of having violated the confidence we had reposed in him, ridiculed his attempt on the hut-keeper, and apparently had made up his mind to have his little territory invaded by the sheep. At shearing time, I found him and the other blacks very useful, placing all the flocks in their charge, as I was obliged from a scarcity of sharers in that out-of-the-way place to employ all the shepherds in shearing the sheep. I never found them to have appropriated any to their own use. I sold this run, which I called Bailrook, from the desert on which it lay, to Mr. George Urquhart in the following December. It has subsequently passed from his hands to Mr. Broughton, the present holder. Its registered extent is fifty square miles. It is bounded by the runs of Major Firebrace, formerly Grants, Mason, and Little. End of section 17。section 18 from Letters from Victorian Pioneers。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。
Recording by Beth Thomas, Melbourne, Victoria. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 18. From Captain Foster Fyans. Arrived by order of General Sir Richard Burke at Geelong in 1847, where, according to the General's directions, I was to take an absconded felon on my staff. This man had been a resident near Geelong for thirty-three years, and was therefore well acquainted with all the natives in that locality. My orders from the general, being to assemble as many of the natives as possible, for the purposes of knowing their numbers in this part, due notice was given, and we succeeded in making a large muster of two hundred and seventy-five of all classes, men, women, and children. The general sent bales of blankets, slop clothing, dresses for the females, shoes, and a large quantity of flour and tea, and two dozen of tomahawks, not issued, but thrown into the Murrabul River. These articles were all divided among the natives. Unfortunately, a few blankets were deficient, whereupon the native men unprovided set up a yell, and became almost frantic, a state of things which instantaneously became general, and the assembly demanded more and more every minute. Fearing bad results from my visitors, from their general demeanour and manner, and becoming somewhat apprehensive, I ordered my two constables to load, and my ten convicts to fall in close to my hut. The natives saw this preparation, and I kept some distance from them with my double-barrel gun, accompanied by Mr. Patrick McKeever, district constable also armed. It had the effect of making the natives retire, the interpreter Buckley telling them to do so. I was exceedingly happy at the result, not having the slightest trust in Buckley, and, I may now add, my conviction is that the natives assembled wishing an opportunity to murder every person in the place. After this escape, I never permitted more than a few to approach the place, when they were kindly treated and provided with some salt pork, which was not such a delicacy as mutton, but fresh meat was not to be had, and sheep were extremely dear and scarce. A few days followed. I saw a native in a rage take a child, giving it many blows, and eventually catching it by the leg and battering its head against a gum tree. This was on the opposite range of the river. On my arrival at the spot, which took some considerable time on account of the river winding so much, when I reached the tree I found evident marks that the child had been killed and taken from the place, but there was not one native to be seen. A station at the Lee was attacked. Two men in charge defended a few hundred sheep, driving them before them to another station. I saw some four natives that had been shot dead. I investigated the affray, and gave much credit to the men for their good conduct. Buninyong, only fifty miles from Geelong, was thought a great discovery. Some few of the settlers removed to that locality, where many disturbances took place. Shepherds were murdered and sheep stolen. On numerous occasions I have had to visit the place on complaint of the settlers, and also that I might have it in my power to gain information as to the reported depredations of the natives. I felt convinced of these depredations, and generally found the origin of theft and murder was from an over-intimacy on both sides, the women ruling, depraved, and bad. So much of this existed that there was hardly a shepherd without disease. Large families of natives, husband, wife, boys, and girls, were eaten up with venereal disease. The disorder was an introduction from Van Diemen's Land, and I am of the opinion that two-thirds of the natives of Port Phillip have died from this infection. During 1837 and 8 and 9, as the country began to be occupied, I had many journeys to stations of from 40 to 50 miles, Colac and Buninyong being the most distant. In all my investigations, I found where life was lost that blame was attributable to both sides. To the jealousy of the native and over-intimacy of the hut-keeper or shepherd, who was one day feeding the natives and the day following beating and driving them from the place. In 1840 I was made commissioner of Crown Lands. I had 18 troopers. These men were soldiers who were sentenced by court-martial when serving in America for desertion to transportation to New South Wales. I never met with a more orderly or steady set of men. They had their horses always in good order and were ready and willing to perform their duty. No pay was allowed by the government, and their only remuneration was the common ration. For the seven years I held the office of Commissioner of Crown Lands, I had only one man who left me. He deserted to Adelaide. Every man I had could have followed him, and that too well mounted. I am glad to say, to their credit, not a man followed his example. In 1839, the squatters in Portland Bay District were very limited in number, not exceeding a dozen. In 1840, very few joined them, and the revenue and licenses did not exceed £150. In 1842, the district began to become of some notice, and a vast number of most respectable establishments appeared. In 1843 and 1844, the district was rapidly filling. 
and during 1845 and 1846 there were 400 licenses granted in a country almost without a European in it in 1839, and nearly as large as England. Mr. Gisborne was the Commissioner of Crown Lands for Port Phillip, which was divided when I was appointed. I may remark on the Portland Bay District, knowing it for years, and having ridden over it some 34,000 miles, that a finer or a more beautiful country cannot be. There are parts sandy and barren, but generally the ground is useful, many parts possessing great advantages for pastoral purposes, and many bits of ground being fitted for immediate agricultural purposes, I may safely say, without an outlay for grubbing a tree, so different from New South Wales, where every one cleared is attended with a serious expense. The district is exceedingly well provided with water, many of the waterholes are everlasting, and there are besides reaches of rivers and many fine and valuable springs. In 1839, by order of Sir George Gipps, I left Geelong to proceed to Portland Bay. I was allowed three mounted police and seven horses. Mr. Smith of the Survey Department had orders to attend me. The distance is about 220 miles. At that time the squatting stations were chiefly about the towns. We proceeded, bringing provisions on a pack horse. We experienced great difficulties and obstructions. In many instances we had to return for miles, the country being impassable, and seek another route. We were two days endeavouring to cross the Stony Range, and had to return to Mount Eels without water. We found ourselves surrounded by, I suppose, a hundred and fifty natives, following us with their spears, yelling and brandishing their waddies. On leaving the range we halted at a tea-tree scrub, where we found water. We were cooking some pannikins of tea, when we heard the native cooey in every direction. This subsided. I suspected that the natives were close to us. I walked down the creek with my gun, first ordering the men to stand to their horses. I returned and told Smith that the creek, I thought, was full of natives. We took some tea, mounted, and rode about fifty yards, when a formidable number, at least a hundred and fifty natives, jumped from the brushwood in the creek, making after us for some miles. We escaped them and met others, but none would approach us. No inducement could persuade them. We chased one to endeavour to make him find water for us near Mount Rouse. He ran fast and got to a tree, climbing it like a monkey, and letting fly behind on some of the party as he ascended to his utmost satisfaction. We were eighteen days before we reached Portland after leaving Port Ferry. On our left we met many obstructions on the flat grounds and large swamps in that part of the country, which is intersected so much by two small rivers that with difficulty, after some days of consultation as to what we should do, as our stores were all expended, whether to push on or return, we came to a determination to endeavour to gain the high ground, which we fortunately did on that evening. After spending a truly miserable night with nothing to eat, plenty of rain and a good fire, we were glad at daylight to proceed again, when, to our great joy, we saw a vessel at anchor in the bay. We descended towards the beach when our hearts failed us. We were pulled up by a large river in front of us. Another consultation took place when one of the policemen said, Let us go on to the sea. In the former instance, Smith thought to keep up the river was our only plan, which we did. Smith swam across with a sabre in his mouth, and got on the sandhills whence he could see the river, which close to the sea became a large lagoon. On returning, he explained it was useless to follow down. Therefore the party kept up following the river, and rounding some large lagoons. In the second instance, we took the advice of an old policeman. We reached the beach, where a hard sand answered as a good road. Had we in the first instance travelled down to the beach, we could have crossed in like manner, for the river in this neighbourhood has an entrance into the sea. We reached Portland in a few hours, receiving a hearty welcome from Mrs. Henty, who kept a whaling establishment, and were the only residents in the place. I had His Excellency's order to make some investigations, and after a rest of three days, our party proceeded towards the Glenelg, to a station held by Mrs. Henty and the Mrs. Winter on the Wando River. After finishing my business in two days, we purchased some provisions to carry with us on our return home. After crossing the Wannon River, we made a new route almost east, and met with no kind of obstruction, and were only one day without water. We reached along on the fifth day after leaving the Glenelg. I may remark during this journey we did not meet with any natives. The country was desolate and uninhabited, and was covered with rich kangaroo grass, three and four feet high. At that time I considered the country beautiful, particularly in passing Mount Sturgeon, and the long range of conical hills for many miles towards what is now called Mount William. We passed Terranallum Hill, now called Mount Elephant. Since the journey I have again visited all these parts. On the hill, Mount Sturgeon, a large stone sits in a cradle. One or two of my policemen moved the stone. It is nearly round. Terranallum has a large crater, like every other hill in this part. 
also basins, some of them of great depth, and two or three miles in circumference. Three great beauties of the kind are close to Timboon. The country between Timboon and the Hopkins River would remind any person lately from home of a nobleman's park, with the expectation of coming soon to a magnificent house. Many a dreary ride I have had over this magnificent, splendid country, lying waste and idle, with an odd flock of sheep here and there, and fine fat bullocks with a hundred of square miles to roam over. This land for agricultural purposes none can surpass, and it would maintain thousands and thousands of people by common industry, with a yearly surplus of grain, enough to feed the entire population of Victoria to this 17th day of August, 1853. It lies, as formerly for years, in the hands of a few squatters at the nominal yearly rental of a squatting license, which is nothing like the value of the ground. The country for many miles about Colac nothing can surpass in its fine, rich soil. The lake is in circumference about, I suppose, fourteen miles. A few years ago it became almost dry. On visiting it, it was my opinion that it would in a few years become a large swamp. Of late years it has regained its waters, so much so, in May 1852, that its banks were overflowed, the water rushing over the plains into the Barwon and Lee, and causing the wonderful flood on the 20th of May 1852. At Geelong, the Barwon River rose about twelve feet higher than the highest flood experience since my arrival in 1837, destroying a vast deal of property, and carrying the bridge away on Barwon River, Geelong, and also several others. The squatting population consists of such various classes of persons that it is impossible to speak of it as a body. Many of the squatters are gentlemen, worthy and excellent men of undoubted character and well connected at home. Mount Emu is a beautiful country. A noble pack of hounds was kept up by gentlemen squatters who met every season, hunting twice or thrice a week and meeting at each other's houses where good cheer and good and happy society were ever to be met. I have sat down with thirty gentlemen at Mr. Goldsmith's to an excellent dinner given by that gentleman. There was an ample provision of all that was good set before his guests, who one and all had hearty and joyful faces, talking of tomorrow and the day's sport before them. We retired to rest on our shakedowns on the floor at eleven o'clock. At daybreak the master of the hounds, a squatter, sounded his bugle, shortly after his second for breakfast and in half an hour his third bugle, when a fine pack of dogs let loose from the kennel appeared, full of life and glee, led away by the well-known master of the hounds, Compton Ferrers, followed by thirty well-mounted gentlemen squatters. The game was not far distant. In half an hour we came upon the scent of a native dog. He had a long start. The pack took up the scent and followed breast high. The ground was rather moist. Some horsemen were thrown out, but there were twenty in at the death, after passing over sixteen miles of ground without one check. The wild dog is noble sport, and as to the day I speak of, I doubt even if Leicestershire ever turned out a better pack or a better set of sportsmen in a field during a season. On the following day, I had the pleasure of again meeting the same party, and on many occasions after this. I may now remark in a country like this, where dissipation prevails, among this class of gentlemen squatters in no instance did any man exceed or forget that he was a gentleman. Another class of squatters is a kind of shop boys. A plain man can barely approach them. They have wonderful sources of wealth and comfort, with dirty huts and no comfort, but with plenty of pipe-smoking, grumbling, and discontent. For seasons, a hut would be just the same. On one side of the door you will see an aged tobacco plant. There is no garden, no vegetables, but bones, rotten sheepskins, and filth in plenty. Inside the door there was often a large hole in the mud floor worn by the heels of persons going in, and if not aware of this, ten to one that you had a chance of upsetting the table, tin dishes, and greasy mutton chops. As to beds, this gentry are not particular. I lay on one for hours in great torment, tired and wishing for sleep. I envied five or six who were snoring close about me. Sleep I could not, from something hard and long under my loins. I took my knife, cut the sacking, when I pulled out the leg of a sheep with a long piece of the hide as crisp as toast. Here is a country yielding all that man can require for only a little labour. It abounds in a class who care for nothing except self-interest. For years they have the same hut, not so much as a drop of milk. For breakfast, hyson skin mutton chops swimming in fat and damper, damper and fat chops for dinner, hyson skin and the same for supper. No deviation, even in Lent. Another class consists of old shepherds. I have known this class to grow rich, the master poor, and in time the worthy would become the licensed squatter. I have known many of them to become wealthy, and some who did not forget themselves, but most were out of their places, and it would have been better for the community had they remained shepherds rather than become masters. 
Litigation is a favourite rule, and almost anything can be gained by an overwhelming evidence. I stated that on my arrival I mustered 275 natives. So many years have passed over that at the present day, August 22, 1853, I feel assured that not more than 20 Aborigines are living about Geelong. Some were children when I came, and within the lapse of these few years have become aged and decrepit. The life of the Aborigines cannot be of long duration, and I am of opinion longevity is unknown. Ballyang was held up to be more respected than any native in this place. He was remarkable for his good conduct, decency and good order. He was very polite, constantly sending presents of oysters and bustards. He was a particular friend of mine. By some means he became possessed of an old musket, on which I on many occasions told him to be careful or he would shoot himself, urging that it would be better for him to use his spear and boomerang. He laughed, saying the gun was better. This remarkably fine old man went to the Werribee River to shoot bustards. As he was one morning leaving his mere, on pulling the gun, the lock went off, and the contents of the charge went through his body. He died in a few minutes, leaving some three wives and four young boys. One of the boys is still living in Geelong or the neighbourhood. He cannot be more than nineteen or twenty years of age, but for a stranger to look at him, he must consider him an old man. Woolmudgeon was always with his relative, old Ballyang, until the latter died, when he lived with Mr. Fisher for some years. He was taken care of and well provided for on the establishment, his father having been killed, and his old friend Ballyang gone, so that he remained almost an inmate. As he grew rapidly, he became a man in a few years. His habits changed, he withdrew himself for weeks. On returning, he would only laugh at all questions put to him, saying, The bush better than house, plenty of grubs good as mutton. Of clothes he always had a good supply, but when he left in the morning well dressed, if he returned in the afternoon he was always naked. He placed no value on anything. The latter days of this youth, he was about twenty years of age, were spent in drunkenness and riot. He was nearly six feet high, a powerful and strong man, but disease and filth gave him the appearance of age. He died near Geelong from inflammation. Bon John, another of old Ballyang's tribe, lived with me for some four years. He was a stout lad, very civil and useful. He always attended me in the bush, and was often with me for a space of three or four months, going from one station to another, and during that time never seeing one of his tribe. I was passing Colac, and remained at Mr. Murray's for the night. The Colac tribe had a camp near at hand. Some seven men, accompanied by a couple of women, came to us covered with white paint, a death warning, the women's faces torn and bleeding, the men carrying spears, langeels and waddies. One spoke to Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray immediately told me their intention, that is, to kill my boy, Bon John. Pointing to the men, I told the boy, who in a cool way replied, I know it, I am ready for them, letting out a volley of abuse at the party. Taking his pistol and cocking it, Come on, Mary Jig, he cried to the doctor, who came for the purpose of extracting Bon John's kidney fat. He defied all. For safety, I made my boy stay inside the house all night. The natives remained lurking about for an opportunity to murder him. This animosity was caused by the death of a Colac native, which happened at a corroboree near Geelong. It was, therefore, needful that a Geelong native should die. On the following morning, a numerous collection presented themselves, demanding Bon John, with the promise not to kill him, but merely to extract the kidney fat. I asked him if he would be satisfied to undergo the operation. "'Me give,' said he, "'if you wish it,' showing his pistol's clean new flints and his sabre as bright and sharp as a razor. All he required from me was liberty to have a quarrel on the ground. We mounted and left. About two miles from Colac, we met some natives on their way to Colac from the mission station. Approaching us and seeing Bon John, they were quite taken aback and ran from us immediately. In fact, the party were on their way to partake of Bon John's kidney fat and femoral bits. The boy was very brave. In fact, he had no fear. He begged me to let him only kill the one with the big knife, stating that he would not fire, and pointing out one who had a fine lubra, saying, If you let me kill him, I'll get his wife. I had on many occasions tried the courage of this savage boy. Near Port Ferry in 1843, a shepherd was most barbarously murdered by natives, which attracted the attention of the police. I was out for many days with a party of seventeen mounted border police. The weather was cold and wet, and we suffered in many ways. We were on horseback from daylight to night, examining all the creeks and stony lands between Port Ferry and Umarella. We spent ten days in this way, and not a black did we fall in with. We were compelled to give up, owing to want of provisions and sickness. 
on the following morning, accompanied by Bon John, we set out to seek a passage for our dray in order to get away. We went about seven miles, and meeting with great obstacles, returned in another direction, finding a far better country. When we came within two miles of our camp, on turning a tea-tree copse, we met a most powerful native, and on asking questions, he related to Bon John that the clothes he had on belonged to the dead man at Mr. Ritchie's. It was a wet day. Bon John said, This is the fellow we have been looking for. Again asking him if he had been at Mr. Ritchie's, and inquiring about the man in the clothes, we were confirmed. We threw our cloaks off. The native dashed his spear through and through Bon John's. Bon John pulled out his pistol, snapped it, and missed fire pulled out his sabre, and dashed after him, when horse and all fell among the rocks and stones in a deep gully. We had all in our power to apprehend this savage, but we could not. He had four spears, langeel and shield. With one blow, he dashed the sharp end of the langeel through my horse's nose. As we came up with him, the tribe threw many spears at us, making off. The man was left to us. Jumping on a large mound of rocks and loose stones, he howled out, "'Come on, white bastards!' at the same time throwing his last spear at Bon John. He was not to be seen in a second. This native went into Port Ferry some days after, showing his shield with the sabre cuts on it. Some months after this, at Geelong, Bon John became quite changed. He no longer had a wish to follow me or wear his dress. Away with his tribe constantly, he came to me occasionally. He still had a strong grudge against the Colac tribe. He came to me one day, saying, One Colac fellow down here with a gin, and that he would kill him. I desired him not. He was as good as his word. He loaded a carbine, followed the unhappy black with his gun, and shot him dead. Bon John and the gin, who was now occupying his time and attention, came back, and ate, drank, and were merry. Hearing of the murder, I had Bon John apprehended. He was quite indignant, asking me if I had forgotten the tribe at Colac that wanted his kidney fat. Bon John was tried before Judge Willis, a most disreputable old rip, who I think was in consort with the devil, for though the evidence was clear, Bon John was most honourably acquitted, and handed over to another booby of fame, old Robinson, a native protector, to be educated, and told not to break the commandments. Bon John was killed shortly after this, in a scurry with some natives at a corroboree. Over the body of the Colac native an inquest was held. I took Will Mudgeon to see the remains. On showing him the head, the back part of the skull being carried away, he wept bitterly and threw himself on the ground, roaring and screaming. For many days he appeared in sad distress, and long and many a time he spoke of the deed to me, always repeating the words, Poor black fellow. These natives are all dead now, and as far as I can learn, only one remains of poor old Ballyang's friends. From long experience, particularly in Portland Bay District, I am convinced that the number of Aborigines in 1837 in this district could not exceed 3,000 and I feel thoroughly convinced that the race will be extinct in twenty years or less. In the district I met a native, his breast, arms, and body muscular and in fine proportions, his legs were like fins and not larger than those of an infant. This poor cripple followed his tribe, travelling many miles during the day. He sat in a piece of bark tied round his loins. Emus and kangaroos on our arrival were plentiful in all parts of the district, also bustards in large flocks from ten to thirty or forty or perhaps more. The bustards are now scarce, and only met with in distant places. The kangaroo and emu are nearly extinct in the district. The country is almost void of game. Quails in years gone by were plentiful, but I think are fast disappearing. Snipe we have in the season, but not in the same abundance as in other countries. We have also the painted snipe, the same bird that is met with in all parts of India. Black ducks, large and a delicacy, also various small ducks and wood ducks, etc., the bronze-winged pigeon, a fine game bird, fully equal to an English partridge, black swans, useless and ugly, snakes of many descriptions, and some exceedingly bold, more so than I have known them in India. The longest snake I have met did not exceed six feet. For an idler or a sportsman, this country affords nothing, and for a military officer it is the most damnable quarter in the world. There is nothing in the shape of sport, except in the season a few snipe and quail, then it ends until the next September." At the approach of the snipe season, when you seek your Forsyth or Joe Manton to brush it up for the sport, it is more than probable you will seek in vain, for some good and trusty servant has made it his own. Borrowing, as it is termed, these implements is common, but once taken by this class of gentry from your house, they are never regained. Of all the impositions inflicted on mankind, an inn in the district is the most dreadful abomination. It appears to me the licensee considers only one duty, that is, to persecute and victimise the traveller. 
The law makes provision for decency, but the landlord disregards it after a license is granted. His sole object is money. Not to make it honestly, by a return of common comfort, his bill is the object, and pay it you must, though five hundred per cent is overcharged. What could any man have in any part of England, staying at a hotel for a night, if he expended two pounds? I should think such an outlay among the middle classes would be unknown, but in Victoria the two pounds would not afford you a nobbler. You have to put up with the curses of an ill-looking ruffian, the landlord, who heartily wishes that you never again trouble him, as he is not over-fond of gentlemen beggars. The landlord is generally to be seen playing quoits in the front of the hut, with a pipe in his mouth, cursing and swearing, and surrounded by half a dozen idle drunken men, the stable-keeper always sticking close to his master, to swear by him right or wrong, for a nobbler. These games amuse some travellers, for a fight is generally the result. And in almost all instances, as one passes through the country, the landlord sports a black eye or two. The interior of the hut is generally built of wood and weatherboards. The floor is boarded, and a fine rattling breeze rushes in at all parts. Your company is not very refined, all smoking, spitting, singing loudly and rioting, cursing and damning the governors and formerly crowned lands commissioners. Horse races for saddles and bridles and cockfights are got up. You are told of fine bullock drivers, and that Tim was the fellow to shear sheep with flat contradictions now and again, which nearly lead to a bout, but often to the destruction of the landlord's all, in the shape of a half-dozen wine-glasses and his large assortment of tin pannikins. In short, one of these licensed huts may be turned inside out during a row, and be nothing the worse for it on the following morning. A fortune is realised soon in one of these district hotels, and when made, the landlord sells his goodwill of the place, always to a very good man, in short, the best man in the world, who once installed, is found to be a deeper vagabond than the former. These huts, though built on government land, are private property, transferred from one to another. Many pay for the goodwill eight hundred pounds, the house not being in value worth thirty pounds. A thousand pounds is commonly paid down, and I have known one thousand five hundred pounds paid in cash for a hut of this kind. The stable, as it is called, is a place tossed up of all manner of things. It has a kind of a roof, with slab sides of the rudest material, and is often dangerous in passing from old spike-nails and broken bottles. Dung and filth are there a foot or two deep. At the head of the stall is an old gin-case fixed as a manger for oaten hay. If you neglect your poor horse, not a bite of straw will he get. And if you order some oats to feed him, the hostler is generally nimble in getting and giving. He on this occasion is more than civil, as a profit falls to him, the corn being generally found by him, and the more profit the better for him. This worthy has his measure, and fills it to the brim. At the bottom he has his thumb-hole, whereby he deposits the best part back for himself. A man who has a horse almost has to fight for his grub, paying dear for it. At the present time, the expenses for a night for one horse in a bush inn will cost the owner twenty shillings. A licensed man keeping a bush inn can charge as he thinks fit, but his great game formerly, before the goldfields, was the shepherd or hut-keeper on his way to town with his cheque for perhaps a year or two years' wages. This unfortunate man was generally overwhelmed with kindness, made drunk, and kept so for three, four, or five days. On regaining his senses, he naturally seeks his hard earnings, which are not to be found. He applies to the landlord, who tells him that he is in debt, that the sixty pounds is expended. On asking, how? repeats the host, do you forget the shout you stood, the shout for all hands? You are in my debt now, five pounds, and I shall keep your gun and pack until I am paid, says the landlord, pushing the unhappy fellow from his door, perhaps without a rag to his back. For a new colony, only eighteen years inhabited, I consider that there is more vice than is to be found in any part of the world. On my arrival in Melbourne in 1837, Captain Lonsdale, 4th K.O. Regiment, was a police magistrate, having a guard of soldiers, some forty men. The captain had a very small wooden hut, the military one nearly as bad. The few houses about are unworthy of notice, excepting the police office. This was a square building, or nearly so. The walls were sods, and the roof was covered with sods, without windows or a door. From this rude state of things, and a lapse of sixteen years, the town of Melbourne has become a large, a populous, and almost an overgrown city, with a population of eighty thousand, and the surrounding country for miles covered with houses. In the annals of history, nothing equals the rapid progress of this wonderful place. 
The great mistake my good and worthy friend Sir Richard Burke made is in not placing Melbourne where Geelong is. In 1853, Oaten hay sold at thirty-five pounds a ton. Oats sold at one pound one shilling a bushel. Potatoes sold at thirty pounds a ton, or one pound fifteen shillings per bag. Beef sold at seven pence a pound. Mutton sold at eight pence a pound. Turkeys sold at two guineas or three on some days. Firewood cost from four to five pounds a load. Cart horses sold at one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty pounds. Saddle horses fifty to eighty pounds. Goats sold at two pounds. Eggs sold for five shillings a dozen. Cabbages sold at two shillings sixpence each. A servant cost sixty pounds yearly. In eighteen forty eight, twelve fine legs of mutton sold at five shillings. Beef prime at one and a half pence per pound. Mutton less. Oat and hay at three pounds per ton. Oats at two shillings sixpence per bushel. Potatoes at four shillings per hundred. Turkeys at three shillings sixpence each. Fowls were to be had for nothing. Eggs at sixpence per dozen. Good horses sold from ten pounds to thirty pounds. Goats at two shillings. Cabbages at six for a shilling. Firewood at seven shillings a load. A servant in house cost eighteen pounds yearly. As to Geelong, with many advantages over Melbourne, it is exceedingly backward. The trade of this place compared with Melbourne is a mere nothing. Our merchants are few, but good, honest, sterling men. But suffering as they do, great discontent prevails. Our ships and our letters generally go first to Melbourne. The only obstacle to our shipping is the bar. For years and years, application has been made by the inhabitants to the government for assistance in clearing it away. Not one shilling has been expended, excepting by the inhabitants, who have paid surveyors' expenses time after time. Their work hangs in an office, and the bar remains untouched, and is very likely to remain so for long and many a day. If this bar was removed, and shipping came up to the town, Geelong must become a place of vast importance. It has a fine harbour, and great advantages over Melbourne. That most excellent Governor-General, Sir Richard Burke, made a choice, and placed Melbourne where it stands. He also visited Geelong. He was delighted with the place and the country. He remained fourteen days, and having confirmed the site of Melbourne, I suppose he did not wish to alter it. This is to be lamented, for if Melbourne had been placed where Geelong stands, it would become as beautiful a city as is in the world. The locality is pleasing, cheerful, beautiful and healthful, with a fine rising situation, the scenery grand and magnificent. Melbourne does not possess one of these advantages, lying low, with bad approaches on every side. Geelong increases but slowly. A few years ago, the census gave a population of 7,000, but at the present time there must be a population of 25,000, which daily increases from all parts of the world. Notwithstanding the mix of people, the place is exceedingly orderly. We have four small steamboats between this and Melbourne daily, making fortunes for their owners. Large vessels lie at Point Henry, four miles across the bay, but small vessels under 300 tons come to the jetty and discharge. The chief trade of the town, until the times changed so much on account of the gold mania, was wool, tallow, and hides. Wool was a considerable item in the shipments. From 25,000 to 30,000 bales were embarked yearly at Point Henry, in large ships from 700 to 2,000 tons. But from the effects of the gold mines, I am of opinion that a great decrease will take place in the shipments of this article. You are aware of all the gold fields, the ruin of the colony. I shall never forget Mr. Wentworth, the watch-house is not fitted for a gentleman, and his bow to his honour, the superintendent, who was sitting in the corner of the slab hut on a stool with three legs, his honour's graceful recognition of the salute, his honour rising with dignity when the stool upset making a noise to the disgust of Mr. Pat McKeever, chief constable of Little Peddlington. The death of the black horse, the vet doctor, the CCL in giving copious glisters and bleeding, his honour sighing, the vet privately telling him there is no hope, the burial in paddock with a case of bricks to the memory of the departed. I remember well the doctor coming to the hut when we were at dinner. Here comes that infernal rip. Doctor enters. Host rises to greet him. How are you, doctor? Sit down and partake of something. We are so glad to see you. With a hearty shake of the hand. This paper is not signed, but has evidently been written by Captain Foster Fyans, Editor. End of Letter 18 
Section 19 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 19. From W. Odell Raymond. Stratford. Stratford, 15th of August, 1853. My dear Tyres, in reply to your note, enclosing me His Excellency the Governor's favour of the 29th of July, and requiring my reply on Wednesday at the latest, you give me but little time to collect my memory as to my first travels into this district, and certainly no time to enable me to address a letter to His Excellency upon the subject. I will therefore reply by giving you all the information I can bring to my memory, with the hope that you will put it in proper form, and at the same time express my regret at not being able myself to address His Excellency. The droughts of 1839, 1840, 1841, having caused great losses amongst our stock, sheep and cattle, at Wallington, where I had the management of my father's stations, I had recommended a removal of a portion of the sheep to the northward, and had fully made up my mind for a trip to New England with at least half our sheep. Just at this time, early in 1842, I got in possession of a pamphlet published by Count Streslecki, giving a description of Gippsland and pointing out by a chart the route into it. This caused me to immediately arrange for the removal of a portion of our stock to Gippsland, and I had in three weeks after seeing the work 8,000 sheep on the road. I, however, had not started when I received information that Mr. Albert Broadrib had started from Brathurst, with a number of sheep belonging to Mr. Reeve, for the same destination, and I believe upon the same information, the Count's work. I do not deem it required that I should enumerate all the casualties attending upon such a journey, say, seven hundred miles, but suffice it to say that I arrived— after many difficulties, at the Mitchell River, Gippsland, upon the 20th of June, 1842, after a constant travel for four months, with my stock and working cattle in better condition than when I left Wellington. With regard to that portion of His Excellency's letter, if preceded, accompanied, or immediately followed, by whom and when, and the general state of the district around and in advance of me at that period, I beg to state Mr. Curlewis's and Mr. Reeves' sheep preceded me a few weeks. Messrs. Lognan and Taylor, with sheep, cattle, and horses, joined company with me at Mancru. Mr. F. Jones at Omeo, and we travelled in company to the Mitchell River. As to the state of the district around and in advance of me at the period of my arrival, I am only able to refer you to a copy of a letter I wrote upon my arrival at Melbourne, at Mr. Parker's request for the information of Governor Gipps, as the only record of my first observations as to the state of Gippsland upon my arrival. Trusting that it may convey some of the information that Mr. Latrobe is requiring, I now conclude, begging that you will express my best wishes for His Excellency's safe arrival and happy meeting with his friends in Old England, and believe me to be, my dear Tyres, yours ever truly, W. Odell Raymond Letter forwarded by Mr. Raymond to Mr. Tyres Melbourne, 24th of August, 1842 Dear Parker, I should have before this written to you, according to my promise, but the sameness of the country through which I travelled, where you meet nothing pleasing to the eye or interesting to relate, induced me to defer writing up to this time, in the hope that I might be able to give you some information respecting Gippsland, which may not before have reached you. Count Streletsky's description of it as an agricultural and grazing country is fully borne out. In all my travels in New South Wales, for those purposes, I have not seen its equal. His chart, however, gives you a very incorrect idea of the courses of the rivers, as you will see by Mr. Townsend's survey, which I suppose will have arrived in Sydney before this. That part of the country marked in the Count's chart between Gippsland and Omeo as Buckley's and McAllister's stations is a very extensive country, and better suited for sheep than Gippsland, and I have no doubt the greater portion of it will be taken up next summer. 
The richness of the soil in Gippsland makes it, with the exception of small portions of it, less suited for sheep, but it is capable of feeding an immense number of cattle. The runs which I have selected are on the Avon River, and extend to a lake into which the river empties itself, and are a fine, open, undulating country, sound to the water's edge. I, however, do not consider them equal to those I occupied at Wellington, had we the same moisture as I am led to suppose we have in Gippsland. The lake itself is a very large sheet of water, which I suppose to be in width about twelve or fourteen miles from what I saw of it from the mountains when coming to Gippsland, I should imagine it to be from fifty to sixty miles long. The water when I visited it was brackish, but not too much so for stock, and we were soon able to enjoy a good pot of tea made with it after a long day's ride. I am, however, assured by Mr. Macmillan, Mr. McAllister's superintendent, and the first discoverer of this country, who had visited it three times in the summer months, that he never found it so before, and the only way in which I can account for this is that I suppose the rush of water into the lake at this time of the year is so great as to break through some outlet or sandbank, leaving a passage for the salt water to enter, which passage fills up in the summer months. I, however, intend on my return to make an excursion on the lake, and examine the coast side of it as well as the soundings, the particulars of which I will give you when I return to Sydney after shearing. I have not as yet fallen in with any of the aboriginal natives, but from what I can collect respecting them, they are a wild race, and have already committed some outrages on the settlers. There are already in Gippsland about 7,000 head of cattle, belonging to Messrs. McAllister, McFarlane, Arbuckle, Cunningham, Pearson, Jones, Taylor, and Lognan, and some small squatters who, I understand, do not hold licenses. 35,000 sheep, brought by Messrs. McAllister, Ker Lewis, Reeve, Taylor, and Lognan, Jones, and myself, and about 100 horses, and a population of 144 free men, 33 bound, 26 free women, and 17 children, most of them in service, the remainder living God knows how on the beach, where they have erected huts for themselves, waiting, they say, for the town allotments to be put up on sale. We feel the want of a police bench very much here. The servants do just as they like, work or walk away as they think proper, and are harbored by those people on the beach. If my father agreed to my proposition to bring down the remainder of our sheep and to reside there, I shall willingly do my best as a magistrate to keep the district in order, if His Excellency will give me the power by granting a court of petty sessions, a clerk, and a few constables, or perhaps a party of the border police, under the direction of a sergeant of the mounted police, would be more available in the district. Mr. Kerr Lewis, I understand, intends to reside in the district, so does Mr. Reeve, and these gentlemen would, I think, be eligible for appointment to the Commission of the Peace, and their services as magistrates would, I have no doubt, be of great advantage to the district. I arrived here last week after a very severe journey by way of Westernport. Mr. Albert Broadrib, Mr. Pearson, I, and my black fellow whom I brought with me from Wellington, started on the information of a Mr. Campbell, who stated that he had ridden for three days in the direction of Westernport, and had got sight of that place. Upon this information we took with us ten days' provisions and pack-horses to accompany us for two days. We, however, owing to the denseness of the scrub, found it impossible to bring the horses farther than the first day's journey, about fourteen miles. Consequently, we shouldered our pack, blessing the informer, and with great difficulty made about four miles that day. For fourteen days, during ten of which it rained without ceasing, we never could exceed eight miles in a day. On the fifteenth day we got into a lower and less broken country, the scrub still continuing, with water up to our knees, and our provisions, with the exception of a little flour and tea, were all exhausted. We, however, managed to exist to the end of the journey, upon what the black fellow could get in the shape of two pheasants, five monkeys, and a parrot, a small portion of which was served out in the morning with about two tablespoonfuls of flour, 
which we put to boil in a quart pot of water. In the evening, by way of change, we had the monkey and tea without sugar. In this way we lived for eight days, at times so exhausted that when we walked a mile or two we were quite done up, suffering severely from the cuts we got getting through the scrub, our clothes and boots being completely torn off of us, and it was, I can assure you, to our great joy on the eighteenth day that we made Western Port, when we were picked up by Mr. Surveyor Smith, who is surveying the coast, and who kindly conveyed us in his boat to Mr. Jameson's, and thence to Mr. Manton's, from whence we made this place, making the journey on foot in twenty-two days. As the mail by the tambo is about to be made up, I must now conclude, assuring you that I will at all times be most ready to give you any information as to the district that may be in my power, and remain, my dear sir, yours ever truly, W. Odell Raymond. Gippsland Footnote This document is not signed. It was found by Mr. Raymond among his papers, and forwarded by him to Mr. Tyers, along with the preceding letter. Editor End of footnote Population From 350 to 400, of whom 30 are bond Probable amount of revenue Licenses Reeve, Raymond, Curlewis, Cunningham, Duncan and Mason Lognan, Jones, McFarlane, McAllister, Macmillan, Arbuckle, Pearson, Scott, King. Four hundred pounds. There are several settlers squatting without license, keeping stores, grog shops, etc. If obliged to pay license, their licenses would produce Campbell, Bunton, Turnbull, Nielsen, Kennedy, Furnham, Cutts. Seventy pounds. Assessment for this half year. 7,000 cattle, 35,000 sheep, 150 horses, 120 pounds, 8 shilling, 4 pence. Assessment for next half year, adding 50%, 180 pounds, 12 shilling, 6 pence. Probable amount of revenue for 1843, 511 pounds and 10 pence. This amount is likely to be much increased as follows from the number of settlers going to Gippsland. Probable amount of customs duty now lost to the government. 3,600 pounds of tobacco, all can be landed free of duty from Van Diemen's land. Two public house licenses. 360 pounds. Spirits at an average of 10 shilling a gallon. 300 pounds. Total. 1,171 pounds and 10 pence. This is the amount of revenue that can be collected in Gippsland with proper officers. This is allowing 12 pounds of tobacco to each grown adult male per annum, known to be less than the average, and say each man spends 5 pounds per annum in drink. Of this, 4 pounds is for spirits at 40 shillings retail price per gallon. The Treasury has also received £10,260 for two special surveys at Gippsland, and also £5,120 for a third special there, but which has since been allowed to be selected elsewhere. The township is also being surveyed at this moment, and must bring a considerable sum to the land fund. End of section 19 Section 20 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 20 from Thomas Manifold. Warnamable, August 30th, 1853. Dear Sir, I received your letter of the 29th Ultimo, asking information as to the first occupation of various portions of the colony. This I have great pleasure in furnishing, so far as my recollections will admit. I shall therefore commence from my first connection with Port Philip. I first visited it for the purpose of examining it early in February 1836, at which time there were not more than about 2,500 sheep in the whole district, although fully twice that number had been shipped, but from casualties had been reduced to about the number I have named. 
one of my brothers and myself reached Jollibrand Point early in July, where we heard that a number of gentlemen on a pleasure party had been with the brig Henry into Geelong Harbour, and as we wished to settle westward, this at once determined us on attempting to land our sheep at Point Henry, then known by the native name Malopio. We succeeded in doing this, and I put the first sheep ever landed on the point ashore on the 9th of July, 1836. During the same day, Mr. John Stiglitz also arrived with stock. We immediately removed to the Mournable and occupied both sides of that river from Sutherland's Creek down to the old racecourse. At this time, there were only three stations west of the Werribee, that is Cowie, Steed, and Stiglitz at a place on the Morrible known as the Bell Post, Dr. Thompson's station at the falls on the Barwon, and a Mr. Dark on the Barrabool Hills. These, I believe, arrived and occupied the country in the order I have named them, having landed their stock either at the Heads or at Jellybrand Point. We were immediately followed by Mr. William Roadknight, who occupied the country on both sides of the river where the lower vineyards are. In the September, following a great influx of stock into the western district, took place by the arrival of Mr. Joseph Sutherland, who settled on the creek now bearing his name. Mr. G. Russell, on account of the Clyde Company and the Morrabool and Lee, Mr. David Fisher, on account of the Derwent Company, occupying where Geelong now is, indented head, and the country about the junction of the Barwon and Lee. A Captain Pollock went on to the Barwon, where the upper vineyard is, a Dr. Sharp, on account of Colonel Cowsall, taking the upper part of Sutherland's Creek, and Mr. John Hyatt, who remained, moving about a short time on the Barwon, finally removed into the Melbourne district. The above, to the best of my recollection, arrived during September and October 1836. I then, until the commencement of 1839, resided in Van Diemen's land, with the exception of occasional short visits, and cannot say in what order the country was taken up. In November of 1837, my brothers and self examined the country about Banyang, Warrenheap, and Lake Burrumbeet, and encamped one night on the now celebrated Golden Point, Ballarat, little dreaming of the immense wealth beneath us. At this time there were only two stations on the upper part of the Morrible, that is, that of Mr. J. N. MacLeod and that of Mr. G. F. Reed. It was in December of 1838 that my brothers first discovered Lake Purumbiti and Mount Lura country. We then abandoned our station on the Morrible, which became a kind of depot for stock on first arrival, and removed our stock to Purumbiti, which we occupied about the close of January 1839. The Messrs. Balden had a week or two previously occupied the run on the Piran Yaloak, which they soon after sold to Scott and Richardson. The next station formed was at Mount Norat, by a person named Taylor, on account of Messrs. MacKillop and Smith, who sold to Messrs. Neil Black and Co. This was taken up in March 1839. The Mount Shadwell country was now occupied by a Mr. Anderson, who removed from the stations now held by Macmillan and Wilson, Wardy Yellow, with a portion of stock belonging to Derwent Company, and soon afterwards fell into the hands of Captain Webster. Simultaneously with the occupation of Mount Shadwell, the Messrs. Watson discovered the Hopkins, and took up the Merang run on the western side, and then sold to Mr. Ferry. The land on the opposite side to Ferries was first taken up by the Monsieur Bolden in August 1840, and then sold to Mr. G. Roger. During the period from August to Christmas 1840, the Messrs. Bolden, by forming various outstations, occupied on the western side of the Hopkins all the country subsequently held by Messrs. Plummer and Dent, Strong and Foster, Manifold, Ryrie, Carmichael, Good, Mailer, Manning, Eddington, Walker, and Cosgrove, and on the eastern side, the part of the country held by Black, Johnson, Walker, Chris Holm, and Allen. I cannot name the precise time when each of these stations was occupied, but believe that Plummer and Dents, now Joseph Wears, was occupied about the latter end of 1842, or commencement of 1843, Strong and Foster's about the same time, 
Ryrie's, the lake station, in June 1844, my own, the Grasmere station, in the month following. The others were respectively portions sliced off the country claimed by the Messrs. Bolden. Allen's station was occupied first in 1841, and Chris Holmes, junction of Hopkins and Emu Creek, about the same time. In reply to your inquiries as to the haunts, numbers, etc. of the Aborigines, I am afraid I can give little or no information. Although each tribe has its own district, and each family its portion, I never could perceive that they became in any way attached to a particular spot, or attempted to construct a dwelling having any greater claim to permanency than the common Maya Maya. Nor have I ever observed the slightest semblance of religion among them. With respect to their number at the time the country was first occupied, it has been in all accounts I have seen very much overrated. I come to this conclusion from having counted their Mayamayas when congregated, and do not recollect in any instance seeing more than about thirty, nor do I think they would average more than from four to five in a hut. Their manner towards the first settlers had generally the semblance of extreme friendship, but this, I am convinced, did not in reality ever exist. It arose from the mere novelty of the thing, and a desire to gratify their curiosity, which, being satiated, they would, whenever they got a chance, plunder or murder even those from whom they had only a few minutes previously received presents and food. This may seem harsh, but I have known so many instances of it that I feel justified in speaking thus generally of them. Trusting the above may be of some little service, I remain, dear sir, yours truly, Thomas Manifold. To His Excellency, C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. End of section 20section 21 of letters from victorian pioneers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org letters from victorian pioneers letter 21 from george armitage hermitage october 6th 1853 dear sir in reply to yours of the 29th of July, requesting information as to the first settlement of the country adjacent to the Barwon and Glenelg rivers, in the first week of May 1836, I left Georgetown, Van Diemen's Land, with a small flock of sheep in the brig Henry. Five days after embarkation, they were landed at Williamstown, Port Phillip, where I found several, if not all, of the first settlers with their flocks, all of which had been brought from Van Diemen's land within the five or six previous months, and which were left in charge of the shepherds near the beach until suitable runs could be procured. I have no recollection of any serious depredations having been committed by the Aborigines at this time. The wild dogs were very numerous and troublesome, and destroyed several sheep. Their howling at night was terrific. While at Williamstown and Mr. Franks and I agreed to take up a run together, Mr. Franks was to select it. After making these arrangements, I left my sheep and shepherd, and returned to Van Diemen's land. About six weeks after, I received the melancholy intelligence of the murder of poor Mr. Franks and my shepherd, both of whom had been struck on the head by the blacks with a tomahawk while making a bush fence for yarding the sheep on the new run they had selected on Mount Cotterill near the river Axey. Shortly after, during the day, my son Thomas, on riding up to assist in making the yards, found the unfortunate Mr. Franks and the shepherd lying on their faces, with the back of their heads split open. About this time there were other murders, one at indented head. Captain Flatt, a manager for Dr. Thompson, after being dreadfully beaten and left for dead, recovered. Several other murders and robberies were committed by the blacks, but I cannot particularize them. After this, my sheep were put into a flock of Judge Petters, in charge of Mr. Dark, where they remained until the unfortunate circumstance of the loss of Messrs. Gellibrand and Hesse. These gentlemen had been missing some time, and, doubts being entertained of their safety, my son, who was an articled clerk to Mr. Gellibrand, went with four or five others in search of the missing explorers in the direction where, from the information they had received, 
they hoped to fall in with their tracks. After searching and following the Barwon River in the westerly direction, about thirty miles from Geelong they found the tracks of the lost party, and followed them until they reached the place where Mr. Jellybrand and Mr. Hesse had camped. On this spot the searching party stayed during the night. Next morning they continued following the track up the river until the country became so stony and rough that they could not trace the party further. Consequently they struck off from the river towards Lake Colac, and therefore it was at this time and by this party Lake Colac was first discovered, and also Banyang, Stony Rises, and other places. After the party returned, my son took the sheep to the spot where he first found the track of Jellybrand's party, and where we have been ever since. This part of the country has since been surveyed, and marked off into counties and parishes. Our station, named Ingleby, is in the parish of Yan Yan Gort, county Polworth. The eastern side of my Ingleby station was taken up by Mr. Henry Hopkins, of Hobart Town, and is now the property of his son, John Hopkins and called Wormbeat. This property is considerably improved. The station on the north side of Wormbeat was first taken possession of by Mr. W. Roadnight, whose son is now in possession. The station south of Ingleby was taken up by William Roadnight and is now occupied by Mr. Thomas Vickery, Mr. Roadnight's son-in-law. This station is called Yan Yan Gert. The station adjoining this on the west was taken up by Thomas Crutch, who sold it to Matthews, who sold to George Vickery, who is now in possession. The original occupiers of the country adjacent to, and lying west-southwest further up the Barwon River, were Messrs. Austin, Roadnight, Ricketts, Dennis, and myself, all of whom, in 1840, were removed by the government to make room for the Wesleyan missionaries, who, if I am correctly informed, brought an order from the home government to occupy ten miles square of land for the purpose of maintaining and civilizing the Aborigines. This mission failed, and the land has since been sold and let to the highest bidder. Nearly the whole of it is now in possession of Mr. James Austin and myself. Northwest of the mission station was originally occupied by a Mr. Matheson, who sold to the Messrs. Dennis, the present occupiers. The original occupiers of the land lying westerly from Messrs. Dennis in the Colac district were Messrs. Murray, Lloyd, Dr. Morris, Pollock, Dewing, and Captain Fyans, the whole of whom sold their rights of runs, excepting Mr. Murray and Captain Fyans, in consequence of the great expenses and many difficulties they had to contend with. About five miles in an easterly direction from Dennis Brothers, and north from Ingleby about three miles, are two small mountains, supposed to be of volcanic production. They are named after the two unfortunate gentlemen, Messrs. Jellybrand and Hesse. Between Mount Jellybrand and Dennis Brothers Station is situated a station selected and originally occupied by Airy and Darnell, who made considerable improvements. These gentlemen dissolved partnership. Darnell sold to Airy, who has since died. The property is now rented to Messrs. Beale and Trebek. The station lying east of the last mentioned, called Hesse Mount, is part of a station originally occupied by Messrs. Hyatt and Harding. They have separated. Hyatt sold to Mr. Hopkins of Hobart Town, whose son Arthur is now occupying it. Mr. Harding still retains possession of his half. My son Thomas, who has been previously mentioned in this letter, lost his life by a cold caught in crossing the Barwon before there were any bridges. I have the honor to remain Your Excellency's most obedient servant, George Armitage. To His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor, C. J. Latrobe, Esquire, etc. P.S. Most substantial improvements, chiefly stone, have been made on nearly all the stations herein mentioned. They are fully stocked with sheep, cattle, and horses, and there are cultivated fields well fenced on nearly every station. On our station there are 40,000 sheep, 2,000 cattle, and horses, etc., the Aborigines occupying the country adjacent to the Barwon River, from the sea to its source, were supposed to be about three hundred in all. They indented Head, Barabul Hills, Colac, and Yanyan Gurt tribes. 
Their chief support was fish, caught in the river in the summer and autumn seasons, and in winter and spring they depended on their success in hunting, together with a root called murnong. The gentleman I expected to get information from, relative to the country adjoining the Glenelg, acquaints me he has given all the information Your Excellency required to Mr. Bell, the Commissioner, but I am expecting this gentleman in Geelong, after shearing, when, if I can glean anything further, I will take care it shall be forwarded. G. A. End of section 21「I'm not surprised at your returning to Britain, be it for weal or woe. As for me, I suppose, as I made a fool of myself by going home for a wife, I must also make a fool of myself a second time by going again with her. For his honour's information, I came here about the year 1841 with 1,800 sheep and a few horses. The damned sheep ate the grass, and I pared their feet and improved the country by my individual labour. I got the run from James R. Unnett, and Thomas Woolley first occupied it. I've had many a scrimmage with the whites, and the niggers once took a mob of my jumbucks across the Victoria to the Glenelg, where I followed them. I recovered all but forty-four sheep with the assistance of Captain Dana, and his since much despised blackguard. The niggers have always been shy of coming to or showing on this country, you will excuse my not writing more, as tis my abhorrence. With compliments to Mrs. Rose, and wishing you every happiness, I remain yours very truly, Henry Dwyer, P. D. Rose, Esquire. End of section 22 Section 23 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers, letter number 23, from Sir H. E. F. Young. Station of Hogg and Lawton on board Lady Augustus Steamer beyond Swan Hill, Tuesday, April the 20th, 1853. My dear sir, you will oblige me by causing to be made and sending to me at Adelaide a copy of my dispatch to the Secretary of State from the copy which I sent to Governor La Trobe from Swan Hill on the 17th instant, for by some oversight of my amanuensis a transcript of it has not been retained to enable me to forward a duplicate to Downing Street. You will hear no doubt from Mrs. Irvine, a correspondent of Mrs. Campbell's, many of the little incidents of our voyage which a lady's pen can only describe suitably. All I need to say is that, in every respect, the journey has thus far been very agreeable, and Mrs. Irvine's wit and cheerfulness have contributed greatly to enliven us. The river, for forty miles approaching Swan Hill, and for twenty miles beyond it, presents the most singular aspect which it is possible to conceive, a vast plain of reeds, without visible high land of any kind or trees. The river course perfectly safe, open and deep, three and three and a half fathoms, occasionally a fringe of high trees, and then another vast plain, entirely bare and open, with large lakes. Whilst the first fringe of trees lasted, the snags were pretty frequent, and the trees rather overhanging, but offering no serious impediment to the navigation. On the reed plains we have seen many fat cattle, but generally at this season they are too much under water to be fit for pasture, but in summer I should think them excellent. The reeds evidently have a tendency to give place to grass, and consequently firmer ground, and when the day arrives for the wet plains to become meadows, they will be rich indeed. 
The Mary Ann, a steamer of twenty tons, built, navigated, and owned by the Randalls, millers and farmers of Gamaraca, started a fortnight before us from the Reedy Creek, and reached Spawn Hill some hours after us on the seventeenth instant. She is now ahead of us, having steamed all night, and passed us this morning while we were at anchor, cutting wood. The squatters are all delighted at the prospect of sending their wool by water, and there can be no doubt that the steamers will henceforth never leave these waters to the great benefit of all the colonies on this speedy exploration of the rest of the continent. Yours very sincerely, H. E. F. Young. Norman Campbell, Esquire. End of section 23I received your communication of the 29th of July about five weeks since, and I have to apologize for not replying sooner. I hope that you will obtain some of the information required from the enclosed. Last Wednesday evening the Lady Augusta steamer arrived here, having on board Sir Henry Young and a number of ladies and gentlemen from South Australia. They left on Friday morning on their return. They seemed much delighted with their voyage, and quite sanguine as to the continual successful navigation of the Murray for six or eight months in the year. I am, sir, your most obedient servant, A. M. Campbell. His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. In October 1844 I came up to the Murray to look for an occupied country suitable for pastoral purposes, and went out exploring on the other side of the river, and saw much available country. The lowest stations then were Messrs. Collier's on this side, and Mr. Clark's on the other side of the river. Mr. E. B. Green had taken up a run below Mr. Clark's, which he had to vacate for about twelve months on account of the hostility of the blacks. In February 1845 I brought my stock, sheep and cattle, up to the Murray, and stationed them temporarily on the Yalloak Creek, about thirteen miles below the Messrs. Collier's home station, and went out exploring on this side of the river, accompanied by Mr. MacDougall, acting for Mr. J. C. Curlewis, and Jack, a native of Twofold Bay, and after being out fourteen days returned to my camp at the Yalloak Creek. Mr. MacDougall and I proceeded to Melbourne to obtain depasturing licenses, and before my return, poor Jack had been enticed away by other Aborigines who murdered him the day after. I was much surprised that he joined them, as I had frequently heard him express his belief that if they got an opportunity they would kill him, and that he would put no faith in anything they might say to the contrary. I was much grieved at his loss, for he was a merry, agreeable fellow, a first-rate bullock driver, and an expert horseman. He was about twenty years of age, and had lived seven years with the whites. I came here early in June. Mr. Curlewis had passed to Lake Boga. Mr. James Cowper had located himself on the other side of the Loddon, with sheep, about eighteen miles from this, and Mr. James Rowan arrived at Gunbower Station shortly afterwards. I cultivated a friendly feeling with the natives, and I found them inoffensive and obedient. Upon one occasion, however, seven strange blacks came to the hut. There was no one at home but myself, and after some conversation with them, I went to the river for water. Previous to stooping down, I happened to turn around and saw one of the natives— Warrigal Jemmy, afterwards transported for life, following me a few yards behind with my own axe uplifted and clasped in both hands. I fixed my eye upon his, walked deliberately up to him, and gently took hold of the axe, which he quietly relinquished. I walked back to the hut conversing with him, as if he had done nothing to excite my suspicion, and I concealed the circumstance from my own men and the natives on the station for about two years. 
When I mentioned it to the natives of this place, they said they had no doubt but that Warrigal Jemmy intended to kill me, but that he acted from impulse, and there was nothing premeditated. At another time, when near the reedy lake about thirty natives, naked and armed with spears, surrounded me, and I was well pleased to recognize three of the blacks from my own station among them, whom I advised immediately to go home, which they did. The party, when I saw them, were going in the direction where, two days afterwards, about sixty miles distant, two of Mr. Cowper's shepherds were murdered by Aborigines, who, about that time, showed much hostility towards Mr. Cowper, and shortly afterwards towards Mr. Curlewis. The latter sustained a loss from their attacks upon his cattle of about six thousand pounds. The cause was, I believe, the following— some white men on one side of the Murrabit called out to some blacks on the other side to come to them. The latter inquired who they were, and were told that they were Mr. Curlewis's men, shooting ducks. The unsuspecting blacks were crossing in a canoe, when one or two of them were shot by the whites, who were Mr. Cowper's men. In April 1846 I went about 140 miles down on this side of the Murray, accompanied by two whites and a gunbower blackfellow. When about ten miles below the country since occupied by Mr. Beaveridge, we saw a number of natives at a distance, who seemed very frightened of us. At length they approached nearer, carrying green boughs in their hands, which they kept waving towards us, and came to the opposite bank of a creek, when we carried on a conversation through my black fellow, and two of them agreed to cross to us if we sent away our guns, which was done. We were short of provisions at the time, and they promised to meet us next day with fish. We then proceeded lower down the river, resolving to return next day. After parting with the natives, my black fellow informed me that when we went for the fish, the natives would kill us, that they told him so, and asked him to join them. I doubted his statement. After consideration, and after questioning him closely at different times, I discovered that he was trying to deceive me, which he confessed, but said that we ought to shoot them after they brought us the fish. We met the two natives next day, according to appointment, who gave us the promised fish. One of these men afterwards assisted to murder Mr. Beaveridge. Some months after I came up here, Mr. A. McCallum occupied Mount Hope and Tragovel, and Mr. Green reoccupied the stations on the opposite side of the Murray. The Gunbower Blacks are thirty-five in number. The Miali Water Blacks, or my Blacks, are thirty-two in number, and are not decreasing. End of section twenty-four Section twenty-five of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 25 From John Gardiner Note taken from Mr. J. Gardiner by Mr. Latrobe on board the Argo, August 19, 1853. First visit to P. P. Wijalibrand, 1836. See Journal of Latter. Returns to V. D. L. and thence to N. S. W. Close of Year, December. Came over land to Murrumbidgee with sheep, with Hawdon and Hepburn, having disposed of his station on that river to Mollison. Ebden follows. End of section 25. Section 26 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 26. From Philip D. Rose, Melbourne. Dear Sir, I send you the enclosed, which I fear is of little value, but I found a reluctance in many to allow me to repeat anecdotes of blacks mentioned by themselves, and have only told of what I know to be correct. I am, dear Sir, yours very truly, Philip D. Rose. His Excellency C. J. Latrobe. James Hodgkinson. Maiden Hills, Woodstock, taken up in 1841 with 2,000 sheep, one horse, and six bullocks. 
sold in 1853, 20,000 at 23 shillings 6 pence, and let 10,000, with part of the station, at 2 shillings 6 pence for five years. Had great trouble with the blacks at starting, lost by them 200 sheep. The number of blacks exceeded 500 in 1841, now only a few stragglers remaining. Frequent murders among the blacks, and in some instances, Europeans also. The country is now much improved for pastoral purposes. Kangaroo grass has nearly disappeared, and wire grass taken its place. Brody and Cruikshank Wonwanda, River Wimmera, taken up in February 1844, with 3,300 sheep. Lost by the blacks during the first year, 1,800 sheep. The extra expenses while forming the station, guns, extra labor, etc., two shepherds to each flock and additional hut keepers, 1,000 pounds, added 18,000 sheep during the year. The blacks were exceedingly numerous and troublesome, Mount Arapiles being their headquarters when with stolen stock. Their numbers are now greatly diminished. Alfred Taddy Thompson Fiery Creek taken up in 1841, having been five months on the road, with 4,000 sheep. Lost 300 under Mount William by the blacks, who were so troublesome as to cause two shepherds to be with each flock, and at times the men refused to shepherd from fear of the blacks. R. Sutherland Took up part of Taylor and McPherson's run in 1846, and caused a lawsuit, each party leading his men in a battle royale. Sutherland had to vacate. Alec Anderson Emu Creek taken up in 1840 with 2,000 at 30 shilling per head. Not troubled with blacks himself, but great complaints farther off. Companies Lee on the Morrible taken up in 1839 with 25,000. Blacks troublesome at first. There were 200 at that time in the tribe, called the Woodcall tribe, few remaining. John Carfrey, Ledcourt, Wimmera. Bought in 1848, 21,000 sheep at seven shilling per head. Clean. It is doubtful if this run has improved, being of a wet nature, a coarse grass having taken the place of the natural grass and herbs. The kangaroo still plentiful at the foot of the mountains. Main range of grampians, sandstone, and all the shoulders from the base, ironstone, granite in some places covered with sandstone. Sir Thomas Mitchell's track still visible at Mount Tyres, also one circular encampment. Neptune Malgorarainur, Light of the Mountain, or Wild Dog of the Mountain, at the latter end of 1853, died with drinking spirits. He slipped away from the other blacks and spilled a cask, and was found dead under it in the morning. One family of blacks have died off in this run in three years, all strong, fine men each dying in the same month, same week, in corresponding years, from apparently the same cause, that is, wasting of the lungs, attributed to change of clothes and diet. Dublin Jack, a white man, lived six years with the blacks, and has two fine boys. He was found dead in his camp in about June last, supposed to have been strangled by the natives. One black at Mount Willis Station died from eating wheat while grinding, Another at Ledcourt, from eating enormously, of a deceased sheep. Crows and eagle hawks are our worst enemies, and the wild dog is again beginning to appear. Hay was sold this year at seventy-five pounds per ton to the innkeeper. Old Bill Yanangona, spring from the earth, is at Norfolk Island, having been sent there for stealing six hundred sheep belonging to Bailey and Hamilton, which were found with all their forelegs broken to keep them from getting away. This black was seen at Norfolk Island, and whenever he mentioned the Grampians, invariably cried from thought of home. In 1841, a hut-keeper and stockman at Mokipilly took two lubras from their camp to their own huts, then went and shot the coolies, whom they buried in the sand. I was told this by a black, Callaghan, well known at the Grampians, who pointed out the spot where they were buried, and digging I found it to be too true. A black dead three months was taken from the tree where he was buried, and a council being held, he was taken carefully down. 
one old man holding the body in a sitting posture between his legs, still all covered with cloths and rags, when one black walked up and, uncovering the foot, broke off the toe-bones and retired. Another did the same with the other foot, then others came in turn, and each breaking off a joint, until they came to the neck, the face never having been uncovered, which was kept from view by the old black holding it. The lubras were singing all the time, and the head was again buried in a tree, and all the bones of the body collected and put into a bag, which the old mother slept on, and uses still, September 1853, as a pillow. In 1844 and 1845 I took a white, half-caste infant from the mother, who gave it up very willingly. I kept it for two months, but a disorder breaking out on it, my servant refused to attend to it, and on my departure for town made the mother take it away, since which I could never persuade her to let me have him again, but she has since sold him for a sack of flour to Armstrong of Allenvale, who has him at present with his own boys at school in Melbourne, and he surpasses the white children of his own age in quickness and learning. He has lost all knowledge of the native language, and is in great fear of blacks. In 1843 I had a little girl about nine years old, who kept constantly on the station from being nearly blind and in continual bad health. She took great delight in pointing out springs on the run, and was always very merry. About two years after, an old black, Captain Jack, came and took her away, and when in the gap, six miles from Rosebrook, he drew her behind him as he sat on the ground, and grasping her neck, strangled her. This was told me with merriment by the other blacks, who were at the time stimulating the noise and convulsions of the poor little savage. Captain Jack, her murderer, was himself killed by two of my own black boys, who made him the first victim they had ever slain. They did this by treachery. They induced him to go with them to hunt, and one sat down and offered the old fellow something to eat, and when quite off his guard, the other boy from behind knocked out his brains. I am not aware what they did with the body. Being anxious to procure a skull, two boys brought me one, using it as a football, and in great glee when the jaws and teeth rattled. They did not like touching it with their hands. About 1846, a woman and two children came to my station, Mokipilly, badly wounded with spears. The mother had crawled nine miles and died two days after her arrival. One child died also. The other, a boy, I kept for five years, and he was very useful. When my wife came to the station, he was very fond of her and told her of all bush and native habits. On one occasion he asked my brother to let him go to a meeting of blacks, but was refused, as we were busy, when he said, If busy, he did not want to go. My brother, being pleased with his willingness, allowed him to leave, but the poor little fellow was killed the day after. The meeting had been all arranged for the purpose. A letter sent me by a hut-keeper. Monsieur, I shend tin big backs, my artist box. P.S. Catchy the Ratchy. Obedient Servitor, Norbert Doloboski. I send ten big bags, Margaret's box, and the puss has caught the rat. Rosebrook, taken up in March 1843 as Huber Station, expended three thousand dollars in purchasing stock for it, had a few losses by blacks and was obliged to have two hut keepers together. Sold in 1853, ten thousand sheep, three hundred cattle, and all other items on station given in for twelve thousand pounds, nine thousand pounds of which was to hang over five years at six per cent. I have foolishly transferred my license, which would have been one of the best securities. I have known as many as four hundred blacks assembled, different tribes, on this and neighboring stations at one time, few are remaining, about thirty only of one tribe. Now, in 1843, I think there were over hundred. A few old men still use a spatula to dig a small hole and cover their evacuations like the Israelites of old. In 1843, at the Grampians, all did this. None will eat pork there even now, cooked in any shape, salt or fresh. They think it brings a scab out on them. From my own experience, I think the country greatly improving in grass, but in some districts getting scrubby from fires not being so frequent, 
principally in box forests and in the Sydney country. End of section 26《Section 27 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia《Letters from Victorian Pioneers》Letter 27 From George Faithful, Wangaratta Wangaratta, 8th of September 1853. My dear sir, Your Excellency's letter of the 27th of July I beg respectfully to acknowledge, and as far as it may be within my power, I will endeavour to give Your Excellency as clear an account as my memory at this distance of time will admit, respecting the first settlement by the white man of the land lying between the Murray and the Broken River. It was in February 1838 that I first determined to remove my stock from the colony of New South Wales to the famed land of Port Phillip. It was known for years prior to this time that much fine land lay in this neighbourhood, and extended from the Murrumbidgee to the bay of Port Phillip. Hume and Howell were the first discoverers of this fine country, but Sir Thomas Mitchell, some years afterwards in tracing down the Darling, opened up the great country to the westward, which gave the stimulus to the proprietors of stock in New South Wales to migrate with their flocks and herds from a land at that time suffering from severe drought into a land which is the glory of all lands. Many persons and numerous flocks and herds were on the line of march when I was, but none tarried or turned to the right hand or to the left. All were hastening on to the land so highly pictured by the discoveries before mentioned. When I arrived at the ovens, I knew from Hume's description that there were plains called after the former surveyor-general Oxley. I determined to turn out of the beaten road and visit Oxley Plains, where I finally determined upon leaving my horned cattle, sending on my sheep to the final lands spoken of by Sir Thomas Mitchell. It was at this juncture that I sent on my brother's sheep, under charge of his overseer, to the broken river to await my coming up. Unfortunately, Within a few days after their arrival there, they were attacked by the Aborigines, many of his men murdered, the stock scattered through the country, and about two hundred pounds worth of property then in the drays taken away. My brother having arrived shortly after the massacre of his men and destruction of his property, we determined, for the sake of more fully protecting each other, to settle on the ovens. Some few months passed on when I had Messiahs, Bowman, Raid, Chisholm, and Docker as neighbours. The country was left to us for some years in consequence of the hostility of the blacks, which became so unbearable that I could not keep shepherds, although well armed, without employing a horseman in addition to myself, to keep continually perambulating the woods, lest the natives might cut them off. During my employment in this way, my cattle were destroyed in numbers within the short distance of only six miles from my hut. I once found fourteen head of slaughtered cattle in one pond of water. They had been driven in by the natives, it being an anna branch of the river, and from the depth of the water and the boggy state of its banks, they were destroyed with the tomahawk in endeavouring to get out. Thus I and my men were kept for years in a perpetual state of alarm. We dared not move to supply our huts with wood or water without a gun, and many of my men absconded from my service, throwing away their firelocks, and in some cases destroying the locks and making them wholly useless from sheer terror of the blacks. This may appear too absurd for belief, nevertheless it is a fact. At last it so happened that I was the means of putting an end to this warfare. Riding with two of my stockmen one day quietly along the banks of the river, we passed between the Anna branch of the river itself by a narrow neck of land, and after proceeding about half a mile, we were all at once met by some hundreds of painted warriors with the most dreadful yells I had ever heard. Had they sprung from the regions below, we could have hardly been more taken by surprise. Our horses bounded and neighed with fear, old brutes which in other respects required an immense deal of persuasion in the way of spurs to make them go along. Our first impulse was to retreat, but we found the narrow way blocked up by natives two and three deep, 
and we were at once saluted with a shower of spears. My horse bounded and fell into an immense hole. A spear just then passed over the pommel of my saddle. This was the signal for a general onset. The natives rushed on us like furies, with shouts and savage yells. It was no time for delay. I ordered my men to take deliberate aim and to fire only with certainty of destruction to the individual aimed at. Unfortunately, the first shot from one of my men's carbines did not take effect. In a moment, we were surrounded on all sides by the savages, boldly coming up to us. It was my time now to endeavor to repel them. I fired my double barrel right and left, and two of the most forward fell. This stopped the impetuosity of their career. I had time to reload, and the war thus begun continued from about ten o'clock in the morning until four in the afternoon. We were slow to fire, which prolonged the battle, and sixty rounds were fired, and I trust and believe that many of the bravest of the savage warriors bit the dust. It was remarkable that the children, and many of the women likewise, had so little fear that they boldly ran forward, even under our horses' legs, picked up the spears, and carried them back to the warrior men. We at last beat them off the field, and found that they had a fine fat bullock, some of it roasting, some cut up ready for the spit, and more cattle dead, ready to portion out. The fight I have described gave them a notion of what sort of stuff the white man was made, and my name was a terror to them ever after. I picked up a boy from under a log, took him home and tamed him, and he became very useful to me, and I think was the means of deterring his tribe from committing further wanton depredations upon my property. My neighbors, however, suffered much long after this. The government during all this time gave no help, no assistance of any kind, and at last threatened to hang any one who dared to shoot a black, even in protection of his property, and appointed protectors to search about the country for information as to the destruction of the natives. These gentlemen resorted to the most contemptible means to gain information against individuals whom the trumpet tongue of falsehood had branded as having destroyed many of these savages. This, instead of doing good, did much evil. People formed themselves into bands of alliance and allegiance to each other, and then it was the destruction of the natives really did take place. I, however, never troubled myself to go off my own run. I had no need of help, and had no desire for the destruction of the wretched race, but I would not undergo the same injuries, annoyances, and anxiety again for ten times the quantity of land I hold. No sooner was all fear of the blacks dissipated than the whites became almost as great a nuisance, in edging in their applications and claims for portions of our runs. And let it be remembered that we were the first squatters and pioneers of the district. Unfortunately, the government gave too willing an ear to them, as we were all branded as murderers of the blacks. They readily deprived us of portions of our runs to give them to the other squatters, who were considered peaceful men, as they well might be after the war was ended. Ours was the danger, theirs the reward. I need hardly carry my short and necessarily imperfect account further. Your Excellency is fully aware of the history of the squatters since. No sooner did the home government give to that class an interest in their stations, for the wholesome purpose of encouraging them to open up the wild lands of the colony, to raise the wool so necessary for the use of the world at large, to make themselves comfortable and become the purchasers of some portions of these wild lands, then the gold digger, the ephemeral grubber of a day, sets up his claim to the right not only of the auriferous metal in the bowels of the earth, but to the grass upon the earth, and that too, free from all restraint, tramping underfoot the rights of the pioneer squatter, rights gained by discovery and by conquest, and which are acknowledged by our government. Because the land was God's land, made for all men to enjoy in common, therefore things in the earth and above the earth are theirs also in common. Ergo, the cattle will shortly be theirs, as the cattle eat the natural grasses of the earth, and breed upon the earth, and require no more tending than the kangaroo. And why should one man enjoy, monopolize, flocks and herds sufficient for thousands, because he may choose to put his brand upon them? This is the next argument I expect to hear from these men. Trusting that Your Excellency will pardon me for inflicting so long a letter upon you, I remain, with great respect, Your Excellency's obedient and humbled servant, George Faithful. 
His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire, Lieutenant Governor, Victoria. End of section 27「Letter 28 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas, Melbourne, Victoria. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 28 from George D. Mercer. To His Excellency, C. J. Latrobe, Melbourne. Weatherboard, near Geelong, Victoria, August 22nd, 1853. Sir, I regret that indisposition has prevented my earlier reply to your letter of 29th July, requesting information as to the time and circumstances of the first occupation of the Lee and Barwon and Geelong district generally. On my arrival in this country, the 11th of April, 1838, the Derwent Company, lately Port Phillip Association, possessed stock on the indented head and at Geelong. The land about Point Henry was only used for landing stock. Mr. Cowie and Stead had a station on Bell Post Hill, but shortly afterwards moved to their present runs. Mr. Manifold had a run at Batesford on the Dog Rocks, and they removed in April 1839 to their present runs. Mr. G. Russell, of Clyde Company, had his home station on the Moorabool, now a portion of Dr. Learmont's purchased ground, but very shortly afterwards he moved up to his present head station on the Lee. Mr. Sutherland had a station on a creek running into the Moorabool on the north side, the station Mr. William Sharp now occupies. The Mr. Bates were on the Duck Ponds, Mr. Jason Simpson on the Werribee, now Mr. Churnside Station. The Derwent Company stations extended as high as this one, the Native Creek, Mergabolly Flat, and Deep Gully stations being all on the road, besides a station on the Barrabool Hills, on what is now Mr. Fisher's purchased land. Dr. Thompson occupied his present house and held the adjacent country towards the coast with stock. The Misters Learmonth had a station on my first arrival, which is now a portion of this one, on the south side of the Barwon, but they left it about May 1838 for Buninyong. At this time, there were no stations further out in the plains. In May 1838, Major Mercer, Mr. Fisher and myself went out and came on the Wadi Yalloak at or about the Frenchman's Inn, and following the creeks up, discovered the run now held by Mr. J. G. McMillan with those now held by Mr. Aitchison, Mr. C. G. Ferrers and Mr. A. F. Cunningham, as also the cattle run now belonging to the latter and returning home by the Lee, immediately sent out stock, and took up in June 1838 the last named four runs, and not long afterwards took up the first. In March 1839 we again started with a dray from Mr. Macmillan's present station, went across to Timboon, which we then held temporarily with two flocks of sheep, for Messrs. Manifold, who had penetrated through the stony rises and discovered their present run. From Timboon we went on to Taylor's River, where Mr. F. Taylor, in charge of sheep belonging to Mrs. MacKillop and Smith, had been about a fortnight. This station is now held by Mr. N. Black. From thence we went on to Mount Shadwell, under which the Derwent Company had two flocks. This station is now held by Mr. Burke, recently purchased from Captain Webster. Leaving this, the last station, we went by Mount Rouse, Mount Napier, across to Mount Sturgeon, thence following the edge of the plains, crossed the Fiery Creek, Hopkins, etc., and by Mount Emu and Emu Hill, back to Mr. McMillan's station from whence we started. The station on Mergaboli Flat, afterwards held by the Derwent Company, was originally taken up by the Misters Yule, but before my arrival they had moved in consequence, I believe, of one of their number having been killed by the natives. The station, now Mr. P. Sharps, on the Native Creek, on the old road to the Lee, was originally taken up by Mr. J. G. Ware. Mr. W. Harding occupied, on account of Mr. Hyatt, the station now Mr. A. Hopkins, on the Muddy Lake, and adjoining this, and on their afterwards separating, formed the Mount Hesse stations, his present ones, on his own account. But the dates of these I am unable to give. Captain Pollock occupied the station in 1838, now purchased land at Pollock's Ford on the Barwon. This is the spot where Mr. Jellybrand and Hesse were last seen, and transferred it to Mr. J. Allen, who in 1842 or 3, I fancy, acquired the station now held by Mr. Russell, Simpson and Russell, from Mr. C. P. Tilly, who originally settled it. Mr. A. must have sold to Mr. James Austin, who sold, 1851, to Mrs. R. S. and R. 
Mr. Prentice originally took up the station held now by Mr. A. F. Cunningham, Warrenbean, lately Mr. John Thompson's. This run was allotted to my father on the division of the Derwent Company in June 1842, as also the Mount Mercer cattle station, now belonging to Mr. A. F. Cunningham. As regards the natives of the colony, my intercourse with them was little, chiefly in the neighbourhood of Geelong. When out on the expedition by Mount Rouse and Mount Sturgeon, we were, under the latter hill, very nearly attacked by a band. The Aborigines about Geelong were, after the first year, always quiet. They killed two of the Port Phillip Associations, or Derwent Company's men, on indented head in 1836. The Buninyong natives were occasionally troublesome, both in their own country and even down as far as this. Could I be of any assistance to you, I beg you will command my services, and I will be happy to add any information I may just at present have forgotten, as this is written rather hurriedly. I remain, sir, yours faithfully, George D. Mercer. End of letter 28《in which you ask for information respecting the first settlement of various portions of this colony. In reply, I beg leave to say that any information in my power to communicate will, I fear, prove very meagre, inasmuch as it was not until 1841 that I arrived in the colony, and I have never myself taken up any new country, but have invariably purchased from others who preceded me. It is, however, within my knowledge that all the country on the Wimmera to the north and west of the Pyrenees, from W. J. T. Clark's and Smythe stations to Lake Hindmarsh, was unoccupied prior to the year 1844. In that year, the flocks of Mrs. Brodie and Cruikshank, Mrs. Taylor and Macpherson, Mrs. Wilson's, Major Firebrace, Philip D. Rose and others were first settled on the country in the neighbourhood of Horsham and Mount Arapiles. It was in August 1845 that I purchased Messrs. Brodie and Cruikshank's livestock with the right to their station, known by the name of One Wonder, and in connection with my partner, Mr. C. P. Pinsent, I still retain that establishment. I have reason to believe that the Aboriginal population, though not nearly so numerous here as on the Murray, were very troublesome and caused great losses to the settlers during the first year they occupied this part of the country, but since that period they became nearly harmless, and appear to have greatly diminished in numbers. The neighbourhood of the Glenelg was much earlier settled. It was in 1840 that the flocks of Messrs. James Jackson and M. Gibson, after rejecting the fine plains from the Lee to Mount Elephant and to Mount Shadwell, and also the rich country of the Wannon, were finally settled down on the precipitous and heathy banks of the Glenelg. It was in 1846 that I purchased Messrs. Jackson and Gibson's livestock with a right to their Rosenead stations on the Glenelg, which in 1849 I sold to Mr. John Ralston, the present occupant. The country on the Lower Loddon, Lower Avoca and Lower Murray remained unoccupied until the year 1847. In that year there was a great rush to this quarter, the flocks and herds of Messrs. Booth and Argyle, A. M. Campbell, Mr. Cooper, Messrs. Kerr Lewis and Campbell, A. Beveridge and others occupied for the first time this fine pastoral country. In 1849, I purchased Messrs. Kerr Lewis and Campbell's livestock with the right to their extensive stations, all of which I still retain. The Aboriginal inhabitants of the Lower Murray a more numerous and a finer race than any other native tribe I have seen in Australia, the comparatively warm, short winter of this neighbourhood and the abundant sufficient game may in part account for this. I can furnish no estimate of their numbers, but as far as I am able to judge, their decrease here is much more gradual than elsewhere, and although there have been numerous instances of aggression on their part, one of which, the murder of Mr. Beveridge, may be in your recollection, 
the native population of the Lower Murray have on the whole proved much more useful to the settlers than those of any other district with which I am acquainted. Yours very truly, William F. Splatt, to His Excellency C. J. La Trobe, Esquire, End of Section 29. Section 30 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter number 30 from Robert Jameson. Melbourne, 9th of August, 1853. I have the honour to acknowledge receipt of your letter of July the 26th, which reached me three days ago. In cheerfully complying with the request, I must express regret that I can afford so little information. I arrived in Port Phillip towards the end of the year 1838, and about six weeks afterwards proceeded to Cape Shank, accompanied by William Ryrie, Esquire, to look at a tract of country which had just been taken up with a herd of 800 head of cattle from Manaroo by an overseer in the employ of Charles Campbell, Esquire, Sydney. By the advice of Mr. Ryrie, the stock and run being for sale, I proceeded to Sydney Overland, completed the purchase, and took possession from the 1st of January, 1839. The boundaries of the run were very indefinite, as I was the only settler on the coast side of Arthur's seat, and all the country from Point Nepean to Cape Shank, now comparatively so thickly populated, was then in undisputed possession of the kangaroo, emu, and native dog, the first of these running literally in large herds. Between my run and Melbourne, a distance of about seventy miles, there was but one settler, Mr. Edward Hobson, located at Kangarong at the base of Arthur's seat. About the month of July, 1839, Messrs. Hobson, Desalia, and myself, accompanied by three Aboriginal natives, carted a whale-boat from Kangarong to Western Port for the purpose of exploring the country in the neighbourhood of that bay. The result of the expedition was my taking possession of the run at the head of Western Port, known afterwards as Yalloak, and moving my stock there, with the exception of about 150 head of cattle, which, with my right to the Cape Shank run, I sold to Messrs. Willoughby and Thompson. Mr. Thompson afterwards sold to the present occupant, John Barker, Esquire. For a considerable period after occupying Yalloc, the only settlers beyond me were Mrs. Anderson and Massey, who had an agricultural establishment on the Bass River, and sent their produce to market by water, employing for that purpose small vessels of from twenty to thirty tons burthen. I retained possession of Yalloc Station till the year 1845, when I sold out to Henry Moore, Esquire. In the beginning of 1839, there were very few settlers on the south side of the Yarra. Messrs. Ryrie were the highest up the river. Between them and near to town were Messrs. Wood and one or two others. On the road to Western Port was the Dandenong Station, superintended by A. Langhorne, Esquire, and beyond it there were, I think, only Ruffy's and O'Connor's stations, while lastly, on what is now the Point Nepean Road, was the solitary station of Mr. Hobson. The tribe of Aboriginal natives, known as the Western Port Blacks, numbered, I should imagine, when I knew them first, upwards of three hundred, but on this point Mr. Assistant Protector Thomas would be an authority. During the seven years of my residence in the bush, I saw a great deal of the natives and invariably found them quiet, inoffensive, and willing, in their way, to be useful. They never did me any harm intentionally, and on many occasions really helped me, although any attempt to induce one or more of them to settle down to any steady work, however light, even for a single day, was utterly vain. I believe I may safely say that the settlers south of the Yarra were invariably kind to the natives, and there are, I believe, few if any instances of ingratitude in return on record. 
I was not, however, so fortunate with the Aboriginal natives of Gripsland, readers note sick, who before the occupation of that district by white men came to attack the Western Port tribe, and making my station did a considerable amount of damage, but fortunately no lives were lost. Again, regretting the scanty nature of the information furnished to you, I am, sir, your most obedient servant, Robert Jamison. His Excellency C. J. La Trobe, Esquire. End of section 30《Section 31 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter No. 31 From Charles Wedge My dear sir, 10th of September, 1853 I beg to acknowledge the receipt of your letter of the 29th of July, and feel great pleasure in affording every information in my power on the subjects referred to therein, but I regret that owing to the loss of my journal, which for the first two or three years' residence in the colony I kept as a reference, by the melancholy occurrence occasioned by the flood in the Werribee last year, any which I can afford from memory will be of a very meagre and unsatisfactory nature. The settlement of this colony of Victoria originated with my father's brother, Mr. John Helderwedge and Mr. John Batman. I think, owing to some observations made relative to the proximity of the two lands by Sir George Arthur, then Lieutenant Governor of Van Diemen's Land, whom they had accompanied on an exploratory expedition to the north coast of that island, when, in 1835, a company was formed and an expedition dispatched under Mr. Batman to report on the nature of the country and its adaptation to the growth of wool, as an outlet for our surplus stock was then beginning to be severely felt. Immediately upon the return of that expedition, and on the report of its leader of the great fertility of the soil being brought it abroad, several private adventurers, as well as the company previously formed, determined on the occupation of the country. At the end of that year, or beginning of 1836, the first sheep were landed where Williamstown now stands, and the stations of the Messrs. Wedge and Mr. Simpson, then formed on the River Werribee, at the confluence of the salt and fresh water. The tribe of natives occupying that part of the country were found to be very peacefully disposed. In a great measure, owing doubtless to the facilities for communication afforded by the long residence among them of a runaway prisoner of the Crown named Buckley, who had escaped from a party dispatched from Sydney for the formation of a settlement in Port Phillip in the year 1803, and which was abandoned for want of water. Vessels were now constantly leaving Launceston Van Diemen's Land with stock for the newly discovered country, which, in the vicinity of what is now known as Melbourne and Geelong, was fast filling up. It is perhaps worthy of notice that shortly after or about the time of the arrival of our expedition from Van Diemen's Land, in New South Wales, an expedition was fitted out by the government at Sydney under Major, now Sir Thomas, Mitchell, then Surveyor-General, for the exploration of the same country, who on his arrival on the coast in Portland Bay was astonished to find a large whaling establishment there, the property of the Messrs. Henty, who, on the report of Sir Thomas Mitchell of the grazing capabilities of the country to the northward of the port, immediately commenced, and with great labour succeeded in, cutting a road through the forest, and formed a sheep station on what is now known as the Merino Downs. Shortly after the first arrivals, a Mr. Franks, who had formed a sheep station at Mount Cotterill on the River Werribee, was killed by the natives, which outrage was at the time attributed to their anxiety to obtain axes, blankets, flour, etc., the value of which soon became apparent to them. Owing to the report of Sir Thomas Mitchell, 
some of the most enterprising of the stockholders on the outskirts of civilization in New South Wales were induced by the advantages of being near a shipping port to travel their stock overland to Port Phillip, amongst whom as the first arrivals may be mentioned Messrs. Ebden, Horden, Hepburn, Coggill, Howie, Yaldwin, etc., who were fast followed by many others and rapidly filled up the country in the neighbourhood of the coast. In the year 1839, vessels began to arrive from England and Scotland, the settlement of the colony having attracted considerable notice at home. Stockholders also began to push more into the interior, the earlier settlers having confined themselves to the coastline, and I, with my brothers, removed our stock to the country at the foot of the Grampians, now known as the Grange, on the creeks forming the River Wannon in the Australia Felix of Major Sir Thomas Mitchell, to which part of the country I was followed by Mr. John Cox, Dr. Martin, Mrs. White, Barton, and Aylwood Norris, etc., after which the country soon became fully occupied. Upon my arrival at Portland Bay, to which place I had directed stores to be shipped to me from Launceston, I, to my surprise, found the establishment previously alluded to in the occupation of Mrs. Henty. Here I also found the Mrs. Winter, who had also formed a sheep station on the Merino Downs, part of the Australia Felix of Sir Thomas Mitchell, which was soon very fully occupied with stock from the opposite shore. Herds of cattle and flocks of sheep were also now pressing on their way to Adelaide. Up to this time we had but little trouble with the Aborigines, but they now began to attack our shepherds, whom they drove from their flocks, which they took into the mountains known as the Victoria Range, where they disposed of many hundreds of them by killing, maiming by breaking three of their legs, and otherwise mutilating them in a cruel manner to prevent their escape, and resisting, their numbers giving them confidence, recovery. At this time they also killed a valuable horse and cow belonging to me, and drove away the whole of my milking cattle and working bullocks, some of which returned with spears in them. And these depredations did not cease till many lives were sacrificed, and I may say many thousands of sheep destroyed. In the hope that the very small amount of information I am able to afford may be of use to you, I beg to remain, my dear sir, yours very truly, Charles Wedge, C.J. La Trobe, Esquire, Melbourne. End of section 31section thirty two of letters from victorian pioneers this is a librivox recording or librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org letters from victorian pioneers letter number thirty two from j blair portland thirteenth of august eighteen fifty three my dear mr la trobe i received your excellency's note of the twenty seventh ultimo some days ago but delayed replying to it that I had satisfied myself by inquiry on some points I was doubtful about. In January 1840, Mrs. Addison and Murray brought sheep from Van Diemen's Land and took up Dunrobin, the first station formed on the Glenelg on the west bank of the river, above its junction with the Wannon, and were immediately followed by Mr. McCulloch, who took up the station known as the Retreat, on the east bank of the river near its junction with the Wando. It is now occupied, I believe, by Mrs. Carmichael. Mrs. White Brothers took up their station, Penongatong, on Bryant's Creek, and Mrs. J. E. G. Robertson and W. Corney took up their stations, Wando Vale and Kashmir, on the Wando, about the same time. In March or April 1840, Mr. Norris took up Kootenaran, now occupied by Mrs. Swanston and Willis and Stall and Ellis, comprising both sides of the Glenelg, Chetwind and Pigeon Ponds. And in about July or August, Mr. Ricketts took up Cluny, the station immediately above it, and now occupied on the east bank by myself, and on the west bank by Mr. Whittaker and Mr. Hamilton. And at the same time, Fulham, still higher up and now occupied by Mr. Armitage, was taken up by Mr. De Sully for, I think, Sir John Owen. In 1842, Mr. Winter 
took up a station on the east bank of the river below the junction of the Crawford, but after some time abandoned it, and it was again taken up by Dr. MacDonald in 1844. And in 1845, Mr. T. Scott took up a station on the west bank. About this time, or soon after, Mr. Lang took up a station on the east, and Mr. Black upon the west bank, near the mouth. Mrs. White Brothers were the only settlers I heard of being annoyed by the Aborigines as early as 1840, but they tracked those gentlemen on their route from Melbourne and harassed them in every way, setting fire to the grass round them, throwing spears at their shepherds and stealing their sheep. It was not, however, till 1841 and 1842 that Aboriginal aggressions became of frequent occurrence. Shepherds were then constantly murdered and their sheep driven off sometimes fifty or sixty miles, and as they were usually found with their legs broken, they were valueless to their owners. Mr. Ricketts, the original proprietor of Clooney, lost so severely by their frequent incursions that he became insolvent in 1844, and I purchased the station from his trustees. Since then, the natives have been quiet, but I believe they were troublesome as late as 1845 on the station at Mount Arapiles, which was just then taken up by Mr. Urquhart. I have no idea of the number of the Aborigines at that time, nor do I think it possible to estimate it. They were shy and stealthy, holding no intercourse with whites, and seldom seen by the settlers, unless when detected in committing an outrage or overtaken in retreating with their plunder and as they frequently travelled very long distances to commit outrages, no one could tell to what part of the district they belonged. I am, my dear Mr. La Trobe, respectfully and faithfully yours, J. Blair, His Excellency C. J. La Trobe, Esquire. End of section 32
The blacks, seeing their superior strength, commenced driving off a number of sheep in defiance of the shepherds and destroying them wantonly and slaughtering them for their support. On one occasion, one of my overseers and shepherds traced them to one of the high mountains where they had a large quantity of my sheep slaughtered for use, and they drove off my people and retained their plunder. There was one native soon discovered to be more notorious than the rest. He was given the name of Billy Billy, who reigned several years. He, with the assistance of a number of the tribe, drove off a considerable number of my sheep and formed a station north of mine at a place which is now well known as Billy Billy's Waterholes, where they made a bush yard and shepherded the sheep during the day and yarded them in the usual way at night. And when discovered, the remaining sheep were recovered with considerable difficulty. Such was the state of the station for nearly two years. When my people found it necessary to defend themselves, a number of the blacks, I am sorry to say, were shot. A Mr. Francis, the overseer of the station, was many times engaged in the fights with them. He was afterwards murdered by one of the shepherds on the station by being stabbed with a shears blade. The offender was brought to Melbourne and found guilty of the murder. Soon after, the natives became less numerous and peaceable, taking occasionally a sheep or two out of the folds at night, but seldom came into contact with those in charge. When labour became more abundant and the scab cured, the sheep increased rapidly, so much so that the stock of 2,000 I commenced with now count upwards of 80,000, and I have sold and boiled down for these last four years on an average 12,000 per annum, and have shipped from this stock alone for several years past nearly 800 bales of wool with upwards of twenty pounds per bale. Notwithstanding the present result, I beg to observe the loss was great for the first seven years. Having had occasion to have the stations of Dowling Forest and Pyrenees valued seven years after I first settled, the expense of carrying them on, with first cost of sheep, etc., with interest added, amounted to double the amount of the highest value that could be then set on them after giving credit for all sales of wool, etc. This arose chiefly from the great difference in the value of the sheep, as when I shipped the original from Van Diemen's land, sheep were worth upwards of two pounds per head, and at the expiration of seven years they were only worth three shillings to three and sixpence, for which price I bought one of the best stations in Victoria, situated at the Maiden Hills, from Mr. Hodgkinson. But from that time sheep farming has gradually improved, and every one that has managed his flocks properly cannot have any occasion to complain. As to cattle generally, I think they have been unproductive previously to the gold fields. Having myself purchased 400 head in the year 1840 for 4,000 pounds, which cattle I kept till the year 1849 and their increase, which numbered upwards of 2,200 head, when I sold the whole for 3,300 pounds, giving one, two, and three years' credit without interest. I also established a herd of horses that increased and paid exceedingly well. I have the honour to be Your Excellency's most obedient servant, William J. T. Clark. His Excellency C. J. La Trobe, Esquire. End of section 33. Section 34 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Edward Bell from Wimera. Number 34. I arrived in Sydney from London in the latter end of September 1839. The weather was very hot, the glare very great, the dust abominable. I knew no one, and I was glad to get out of it without loss of time. I had read the treatises on sheep and cattle in the Library of Useful Knowledge, 
and had endeavored to gain some information respecting colonial life from Major Mitchell's Travels in Australia, Mr. Wow's Three Years' Experience, and Dr. Lang's New South Wales, all which works I had industriously pursued on the voyage. Beyond this, my general information regarding livestock was limited to a confused knowledge of sheep by their distinctive titles of rams, weathers, and ewes, and a vague idea of cattle as heifers, cows, bulls, and oxen, and as beasts that had horns and made a great bellowing. But I am not sure that I could have distinguished any of either description of animal on view. I had, however, acting under the advice of certain prudent relatives in England, fully determined on entering on pastoral pursuits, or what I found was called in the colony, going into stock, and had armed myself with letters of introduction to several gentlemen, who had emigrated a short time before me with similar views. Amongst these was one from Mr. Alex Hunter of Edinburgh, whom I had met in London, to Messrs. Watson and Hunter, who had sailed shortly before me, and who were amply supplied with means to form large stations. I had an indistinct idea that Port Phillip was to be the field of their operations, and a much more indefinite one of how I was to get there. Some inquiries, however, in Sydney, brought me the gratifying intelligence that Mr. Watson was himself in the Sydney district at the time, though out of town at that moment, and I was further informed he was on the point of starting with an expedition for Fort Phillip, in which I made up my mind to join if possible. I accordingly purchased a horse off a Sydney dealer as a preliminary step, and, in five days from my landing, had made all the necessary arrangements with Mr. Watson for my forming one of his party. We left Sydney, I think, on the 3rd of October, and we travelled by easy stages till we reached Sutton Forest, where we overtook Mr. Alec Hunter, who had gone on before with the drays and horse stock. From this place we went on to Lake George, on the other side of which a property had been purchased for the sole purposes of procuring some assigned servants, of whom we had twenty in the expedition. In this neighborhood I bought about three hundred head of cattle, and made an agreement with Mr. Watson to run them with his stock, giving him half the increase for two years, and the benefit of my services during that time. I recollect nothing particular about the country we passed through, except that the bush was very thick, and that I was always afraid of losing myself if I left the road, or was out of sight of my companions for a moment. We had also about four hundred head of cattle bought from a Mrs. Barton at Barima, with which we fortunately got a stockman given in, named Little Sam, which, considering our intense greenness, and the uselessness of most of the convict servants, who were just turned out of government, was of great consequence. Paddy's River, Yass, and other well-known localities were passed, and we eventually encamped on the Tumut, where some six hundred more cattle, with a run, had been purchased, which, to add to our trouble, had the character of being the wildest brutes in the colony. Here our party divided. Mr. Alec Hunter, Mr. Tula, and the Honorable Gilbert Kennedy went on to Melbourne with the horses. Mr. Watson returned to Sydney to wind up some incomplete arrangements, whilst I remained with the cattle at the Tumut, where we formed a station on the Gilmore Creek. Here I added to my fortunes one hundred picked heifers, which were strongly recommended by the vendor, Mr. Shelley, and also by Mr. Watson, whose interested motives in advertising the purchase of female stock I was too gullible to see through at the time. My position at the Tumut, with my twenty government men, about 1,200 head of cattle, and about 30 horses, in a country with which I was totally unacquainted, may perhaps be conceived, but it is difficult to describe. I was very much afraid of losing my cattle, and therefore tried to keep them within sight, counting them regularly every day, which, considering that more than half were broken into the run, was an absurdity which nothing but experience convinced me of for when we wished to remove them, about six weeks after, 
it was found to be impossible, with our insufficient help, to drive them off the run, and we consequently formed a permanent station at Gilmore Creek, a tributary of the Tumut, where we left the cattle till the next year. The vast herds which were travelling from Sydney District, and the possibility of the Melbourne markets being overstocked, coupled with the difficulties of the road from the flooded state of the rivers, confirmed us in this decision. My troubles as a squatter commenced very early in my career. The great scarcity of flour during the summer of 1839 was felt all over the colony, but in no part more so than in the interior, where it was selling at sixty pounds a ton. Even at Government House in Sydney, it was said that Lady Gipps was restricted in her supplies for pastry. For some weeks our food at the Tumut was confined to beef and milk and a little rice, but the incessant grumbling of the men at last induced me to send a cart to Yas for flour. The Tumut was flooded at the time, but I had seen a horseman cross and ventured over myself at the same place. A hurdle was lashed on the dray, on which the bedding of the two men who were to accompany it was placed, and, with three horses harnessed to it, it went boldly into the stream after me. The leading horse, about halfway across, turned down the stream, and in a moment the cart was afloat and soon capsized, drowning the two other horses and nearly drowning the two men on the hurdle. The one was a fine swimmer and swam out to the leading horse, and eventually released him from his harness. The other clung to a log, and was hauled ashore by a rope about ten minutes afterwards. A few days after this, the river having partially subsided, and the grumbling continuing unabated, a second attempt was made, but at another crossing place, and with only one horse. The same occurrence took place again, except that the horse swam for a quarter of a mile down the river with the cart after him, and was not drowned till a log turned the cart over and rendered him helpless. The driver, who remained till then on his seat on the hurdle up to his neck in water, calling out to me, he was done like a dinner. Three hundred pounds worth of horse flesh went in these adventures. I then bought a team of bullocks, and eventually procured a ton of flour from Yas, which lasted the party till it reached Melbourne. An overseer was then engaged, and the cattle delivered into his care, and on the 24th December Mr. Watson and I started in a tandem for Fort Phillip. Near the Murray we broke both shafts, and had to take to our saddles, leaving the remains of the gig and several valuables, amongst others my writing case and journals, at an outstation hut of Mr. Cockburn's to be sent on by the drays. Of course, I never saw any part of them again. On arriving at the Murray, we overtook several expeditions which were waiting for favorable opportunity to cross. There were said to be ten thousand head of cattle on its banks in various mobs. Messrs. Bolden had crossed several hundreds that day, and at night we camped with our party. On the ovens we overtook others. The natives had attacked some parties in this neighborhood during the previous summer, and the places were pointed out to us where Faithful's men were murdered, and where Snodgrass had had a stand-up fight with the blacks. My own experience of the natives at this time led me to suppose that they were a very inoffensive race, for all I had seen had been the Bogong blacks on the Tumut, who came down in the summer from the ranges, sleek and lazy from the grub or fly of that name which infests that part of the country. I think they were the handsomest natives I have ever seen. At all events, they were the best conditioned. On the ovens, however, we saw none. A party of mounted police was stationed at the Broken River, who entertained us, as they appeared to do all travelers, for a consideration. The country was all, so far, settled, although we saw no signs of it either by meeting with human habitations or with sheep or cattle. If the country was stocked, the stock fed off the road, but we heard the names of Barber, Mitchell, Fowler, W. A. Broadrib, Faithful, McKay, Docker, Binney, Speed, and Anderson as occupants of the various runs through which we passed. At Templeton's, 
on the Seven Creeks, Mr. Watson left me to go up to the Devil's River, which he and Mr. Hunter had occupied during the previous spring. I remained for a few days at Ballora, a station Mr. Hunter had formed on Templeton's Creek, about three miles above him, but which was about being abandoned for the better country of the Devil's River and Mount Battery. I accordingly proceeded alone to the settlement, as the city of Melbourne was in those days called, stopping at Hughes, Hamilton's at the Sugar Loaf, and at a Mr. George in Kinlachu, and eventually reached Keilor, where Messrs. Watson and Hunter had their headquarters at the time. There were no particular charms in Melbourne in those days, beyond the champagne lunches which always accompanied the sales by auction, and of which I partook with others, though I never bought any land. One cannot help reflecting on the narrow escape from making a fortune which daily fell in one's way, when we look at the properties which were to be had for a few pounds at the time, now bringing in thousands per annum. However, I was never destined to do this, and I soon returned to the bush, and devoted myself to learning my trade as a squatter. A serious illness which attacked me at Mount Battery, however, threw impediments in my way. I was confined to my bed with bilious fever for several weeks, and on my recovery went back to Melbourne, from whence, by the advice of the medical men, I went by sea to Sydney. A few weeks nursing at Parramatta restored me to health, and in May I returned to Melbourne in the Cumberland, chartered by Mr. Dutton. I was then about proceeding in her to Valparaiso to buy horses, and had secured my passage, when the news of a bad sale of South American horse stock in Sydney deterred us from entering into the speculation, and I went back again with Mr. Hunter to Sydney to make further purchases of horses and cattle, taking some sixteen thousand pounds with us for the purpose. After a few days' delay, I accompanied Mr. Terence Murray to his station near Quien Bayan to attend a large sale in which he was interested, and to purchase cattle if I thought it advisable. Failing in getting what I liked, for I had by this time become a judge of stock, I went on to the Tumut to collect our leavings of the previous year, where I was shortly after joined by Mr. Hunter and his cousins with more cattle and horses. We had altogether about two thousand head and about seventy horses, with which we again started for Fort Phillip, and after many losses and crosses, eventually formed our main cattle station on the upper part of the Broken River, about four miles above the station at present in the occupation of Mr. John Moore. From the Broken River to the Devil's River, crossing the Mount Battery Plains, a distance of about twenty miles, the whole country was claimed and stocked by Messrs. Watson and Hunter. Messrs. Stevens and Thompson were camped upon the Broken River, about three miles above the cattle station, but only remained until they had shorn their sheep, when they moved towards the westward. During the winter that I remained at the Devil's River, I was a witness of the fatal effects of catarrh on sheep. The climate was very severe, the frosts and fogs frequently lasting all day. The sheep could not be let out of the yards on many days until noon. How the disease came into that neighborhood, if it is really contagious, I do not know, but if any climate could produce it, I am sure that of the Devil's River in 1840 was quite trying enough. I have seen as many as five hundred sheep dead at the yards in a single night. There were some settlers who had come with a few sheep above us on the Devil's River. I think their names were McFarlane and Mitchell. Their loss was more severe than Messrs. Watson and Hunter's. We used to fancy that the river was affected by their throwing the carcasses into the stream, though this is not probable, as they were sixteen or twenty miles above us, and the river was a considerable one. During this year I formed one of a party, consisting of Mr. Alec Hunter, Mr. Archibald Jameson, an overseer, and a black fellow named Pigeon, who was afterwards drowned at the wreck of the salt house, that started to find a road into Gippsland for stock, which Strizolecki's discovery had just opened as a field for Port Phillip Enterprise. 
we ascended what we took for a leading range into the southwest of Mount Buller, but found ourselves in a most difficult succession of gullies, in which we struggled for eighteen days, and eventually camped on the headwaters of the La Trobe. My horse had met with an accident in falling down a steep bank, and I remained with Pigeon at our camp on the river, while my companions went on to see what they could of the new country. In three days they returned, having reached a rich plain and fine herbage, I conclude part of the run afterwards occupied by Mr. Reeve. On our return we got upon a leading range in right good earnest, which in two days took us back to the head of the Gilborn. But the descent was considered too steep for stock, and the idea of bringing a herd by that route was abandoned. Mr. Tyers afterwards tried to follow on our returning tracks, but lost his horses and gave up the attempt to reach Gippsland from that entrance, and I am not aware that it has yet been considered practicable. The time was now drawing near when my agreement with Mr. Watson was about expiring, and I was most anxious for it, as I found that cattle in halves was not a profitable speculation to the proprietor. An attempt had been made to muster the whole herd in March, but it proved ineffectual, and it was not till October that I eventually got delivery of my stock. I now made an agreement with Mr. Riley, of the Wannon, to put my cattle on his run, he undertaking to hand his heifer station over to me if we did not continue to keep our cattle together. And early in November 1841 I left the Devil's River and drove my herd to Melbourne, where I sold all the butchers would buy, and, after providing myself with a dray and stores, started for the west with the remainder, somewhere about three hundred head. We passed by La Lal, Buninyang, Bailey's, and Mount Emu, which country was all occupied right and left of us, and crossed the plains to Lake Boloke, which was the only vacant spot I saw. Wise Alaski was at the crossing place of the Hopkins, where his station now is. Dr. Martin, under the guidance of Mr. James Manning, who had sold his cattle with the condition that he was to find a run for them, had occupied Mount Sturgeon, the station being at the time under the charge of Mr. Knowles. Beyond him, to the west of the Wannon, was Mr. Barnett, now Churnsides, and next to him was Mr. Riley, where my headquarters were for twelve months. During this time I saw a good deal of the surrounding country. At the Grange, a police magistrate, Mr. French, was establishing himself, and in the month of June of the same year I had the honor of being appointed a magistrate, and assisted him regularly on the bench. Mr. Riley's station had been occupied by a Mr. Gibson, whose wife was famous for some extraordinary journeys she made to Melbourne, accompanied by a single male attendant, was abandoned by him, and afterwards taken up by a Mr. Norris, who suffered so severely from depredations committed by the blacks that he had also given it up. The natives had, however, by all accounts, been taught some severe lessons, and had learned to be better behaved but they were still what was usually termed in the bush very troublesome. We had in the meantime occupied Englefield on the Glenelg as our heifer station, and had erected the necessary improvements there. But we found that the natives continually intimidated the men, and whilst absent from the hut had occasionally stolen their rations, and it was eventually determined to give up the heifer-tailing scheme and the station was abandoned. Dr. Edward Barker, who had come into that neighborhood on my recommendation, immediately occupied it. A few months' residence there, and a partnership which he had in the meantime formed with Mr. Riley, induced him to sell it back to me for the value of the improvements, fifty pounds, and in the summer of 1842 I again took possession of it. My cattle had, in the meantime, discovered other country for themselves on the head of Bryant's Creek, but the arrival of Mr. Cadden, previously an overseer of Mr. John Hunter Patterson's, with sheep and cattle, soon dislodged them. Mr. Archdale next came in between me and the Wannon with sheep and cattle of Mr. Hyde, of the Green Hills, 
near Bacchus Marsh, and eventually, under the orders of Captain Fians, the Crown Commissioner, I was hemmed in within very moderate bounds. The jealousy with which we heard of the arrival of any one in our neighborhood, notwithstanding the vast tracts of land that we each laid claim to, was one of the remarkable features of our early settlement. I recollect my stockkeeper coming in one evening with a story of a dray track across the Kongbul Plain, as it was called, about eight miles to the southward, and some coffee spilt along it, and soon after finding we had a neighbor in a Mr. Mather, a carpenter from Melbourne with a few sheep, who was soon after killed by the falling of a tree near his hut. He was known, in consequence, as the coffee merchant till his death. There was no one at this time above me on the Glenelg, and the stringy bark ranges came in upon the river so determinedly for many miles that we imagined for a long time there was no available country in that direction. But Mr. Cadden soon after discovered a small creek running into the river, which would serve his purpose as a washing place for his sheep in the event of the water in Bryant's Creek failing, which was considered more than probable. He soon, however, deserted the outstation he formed there, which was then taken possession of by Messrs. Urquhart and Glendinning, where they formed their head station. It is now held by Mr. McIntosh. Above him, again, Mr. D. C. Simpson occupied both sides of the river, immediately under the Victoria Range, and adjoining what is now Mr. Rose's station in the Grampians. This was not until 1843, in which year also Mr. Charles Sherratt, who had come from a station of Messrs. Heap and Grice's at Mount Alexander, arrived on the opposite side of the river to me, and occupied the frontage to it for many miles. He politely came to my hut and asked me what I claimed, and took what I did not want. Below me, Mr. DeSaley was in possession of the station now held by Mr. Armitage, having occupied it with sheep from Van Diemen's Land for Sir John Owen. About this time, however, the station got into Chancery, and in 1842 was managed by Mr. George Fairbairn, who now has the adjoining stations of Mather and Affleck, the latter having been admitted by me on to a part of my run during the winter of this year, as they were old servants of my friends the Hunters, on the express condition that they should return the station to me when the weather would allow them to look for another. They, however, sold it in spite of me to my neighbors for fifty pounds. Below de Saley, Ricketts, who had been removed from the Buntingdale Mission Station on the Barwon on its occupation by the natives, had, in 1841, taken up the stations now held by Mr. Blair, as well as those occupied, on the opposite side of the Glenelg, by Mr. Thomas Hamilton of Kootenarin, and Mr. Donaldson of Longlands, now Messrs. Whittaker's. Mr. Norris, whose compulsory abandonment of the Wannon I have mentioned, came next on the river, taking up both sides with sheep belonging to Mr. Thomas Winter of Van Diemen's Land. This station, comprising the Pigeon Ponds and Chetwind Country, was subsequently sold to Messrs. Carr and Swanston, and is now divided into two runs, occupied by Messrs. Willis and Swanston, and Messrs. Staywell and Ellis. Mr. Gibson, who had first occupied Mr. Riley's station on the Wannon, came next on the river. Very little of the country which had not frontage to the main rivers was considered available at this time. It was not until 1844 that Mr. John Airy sent a party, consisting of a Mr. Mann and his overseer, with about 3,000 sheep, to look for country in my neighborhood. I had an indistinct notion from various cattle hunts in that direction, that there must be plenty of good country to the northwest of me across the river, and advised them accordingly, and they returned to my station in a week, having discovered the Mount Talbot country, which, if they had occupied all they could at the time, would have been one of the finest runs in the whole colony. The want of water was for a long time considered its only deficiency." though it is now covered with many immense lakes, several of which are from twelve to fourteen feet deep. 
In the summer of this year several others passed to the westward, and the new country, as it was called, was occupied by Wallace, Hope, Bates, Ballantyne, MacLeod, etc. The collisions with the blacks, which I had heard of on almost every station after my arrival in the western district, if they took place at all, were kept very quiet. There were certain hangers-on at stations, Tulla at the Grange, for instance, who boasted of such encounters, but it was generally believed that those who talked most knew least of such scenes. Their aggressions, however, whether avenged or not, were not infrequent. I had a horse which till his death would never go near a tree, my stockkeeper having been attacked by the blacks from behind one. On another occasion, the blacks were seen driving my cattle through a swamp, and holding on by their tails, and spearing them as they went. I recollect a cow being brought into the stockyard, stuck all over with spears like a porcupine. We extracted them, and she lived and fattened, and was eventually sold fat in Melbourne. On my first settlement at Englefield, in tracking cattle, I came upon a place where the blacks had within a few days camped some stolen sheep in bow yards, and where the torn fleeces and broken legs and joints, since gnawed by wild dogs, told a tale of wasteful destruction. It was scarcely to be wondered at that the settlers took the law into their own hands on such occasions. Whether it was fear or a better acquaintance with us which worked upon them, it is difficult to say. But about 1843-4, we heard no more of sheep-stealing in the neighborhood, and the blacks, who had always fought very shy of my station, where Cranky Jem, my hut-keeper, had the reputation of being a good rifle-shot, which was clearly proved by the holes in all the trees round, where bullets had been cut out, commenced to come about, and offer to strip bark and make themselves useful. They are not generally very much wanted on a cattle station, and I seldom encouraged their advances. Later, in 1845, I had a black boy named Bill from the Mount Rouse tribe, who remained with me for about eighteen months when the summer amusements of his relatives and companions proved an irresistible temptation for him, and he bolted. I could, however, place implicit confidence in him, and found him most obedient and docile, and a great deal more cleanly in his person than most of the white men with whom he lived." On one occasion I had taken him to Geelong to bring back some cattle. My stockkeeper was drowned at Fayens Ford, and the cattle remained in the sole charge of Bill for a couple of days until assistance was sent to him. He watched them night and day and did not lose one. I have heard that he has since returned to the present proprietors of my station, and is still a useful member of society." In the summer of 1842, I returned with a stockkeeper to the Devil's River to collect the leavings of my herd. At Lake Repose, near Mount Sturgeon, I came upon Major Mitchell's tracks and followed the marks left by his heavy boat carriage across the Hopkins Plains to the Fiery Creek, where I found my friends, Messrs. Stevens and Thompson, shearing their sheep under a tarpaulin, and, passing through the runs of the Campbells and Donald and Hamilton, slept in a shepherd's watch-box on Mr. Irvine's run at the amphitheatre. This was my first visit to the district for which I am now commissioner. The Wimera, at this time, was not occupied below Clark's. Mr. Lynott had taken up what was afterwards Decameron for Dr. Imlay. Irvine had crept in above him, on the river and between him and Messrs. Donald and Hamilton, disputing right and left. In 1842, Decameron was sold to Mr. James Allen Cameron, late of the 13th Light Dragoons, for 1,500 pounds, who lately sold it to Mr. Charles Williamson for 30,000 pounds. Below Clark's, which was managed by Messrs. Pettit and Francis, the latter was killed by one of his own men, with sheep from Dowling Forest, originally brought from Van Diemen's Land, there was no head station, though Blow, who originally occupied the Allenvale country for Mr. Sinclair of Van Diemen's Land, 
laid claim to what was subsequently sold to Dr. Blundell and Mrs. Green. The latter run was bought for five hundred pounds, and sold lately to Mr. Macmillan for seventeen thousand pounds. Briggs, from whom Briggs's Bluff and the Grampians derives its name, came next on the river, having outstations near where the Four Posts Inn, or Glenorchy, now is. The lower part of the river was next taken up by Darlot in 1843, and after him, what he had passed through as valueless was occupied by Messrs. Taylor and McPherson, who have since divided two of the finest runs in the district. Back from the river, on the Mackenzie Creek, Messrs. Brody and Cruikshank took up about this time the Wanwanda Station, now Messrs. Splat and Pinsense. Below Mr. Darlot, Major Firebrace took up the Vita Station on the river, disputing part of it with the Messrs. Wilson, who ultimately squeezed in between him and Mr. Darlot, about three miles below the present township of Horsham and Messrs. Bailey and Hamilton took possession of Major Firebrace's leavings again lower down the river. Ellerman came in about twenty miles below Firebrace, holding his present run for Darlot, and Steiglitz first took up the beautiful country at Lake Hindmarsh, which is now divided between the Belchers and Atkinsons, etc. The northern part of the Wimera district, including the Mallee runs, were not thought of till later. Grant, who took up the Mount Arapiles country, was the first who found out their value in 1844, and disposed of his interest in the present Mount Elgin station to Major Firebrace. The Murray, Avoca, Avon, and Richardson runs were all of later discovery. In 1845 I exchanged the Englefield run for one near Mount Rouse, to which we gave the name of the Green Hills. The country about me had been all along settled, excepting a small patch to the southwest of me, into which a Mr. Gibb managed to squeeze himself. But the days of the early settlement of the colony may be said to have been over before this period. Edward Bell, Wimera, 15th September, 1853 Devil's River this country, lying to the north of the upper Goulburn River district, and extending to the head of the Broken River, was first occupied in September 1839 by Messrs. Watson and Hunter, who, in February 1840, formed their head station upon the Devil's River, at a place called by the natives Wapang. The original discoverers of this country were Mr. John Hunter, of the above firm, and Mr. Campbell, of Otter, who entered it from the Big Hill, near which, at the head of the Seven Creeks, Templeton's Station, Mr. Hunter had a station called Belora. They could see from the top of the Big Hill Range the open country of Mount Battery, backed by Mount Bueller and the line of Australian Alps. They eventually found the Devil's River, so called from hearing a black's corroboree upon its banks the night that they first camped upon it, but their first station was at Mount Battery. The whole of the country occupied now by Messrs. Goodman and Locke and Malcolm, and the head station at Wapang, which is now in the occupation of a working overseer named John Bon, who landed from an emigrant ship in 1841 without a wrap, were comprised within Messrs. Watson and Hunter's original station, besides their cattle station on the Broken River, which extended to and took in Mr. Moore's present station of Barjang, afterwards the Arundel's homestead. In 1841 I had a license for a small station upon the south side of the Devil's River, below Mr. Wow's station, the author of Three Years' Experience in Australia, a pamphlet which galled half England and Scotland in 1839 and 1840, called Mima but I gave it up in the month of November of that year to Mr. Alec Hunter, who afterwards sold it to a Mr. Sargentson. My first visit to this country was in January 1840, when the whole of this country was in Messrs. Watson and Hunter's hands. Edward Bell, Wimera, 12th August, 1853. Englefield, Glenelg River 
This station was formed by me and Mr. James Riley in November 1841 as a heifer station. There was at the time no settler higher up the Glenelg, and we laid claim to the country which now is divided between Mr. Lewis, late Cadden, Sterling and Fairbairn, formerly Mather, a carpenter from Melbourne who was killed in 1843 by a falling tree, and Mackintosh. It had been previously temporarily occupied by a Mr. Norton, but the blacks had killed so many of his sheep he was glad to desert it. In 1842 I gave up my claim to Englefield, and it was occupied by Dr. Barker, who sold it back to me for fifty pounds toward the end of that year. In 1843 Mr. Cadden came with sheep, and Mr. Commissioner Fyans followed him to take a large portion on my country from me, which I disputed till 1844, when we settled the affair amicably. In the same year I allowed Messrs. Affleck, who had been old servants of Messrs. Watson and Hunters, to occupy the lower part of Mather's Creek, and in 1846 they tried to claim my whole run, but eventually sold the run I had lent them to Messrs. Sterling and Fairbairn for fifty pounds, having first tried to do me all the injury they could. The natives were very troublesome until 1844. My cattle were frequently found with spears in them, and once the blacks were chased by my stockkeeper when they were hunting the cattle through a swamp. I never, however, heard of any collision with the natives on that station. In February 1846 I exchanged this run with Mr. Robert Clerk for one called the Green Hills, near Mount Rouse. It is now occupied by Mrs. Green of Woodlands. Edward Bell, Wimera, 12th August, 1853. The Green Hills. The original station of Mumumberic, of which the Green Hills formed a part, was taken up in 1840 by Mr. Matthew Gibb for Captain Swanston. It was afterwards, about 1843, sold to Mr. Robert Clerk, with whom I made an exchange for Englefield on the Glenelg River in 1846. Mr. John Cox, who occupied Mount Rouse, and Mr. Henry Best, who occupied Birchett's Run, and Messrs. Kemp, who occupied what was afterwards Chain's Station on Muston's Creek, were the original neighbors to this run. Edward Bell, Wimera, 12th August, 1853. End of section 34。section 35 of letters from Victorian pioneers。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Betty B。letters from Victorian pioneers。number 35 。Middle of 1836, A. F. Mollison came to Port Phillip in a vessel from Hobart Town to view the land, having gone from Sydney to Hobart Town, as there were no vessels sailing from Sydney to Port Phillip at that time. Major Mitchell had not returned from his journey through Australia Felix at this time. John Batman, MacKillop, Faulkner, and others had been settled at Port Phillip two or three months when A. F. Mollison arrived. Sheep, breeding ewes, were being brought over from Van Diemen's land for the first settlers, price twenty shillings. Having seen the country, he returned to Sydney via Van Diemen's land and started, April 1837, from a station on the Morumbidgee, which he had bought a year before, with 5,000 sheep collected from various quarters, Price twenty five shillings to thirty one shillings, six pence, six hundred cattle, twenty horses. End of eighteen thirty seven. After a long and harassing journey, wintering at Bon Thurambo, by the way, he reached Caliban and formed that station. Ebden had reached Carlsrube six weeks before with stock, and shortly afterwards, Yaldwin came down and took up what is now W. H. F. Mitchell's country. I joined A. F. Mollison in 1838. We lived in Reed Mia Mia's 
and tents comfortably enough for some time the winters were much drier the coliban now a formidable stream when flooded was crossed on a plank during the first winters eighteen thirty eight pyalong was occupied as a cattle station w hamilton mundy and smythe and f a pallet followed in this quarter eighteen thirty nine to eighteen forty the head of the Loddon, present aboriginal station was first occupied by a f mollison the country north of this river had been frequently explored before but was called the barren plains and supposed to be without water look at them now eighteen forty lyon campbell followed and then l mckinnon and others early part of eighteen forty one parker occupied our station on Loddon as a reserve for the aborigines and settling there attempted to carry out the exeter hall views for their civilization with but slight success as was to be expected the aborigines in our neighborhood afterwards known as the jim crow tribe were from the first peaceable they were a small insignificant tribe frequently spoiled and oppressed by the more numerous and warlike tribes from the goulburn murray river and westward who used to carry off their women etc there is a tradition of one if not two bloody encounters between parties of these last tribes and hutton's men hutton was then the farthest out to the northwest and it is pretty well known that several white men getting lost in the bush were cut off by the natives as they were never heard of afterwards at any rate the shepherds felt or pretended so much alarm that at the request of the settlers about and beyond mount alexander a small party of the twenty eighth regiment was stationed on the Compospe during eighteen thirty eight and eighteen thirty nine to protect both whites and blacks the squatters or rather their men should be in fairness freed from the imputation cast upon them by the protectors and missionaries of corrupting the native women from the first i know that the use of the women was offered by themselves and their husbands indifferently for a very trifling gratuity it was always believed that they were cannibals that is that now and then under particular circumstances they ate portions of the human body rather as a rite perhaps than to make a meal there are traditions of portions of the body usually hands or fingers being observed in the lubra's bags but of doubtful authenticity i think certainly in conversation they admitted the fact but this does not prove it because we know that they will at any time admit or say anything which they think will please their interlocutor witness the bunny up and mr powlett's great serpent of the interior both of which have been accurately described in fifty different shapes also the volcanic eruptions of jim crow etc etc in short if leading questions are put to them as is usually done by enthusiastic inquirers who are following up their own ideas they the natives may as i think be made to say or to describe anything eighteen thirty nine sheep were in this and the following year taken hence to adelaide considerable numbers by sea price paid here in eighteen thirty nine by mcfarlane and others for the purpose of sending to adelaide twenty seven shillings six pence for breeding ewes wheat sold at the coliban at twenty shillings the bushel january eighteen forty the first shipment of cattle hence to new zealand by welsh and others cows ten pounds steers twelve pounds eighteen forty one the first mill for grinding corn by water power was erected at the coliban about this time eighteen forty two fat weathers this year from eight shillings to twelve shillings eighteen forty two to forty five in these years there was a great depression of the pastoral and agricultural interests yet the colony continued to advance slowly in point of comfort and property although there was but little money many squatters who in their earlier operations had become indebted to the merchants were obliged to surrender their stations and were left penniless the new men who bought at this time have become rich escaping the privations and anxieties of the first pioneers their predecessors they have been floated on to wealth by the tide of general prosperity 
but of the older settlers who held on many pressed down by the unfavorable terms on which assistance was granted to them have only recently after a struggle of years found themselves freed from their difficulties now in the pride of wealth consequent on the wonderful gold discoveries the early squatters their sufferings and their services to the colony are alike forgotten and men seem to regard them as the new heir regards the furniture and portraits of the distant relative to whom he has succeeded as something to be at once quietly consigned to the lumber room or the auction marts eighteen forty five to fifty three from this period there are printed records of the progress of the colony and its general statistics which it will be at once more easy and more satisfactory to consult than somewhat loose memoranda w t mollison high along twenty second august eighteen fifty three End of section 35。section 36 of letters from victorian pioneers。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by betty b。letters from victorian pioneers。number 36 。Memorandum Neti Alla Station Avoca I went with sheep to the river Avoca in february eighteen forty two and occupied the country immediately north of Dutton, Simpson and Darlot, who arrived very early from New South Wales with sheep and cattle. There was no settler on the Avoca before me. Mr Alex Irvine had an outstation hut on it. He was formerly in partnership with Dr Imlay of Twofold Bay mr lanotte a cattle holder who purchased from dr imlay was my near neighbor mr hodgkinson was in the vicinity before me a mccallum was at mount greenock the only settlers on the loddon were mollison mckinnon and dutton all from new south wales a few days after me mr colin mckinnon occupied the mountain creek between the pyrenees range and my station in 1844, Mr. Ellis, from Ireland, occupied a station with sheep purchased from me 30 miles down the Avoca. There was then a general rush made to the plains lying to the north, which up to that time had been quite devoid of water. Mr. Allen Cameron, Scotch, Captain Harrison, Horsfall, English, Stuart, Scotch, K and K, Foley and Cameron, Coots, Rutherford, Donald, and Hamilton, A. Thompson, and several others all took up runs together. On the Loddon, Cato, Brain, and Williams, Thorpe, and Bear, all English, took up stations, while a large tract was taken on the lower Loddon and Murray by Curlewis and Campbell from Sydney. Subsequently, McCallum, Campbell, and Rowan, all Scotch, occupied Mount Hope and the banks of the Murray. The aborigines were reported to be very fierce and intractable when I first occupied, but I never had any trouble with them. They never were much use and seemed to me to improve very little, while by degrees they diminished in number. There was never any outrage of any moment committed by either the settlers or them in my time, but previous to that several had been killed on both sides. The country was quite wild when I first saw it. A herd of wild cattle escaped from Dr. Imlay's herd were running wild for years, and some horses apparently lost by a surveying party. The soil on my run and to the northward is generally very poor, very flat, a very retentive clay lying for the most part on a bed of quartz pebbles. Gold has been found on the Avoca, and there are several hills of most metalliferous appearance. End of section 36. Section 37 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Number 37. Terrawingi, 30th August, 1853. 
sir in reply to the letter dated twenty ninth july which i have had the honor to receive from your excellency i beg to state that i arrived at the ovens in march eighteen thirty eight on the evening of the day on which mr faithful's party were attacked by the blacks at broken river there were two temporary encampments previous to my arrival viz mr w bowman's and colonel white's in a few days mr g faithful selected the lands he now holds oxley plains and i occupied the lands immediately opposite mere he now the station of j w chisholm a panic seized the servants and they deserted their employers bowman faithful and white abandoned their cattle on the runs and i was left alone with three assigned servants my free men having absconded in a few days these assigned men told me that they would stay no longer but offered to assist me back to the settled districts with the stock i was thus compelled to leave the ovens i took my stock back to the hume river nuringong on my return to the ovens in about six months time i found that chisholm had taken possession of murhi and i settled at warule which i still hold faithful had returned to oxley plains bowman was here terawingi and docker at von therambo soon after reed occupied carajarmangai and in a year or two the stations in this district were occupied pretty much as they are at present i may mention as a specimen of the fatigue undergone by the earlier squatters that for six days and nights before i left the ovens i never lay down being engaged all day in herding the cattle and all night in walking round them i was alone one of the men being similarly employed with my sheep and the other two in removing and guarding the stores as soon as the necessity for exertion ceased i was seized with otomatous swelling of the legs and eyelids i could neither see nor walk and was carried back to the hume on a dray there was at that time no station occupied between barnawartha on the hume now g h barbers and sugarloaf creek w hamilton's the blacks were not numerous but very hostile they murdered a number of white men and destroyed a great many cattle and horses in may eighteen forty twenty one of them all armed with guns besides their native weapons attacked my station in my absence they murdered one of my servants and burned my huts and stores and all my wheat tea was worth at that time in melbourne twenty pounds per chest and flour one hundred pounds per ton four horses each worth one hundred pounds were killed and only seven head of cattle out of nearly three thousand were left alive on the run one hundred and eighty head exclusive of those found dead were totally lost the rest were recovered at such an expenditure of money and of personal energy as have left me an invalid for life and to this day comparatively a poor man my demand for compensation was treated with contempt by the governor of new south wales he said i had voluntarily placed myself beyond the boundaries of police and must take the consequences although i was then paying an assessment upon stock for the very purpose of securing police protection beyond the boundaries three special commissioners were sent one after another to examine into the matter major letson of the eightieth regiment mr bingham commissioner of crown lands for the district and chief protector robinson the whole drift of their inquiry seemed to me to be an attempt to prove that the cause of the attack upon my station by the blacks was an improper treatment of the native women by my servants this was shown to be totally without foundation for the natives had no women with them and it was their first visit to the station it was also their last i followed them for eighteen months and apprehended seventeen of them and though they were discharged from melbourne jail almost as soon as they entered it yet their capture had such a good effect that their depredations have since been confined to a few cattle for food there have been none of their former wholesale slaughterings and no murders of white men since then these sir are the salient points of my experience as a squatter i have lost my capital i have lost my health i have lost fifteen years of the best period of my life i have undergone many hardships exposed myself to many dangers 
and am now a poorer man than i was when i became a squatter there is an apparent egotism in this letter which would be offensive without the comment that from the tenor of your excellency's circular i concluded that short narratives of individual experience and not general disquisitions were what your excellency required i have the honor to be sir your excellency's most obedient servant george edward mckay his excellency c j latrobe esq lieutenant governor of the colony of victoria end of section thirty seven section thirty eight of letters from victorian pioneers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b letters from victorian pioneers william taylor longiranong wimera statement of the progress of the settlement of that portion of the wimera district around and beyond mount zero during eighteen forty three to eighteen forty six eighteen forty three in july of this year mr darlot occupied his present station with about three hundred head of cattle in november my partner mr mcpherson started to look for new runs and followed the course of the wimera from mrs green's present home station at that time an outstation of mr john allen's the wimera was at that period unoccupied from allen's outstation to mr darlot's eighteen forty four in february we started our sheep from a station on the morabool twenty miles from geelong and occupied our present homestead on the wimera about the end of the same month at that date with the exception of mr darlot's three hundred cattle eight miles lower down the river there was no stock north of cameron's heifer station navarre or west of the avoca to the glenlig that i was aware of about this time mr hamilton manager for b boyd esq occupied the eastern branch of the wimera for ten miles above and below where the township of glenorchy is now fixed mr mills manager for messrs brodie and cruikshank passed our station about the twentieth march with three thousand sheep and occupied the station now held by mr splatt Juan wanda a few days afterwards this was the second flock of sheep that passed into the country beyond leadcourt ours being the first we saw no natives till we were on the station two months afterwards they came in very quickly till they numbered about one hundred men women and children at this time they were in the habit of stealing a sheep occasionally at night in september about forty natives attacked one of our shepherds threw several spears at him and took his flock from him within a mile of the homestead the overseer mustered the men and the sheep were regained within an hour during the winter the natives were very troublesome mr w j t clark at the pyrenees lost one thousand sheep he had a shepherd badly speared after this captain dana and the native police arrived at the pyrenees followed the natives and overtook them near a ray and nichols present homestead at that time unoccupied country at boyd station lead court the natives stole during the winter about eight hundred sheep the station was constantly annoyed by their stealing sheep which they generally drove towards the richardson and occasionally behind mount zero messrs brodie and cruikshank had two hundred sheep stolen messrs darlot ellerman mills and mcpherson tracked them for two days and found them near mr bailey's present station polkabet in a gum scrub they had killed ten and carried the carcasses away breaking the legs of those left behind alive this was their usual plan to prevent the sheep straying and at the same time annoy the settlers brodie and cruikshank's loss that winter was in all about nine hundred sheep in november of this year messrs cresswick occupied the avon station during december messrs wilson occupied a station on the richardson near rutherford's present station but afterwards in december moved down the wimera east of mount aropolis where mr firebrace's station now is eighteen forty five during january major firebrace 
brought up six thousand sheep and claimed the run occupied by messrs wilson and having no license messrs wilson were compelled to move lower down the river where mr bailey now is but left during the winter being afraid of the natives and sat down where their present station is three miles below horsham with two thousand sheep messrs bailey and hamilton claimed the portion of this run adjoining ledcourt in february but were removed by the crown lands commissioner about tenth february they occupied the ground vacated by messrs wilson below major firebraces with three thousand sheep about the end of february rutherford and robinson took possession of the run on the richardson now in occupation of messrs rutherford dennis and a ray and nickel with three thousand sheep about tenth march joseph thyer occupied the run on the avon now loves about this time we occupied the lakes north of mount zero and the yariambiak creek for twelve miles messrs wilson immediately afterwards built two stations lower down the same creek keywell and muckbilly about the twentieth march messrs donald and macready came to lungiranong looking for runs on questioning the natives we found there was good water to the northeast a day's journey distant two days afterwards my late partner mr mcpherson started with them taking a native as a guide and the same evening struck the avon below the station of horsfall who had been there about a week previous next day they followed the avon to banyong the water they started for mr j donald immediately left for melbourne to get a license and bring up stock mr w patterson occupied his station on the wimira in april with three thousand sheep mr george urquhart occupied maryvale in july with four thousand sheep mr glendinning the salt lakes in october and november with two thousand sheep in november messrs scott occupied their run on the yarimbiak creek in april of this year mr robinson the protector of aborigines first visited the wimera and penetrated as far as lake hindmarsh mr h darlot and other settlers accompanied him they saw very few of the natives the losses of the settlers and sheep by the natives were again considerable this winter messrs bailey and hamilton suffered most severely in all they lost one thousand sheep besides lambs and were continually harassed being near the scrub where the natives had plenty of cover major firebrace and mr patterson also lost several hundred sheep the old system of breaking the legs was still carried on the stations higher up the river escaped this year the country on the richardson and avon being settled the blacks had no place to take the sheep to on the glenelg also the settlers were comparatively unmolested as the wimira and the country about mount arapilis was a great resort of the natives with stolen sheep in august mr horsfall on the avon had a hut keeper murdered by the natives with a spade that was in his hut the murderers were never taken after the first year's occupation the demeanor of the natives was generally friendly to the settlers on many of the stations their services were of great value in looking for strayed horses and especially sheep several of them have shepherded for eight and ten months at a time and were the best shepherds in the district not being afraid of losing their flock they allowed them to spread over a large tract of country they were also useful in pointing out the permanent water holes eighteen forty six this year in january mr stieglitz occupied the country around lake hindmarsh with sheep messrs shaw and ellerman the antwerp station in february this year mr mcginnis occupied the lake that the yariambiak flows into in may of this year captain fyans commissioner of crown lands first visited this part of the district and we occupied munarp towards banyong in june dr thompson brought sheep up and laid claim to one hundred fifty thousand acres a great extent of which had been already occupied by others i believe that your excellency is aware that the country in the wimera district at least this part of it was when occupied poor and thinly grassed since it has been stocked with sheep the grass has improved so much that i am sure it will now fatten more than double the number 
it could have done at first. William Taylor End of Section 38「Fifteenth July, eighteen forty four. Sir, reverting to your honour's instructions, number forty three slash thirteen fifty four of September eighteenth, eighteen forty three, and to my reply thereto, number eleven slash forty four of twenty second January, reporting the state of this district on my arrival, I have the honour to state that, as at that time, my residence in Gippsland had been limited to eight or ten days, and consequently my opportunities of obtaining correct information relative to the district few, I consider it my duty, now that I have been resident here six months, collected some information and gained a little knowledge of the country, to follow up that report by a second, in which I shall endeavor to convey to your honor an account of the state of the district up to the 30th June last, a description of the country, rivers, and lakes, and such other information as may appear essential to a knowledge of this part of the colony. Area of Gippsland The district of Gippsland, by His Excellency's proclamation published in the Government Gazette, is bounded, quote, on the south and east by the sea, on the north by a line running in a westerly direction from Cape Howe to the source of the nearest tributary of the Murray River and the Australian Alps, again on the west by the Alps, and a line south to Anderson's Inlet, end quote. being about 250 miles in length and 56 miles average breadth, and containing, consequently, about 14,000 square miles, of which the ranges comprise perhaps about 10,000 miles, forest, scrub, and generally unavailable land, 3,000 square miles, and the good available land, 1,000 square miles. Ranges High broken country extends from the dividing range or watershed towards the sea coast, about forty miles, a great part of which is covered with snow from June to October, and as the average distance from the main range to the sea coast is not above seventy miles, the low and occupied country does not extend much above thirty miles from the coast. With the exception of three or four, the settlers are confined within a belt of its width, eighty-nine miles in length, extending from Port Albert to the River Thompson or Tambo. To the eastward of the Thompson, for some little distance, the country is so precipitous and broken that there has hitherto been no communication between this part of the district and the Snowy River, which is said to be distant twenty or thirty miles from the Thompson, but by way of Omeo. I believe an attempt was made by a party upwards of a year ago to reach Manaroo in a northeasterly direction from Bruthen, but failed in consequence of their horses being too jaded to proceed. The distance to be saved by this route to Manaroo, were it found practicable, would be nearly 100 miles, and the high ranges about Omeo would be thus avoided. Rivers The rivers that water the before-mentioned belt of occupied country are seven in number, namely the Latrobe, Mancanochi, Barney, Dunlap, MacArthur, Riley or Nicholson, and Thompson, or Tambo, of the Omeo natives. The Perry, described by Count Strzelecki, between the Dunlap and the MacArthur, cannot be classed with these, it being merely a small chain of ponds. There are, besides these rivers, several minor streams falling into the sea between Corner Inlet and the Latrobe. Minor Streams the Albert and Terra rivulets rise in a small range seventeen or eighteen miles from Port Albert and empty themselves into that port. Bruthen Creek, Merriman's Creek, and two others, rising in the same range, fall into the sea north-northeast of the port. The River La Trobe, which is the westernmost and largest river in Gippsland, derives its waters by various tributaries from the dividing range, opposite the sources of the Goulburn. 
The chief source is perhaps in latitude 37 degrees 40 minutes south and longitude 146 degrees east, from which to its junction with Lake Wellington in latitude 38 degrees 8 minutes and longitude 147 degrees 22 minutes nearly is about 100 miles. The course for the last 70 miles is due east to the lower part for 42 miles, being occupied by settlers. For the respective positions of the stations, etc., I beg to refer your honor to the accompanying map. River Makinochi The next river to the La Trobe is the Makinochi. It appears to rise near the base of the hilly country, in latitude 38 degrees and longitude 146 degrees 45 minutes, and, following an east-south-east direction for 19 miles, joins the Barney. Although running throughout the year, it is a small river, sometimes admitting a person to cross almost without wetting his feet. This river is also occupied, with the exception of a few miles of indifferent country near its source. The Barney, I have every reason to believe, rises about 30 miles southwest of Mount Buller, and, after flowing south-southeast for about 45 miles, enters the low country. Its course is then east for 7 miles, and southeast and by south for 16 miles, when, after receiving the waters of the Makinochi, it flows into the La Trobe at the distance of 10 miles from Lake Wellington. Near the head of this river, between the Dividing Range and the Gippsland Range, a large extent of fine, open, and well-watered country is said to exist, having been discovered by an exploring party from the Devil's River two or three years ago. Its existence has been corroborated by some natives from the Doro country, and its supposed position was known to several settlers in Gippsland, yet no attempt has hitherto been made by any party in the district to reach it, although an extensive valley called Glenmaggie, stretching in that direction, seems to invite the attempt. A stockman named Andrew Ewing, in the employment of Messrs. Watson and Hunter of Devil's River, informed me he had seen it, and even applied for a license, so far back as November last, to occupy a station there. Not having heard of his arrival, I may presume he has not succeeded in finding a road over the ranges practicable for sheep. Dunlop River The next river in succession, the Dunlop, the Avon of Mr. McAllister, apparently taking its rise near Mount Gisborne or Wellington, and running in a south-southeast direction for twenty miles through a broken and scrubby country, is met at the head of the low country by a minor branch from the westward, passing under a moderately elevated hill called Ben Cruachan. At the distance of twenty miles southeast from the junction, the Dunlop falls into Lake Wellington and is navigable for eight miles from its mouth for vessels of considerable burthen, the depth being four and a half fathoms and width varying from one hundred to two hundred yards. It is deep close to its margin. Heart of Gippsland The country between this river and the Barney, from the foot of the ranges to Lake Wellington, containing one hundred sixty square miles, may be truly called the heart of Gippsland. It consists of fine open plains and forest land, and, from its superior herbage, is, I am of opinion, capable of depasturing 50,000 sheep, or at the rate of two acres to each sheep. A part of this country is in the occupation of the discoverer of Gippsland, Mr. McAllister, whom I am informed, at the enormous expense of between 2,000 pounds and 3,000 pounds, opened a road over the ranges to this beautiful district through the Omeo country, prior to Count Strezlecki's journey. MacArthur River The MacArthur, next in size to the La Trobe, apparently comes from the Snowy Mountains, and a minor branch of it from the Gippsland Range, near Mount Valentina. The country, as far is as known of it, through which it flows, is broken and scrubby to within 23 miles of Lake King, which lake receives its waters. The land on either side of the lower part of the MacArthur is occupied. River Riley The Riley, or Nicholson, a small stream, occasionally dry in places, rising in a minor range, waters an unavailable, scrubby country. It falls into Lake King about a mile to the northward of the mouth of the MacArthur. Thompson, or Tambo River The Thompson, or Tambo, rises about 10 or 12 miles to the east of Omeo. 
It flows into Lake King five miles east of the Riley, after a southerly course of 60 miles. The country between the Thompson and the Snowy River, a distance of about 30 miles, is unexplored, but a river of some magnitude is said to flow through it. Eastern portion of the district not visited. The eastern portion of the district I have not yet visited, nor will a visit to it be practicable until the spring, owing to the ranges being covered with snow. A description of that part of the country will therefore form the subject of a future communication to your honor. Lakes. The whole of the drainage of the ranges and country above described forms an extensive chain of lengths, 49 miles in length, running near to and parallel with the sea coast. The first or westernmost of these, called Lake Wellington by the discoverer, Mr. McMillan, receives the waters of the La Trobe, Mackinacci, Barney, and Dunlap, and is fresh throughout the year. It is in length 12 miles, in width from 6 to 8 and a half, and in depth varying from 1 to 3 fathoms. The country between it and the sea has not been explored. That to the westward and northward is generally good, and all that is available occupied. McLennan's Straits. The outlet of this lake is through a narrow channel six miles long and from 100 to 200 yards wide and four or five fathoms deep, called McLennan's Straits, so named after one of the party who first explored it in a boat, into Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria also owes its name to the discoverer, Mr. McMillan. It is in length 32 miles and in breadth averaging only about one mile and a half and is generally between four and five fathoms deep. The outlet to the sea at its eastern extremity is too narrow and shoaly to be rendered available except for small boats. Lake King Lake King of Count Streslecki is the northern portion of Lake Victoria, 11 miles long and 7 broad, having an average depth of about 4 fathoms. It receives the waters of the MacArthur, Riley, and Thompson, the former of which carries four and a half fathoms water for upwards of ten miles, although it is only one fathom deep at the entrance. Lake Reeve Communicating with Lake Victoria by means of a very shallow channel, between that lake and the sea coast, is another lake of some extent, called Lake Reeve, after the discoverer John Reeve, J.P., proprietor of a special survey at Port Albert. While exploring the lakes a short time since, with a view to discover if any outlet from the lakes to the sea existed that could be rendered available for shipping, I made an ineffectual attempt to get a boat into Lake Reeve, an outlet to the sea about a mile wide, having been seen by Mr. Reeve from a hill between the two lakes. From a view I also obtained of that lake from a different hill, I am of opinion that should there be an outlet to the sea, it is too shallow to admit of its being used as a harbor. If, therefore, this prove the case, Alberton and the special surveys, although badly situated with reference to the heart of Gippsland, must continue to command the country. Gippsland likely to become a valuable portion of the colony. From the salubrity of the climate, the absence of hot winds and summer frosts, the copious supply of summer rains, the fertility of the soil, Notwithstanding that the lakes should not be available for external navigation, Gippsland will no doubt at some future period become the granary of New South Wales and form a valuable portion of the colony. The number of stations in the district on the 30th of June was 40, and of people employed on them 327, of whom 227 were free males, 51 free females, 47 male prisoners of the Crown, and 2 female prisoners. The stock depasturizing on Crown lands was 410 horses, 20,157 cattle, and 62,455 sheep, besides a few hundred head of cattle and some horses belonging to persons whom I have deemed it necessary to defer recommending for licenses until I shall have received testimonials of their characters from the commissioner of the district they left prior to coming here. Residents at Victoria, at the Shipping Point, and at Terraville. Besides the number of persons given above, there are 120 living on purchased land, viz. at Victoria, Mr. Orr's special survey, 17 males, 6 females, and 13 children. On Major Davidson's survey, shipping place, 18 males, 7 females, and 3 children. At Terraville, Mr. Reeves' special survey, 29 males, 14 females, and 13 children. 
Alberton deserted. Alberton is now quite deserted in consequence of Messrs. Turnbull and Orr having moved their stores and counting house to the shipping point where most of the mercantile business of the district is carried on. Those persons given in my last half-year's return, then residing at Alberton, most of whom were bad characters, have either left the district or have sought refuge on the special surveys. The runaway convicts and other bad characters with which this district was infested a few months ago have, I believe, been nearly all driven out of the district by the system of surveillance pursued by the border police, acting under my instructions. The system will be explained on reference to the annexed copy of a letter addressed by me to the respective settlers. More police required. I regret, however, to observe that the depredations of the Aborigines continue, and that the small police force at my disposal is inadequate to put a stop to them. The most effectual method that suggests itself to me to check these attacks is by establishing two police stations in different parts of the occupied country, each consisting of five troopers of the border police and two of the native police attached as trackers. One of these stations I should propose fixing in the midst of the settlers on the Latrobe or Mekanachi, under the orders of the sergeant of the border police the other at the present headquarters, on the MacArthur, near which the natives have been very troublesome, killing ninety head of cattle belonging to Mr. Sparks at various times, and many belonging to Mr. Jones. In this quarter Mr. Tom has also been a sufferer by their repeated attacks. The Aborigines of Gippsland are supposed to exceed in number those of any other known part of the colony of equal extent, and this supposition is favored by the circumstance of their isolated position being such as— in a great measure, to prevent their being destroyed by wars made upon them by other tribes, as well as of their having had no intercourse with Europeans. Those inhabiting the country about the lakes, judging from the numerous fires, and the different large parties of them I saw while on the lakes, cannot be less than a thousand. Van Diemen's Land, a good market for Gippsland stock. To turn, however, from the loss sustained by the settlers by the depredations of the Aborigines, it is gratifying to remark the comparatively remunerating prices obtained by the stockholders for their stock in the Van Diemen's land market, for which market Alberton is so conveniently situated. The subjoined returns, kindly furnished me by Mr. Turnbull and the collector of customs at Port Albert, show a monthly average of eight vessels for the last half year, employed chiefly in this trade, and an increase of shipping over that of the half year ending December 1843, reported in my former communication to your honor of 1,172 tons. Exports exceed imports as two and two-thirds to one. It also shows the value of exports to have been 8,238 pounds eight shillings for the half year, while that of the imports furnished by Mr. Moore of the customs was, for the last four months only, two thousand thirty seven pounds fifteen shillings fourteen pence being at the rate annually of sixteen thousand four hundred seventy six pounds sixteen shillings exports and six thousand one hundred thirteen pounds six shillings imports the exports exceeding the imports by ten thousand three hundred sixty three pounds ten shillings or nearly as two and two thirds to one revenue the revenue collected by Mr. Moore for the last four months was one hundred fifty seven pounds zero shillings eleven pence, or at the rate of four hundred seventy one pounds two shilling nine pence per annum, but from the recent addition to the district of several settlers with stock, and from the circumstance of the sly grog sellers having been driven from their unlawful occupation and succeeded by two licensed publicans, added to the permission recently promulgated by the governor to the merchants of Alberton, for the sale of wine and beer in quantities not less than two gallons. It may be fairly presumed that the revenue for the ensuing year will exceed that sum. Particulars of Port Albert shipping from the 1st of January to the 30th of June, 1844, inclusive, furnished by Messrs. Turnbull and Company Merchants. Arrivals, 48. Departures, 43. Briggs, 8. Brigantines, 11. Schooners, 17. Cutters, 12. Exports, 886 cattle at 80 shillings, 3,544 pounds. 
21 calves at 20 shillings, 21 pounds. 2,137 sheep at 4 shillings, 427 pounds, 8 shillings. 39 tons bark at 30 shillings, 58 pounds, 10 shillings. 335 bales wool weighing 83,750 pounds at 1 shilling per pound, 4,187 pounds, 10 shillings, for a total of 8,238 pounds, 8 shillings. Amount of tonnage from 1st July to 31st December 1843, 3,339. 1st January to 30th June 1844, 4,511. Increase, 1,172. Statement of the value of all articles imported and exported from 6th March to 5th April 1844, with the amount of duty and other revenue collected during that period furnished by Mr. Moore. Imports, 224 pounds, 10 shillings, 0 pence. Exports, 1,055 pounds, 10 shillings, 0 pence. Amount of revenue collected from duties, nil. From fees, six pounds. Total revenues collected, six pounds. Statement of the value of all articles, imports, and exports during the quarter ending 5th July 1844, with the amount of duty and other revenue collected during that period furnished by Mr. Moore. Imports, 1,813 pounds, five shillings, four pence. Exports, 4,070 pounds, 10 shillings, 6 pence. Amount of revenue collected from duties, 122 pounds, 10 shillings, 2 pence. Amount of revenue collected from fees, 34 pounds, 10 shillings, 9 pence. Total amount of revenue collected, 157 pounds, 0 shillings, 11 pence. Exports from 6th March to 5th April furnished by Mr. Moore. Wool, 12,600 pounds, 630 pounds, 0 shillings, 0 pence. Cattle, 93 head, 366 pounds, 0 shillings, 0 pence. Sheep, 85 head, 42 pounds, 10 shillings, 0 pence. Sundries, 17 pounds, 0 shillings, 0 pence. Total, 1,055 pounds, 10 shillings, 0 pence. Exports for quarter ending 5th July furnished by Mr. Moore. Wool, 10,440 pounds, 522 pounds, 0 shillings, 0 pence. Cattle, 6,540 head, 2,476 pounds, 0 shillings, 0 pence. Sheep, 2,408, 909 pounds, 14 shillings, 0 pence. Sundries, 162 pounds, 16 shillings, 6 pence. For a total of 4,070 pounds, 10 shillings, 6 pence. Having now endeavored to convey to your honor a succinct account of the District of Gippsland generally, as proposed at the commencement of this letter, I may now be permitted to make a few brief remarks on the state of that part of it more immediately connected with Port Albert. Alberton. The government township of Alberton, as before stated, is entirely abandoned, owing chiefly perhaps to its possessing no commercial advantages, being out of the line of road from the interior to the shipping point. Victoria. The Victoria Township, on Mr. Orr's special survey, cannot, for the same reason, be other than a small village. Major Davidson's survey, containing, I believe, 180 acres, commands the anchorage. There are, however, only about 10 acres of scrub available for any purpose whatever, the remainder being a saltwater swamp. Besides, the present few inhabitants have either to cart water a distance of five miles or to beg it from the shipmasters. Two wells have been sunk, but the water in both cases proved salt. A township evidently cannot be established at this point. Terraville. On the contrary, the township of Terraville, Mr. Reeves' survey, has the advantage of being so situated as to command the nearest line of road to the interior, and at the same time of being within a convenient distance, about three and a half miles, of the shipping point. 
It has also the advantage of water communication to the shipping for vessels of small burthen, such as lighters. Reserve Recommended under these circumstances, I feel it my duty to recommend that portion of land on the Terra Creek to the southward of Mr. Reeves' survey be reserved until it shall be finally decided on what site the government township would be most advantageously situated. A courthouse and lockup are about to be built at the expense of the settlers as soon as a convenient site can be ascertained and sanctioned by the government. In informing your honor of these circumstances, I cannot refrain from expressing my opinion that the erection of these buildings and the appointing Alberton a place to hold petty sessions will be attended with no advantage whatever unless a constable and lock keeper be allowed. Hitherto the duty has been performed by the border police, but it is evident that the services of the few men of that corps attached to this district are equally required to protect the settlers against the incursions of the Aborigines and for other police purposes in the interior. In conclusion, I beg to express my expectation of being enabled to complete this report in the spring, when the disappearance of the snow from the ranges will admit of my visiting the eastern portion of the district. I have the honor to be, sir, your honor's most obedient servant, Charles J. Tyers, Commissioner Crowned Lands, His Honor C. J. Latrobe, Esquire, Melbourne. End of section 39. Section 40 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Number 40. From C. Hutton, Melbourne. Melbourne, August 19th, 1853. Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of Your Excellency's letter of the 29th July last, requesting information regarding the first occupation of the Compaspe and King Parrot Creeks. My party was one of the numerous ones which drove sheep overland from the Sydney to the Port Phillip district in 1838. Unfortunately, Qatar broke out in some of the flocks between the Murray and the Ovens, and, rapidly spreading to others, compelled the proprietors to seek for not only new runs, but new districts, where no sheep were already depasturing. Mr. P. Snodgrass, Dr. Dixon, Farquhar Mackenzie, and others followed up the Goulburn, and found suitable runs on that river and its tributaries. I crossed the Goulburn in June, following Sir Thomas Mitchell's line of road, till I reached the Compaspe Plains, subsequently occupied by Monroe, and then known as Monroe's Plains, where I kept the stock for upwards of a month while I examined the surrounding country, and I then moved lower down the creek to the run, which I disposed of in 1840 to Messrs. Jennings and Plain, and which has now passed into the hands of J. H. Patterson. At that time there were no runs taken up to the north of Mitchell's line, excepting Mr. Bowman's, on the Culliban, at the foot of Mount Alexander, which shortly after came into the possession of Mr. Orr, who is, I believe, still the occupier. It will be in Your Excellency's recollection that 1838 was the year of the great drought, and it was only by having my marching establishment complete, and thus constantly shifting my ground, that I was enabled to keep the stock alive. When I came into that district in July, the ground was exceedingly dry, the grass apparently dead, although after the first rain it grew again most luxuriantly. The water holes very low, and for nine months there was not even a moderate shower to freshen the herbage. Consequently, there was no attraction for settlers, and I had no neighbor, except those I have mentioned, during my stay there. I am informed that there are now between 200,000 and 300,000 sheep depasturing on the lower Compassby Plains, where, in 1838-39, there was not grass enough to feed half a dozen goats. I only knew of two tribes of natives in that part of the country, one called the Goulburn Blacks, who chiefly stopped on that river, but occasionally came as far as my station, a distance of about fifty-five miles, and were tolerably well behaved, only pilfering and sometimes frightening the shepherds, and the other tribe, more particularly belonging to the Compaspe, who, from the first, appeared to have a dislike to the whites. I can hardly tell the numbers of these tribes, but think the Compaspe blacks might muster about forty able-bodied men in all. 
They were rather fine men, but very mischievous, and did much damage, not only to myself, but to the settlers as far as Ebden's Run, at Mount Macedon. No doubt there was blame on both sides, and had the whites not been over-familiar with them for the sole purpose of getting their women, many of the outrages then perpetrated might have been avoided. The greater part of these men suddenly disappeared, and I know it was, and perhaps is still thought, that they were slaughtered by the whites, and especially by myself. But my belief is that they died from influenza, which was prevalent in a very severe form at that time, and to my own knowledge more than one died of it. And as your excellency is about to leave the colony, and I may not have another opportunity, it is a satisfaction to myself to solemnly assure you that I never shot or otherwise destroyed one of them. I never even fired at one, and only once, when some troopers came up to apprehend them for killing two of my shepherds, am I aware of any being killed by the whites. My run on the King Parrot Creek was taken up by my overseer, and I never resided on the station. It was adjoining Farquhar Mackenzie's, and indeed at one time was claimed by him. I can give Your Excellency no current information of the first occupation of that part of the country. I have the honor to be, sir, Your Excellency's obedient servant, C. Hutton. His Excellency, C. J. Latrobe, Esquire, etc. End of section 40、section、forty section one of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Number forty one from John Aitken. Mount Aitken. Mount Aitken, 26th August, 1853. Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your letter of the 27th of July, asking information regarding the first settlement of Victoria. I beg leave to inform you that Mr. Batman, who arrived in May 1835, was the first person who visited Port Phillip from Van Diemen's Land. Messrs. Jackson, Evans, and myself, Arrived in Hobson's Bay in September of the same year for the purpose of exploring the country preparatory to bringing stock over from Van Diemen's land. The country appeared to us so well adapted for grazing purposes, both as regarded pasturage and climate, that we lost no time in going back to Van Diemen's land for our stock. In March 1836, I landed with my sheep, etc., at Arthur's Seat, owing to the ship getting around in the bay and traveled with them to this place. Called by His Excellency Sir Richard Burke, Mount Aitken, where I have continued to reside ever since. Mr. Batman and Mr. Arthur brought sheep over from Van Diemen's Land about the end of 1835 or the beginning of 1836. The above mentioned gentlemen were the only parties who brought stock prior to my arrival. Various other parties arrived soon after me with stock, viz., Messrs. Jackson, Evans, Brock, Brody, Sams, Wedge, Franks, Malcolm, Smith, Sutherland, White, Clark, and Faulkner. The latter gentleman was the cane, or the first killer of the soil in this province. Unfortunately, he made a poor selection opposite the present city of Melbourne in the swamp, and consequently it turned out a failure. Owing to this circumstance, the impression became general that, however well adapted the country was for the grazing of sheep and cattle, It was altogether unsuited for agricultural purposes. The consequence of this false impression was that Van Diemen's land farmers immediately raised the price of wheat to one pound per bushel, as they imagined this country would be entirely dependent upon them for supplies of breadstuffs. In June and July, 1837, settlers from the Sydney side commenced to arrive. Amongst the earliest were Messrs. Howey, Ebden, Mollison, Hamilton, Coghill, and Hepburn. A great number of others immediately following them. With reference to the natives, on landing at Arthur's seat, they were mostly friendly, assisting me to land my sheep, etc. About eighty was the number I then saw, being the Western Port tribe, some of whom accompanied me in my journey round the bay to Melbourne. The Mount Macedon tribe of natives came to my tent soon after my arrival at Mount Aitken. I did all in my power to conciliate them. By giving them rations of rice, sugar, flour, etc., while they remained about the place. 
The number of the tribe, as near as I could guess, was about one hundred, men, women, and children. I consider that this tribe was more savage than the Western Port tribe, a neighbor of mine, Mr. Franks, and his servant being murdered while serving out food to them. Two of Mr. Gellibrand's men were killed soon after by the same tribe. I had great reason to be thankful that I succeeded in saving myself and shepherds from sharing a similar fate. I have the honor to be, sir, your Excellency's most obedient servant, John Aitken. His Excellency C.J. La Trobe, Esquire, Lieutenant Governor of Victoria, etc., etc. End of section 41《セクション42 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand《Letters from Victorian Pioneers》Letter No. 42 From Peter Snodgrass, St. Kilda St. Kilda, September 15, 1853 Sir, in reply to your letter of the twenty ninth July last, requesting information respecting the first occupation of the Goulburn River and the general line of the Sydney Road, or any other portion of the colony of which I am personally cognizant, I beg to state that I arrived in Port Phillip with stock from the Sydney district in May eighteen thirty seven, in company with Messrs. Hughes, Farquhar Mackenzie, Murdoch, and Colonel White. I took up a station on the Muddy Creek and Goulburn River. Mr. Hughes located himself on a creek known as Hughes. Mr. Mackenzie took up a station on the King Parrot Creek. Mr. Murdoch occupied the country immediately below me on the Goulburn, and Colonel White formed his station on the Sunday Creek. At that time, the only person living on the river was Mr. John Clark, who was resident at that part known as the Old Crossing Place. He had arrived there the previous February. There were no residents to the north of the Goulburn, with the exception of two houses of accommodation at the Murray and Ovens rivers. About two years subsequently, Messrs. Colburn and Fletcher took possession of the country above me on the Goulburn, Acheron, and Rubicon rivers. Dr. Patrick first occupied the station, now known as Cathkin, in the occupation of Mr. Maxwell, and Messrs. Watson and Hunter occupied the Devil's River. The first occupants of the Goulburn below Seymour were Colonel Anderson, who took the country immediately adjoining, Messrs. Mantons, who occupied both sides of the river, including almost the whole from thence to the Murray, and Mr. MacGregor, who located himself near the junction of the Broken River and Seven Creeks with the Goulburn. Mr. Gideon Stewart occupied the country on the Sunday Creek, contiguous to that part now known as the township of Broadford. Dr. Hamlin, the land around Kilmore, Mr. Archibald Tom, Beveridge's Flat, and Mr. Malcolm can lock you. It is beyond my power to state precisely at what time each station was taken up, but the whole of the above parties were an occupation of them in the year 1840. The number of the Aborigines on the Goulburn and its tributaries at the time of my first settling there was probably about five or six hundred. They were generally scattered about in small tribes in various parts of the rivers and creeks, but occasionally collected in large numbers. At first they killed several of the men in the employment of the settlers, and some of their sheep and cattle. But, by using conciliatory measures, they gradually became well disposed toward the white inhabitants. From the statement of the natives themselves, they seem to have been much more numerous some few years before our arrival amongst them, but they suffered severely from the smallpox, of which disease many of them bore evident marks. In fact, individuals may be seen to this day who have plainly suffered from that malady. From their first acquaintance with the white population, their numbers have diminished from disease and other causes, until there are perhaps scarcely one-fifth of the number above stated, and it seems probable that in a few years they will become extinct. I have the honor to be Your Excellency's most obedient servant, Peter Snodgrass. To His Excellency C. J. La Trobe, Esquire. End of Section 42 Section 43 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Number 
from c b hall amherst burbank amherst burbank sixth september eighteen fifty three my dear mr latrobe in answer to your letter requesting me to communicate any information that i may be able to give respecting the early settlement of a portion of this colony i have much pleasure in forwarding the accompanying document i have revised it carefully and believe that the facts stated are correct to the best of my knowledge and recollection my interest in the colony arising from early association has long been great and though uncomfortably disturbed by recent important changes in its social aspect is still so much as to cause me to hope that its history may be rescued from oblivion i cannot but trust that there is some promise of this being now done in a manner which must gratify all who can appreciate graphic records and vivid descriptions i remain my dear mr latrobe very faithfully yours c b hall to his excellency c j latrobe melbourne muster cattle on manaroo in the year eighteen forty i assisted in mustering on the plains of manaroo a herd of cattle belonging to a dr sherwin and purchased from him by a mercantile firm in sydney to send to port phillip as a speculation start for port phillip thirteen hundred mixed cattle were gathered with which our party started in august for port phillip by way of yass many other herds on the road there were several other herds traveling on this road at that time it was said that there were twenty thousand cattle between yass and melbourne however this may have been there were so many different parties moving with stock in the same line as ourselves as made it necessary that great care should be exercised to prevent the mixing of herds and consequent annoyance and confusion the crossing places over the rivers this was particularly the case at the crossing places over the rivers where sometimes from accident bad management or from the cattle proving refractory one party would occupy more in front or behind to send all their men that could be spared to assist at such times the intermediate district through which the road lay was very thinly settled and stocked but still it was all nominally taken up there was however abundance of grass and water for traveling herds without interfering with the resident stock the major's line in approaching the district of port phillip we understood that the line which we followed was that struck out by major mitchell on his return from portland bay finding when we reached the goulburn river that the cattle market in melbourne was overstocked it was determined to place the herd on a run if it could be found Compaspe with this view the country was explored to the north of major mitchell's return line first down the compaspe but though there was no station below what is now mr linott's one formed below it having been abandoned on account of the attack of the natives the country looked so parched up and uninviting that it was not taken up lower laden the same cause deterred us from occupying the lower laden which had been already passed by others as worthless the value of it and the country to the north generally as a winter run for stock not having then been ascertained halt the herd at glenmana in order to more perfectly prosecute the search for available country the herd was halted at the creek lately occupied by mcneil and hall near burnbank whence excursions were made in various directions dutton simpson and darlot this creek was then occupied by an outstation of Messrs. Dutton, Simpson, and Darlot, who had recently arrived from the Sydney district with one of the largest establishments that had ever come over land. It formed the western portion of their run, their eastern boundary being forty miles distant, near Mount Alexander. On this same creek to the southward, nearer to the Maiden Hills, the Messrs. Hodgkinson were established, the southern portion of their run having been previously held by Messrs. Lang and Griffin, who had moved from it to Mount Elephant, and prior to them by a Mr. Bowman, or Borman, who I understood was drowned in a going by sea from Melbourne to Sydney. At this time there were no stations to the north of this part of the country. Avoca River the avoca was also unoccupied except at its source in the amphitheatre among the pyrenees where mr irvin had a sheep station there had been a station taken up about ten miles below this by a mr oliphant but one or two of his shepherds having been killed by the natives it was deserted and occupied afterwards by mr irvin mr briggs who finally settled at the grampians had halted hereabouts for some weeks on his way down from bathurst with sheep Southerly from this neighborhood the country was held by Messrs. Donald and Hamilton, west from Mount Misery, by Messrs. Lermonth, 
north, east, and south from the same hill, by Mr. McCallum, north from Mount Beckwith, he having purchased from Mr. Hawden, in the same line proceeding easterly by Mr. Donald Cameron, and further on by Captain McLaughlin, to the north of whom were Mr. McLaughlin McKinnon, who afterwards sold to Mr. Hunter, and Mr. Colin McKinnon, who disposed of his station to the Messrs. Joyce and moved on to the Pyrenees. River Wimera, Mount Cole Proceeding west past the Avoca, we found the Mount Cole branch of the River Wimera, occupied at the upper part, first by Mr. Irvine with sheep, next to him by Mr. Lynott with cattle of Dr. Imlays of Twofold Bay, and below him by Mr. Francis. Mr. Francis was killed in 1842 by a wound inflicted by a madman whom he had imprudently employed. Mr. Lynott, about the same time, sold his station to Mr. J. A. Cameron for thirteen hundred pounds, who lately disposed of it to Mr. C. Williamson of Melbourne for thirty thousand pounds. Want of Water to the North On exploring the unoccupied country to the north, we found it without water. Places to which we were taken by the natives with assurances that there would be plenty of water, we found quite dry. This was particularly remarkable in the channel of the Wimera, which looked as if it had not run below the stations of Mr. Clark of Dowling Forest, then managed by Mr. Francis, for some years. Mount William, Wimera From this district to the Mount William branches of the Wimera there were no settlers, though Mr. Blow shortly afterwards came in upon the intervening space with sheep of Mr. Sinclair's of Van Diemen's Land, occupying country which is now held by Dr. Blundell and Dr. Thompson, it having first passed through the hands of Mr. John Allen, and thence, I believe, into the possession of the Bank of Australia. Near to Mount William, Mr. Horace Wills, from the Murrumbidgee River, was settled. He had sold a portion of his run to Captain Bunbury. Mr. Kirk was superintending a station east from Mount William on the Hopkins River. This was afterwards sold to Messrs. McGill and Ross, and by them recently disposed of to Messrs. Richardson and Wright and Roger. From these stations north for twenty miles, following the course of the Wimera, there was no one. Beyond this distance, Captain Briggs was settled with sheep brought down from near Bathurst, the property of the Redfern estate there. These were sold to Mr. Boyd of Sydney Notoriety, and next purchased, I believe, by the present proprietor, Mr. Carafe. Plains and Northern Wimera. North of this place, the plains and river Wimera itself were totally unoccupied, little known, and supposed to be worthless for stock. Progress and Cause of Settlement of the Inferior Northern Country. At this time, the richer portions only of the colony found favor in the eyes of intending settlers as only being calculated to afford marketable stock. Afterwards, when melting down had been established into a system rendering settlers independent of the limited market of Melbourne, and giving a value to lean stock in consequences of their being in demand to replace stock boiled down from the richer runs, country till then despised was greedily taken up. The northern plains and the parts more immediately watered by the Wimera and its tributaries were occupied under these circumstances. Then it was discovered that tracts which had been passed over as barren in summer had a peculiar value in winter, and in fact it gradually became apparent that they were second to no district in their capacity for producing fat stock, the fattening seasons, however, being different. Water becoming more permanent. Their condition also of being in a great part without water seemed to have altered, and creeks which had formerly been dry for long periods now filled with the regular rains. We take up a run. Finding the vacant country between Captain Bunbury's and Mr. Briggs's stations in some respect suitable for our purpose, we occupied it, intending, however, to remain there only for a time, during which search for a more favorable spot might be prosecuted. The station changes hands. The station so formed remained permanent, passing into the hands of Messrs. Rose and Jackson, and from them to Mr. Horace Wills, Mr. Rose, in 1843, taking up a run to the west of the Grampians, between Mount Zero and the Victoria Range. At this time, following the Grampians round the southwest, there was no station beyond that of Captain Bunbury, till Mount Sturgeon was reached, where Dr. Martin of Heidelberg had a herd of cattle in charge of Mr. Knowles. Shortly after I settled, however, Mr. Churnside took up a small creek flowing on to the plains from Mount William. To the southeast, Messrs. Stevens and Thompson had arrived overland with sheep from Yass and occupied the Fiery Creek. East of them were the Messrs. Campbell, who had settled at Mount Cole about a year before. 
between the grampians and victoria range a mr dwyer took up in eighteen forty two some country at the back of dr martin's run river glenelg upper parts vacant the upper glenelg at its rise amongst the ranges was unoccupied nor am i aware that any country for a considerable distance west from its source was taken up till later and all towards mount arapiles and on the waters running to the wimera from the western side of the grampians was yet vacant river norton it was not until eighteen forty three that mr rose took up a run on the headwaters of the norton or mackenzie which i had explored much earlier for a heifer station reaching it through a wild and beautiful pass now called rose's gap but which i did not then think worth occupying victoria range it was about eighteen forty three that mr d c simpson took up country lying immediately beneath the victoria range to the west and various stations were quickly formed on the Romera and Upper Glenelg, Mr. Sherratt establishing himself on the latter river below Mr. Simpson, having removed from near Mount Alexander. I leave the Grampians. At the end of 1842, I left my residence at the Grampians and purchased a station from Mr. Simpson on the creek which now forms the western boundary of the county of Talbot. My acquaintance with the former neighborhood consequently ceased to be kept up except by casual visits. Loddon District, etc., the Minday. Being thus settled in the Loddon District, in 1843 I formed one of a party, consisting of Mr. McNeil, Mr. Darlot, and myself, with two natives, to explore the plains to the north of the Pyrenees, induced thereto by the accounts the blacks gave of a large lake there, which we were anxious to see, in spite of the Minday, which they gave us to understand infested it, making a prey of emus and blackfellows, and which the old lubras of the tribe asserted would never allow us to return, an imaginary fate which they bewailed with much lamentation and weeping, endeavoring to deter us by picturing the immensity of the monster. One old and hideous hag in particular dabbed her yam stick into the ground dramatically, and affirmed that, Cobra belonging to Mende along this one station, tail it along o Mr. McCallum thus indicating a length of about eleven miles only. The notion of discovering two such wonders, as a lake in a waterless country and a serpent of such magnificent dimensions, only stimulated our determination. So crossing the Avoca in April, 1843, we struck into a dry creek, the Avon, running north from the Pyrenees. Finding it without water throughout its course, which we followed for a day and a half, till discerning no sign of moisture in its channel, and being in great doubt how far the blacks were to be depended on as to their knowledge of any permanent water thereabouts we turned towards the wimera this by travelling all night steering by a star we reached early on the third morning our horses had been two days and three nights without anything to drink except a quart of water to each which we gave them from our keg pouring it into the crown of a cabbage tree hat into which the fold of a mackintosh cloak had first been fitted to make it hold water the winters of 1843 and 44, proving wet, these various northern creeks filled up, and the country near the Lake Bananong was reached and occupied by Messrs. J. and W. Donald and the Messrs. Wedge, who sold to Mr. Robert McCready. The lower Avoca was also taken up first, below the stations of Mr. Irvine, by Mr. J. L. Foster and Mr. Archdale, since dead, near Beliba next by Messrs. Ellis, Shore, and Elliot, followed by others, down its whole course. Nearer the Pyrenees, on a branch of the Avoca, were Mr. Colin McKinnon, removal from the Loddon, and Mr. James Campbell. Avon River On the sources of the Avon among the northern spurs of the Pyrenees, a large tract of country was taken up about this time by Mr. Lawrence Rostron. Pleasure of Exploring there was a wonderful charm in exploring country thus uninhabited except by the natives and wild birds and animals. These occupied, without altering the face of nature, which, heterodox as the opinion in these days may seem, was, to my eye, more beautiful than in its present aspect of national pretensions and magnificence. Herds of kangaroo abounded in the forests, and emus grazed over the plains, in some cases so tame as to approach the rider with a strange gaze of curiosity. The creeks were then all fringed with reeds and rushes, undevoured by hungry cows and gaunt working bullocks. These reeds and rushes formed a beautiful edging to the dark solemn pools overhung by the water-loving gum trees, where wild fowl abounded, as the plains did with quail and turkeys. 
abundance of game. About the Grampians, in particular, game was most plentiful. My stockman repeatedly brought in young live emu, which he had ridden down, and kangaroo tail soup, in its abundance, ceased to have any attraction for us. I had tame emu chickens performing their strange juvenile antics round my reed mia mia, yellow striped and downy little objects difficult to be recognized as the sources from which future mature emus were to grow. A female kangaroo was a familiar intimate of my hut, and on excellent terms with the dogs that had murdered its poor mother. Wild ducks, geese, and swans were constant visitors upon the water hole opposite my door, and occasionally a pelican or spoonbill appeared as a rarity. The Natives Hostilities At the period of my entrance into the colony of Australia Felix, in almost every part of it the mutual relation of the natives and settlers, at first, was one of distrust and violence. This, it was stated, arose from the attempts of the blacks to steal sheep or other property of value from the settlers. These robberies were often accompanied with violence and murder, committed in the treacherous manner common to most savages. Such occurrences naturally led to reprisals in which the superior arms and energy of the settlers and of their servants told with fatal effect upon the native race. Instances of this deplorable result might often be observed by the explorer in the early days of the settlement of the colony. Native Skeleton in a Water Hole when I was passing with the cattle over the eastern Wimera, a shepherd came up and entered into a conversation with me. He held a carbine in the place of a crook, and an old regulation pistol was stuck in his belt, instead of the more classical pastoral pipe. Pastoral pursuits in Australia, being attended at this time with circumstances more calculated to foster a spirit of war than one of music. After some conversation... He led me to a water hole where the skeleton of a native, exposed by the shrinking of the water in the summer heat, lay on the mud. There was a bullet hole through the back of the skull. He was shot in the water, the man told me, as he was a trying to hide himself after a scrimmage. There was a lot more t'other side. Bones under a gum tree. I might see the bones a sticking up out of the ground close to the big fallen gum tree, where they'd been stowed away all of a heap. A grave good enough, he took occasion to assure me, for the sneaking, murdering black cannibals. Bones under the logs of a bush fire. On another branch of the Wimera, when looking for the horses one morning, after camping out, my black boy came back, his complexion changed to yellow with fright. Taking me away to a short distance, he showed me three or four bodies partially concealed by logs. There were numerous tracks of horses round about. He explained the occurrence in his way. I believe, black fellow... Bibaluli sheep about, then white fellow Gilbert, and put em along a fire. Every station had some tragic tale connected with this subject. At one, a parakeet was pointed out as it ran about the floor of the hut quite tame. It had been the only thing left at an outstation by the blacks, after murdering the hut-keeper and stealing the utensils and rations. It had been found perched on a tie-beam over the dead body and brought in to the home station. Hut-keeper left for dead. At another, the servant who brought in the tea and damper had his face distorted. He had once been a good-looking man, but the blacks came on him one morning when he was shifting the hurdles, battered his face in, left him for dead, and robbed the hut. Spears taken out of cattle. At a third, there was a heap of pieces of spears piled up on the rough slab mantelpiece. These had been taken out of the various cows and bullocks on a cattle run, where the natives had attacked them in the ranges, killing many and driving the rest away. The place was shown where they had their corroboree to celebrate the triumph. The ground was beaten smooth and hard where they had danced, and bark plates lay about on which the choice morsels had been heaped. Cattle driven off the run. On this run, out of 1,500 head of cattle, all had been driven off, but about 30 crawlers. It was many weeks before they were remustered. Sheep driven away, legs broken. From another station, a whole flock of sheep had been taken away far to the north. A few only were recovered, numbers being found by the pursuers with their legs broken, a cruel sort of tethering resorted to in those days by the natives under these circumstances. Settler Speared Again, at another station, a stockyard was pointed out in which one of the earlier proprietors had been speared while milking a cow. Natives Made Useful Yet with all this, the natives generally were welcomed at the stations, for the most part, and they made themselves useful in many ways. 
as for instance in stripping bark finding lost horses and in acting as guides and messengers but they seem always to have availed themselves of any opening for attack left by incaution at least for a long time after the first occupation of the country numerous about the grampians fish weirs about the grampians they were numerous at the time of my residence and had apparently been much more so judging from the traces left by them in the swampy margins of the river at these places we found many low sod banks extending across the shallow branches of the river with apertures at intervals in which were placed long narrow circular nets like a large stocking made of rush work heaps of mussel shells were also found abounding on the banks and old miamias where the earth around was strewed with the balls formed in the mouth when chewing the farinaceous matter out of the bulrush root bird catching they had the art here of catching birds with a long slender stick like a fishing rod at the end of which was a noose of grass twisted up with this apparatus and a screen of boughs they succeeded in putting salt on birds tails to some purpose one old villainous looking black of my acquaintance used to catch large bundles of quail which he would barter freely for suet the kidney fat of a sheep would purchase a dozen brace crawfish the lubras fished up crawfish from the shallow muddy water holes with their toes and yam sticks and exchanged them for the dainties of civilized life a large tin dish full might be obtained in barter by a small expenditure of tea and sugar and when treated with a certain degree of gastronomic science formed a not unwelcome change of diet from mutton chops or salt beef which in those days was the almost unvaried food of the cormorant squatocracy native tracks i here first saw the tracks formed by the natives in traveling over any particular pass there was one across the grampian range about fifteen miles north of mount william leading up a wild romantic glen and over on to the source of the glenelg i found another through the tea tree scrub of the wannon near mount sturgeon from which on each side of the river other tracks diverged over the open ground they were much like cattle tracks except that they passed over places which cattle were not likely to attempt grass tree one variety of food was in use among the natives here which was new to me at the time it was a portion of the grass tree top this was first pulled out of the stem a few preliminary taps being made with the back of the tomahawk and then a length of soft white succulent matter neatly twisted off the lower extremity where it had been embedded in the rugged trunk it reminded me of asparagus in the proportion of tender to tough i also observed them take a red grub out from the grass tree which i was informed was marajig and like it sugar with an assurance further that i was a stupid fellow for not adopting it as an article of diet i cannot confirm the character given of this eatable however not having been induced by the scorn and wonder of the aborigines to test their bill of fare further than by trying the crawfish and grass tree i conceive it quite possible however that an unprejudiced person might pronounce grubs red or white less repulsive in appearance as food than a fat delicious oyster i am by no means convinced that while in our self-satisfied horror at seeing fellow men black and savage though they be eating things certainly not unlike worms we abstain from australian grubs we may not be losing the enjoyment of a delicacy second only to white bait how the blacks eat emu skin when endeavoring to find the lake called Bainanong, before spoken of, I shot an emu, which the blacks who were with us received as a great prize. They cooked and eat it in a style which amused us much. Having first roughly plucked it, they took off the skin, which they stuffed with tender gum twigs. Thus prepared, it was delicately toasted at a slow fire, and then rich, yellow, oily lengths of what looked like the thickest of the fattest possible goose skin were trimmed off and swallowed as the lazzaroni of naples are said to suck down macaroni places of interment from one or two instances which came before us i am inclined to believe that the blacks about the grampian used to bury their dead in hollow trees on one occasion i discovered my stockman manifesting a mysterious dislike to a particular vicinity and on questioning him ascertained that at the foot of a hollow tree at the place in question were the half-burnt remains of a human being at another a dead body was plainly perceptible high up in the hollow of an old gum tree superiority of the laden and marable natives the natives at the grampians were generally speaking a much inferior tribe in appearance to those of the more fertile districts such as the laden and marable 
It seemed as if they depended physically upon the nature of the country which they occupied, the richer portions of the colony nourishing its inhabitants into better grown and handsomer men and women than the less fertile parts. About the Loddon and Marable I have seen men who might have served as models of symmetry and strength, and whose figures were perfection as regards the animal man. The lubras also here were often found tall, well-shaped, and good-looking, as far as could be judged of through a coating of grease and various pigments and filth, white, black, and red. Inferiority of the Grampian Blacks At the Grampians, both sexes were distinguished by preeminent ugliness and dirt, as far as I had opportunities of judging. Absence of Feeling of Revenge in all parts of the colony in which I have been, the character of the natives seems to be free from the inclination to vengeance so common among most savages, at least to vengeance toward the civilized intruder upon their country. Their murders of and thefts from the white population seem generally to have been prompted by mere acquisitiveness, the objects of their desire being different from those which tempt the criminals of civilized communities. The diplomatists of their tribes may even, perhaps, have pleaded justification that their kangaroos and emus were driven away by the flocks and herds of the settlers, for reprisals among an invading enemy, stimulating a sort of guerrilla warfare, not indeed with the war cry pro eris et focis, but for a reason no less cogent to men whose undisciplined appetites may be presumed to have been keen enough. Their cannibalism and cutting out of warriors' kidney fat were only manifestations probably of their religion or superstition, as the rack and the faggot have been and the prison is now, the means by which the dominant orthodoxy of the day is vindicated on the other side of the world. Apart from these peculiarities, I am of opinion that they may, towards the whites, at least in the main, be considered a placable people. For let them be offended ever so bitterly, and overtures then be proffered towards reconciliation through the medium of the cheap gifts which pervert their wisdom, and their wrath evaporates like the morning dew. I have known their dogs to be shot, an offense generally of the deepest die against their social code, and the tribe depart in consequence, shaking as it were the dust from their feet against the station where the offense had been committed, the men jabbering all kinds of native imprecations, as was supposed, and the women howling ululations and hugging their dead mangy darlings in their arms. In a month they have come back smilingly for tobacco, protesting with the utmost amiability that all gone sulky now. C.B. Hall End of section 43section 44 of letters from victorian pioneers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org letters from victorian pioneers letter number 44 from colin campbell dear sir in answer to your excellency's communication of twenty ninth july requesting me to supply any information in my power as to the time and circumstances of the first settlement and occupation of the mount cole country i have great pleasure in mentioning such particulars as have come within my knowledge as an old settler although not one of the first inhabitants i have the honour to be with respectful regards your most obedient servant colin campbell to his excellency c j latrobe esq in October 1838 I left London with my brother, and arrived at Hoberton in March 1839 with the intention of proceeding to Port Phillip. In Van Diemen's Land we bought about two thousand sheep, which, after great trouble and delay, we landed at Williamstown without much loss. Many others were not so fortunate, losing half their cargo from stress of weather and close confinement. We also imported from Van Diemen's Land some fifteen horses. Our sheep cost us at first about fifteen shillings per head, but prices were then rising rapidly, and the cost of shipment and the risk of loss were great. In the month of July, 1839, I think sheep had reached two pounds per head in Port Phillip. During that winter, flour, owing partly to monopoly, rose to seventy pounds per ton in Melbourne. The wages of shepherds and hut-keepers reached about forty pounds per annum, and one pound per week was given to extra hands. The sheep from Van Diemen's Land were all scabby, and the disease became much more virulent when they were put in yards in Port Phillip. This was a source of great trouble and expense, and the act then in force prevented sheep from travelling except in February. We therefore spent the winter of 1839 at the Darabin Creek, under canvas on a small scale, and were there assailed by a succession of floods, which continued at intervals until Christmas, 
on which day I saw a flock of sheep and half a dozen men nearly drowned in the Yarra. In summer shearing was got over, and the wool sold at high prices, although much damaged, about one shilling sixpence per pound in Melbourne. Then we explored for a run, and my brother, after surveying the then barren plains of the Loddon, selected the country at the foot of Mount Cole as the best unoccupied tract. Thither we proceeded with the usual equipment, and in the beginning of March arrived at the Fiery Creek a few miles from the base of Mount Cole. At that time, the country was occupied from Geelong up to the Trawalla Ranges, but was quite vacant beyond these to the north and west. We tenanted a large tract of country, as it was the fashion then for squatters to occupy the best spots as stations, without much regard to their distance from each other, but our dimensions were shorn by flock owners from Sydney, who preferred appropriation to original discovery. It was upon this occasion that the Commissioner of the Western District did me the honour of designating me as a shabby Scotchman, although I was not aware of the fact until very lately. In the year 1840 stock began to pass down from the Sydney side by the Major's Line, which was then deeply furrowed with dray tracks, but the plains to the southwest of Mount Cole remained unoccupied, the prevailing feeling among settlers at that time being that they were too bare and uncomfortable for either man or beast. The country at the head of the Hopkins was, however, taken up soon after ours, with Sydney flocks. The north side of Mount Cole was also occupied about 1841 with sheep and cattle, and depasturage gradually extended down the Wimmera, reaching Lake Hindmarsh about 1846. It was about 1848 that the Richardson and the Avoca became settled, and a change having come over the seasons, which supplied with water tracts of country which had appeared unavailable. To return to Mount Cole, about a year after our first occupation we began to feel settled, having subdued the scab. I was induced, however, very foolishly, to sell the greater part of my sheep and run, from an idea that horses and cattle could be managed at much less expense. So they were, but on the other hand they produced a still smaller income, owing to the great depreciation which took place about 1843, and continued for some five years from that time. Wool alone, I may observe, was independent of this change, and the returns derived from this source from England alone enabled the squatters to weather the storm and the merchants and shopkeepers to carry on their business. Many of the original squatters, however, went down in my neighborhood, and others took their place, buying stations in some cases at little more than a year's income. Squatters at that time, if they could not provide cash, could only get credit through a merchant, for the banks gave them no facilities otherwise. The result was that a large number of settlers were in receipt of advances which cost them about twenty per cent. It was not, I believe, until within the last five years that they became, as a class, independent in their circumstances. The natives, when we first went to Mount Cole, were numerous, but nothing like a census of them was ever taken. When we first camped upon their grounds, as might be expected, they made a demonstration against us by collecting a body of fighting men in our vicinity. It became necessary to dislodge them from their position, but as five or six of us marched steadily up to their camp with the intention of demanding an explanation, they all ran away, and never came round us again for twelve months. We met a black boy, Jackie, however, and induced him to come home with us, and he lived in or about our huts for about three years without ever leaving us for any length of time. He was very intelligent, and proved useful in tracking lost sheep, exploring country, etc., but when he came to a certain age he sought himself a wife, and became a man and a savage. He was always honest and faithful, and at one time incurred some risk from a bushranger, who took his horse from him when he was tailing some heifers, and whom he resisted manfully until a pistol was presented at him. From a good many years' experience I can bear witness to the intelligence and good feeling of the blacks, and believe their capabilities to be almost equal to those of Europeans, but their associations from birth upwards are very powerful." I shall never forget a lesson I gave a fine young man, the son of King William, in geography. When I showed him the map of New Holland, he thought it was a plan of the run. Then I pointed out to him where we were at Mount Cole, and he took it all in. I then showed him the map of Asia, and he understood the relative size of its different parts. I then showed him the map of the world with Asia in it, and he opened his eyes and made exclamations for five minutes together as the new idea flashed upon him. In 1851 I resided for four or five months at the station with Mrs. Campbell, and at one time there were about a hundred natives encamped beside us. I walked through them and introduced Mrs. C. When I came to King William I said, Mrs. C., King W., etc. 
when he took off a cocked hat and made a neat bow, but added, Borak, Mrs. Campbell, Mrs. Colin Campbell, reserving the former honor for my senior brother's wife when he gets one. Footnote. Borak means no, not so. End footnote. When I was last at the station, in October 1852, I found that the very high wages given to the whites had caused the services of the natives to be regularly enlisted. About forty thousand sheep were washed by them alone at Mount Cole, wages being given them at the rate of twelve shillings per week, and they went on steadily at the end of shearing. Two or three were receiving one pound a week as bullock drivers. For ten years previous to this I had seen them earning occasional wages, but I never saw them engaged with such persevering energy as on this occasion. I think, therefore, that good wages would keep the able-bodied men fully employed with an occasional spell, but when they get money the public houses make sad havoc among them. Our tribe from the first saw very little of the protectors, having to run the gauntlet of the Laudan blacks to reach Jim Crow but it often struck me that a voluntary protectorate might have been formed in some parts of the country. Suppose notice to have been given that settlers undertaking the charge of certain natives, and certifying that they had been employed by them for so long a time, would be entitled to receive blankets, clothing, etc., for their benefit. There would have been a great inducement to employ them, both on grounds of public duty and private interest. At least the disadvantages attending their labor would have been somewhat counterbalanced. In this way, small parties of four or five might have been assigned to different stations, where habits of civilization would have grown upon them. The gregariousness of the natives has been the source of the strength of their wandering habits, which have prevented them from settling down in families on particular spots. They lived in clans, and their laws were not dissimilar to those of the Scotch Highlanders a century and a half ago. Divide et impera was, I think, the key to their improvement— but the system of protectors in this colony was one which confirmed their gregarious associations. With regard to missionaries, while the collection of a number of aborigines gives good opportunities, their settlement in distinct places offers a better field for making impressions. In the latter case they would require to be visited where they lived, and it may be hoped that some settlers would take an interest in their eternal welfare. I, for one, cannot sufficiently condemn myself for the neglect of valuable opportunities— at present, I should say the natives are as hopeful subjects for Christianity as many of the whites in the interior. With squatting politics, your excellency must have been ere now surfeited, and I have already trespassed enough upon your patience. However, perhaps you will excuse me for enclosing a discourse upon the subject in print, which has been the result of a good many years' study upon this subject. End of section 44 Section 45 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter number 45 from Edward Grimes. 1st August, 1853. My dear sir, I am very sorry that so few names occur to me of the settlers who originally took up their runs in the vicinity of the Broken River and Lower Murray, but almost all those who, to my knowledge, occupied new country in those days are either dead or gone home. I put Mr. Holloway's name on the list because I think he could give a good deal of information on the subject in general, although he did not settle in that particular locality. Should I recollect any more names, I will forward them to you when I give you an account of the very little information that I possess individually on the matter. Allow me to remain, my dear sir, yours most sincerely, Edward Grimes. To His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. W. McKellar, Lima, Benalla. Alexander Mackenzie Shane, Goulburn River. Charles Ryan, Seven Creeks, Sydney Road. William Atkins, near Seymour. Ephraim and John Howe. W. MacDonald, Junction of Goulburn and Murray. Charles and James Rowan, Ovens River, Care of Messrs. W. Bell and Co. W. Chisholm, King River. John and Charles Manton, Melbourne. Joseph Holloway. 
Theophilus Keene, Lower Murray. End of section 45. Section 46 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 46 from John Templeton. Kyneton, 6 August 1853. Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your letter of the 27th ult, requesting me to furnish you with such details relating to the first settlement of this province as I might be personally cognizant of. I now beg to transmit to you a paper containing such information as I possess relating to the above matter. I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient servant, John Templeton. C. J. Latrobe, Esquire, Lieutenant Governor, etc., etc. Memoranda reflecting the first settlement of part of the province of Victoria. In October 1838, I took up the station known as Seven Creeks, situated close to the Sydney Road, about 35 miles from the River Goulburn. At that time, there were only two stations occupied between the rivers Ovens and Goulburn, viz., one by Mr. H. K. Hughes at Avenel, and the other at Mangalore, River Goulburn, by some person on behalf of Major Anderson. Both those stations were taken up about June 1838. In the beginning of 1839, a police station was formed at the crossing place of the Broken River, and in the latter part of that year and the beginning of 1840, the country in the neighborhood of that river was occupied by different settlers. In the beginning of 1840, the country now known as the Devil's River Country was taken up by Messrs. Watson and Hunter, and about the same time the country in the neighborhood of the Upper Goulburn was occupied. In the end of 1840 and the beginning of 1841, the country on the River Goulburn, below Major Anderson Station, began to be occupied, and soon afterwards the banks of the Murray below the junction of the ovens. I know personally very little of the first occupation of the country lying between the rivers ovens and Murray, but may mention the names of Dr. McKay and Mr. G. Faithful, both still residing on the ovens, as original occupants of that portion of the district, and as likely to be able to afford you every information with regard to its first settlement. In the months of July and August 1838, I saw a good deal of that part of the Western Port District lying between the Sydney Road and Major Mitchell's homeward track. The country on the Melbourne side of the track appeared to be pretty well occupied, but there was at that time only one station on the other side, viz. that occupied by Captain Hutton, near Mount MacIver. With regard to the Aborigines, my means of information are very meager. I have no means of even guessing at their numbers when I first settled in Port Phillip, as, for three or four years, they very seldom appeared at my station, and then only in small numbers. I am glad to say that I never had any collision with them, nor in fact suffered any serious annoyance from them. I am aware that in several parts of the Murray District they proved very troublesome in the years 1838 and 1839, but I have reason to believe that, if the settlers had used proper precautions, in the generality of cases they would not have suffered. John Templeton. Kyneton, 6th August, 1853. End of section 46. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Section 47 of Letters of Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 47 from Alfred Taddy Thompson. Fiery Creek, August 18, 1853. My dear Mr. Latrobe, I duly received your circular from Bell, and avail myself of the first subsequent post-day to reply to your queries. 
I am quite willing to obey your injunction, though I fear that beyond whatever value may attach to the mere record of the date of settlement of the country, all that I have to impart is comprised in the plodding routine of a squatter's life, unrelieved by startling incident or perilous adventure, and nearly destitute of interest. It might be enlivened by anecdotes of the effect of solitude upon the mind, the peculiarities it induces, and the self-delusion engendered amidst what Dr. Johnson would have called its, quote, and fractuosities, end quote. But this would be treading upon egotistical ground, where our resources are abundant, a due sense of our own merits being one of the virtues which solitude imparts, and therefore inconsistent with matter-of-fact statement. Besides, to diverge at all from the path which you have pointed out would far exceed the limits of a letter, the dangers of the brevis essa laboro obscurus fio being already imminent. Upon reaching the ovens in June 1840, with sheep from Sydney, and finding that disease had been spread along the road by the stock of Messrs. Dutton and Darlot, we turned aside and ascended the broken river nearly to its source, passing the stations of Messrs. Broadrib, McKellar, and Peter Stuckey. Then, crossing a low dividing range, we came upon an elevated plateau at the foot of the Alps, known as the Mount Battery Country, which had a short time previously been discovered by Messrs. Watson and Hunter, and was then in process of settlement by them. Some unsuccessful attempts have been made to penetrate the Alps in search of new country about the time that Count Strelitsky was engaged upon his exploring expedition. The aboriginal natives were very troublesome in that locality. They murdered two men in the service of Mr. Waugh, took and kept six hundred of his sheep, and ransacked his dwelling. He came over to me, having on one woolen stocking and one cotton sock, and complained that they had not left him even a pannikin. As illustrative of the early settlement of the country, I may conclude the history of this gentleman's sojourn upon the Devil's River. Some traveling sheep of Mr. McFarlane's, infected with catarrh, camped round his folds, and imparted the scourge to his flocks. Between the ravages of this disease and the constant attacks of the natives, he lost all his sheep, and left the river, I believe, a ruined man, to add another and a bitter chapter to the next edition of the, quote, Experiences of a Settler in New South Wales, unquote. A hut-keeper was also murdered at an outstation of Messrs. Watson and Hunter, two miles from where we were camped. It is probable that he went out of his hut to ascertain what the dogs were barking at, and that a black fellow stepped from behind a tree and tomahawked him in the back of the head, for he was found quite dead, with his hands in his pockets and his pipe in his mouth. The shepherd returned to the hut shortly after, finding it pillaged and encountering the lifeless body of his mate. The shock nearly overpowered his reason. He threw off his hat, coat, and boots, and ran to the home station five miles distant, climbed to the roof of the hut, and sitting astride of the ridge, cried, Murder! Murder! continuously for half an hour before he became sufficiently reassured to impart his intelligence. The effect of these atrocities upon the minds of the men, perpetrated in a lonely, isolated spot, remote from assistance, and where nothing distracted their ideas or prevented their brooding upon the one subject, was great. Their fears magnified the danger to such an extent that they lived in a continual state of anxiety, apprehension, and alarm. The huts were loopholed to enfilade each other. They neither dined nor slept without their arms being within reach. The barking of a dog was a signal of danger which sent every man to his post. We had to place two shepherds with every flock, and when the hut-keeper went to the creek for water, a man was posted on the bank with a double-barrel gun to guard him from the wadi of the ubiquitous aboriginal, who was supposed to lurk behind every gum tree and to peer from every bush. In February 1841, we resumed our journey by following the broken river down to the Goulburn, and the latter to near its junction with the Murray, when we struck into Sir T. Mitchell's outward track and followed it to the Wimmera. But our expectations of the country to be found there formed from his description, were not realized. A series of dry seasons had altered the face of the country, and the fertile region which had presented itself to his delighted view had been converted into an arid waste, destitute of either grass or water. 
Mrs. Redfern's station, now Mr. Carfrey's, was then the lowest upon the river. We followed the river upwards, passing the stations of Messrs. Hall and H. S. Wills, and halted under Mount William, from whence we were driven by foot-rot and the blacks. At this time a strong prejudice existed against plains as runs for sheep. It was generally supposed that the want of shelter, both from the rays of the sun in summer and the biting blasts in winter, would soon break down their constitutions, and consequently many persons had passed over this fiery creek district, and proceeded many miles further from their markets to occupy much worse runs, and thus, though surrounded by stations, we found it most opportunely at our disposal. We took possession of a portion of it in May 1841. Much of the neighboring country had been taken up the previous year by Messrs. A. and C. Campbell at Mount Cole, and by Donald and Hamilton, Hassel and Hamilton, G. and T. McCready, G. Allen, and Wright and Montgomery upon the upper part of the Mount Emu Creek. Mr. Kirk held Burumbeep, McGill's Run, and Mr. Wisseleski's was then the next station up the Hopkins. Messrs. Black and Steele adjoined us to the eastward. The lower part of this creek was dry for many miles, and its entrance to and exit from Lake Bullock could not be traced. In August of that year, 1841, Mr. L. McKinnon took up Mount Fians, and Mr. Chernside possessed himself of the run which we had vacated at Mount William. Two young men of the name Mather formed a station under the Grampians. One of them met with so dreadful a fate that it is worthy of mention in any record of the early settlement of the district. He remained alone at the homestead while his brother was at their only outstation. A short distance from his hut door he was employed cutting down a large tree, which fell across his legs, broke both his thighs, and pinned him to the earth. In this position he must have lain for three days before death terminated his sufferings. He had scraped two large holes in the ground with his hands in the desperate hope of extricating himself. The agony of this protracted torture was probably heightened by the gathering round him of native dogs, greedy for their prey, and which may not have been restrained from commencing their attack during the short remainder of his life. For on the fourth day, when his body was found, portions of it had been devoured, and if my memory serves me aright, there were indications of his having endeavored to scare them away. The first operations when taking up a new country, where the hostility of the aborigines was to be apprehended, and the ravages of native dogs to be guarded against, were to provide for the safety of the stock. Great hardships and privations were almost unwittingly endured, for the constant occupation of mind and body, the newly acquired responsibility, the wild independence, and the charm of novelty all conspired to give interest to the pursuit. It certainly was not at a time when we lived in a gunya or sod hut, and fared upon mutton chops served up in the frying pan, with tea in a quart pot and a slice of damper three times a day, that we reflected upon the hardships of our lot. It would, I fear, be foreign to the object you have in view to trace the improvement in our social state from the days of unvarying tea, damper, and mutton, when our wants were few and limited to the compass of our own ability to supply them, through the several grades of cabbages, potatoes, eggs, tomato jam, newspapers, butter, glass windows, books, pumpkin pies, post offices, and preserving melons, up to our present state of complicated wants, enjoying most of the comforts and some of the luxuries of life. It is with much regret I learn that you are about to leave us. I trust very sincerely that I may have an opportunity of seeing you ere then. I shall make an effort at all events to say adieu personally, and if this should be impracticable, I trust that you will remember me amongst the warmest of the many well-wishers you will leave in Victoria, and believe me to be, ever yours, my dear Mr. Latrobe, very sincerely, Alfred T. Thompson. To C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. End of section 47. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Section 48 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Point Cook, November 1st, 1853. Sir, I have the honour to acknowledge receipt of your letter of July 27th. 
Having been addressed to Geelong, it went to my other stations and I only received it a few days since. I shall now be happy to give any information relative to the progress of this colony, but am at a loss of where to begin and where to end. I will, therefore, give a brief review of what has come under my own observation since my arrival in the colony. I arrived in Adelaide in January 1839, and had no opportunity of judging of the capabilities of the country, although I visited the most remote station, and that was only 30 miles from Adelaide. But I was surprised to find parties of such speculative spirit, raising the price of land by false capital to a fictitious value, and paying for the same with long-dated bills. I arrived in Sydney two months afterwards, and was much disappointed with the poor, barren appearance of the country. There had been a series of unusually dry seasons. Butcher's meat being so poor looked so black and unwholesome that I could not touch it. No vegetables to be had at any price. I started up the country to invest in sheep, and on my way to the Murrumbidgee did not travel a single mile without seeing dead horses and working bullocks. Hay or corn was not to be had at the inns. I saw upon stations where cattle were eager to get a little water them crawl into a water hole all but dried up, and there get bogged and leave their carcasses where there were hundreds of others. No one but an eyewitness can have any idea of the state of New South Wales at that period. Besides the unfavourable seasons, the country was overrun with bush rangers. Neither life nor property was safe, not even in villages. When travelling with the mail, I found at every inn horsemen and gigs waiting to accompany the mail for protection. I saw the corpse at Gray's Inn of one who had been shot while in charge of a dray. I saw another near Goulburn, and I was within a few miles of Gundaroo when Scotchy and Witten's party had possession of that village. And as Mr. Hume, brother of Hamilton Hume, discoverer of the Murray River, was going with his servants to the assistance of the villagers, he was shot dead, leaving a large family to lament his loss. Scotchy and Witten were at last captured. The one hanged himself in jail, the other was hanged in Goulburn. I bought sheep on the Murrumbidgee in April, returned to Sydney, bought a dray and eight bullocks, with the view of taking my sheep to Port Phillip. Before getting to Barima, a distance of 80 miles, six of my bullocks died from starvation, and in consequence of thousands of sheep dying of Qatar, I changed my mind and left my sheep at Murrumbidgee. I bought cattle and took them overland to Adelaide, found two of the lower stations on the Murrumbidgee, only 70 miles below Port Phillip Road, had been deserted for the want of feed, and from there to the Adelaide Territory appeared to me to be unavailable for any purpose. Mr Eyre, late Lieutenant Governor of New Zealand, who preceded me a few months, was then of the same opinion. I have seen a portion of the same country since, and what was then a sandy desert is now tolerably grassed, and the whole of this country occupied. On travelling down the Murray and Murrumbidgee, I found the natives cunning and treacherous like all other savages, and they would take advantage when parties were off their guard. Mr Christome's party from Yass followed me, had all their stock taken, and the whole party killed except one man. Mr Snodgrass followed and also lost a great many sheep by the natives. When I arrived in Adelaide, I found cattle had fallen from £20 to £7, at which price I had to dispose of mine for bills. I returned to Sydney by way of Hobart Town, and found the appearance of the country quite changed, a good deal of rain having fallen in the interval. I then started with my sheep, which I left on the Murrumbidgee for Port Phillip, and arrived at the Loddon in May 1840, having then been 16 months in the colonies. I found all the country north of Captain Hepburn and Mr Coghill unoccupied, and took out a license for the country adjoining them. At that time there were a great many cattle and sheep on the road from Sydney, and six months afterwards all the country to the north for 50 miles was taken up. I found the natives on the Loddon very quiet, but some came from the Pyrenees and killed a Mr Allen, and also Miss Elephant's housekeeper. I sold my station on the Loddon, bought sheep on the Sydney side, and on my way to the westward found all the country occupied until I arrived at Mount William, where I formed a station in April 1842. On my way to Mount William, I met Mr Thompson of Stevens and Thompson, who told me that, although he did not wish to intimidate me, he would at the same time assure me that I would lose every sheep by the natives at Mount William, that he had been there for two months, and that he put two shepherds with double-barrelled guns to each flock to no purpose, and at last was forced to leave. Having been always so lucky with the natives, I pushed on, and upon pitching my tent did all in my power to have some intercourse with the natives, so as to civilise them as soon as possible. It was weeks before I succeeded, and they were always on the lookout and ran like deer. I at last came upon one on the plains, some distance from timber, and gave chase to him on horseback. When I pulled him, he could scarcely stand on his legs from fear, but when I smiled and showed that I wished to be on good terms with them, he gained courage and talked a little. A few days afterwards, he brought some younger ones in sight of the tent who could speak English better. I went to meet them and gave them to understand that I wished to be friendly with them, that if they did not steal, they should be at liberty to roam about as usual. They seemed quite delighted and pleased. I at times gave them a little flour and mutton, but it was some months afterwards before I would allow them to come nearer than 200 or 300 yards to the huts. I don't think I lost 20 sheep by them. In the same year, I bought a station on the Wannon, and to my surprise, not a single native could be seen. I would come upon their camps and fires, but never got a sight of one of them. They were not allowed to come upon any station in that neighbourhood. Indeed, they were in a wilder state than any I had seen in the colonies, and at that time all my neighbours were losing sheep. 
Thinking it the best policy to civilise them as soon as possible, I took two from Mount William to the Wannon, who brought about a dozen to me. I told them the same that I told those at Mount William. A month or so afterwards, there were about 20 assisting at sheep washing. Mr. Riley of Riley and Barker, hearing of it, immediately rode up to see if it were correct, and told me that they were the first he had seen at the station in that district, and strongly advised me against encouraging them, as they were treacherous to their kind as benefactors. I pursued my own policy, thinking the sooner they were civilised and could discriminate between right and wrong, the sooner they would become harmless to Europeans. I found it an answer, and in a short time they were seen all upon the stations in that district. Mr. Matthew Gibson, wine merchant, was the first party who occupied country in the neighbourhood of Mount William. He pitched his tent in 1839 on that portion of the Hopkins, known as McGill Station. But finding the water very bad, he moved on to the Glen Elk. In 1840, Mr. Kirk took possession of the same country, and in the same year, Mr. Wills, Captain Briggs, and others formed stations of about the same period. It is the general opinion that the country has improved much by being stocked, and I have no doubt it has to a certain extent, but I think it's more the result of the change of seasons. In 1842, the Fiery Creek Plains were very thinly grassed, and for the want of water between Mount William and Fiery Creek, there was a large tract of country not occupied until 1846. Being in the habit during those four years of riding over it in every month, I observed the sward of grass getting thicker every season, although there was not a hoof upon it. In 1841, the Fiery Creek was dry for 20 miles, and the bed of the creek smoking as if on fire, which is the origin of the name. In 1842, I saw a flock of sheep feeding in the centre of Lake Bollock, and two or three years ago, Mr. Patterson told me that it was 15 feet deep at the margin near his house. Major Mitchell's Lake Repose, Lake Linlithgow, and several other lakes I saw dry in 1842. It is the change of season and not the stock that has changed the appearance of the country. In 1842 and 1843, water could not be had for the splitters, and now there are springs and creeks everywhere. I formed a station on the Adelaide Territory 40 miles from Goochin Bay about the end of 1845. I found the habits and sea of the natives there the same as in Port Phillip, but was surprised to find they could not swim, and I believe until lately they never had an opportunity, as I am informed ten years ago they could only get water by digging for it. There is no river or creek between Lake Alexandrina on the Murray and the Glen Elk. The country from that part of the Murray to Mount Gambier is the most barren, sterile country I have witnessed in all my travels. Sheep and cattle die within 20 miles of the coast. I had to remove cattle from a station there after losing about 500. The police magistrate, Goochin Bay, told me that it was impossible to keep goats for the supply of milk as they all died. With regard to the capabilities of the different colonies, no doubt Port Phillip is the Eden of the whole. From Lake Collect to Mount Shabwell, Port Ferry, Mount Rouse, Wanlam with the junction of the Glen Elk, considering the extent and area, it is the greatest extent of rich country I ever witnessed within my recollection. Poor healthy soil near Newcastle, County of Northumberland, has been ploughed, drained and manured so as to raise good crops. On visiting the different provinces and districts, I was struck more with the different manners and customs of the Europeans than the Aborigines. In Adelaide, there appeared to be a spirit of keen Yankeeism. In Sydney, the people seemed light, gay and thoughtless. The settlers on the Murrumbidgee and Goulburn the same, and again on the Geelong side and Westerns district, they appeared thoughtful for the future, industrious and persevering, willing to put their shoulders to the wheel and overcome all difficulties, and that at a time when they did not know how to raise £10 to pay their licence. Indeed, I have been agreeably surprised to witness so many very young men arrive in this colony possessing such perseverance, sobriety and exemplary conduct. I have the honour to be, sir, your obedient servant, Thos Chernside, His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor. End of section 48. Recording by Shanna Burns. Section 49 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 49 from E.P.S. Sturt. Lonsdale Street, 20th of October, 1853. My dear sir, as far as my recollections will allow me to record some of the circumstances attending my early career and travels through this southern portion of our Australian possessions, and by so doing contribute to the fund of information you have already gathered through your own long experience and personal observation, it will afford me much pleasure. My early initiation into bush life was as a commissioner of Crown Lands for the Murray District in 1837, a portion of the colony at that time very thinly occupied by stations, though now forming one of our richest grazing districts. Provided with a good tent and camp equipage, a small supply of books and writing materials, a trusty Wesley Richards with an ample supply of ammunition, a capital nag and some fine kangaroo dogs, you may easily conceive that I looked forward to my expeditions with feelings of pleasure and excitement. My means of transport was a light cart with two draught horses, which, with a large tarpaulin, afforded an ample shelter for the men. 
The district allotted to me was from the left side of the Murrumbidgee to the right bank of the Ovens River, forty miles on the Port Phillip side of the Murray. The country was at this time most beautiful, miles of it untrodden by stock, and indeed unseen by Europeans. Every creek abounded with wild fowl, and the quails sprung from the long kangaroo grass which waved to the very flaps of the saddle. Seldom on my return to the encampment after a long day's ride to some outstations, but what I had to acknowledge the culinary talents of my tent servant, as the savoury steam of a stew or pastry would rise from the iron pot, simmering by a glorious fire in front of the tent. No dinner cooked by the most cunning artiste is equal to that one enjoys under such circumstances as those I describe, nor can anything equal the relish which is afforded by the quart pot of tea, a delicacy I know you have yourself appreciated on some of your Excellency's flying expeditions. It has often been a source of regret to me that all the charms attending the traversing of a new country must give way to the march of civilization. The camp on the grassy sward is now superseded by the noisy roadside inn, the quart pot of tea by the bottle of ale. All the quiet serenity of an Australian bush, as we have known it, has yielded to the demands of population, and this, though a necessary change, is not the less to be regretted. I look back to those days as to some joyous scene of schoolboy holidays. The seasons appear to me to have undergone a considerable change, and to have become both colder and more moist. For though a fire was fully appreciated, the weather generally was mild and dry— my impression with regard to the increased rains is borne out by the fact that many tracts of country are now occupied by stock, which I have ridden over vainly seeking for water to relieve my distressed horse and moisten my parched lips. I may particularly allude to the Billabong country and to those plains and flat-box country extending between the Edward and Murrumbidgee rivers. For miles and miles I have ridden over this monotonous, dreary flat, not a hill to be seen to raise the hope that some creek or waterhole might be at hand, the eyes aching with the dazzling reflection and mirage of the plains. Sheep are now occupying the whole of this country, the supply of water for the stations being obtained by sinking waterholes and throwing dams across the slight falls or declinations of the plain, which, though barely visible, yet here and there in the wet seasons become runs of water. Even this, however, affords a precarious supply, and the losses and suffering of these settlers are very great. In the dry seasons they frequently have to move on with their flocks, towards some of the rivers for their absolute salvation, and driven to become interlopers and marauders on others' runs, their existence is far from enviable. Their risk, too, of spreading or contracting contagious diseases among their flocks thus becomes very great. The heat is also here excessive— which, together with the general dryness of the atmosphere and pasturage, deteriorates the character of the wolves. Notwithstanding, however, these drawbacks, it may safely be considered a fine pastoral district. The country to the southeast of the main Sydney road to Port Phillip rises towards the Australian Alps, to which snow-capped mountains we are indebted for the numerous streams and rivers flowing through the lower, and, in summer, arid regions to the north and northwest, most of which unite with the Murray. The nearer we approach the mountains, both the climate and character of the soil change. I've noticed that the upper Murray and tablelands of Omeo afford an abundant but coarse, unnutritious grass. The trees also assume a cold and wintry appearance, and the foliage becomes yet more sombre than the generality of Australian trees. One circumstance I noticed is strange and difficult to account for. Though the climates on the Murray and Murrumbidgee rivers exactly assimilate, and the distance between them is inconsiderable, about 130 miles, the appearance of the two rivers differs materially. The banks of the Murrumbidgee are wooded with large swamp oak, as is also the case with its tributaries, the Lachlan, Burua and Tumut rivers, etc., etc. On the latter, these large oaks overhang the banks until they nearly meet, imparting a peculiar gloom to this rapid stream. On the Murray, the oak entirely disappears, being replaced by the bright wattle or acacia. The scent of its masses of blossom in the spring pervades the air, and adds to the pleasing effect this graceful tree has on the mind of the traveller, enhanced by the wild, sweet call of the bellbird. Another peculiarity attending these rivers flowing to the north and northwest is that they abound in a fine fish called the Murray Cod. In season these fish are very rich and afford the chief sustenance of the natives who spear them from their canoes, at the prow of which they have a brilliant fire of pines, which attracts the fish at night and entices them to their destruction. Strange to say that all the streams and rivers flowing to the south and southwest, 
though in many instances taking their source from the same mountains, are devoid of the river cod, having only the blackfish, a peculiar kind of herring, and the eel, which run to a large size. About this time commenced the stream of emigration into Port Phillip, and the main line of road became enlivened by the overland parties crowding one after another to the newly opened and rich pasturages of the south. Numerous were the incidents, both by flood and field, which these adventurers met with. The rivers were all unbridged and afforded no small obstacle to the overlander, taxing both his courage, enterprise and invention to overcome his difficulties. The danger of attack from the natives was not inconsiderable, and I need hardly call to your recollection the melancholy destruction of Mr. Faithful's party, who were attacked near the Ovens River, several of the men being killed. I happened to meet one of the poor wretches who escaped, thanks to his speed of foot and endurance, as he was pursued many miles by the merciless savages, and though severely wounded he ran forty miles and at last dropped at my tent, overcome by fatigue and terror. The natives were at all times treacherous to a degree, and the murders they committed were numerous. I admit that they sometimes met with treatment from some of the whites sufficient to excite their enmity, but I cannot attribute their acts of murder to a spirit of retaliation, nor do I believe that any cruelty was evinced towards them by the Europeans until exasperated by their savage acts of treachery. The natives of Australia are devoid of any feeling of mercy or pity. No native of a foreign tribe would be safe for an hour if in the power of others of the same race. The most cold-blooded murder will excite no remorse. The braining of a wretched lubra will only add to the heroic and indomitable character of the savage. I knew a fine young lad whom Dr. Martin had civilised. He was a stockman and a very intelligent lad. He accompanied a party with fat stock to Melbourne. At Bunanyong he fell in with a tribe of natives, and, in the act of giving them tobacco, was basely speared and died in the greatest agony. His only offence was that he belonged to a strange tribe. I have seen a lad of twelve years old drive a spear through the body of an old man, because he refused a loan of his pipe. The father of this precocious youth submitted his head without a groan to three terrific blows from a nulla nulla, inflicted by a relative of the old man's. This was in extenuation of his son's offence. Love to their offspring is the only softening feature in these natives, and that is but an animal propensity natural to the brute creation. Much is laid to the evil effects resulting from the intimacies known to exist between the shepherds and stockmen and the native women. This encouraged a familiarity with the tribes which revealed the defenceless state of the Europeans, and they too often availed themselves of this knowledge. But a sensitiveness on the point of their women I much doubt, for the first overtures a savage makes in barter is the tender of his unfortunate lubra. That there are some instances of their becoming useful men I cannot deny, as we might instance some of poor Dana's black troopers, but they are rare indeed. It is only under compulsion that their natural disposition can be restrained. Poor Mr. William, whom I assure your excellency recollects, is now undergoing his sentence for a breach of the laws at the goldfields. He is now at Pentridge Stockade, in the capacity of a servant to Mr. Barrow. In that capacity, he is a useful good creature, being a capital nurse and playmate for Barrow's children. Turn the poor fellow away, and he would soon be seen in the streets of Melbourne a drunken sot. I suppose the example of others had its effect with me, and, seized with an overland fit, I resigned my appointment and started for Bathurst, and thence with sheep and cattle to Adelaide. It would be uninteresting to give any details of the expedition. I believe I was the first to run the Murrumbidgee down with stock. At least no trace of four-footed beast was to be seen as we approached the field of reeds forming the outlet of the Lachlan into the Murrumbidgee. Here I thought we should have been stopped. As far as the eye could reach was one bed of reeds about fifteen feet high. The Lachlan here ceases to have the appearance of a river and loses itself in this bed of reeds. With the drays first, then the cattle, we managed to break down a track for the sheep, and, confident that there was no deep bed of a river to stop us, on we went, and three days' hard work saw us through the Lachlan swamps. I was among the most fortunate of the overlanders, having avoided any serious collisions with the blacks. The country itself was monotonous to a degree. The river runs through a nearly level country. The river flats average about half a mile wide on each side, and afford fine feed for the stock and famous camping places at night. From these flats a bank rises to the plains, which extend for hundreds of miles. These plains in some places are thickly covered with a low polygonum scrub. The soil is a species of whitish clay formed into small hills and hollows like molehills. Some fine silvery grass grows in these hollows, and the tops of the rises are utterly devoid of vegetation. 
The plains are sometimes intersected by a belt of Murray scrub, running down to the very river. Also I met with some belts of pine forest, in which some very beautiful shrubs and flowers are to be found. The whole of this country has, to my surprise, become now occupied, but I hear that the herbage is improved from being fed over, and the sheep seem to thrive on the various salsalaceous plants which abound. It still, however, takes a vast extent of this kind of country to support any number of sheep. The gum trees on the alluvial flats are magnificent, stately trees, and some of our encampments were singularly picturesque. As for the Murray ever becoming an agricultural country, the idea is absurd. The produce which Sir Henry Young fancies will all be conveyed to Adelaide by steamers is a chimerical idea which never can be realised. The alluvial river flats constitute the sole land in any way suitable to agriculture, and these are flooded during the spring and early part of summer by the melting of the snow on the mountains. There is hardly a settler on the lower Murray who can even luxuriate in a vegetable. The weather during my expedition was most beautiful. We, of course, kept regular watches, and the bugle sounding the morning watch at two o'clock was the signal for the camp to arouse. Breakfast was then cooked, drays loaded, bullocks yoked, and the stock moved off. We then travelled on, but seldom could do much of after ten o'clock in the morning, when the heat would become too intense. The sheep would cluster in knots, seeking any shelter from the intense rays of the sun. We generally managed to make one of the bends of the river at this time, and there lay by until four or five o'clock, when we would accomplish another three or four miles of our journey. The extraordinary number of birds which collect on the river afforded abundant sport as well as capital dinners. It appears to be now indisputably settled that the interior of this country is chiefly characterised by barren scrubs and sterile sandhills, forming as it were a basin, and yet the flights of birds all from the north would lead one to suppose that there must be some oasis in that desert tract, extending to Sir Thomas Mitchell's discoveries on the Victoria River, on which the migratory feathered race might rest on their weary flight. The air would sometimes absolutely resound with the chatter of birds, the lagoons swarming with ducks and snipe, and then the luxury of a plunge into the fresh stream after a hard day's work with the thermometer at 110 degrees Fahrenheit cannot be exceeded. It is curious to observe the skill shown by the natives in their pursuit of game. They catch vast numbers of ducks in an ingenious manner. The lagoons run for some length, narrowing at the end where the trees close in. Two or three blacks plant themselves near this narrow pass, having extended a large net from tree to tree. The others then proceed to the top of the lagoon, driving the ducks before them. As they fly by the ambuscade, they throw their boomerangs whizzing over the heads of the birds, which, dreading that their enemy the hawk is sweeping at them, make a dash under the trees, strike the net, and fall as if shot, when the natives dash in after them. I imagine it's a panic that seizes the poor birds, for I have seen a hundred caught by such means. We encountered some difficulty in crossing our stock and drays over the Rufus and Darling, but none which, with a good heart, we did not overcome. Indeed, such difficulties added zest to our labours. At the northwest bend of the Murray, the river takes a sweep to the south into Lake Alexandrina. From this point I left our party to strike across the scrub into Adelaide, or rather into the settled parts of the colony. We had run short of flour and sugar, and my object was to cut through the scrub with a light horse cart and bring out supplies for the party, as well as ascertain the best route in for the stock to take. Tracks of former parties were indistinct, and at the point I struck in, we noticed for some distance a single cart track going the direction I wished to follow. This, however, we soon lost, and I discovered that we had fearfully miscalculated the width of the scrub, or its density at the point I entered. Since then, poor young Bryant perished in the same scrub whilst on an expedition with Colonel Gawler, the then Governor of South Australia. It appeared the Governor wished to penetrate to some hills north, but finding the scrub too dense and no water to be had, he hastened back to the river, after having had to kill one of the horses. The party somehow separated in pushing for the river. It was a struggle for life, as another day's sun would have been fatal. Poor Bryant must have lost his presence of mind, for his tracks were found running the scrub down parallel to the river, but no traces of the poor fellow could ever be made out. He must have perished a miserable death. To return to my own misadventures, my party consisted of two men and a native of New South Wales. For two days we cut through the scrub with little appearance of getting out or of finding water. The labour was excessive, and the men were improvident with our limited supply of water. The third day saw us without any. Still, I was determined to push on to the hills, knowing that by keeping firm in the one direction I must succeed. 
The heat was terrific, and the second day told fearfully upon us. It was doubtful whether we could have made it back to the river, and the hills, the object of our aim, and hopes of water I saw before us. So still we plunged on, the poor horses being in a most pitiable condition. The third day we crossed the hills, but not a sup of water to be found in the porous granite ranges. We camped at three o'clock, the men being utterly prostrated, and the horses in a dying state. The plains of Adelaide were before us. I was sure water must be near, so leaving the men a compass with directions that should I not return by morning they should kill one of the horses and moisten their mouths with its blood, and then push on in the same course. I started, or I may say tottered on, for about two miles, when I overcome I sunk at the foot of a tree. I never shall forget my sensations at that time. I felt the miserable death awaiting me. I then thought of home, and that I was in some richly carpeted drawing-room, and I struggled against insanity. When I recovered to some extent, it was a bright, fresh night. I sat up, endeavouring to collect my senses, when I heard a flight of birds overhead, and the unmistakable cry of the wood-duck. With renewed energy I pushed on, and within a hundred yards of me was the creek. An hour served sufficiently to restore me, and soaking my woollen shirt in the water, I retraced my steps to the cart. We were saved, but it was touch and go. One of the men never recovered it, and the last time I saw him, he was an idiot in Adelaide. We were but three days without water, but it was summer, and we were working with a blazing sun overhead. My residence since 1844 has been at Mount Gambier, about halfway between Melbourne and Adelaide. I there formed a station, and occupied a most splendid portion of country. I just missed Your Excellency when you were at the Mount, being then on the point of taking up the country adjacent to the Mount. I look at this portion of the colony decidedly as the finest I have ever seen, and it would be most interesting to a geologist. When I first occupied it, surface water was very scarce, being found only in a few tea-tree springs, or in the craters of the extinct volcanoes. I, however, subsequently discovered that the whole country was cavernous, and that absolute streams and rivers were flowing within, in some places, a few feet of the surface. The rock is generally limestone, which crops from the surface in all directions. Indeed, in some places there are but a few inches of soil above the mass of limestone. Our early occupation of Mount Gambia was marked with perhaps more of the difficulties and troubles generally attending a settler's life. When I took up the station I was again beginning the world, with little more than dear-bought experience. The ruinous years of 1842 and 1843 had involved me in the, I may nearly say, universal crash, thanks to the improvidence which I believe is as characteristic of the early squatters as of the British sailor as also to the simplicity with which so many of us scribbled our autographs to pieces of paper, for the relief of pretended friends, whom we found too willing to shuffle their own difficulties on the shoulders of their more generous dupes. There is nothing of which a young man, commencing his career in the colonies, should be more earnestly warned against than this same yielding to the impulse of good nature. When I fixed on the site of my new homestead I had not a shilling in the world. Unfortunately the boot was very much on the other leg, but thanks to the success attending sheep farming, I have outlived my difficulties. The natives were very inimical when we first arrived, and to add to my difficulties, all our men, with the exception of one, deserted us. I had, however, a trusty friend in poor Edward White, whose daring energy of character has been fully tested in his expeditions in the survey department, to which I am sure Your Excellency will fully testify. Another young friend, Mr. Brodrib, also bravely adhered to my fortunes. There were but four of us, but we managed to lamb the sheep down and build a bark shed for shearing. With little assistance we sheared the flocks and managed, I can hardly say how, to turn the wool into supplies for the following year. Our neighbour, Mr. Leake, suffered many losses from the natives, some thousands, I believe, but we escaped any attack, which I attribute to the astonishment they evinced at seeing the effects of a good rifle aimed by a correct eye, for not a crow would dare to core on the highest tree near our camp but a rifle ball reached him, or a kangaroo bound through the forest within shot but the sharp ring of the rifle saw him stretched on the sward. I have always thought this gained us their respect." They gave me the name of a chief who had fallen in battle, and affirmed that I had again come among them as a white fellow. We gained their respect, but it was through fear, and subsequently their confidence through kindness. Many of them have since become useful shepherds, and been of the utmost service to me, but it is difficult to have fat sheep where natives shepherd them, for they are too indolent even for that service. 
The whole of this country is volcanic, but of a different character to that of Mount Napier and the Belfast district, where the rivers of lava can be followed for miles, now having the appearance of rivers of huge rocks of trap, cracked and rent by time and heat. At Mount Gambia there is little rock save the limestone, and the eruptions of the expired volcanoes of the Gambia, Shank and others are only marked by a deposit of scoriae and ashes. The bottoms of the craters are now lakes of unfathomable depth, the waters of which on a cloudy day assume an inky darkness, which gives a degree of solemnity to the scenery. There is also a singular feature in the country. There are many holes and caves. The caves appear endless, and it requires some degree of nerve to head an exploring expedition in these subterranean territories. Some of them are very beautiful when lit up by torchlight. Long pendulous stalactites hang from the ceiling or roof of the cavern, connecting themselves with the floor, and the continuous dripping of the water and deposit of the sediment has formed itself into the most grotesque shapes. Niches and seats appear of this glittering white marble, which a not very imaginative mind might conceive to be the seats of the presiding genius and his attendant satellites. I have never discovered any petrifactions in these caverns, but I thought once to have discovered something that would have handed down my name to posterity. In one of these niches I observed the figure of a man, bent as in an attitude of thought, his elbows resting on his knees. I approached and felt this object, when I found it to be the body of a man, as I supposed petrified. Anxiously I examined it, and took an arm and hand, which were loose to the open air, for closer inspection. I then found that it had more the appearance of a mummy, the skin having become hard and dry, and containing nothing but dust. It, however, merited closer inspection, but I had some miles to ride, and determined to defer such examination to another time. Since then I have never been near the spot. The holes which I have before alluded to are perfectly perpendicular, and vary in size. Some go down perpendicular, as if bored by a huge auger, some two hundred feet. At the bottom is water, which has all the appearance of being bottomless. The country between the mountain and Adelaide is very flat, having large gum forests well grassed and extensive swamps and plains. It has evidently been recently flooded by the sea, there being large beds of oysters exposed where any large tree has been blown down and torn up the soil. The surface is also covered with oyster shells and other deposits of the ocean. To the north the country becomes arid, and barren of any vegetation save the eternal Murray scrub. I have travelled much through the western country— ascended the crater, or rather descended it, of Mount Elys, but of all that country you are equally well informed with myself. Of the plenty which you asked me to mention, I have no pleasing reminiscences. I only know at that time it consisted of a district of cattle stealers. The only pleasing recollection is that of a certain trip I took with your excellency, when certainly our bush experience did not ensure us a perfect knowledge of our locale. I fully believe you attribute our eccentric course to my guiding, but you will allow, and I have always believed, you are fonder of leading than being led. Thus I take no credit for our shortcuts on that occasion. I fear I have spun this out much longer than your patience will allow, but if any portion will afford matter worth noting, I shall be glad, with a sincere hope that I may have the pleasure of talking over Australian life with you, happily united to your family in brave old England, Believe me, my dear Mr. Latrobe, yours most sincerely, E. P. S. Sturt. To C. J. Latrobe, Esquire. End of section 49. Section 50 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 50 from Dr. A. Thompson March 20th, 1854 Sir, I would have replied long before this to your circular of date 27th July last, but waited expecting to find my journal, which was lent to Miss Drisdale, and cannot be found, which will account for the meagre reply I now make. 1. In September 1835 I shipped per Narval, Captain Coltish, the first cattle for Port Phillip. 2. In March 1836 I landed at Melbourne with my family. There, being no constituted authority, I was requested to act as a general arbitrator. 
I did so by common consent, my tent being the police office. Many felt a pride in showing an example in upholding order, which was done without much trouble. The people were very quiet and attended every Sunday morning at my tent for public worship, where I read the Church of England service. 3. In April 1836, I built, by subscription, a house for a church and school, the old weatherboard lately removed from St. James. 4. The first clergyman who visited us was the Rev. Josh Orton, Wesleyan, and afterwards the Rev. Messrs. Clough, Forbes, Grills, and Waterfield. 5. In May 1836, Mr. Batman arrived with his family. 6. From that time we had weekly arrivals with stock from Van Diemen's Land, and many stations were taken up near Melbourne. 7. In July 1836 we took the first census, numbering 149. 8. In December 1836 the first herd of cattle was brought from Sydney by Mr. Gino Cardiner and Captain Herborn. Geelong. 9. In May 1836, I landed my sheep at Point Henry and occupied the present township of Geelong as a sheep station, and indented head as a cattle station of Captain Swanson. Messrs. Cooey and Stead and myself had the whole western district to ourselves for eighteen months, parties being all afraid of the blacks. We were afterwards joined by Road Knight, Dark, Derwent Company, Russell, Anderson, Brown, Reed, MacLeod, Staglitz, Sutherland, Moray, Morris, Lloyd, Ware, Lermont, Armitage, Raven, Pettit, Francis, Bates, and others. 10. In 1837, I built the present house of Cardinia, which I called after the aboriginal word for sunrise. I built also a house for the Derwent's Company, occupied afterwards by Mr. Fisher. 11. In 1838, Mr. Scratchen built the first store in Geelong. He was followed by Messrs. Rucker and Champion. Aborigines 12. On my first journeys into the country, I was very much surprised to find so few natives, and thought they were keeping out of the way. During our first visit to Buninyon, we did not see one, and on our first journey to the west, when we discovered Kolak and Koranga meat, we saw about twenty at Piron Yalok, who fled on seeing us. On better acquaintance I found their number really very small, all within hundred miles had visited us. 13. In December 1836 I was at great pains to muster all that were in the Geelong district, and gave each a blanket. They were Buckley's tribe, and he assured me I had mustered the whole of them, amounting to only 279. They were always friendly. I was well known amongst them, and wherever I went they received me kindly. But alas, the decrease has been fearful, chiefly from drinking, and exposure to all weathers bringing on pulmonary complaints. Since their connection with the whites there has been little increase. When I first numbered them they had several children amongst them, but they decreased every year, and now in this tribe we have only thirty-four adults and only two children under five years. The men now living were all children when I arrived, and are beginning to look old, so that in ten years more there will not be one alive. Every attempt to civilize them has signally failed. I have had several in my family for years, and taught them to read and go to church with the family, but after a time the other youths would threaten them and carry them off, when they again got fond of a savage life. I am convinced that no plan except one based on entire isolation will succeed with these poor degraded people. A. Thompson, M.C. To His Excellency C.J. Latrobe, Esquire. Addenda. The Merrick, Scrubby Hills, near Cape Otway, form fifty miles by ten of dense scrub, exactly like the country you saw at Wilson's Promontory with immense trees towering to the height of eighteen and one hundred and twenty feet, and fern trees of twenty feet in the gullies, a rich black soil, and streams of water running into the sea every six or seven miles. A. Thompson 
Lonsdale's Notes on Dr. Thompson's Statement 2. Mr. Simpson was named by the persons interested in the formation of a settlement at Port Phillip as arbitrator, etc. Dr. Thompson and another were, I understand, afterwards named to assist him, somewhat in the quality of assessors. Dr. Thompson may possibly, during the absence of Mr. Simpson in Van Diemen's Land, have acted as arbitrator in some cases. As to the state of order among the people, I have no reason to doubt, but that they were as peaceable as could reasonably be expected under the circumstances in which they were placed. But I know that repeated representations were made to the Sydney government, to the contrary, of so strong a nature that Sir Richard Burke thought there was a probability of some resistance being offered to his establishing authority in the place and directed me to apply to Captain Hobson for the marines of his ship, should I find the detachment of troops I took with me insufficient. This, however, was perfectly useless. The people were quite quiet. The only indication to the contrary was the simple circumstance of the printed proclamations which I had caused to be posted up being torn down. One of the first persons who made himself known to me was Dr. Thompson, who, with a formidable brace of pistols in his belt, told me he was very glad I had arrived, as they were in a most lawless state, and always in dread of being assaulted or something to that effect. Dr. Thompson's appointment by the Port Phillip people was that of medical officer, and I think catechist. In the former capacity, he was afterwards for a short time in the employment of the government. I dare say he performed the church service as he states, but on my arrival I did not understand it was performed. Mr. James Smith was the first I was aware of who read the service regularly on Sundays, for such of the people as choose to attend. 3. When I arrived in September, this building was not near finished. I was given to understand that it was erected by general subscription for Church of England service and was handed over to me for this purpose. I afterwards collected further subscriptions to finish it, in the course of which I had some little altercation with Dr. Thompson, who was supposed to be unconnected with it, but he claimed to be a member of the church. 4. The Rev. Mr. Orton was here after I arrived, as a passing visitor. I was not aware that he had been here previously. Mr. Waterfield, an independent minister, was the first clergyman who arrived to perform service permanently. Mr. Naylor had paid the settlement a visit, and had performed service, and some of the rites of the Church of England. 8. It was Mr. Gardiner and Mr. Joseph Hawdon who brought over the first herd of cattle from Sydney. 12. This is a very uncertain and indefinite statement, and appears in some measure to be contradicted by the next paragraph where a tribe belonging to a small tract of country is represented to be 279, and which I can say is correct from what I saw of the other tribes at that time. End of section 50section 51 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 51 From A. Macmillan, Bushy Park Bushy Park, 25th of August, 1853 Dear Sir, In answer to Your Excellency's letter of the 29th of July, and to a note from Mr. Tyers on the fourteenth instant, requesting me to give, with the least possible delay, an account of the discovery of Gippsland, dates, with events connected with it, the particulars of Count Strzelecki's visit, etc., etc., I beg to forward the accompanying memorandum, and trust that the information contained in it will answer the purpose required, but should you require anything further, I shall be happy to give a more detailed account. 
I remain, dear sir, your Excellency's most obedient servant, A. Macmillan. Two, His Excellency C. H. Latrobe, Esquire. Memorandum of trip by A. Macmillan from Maneroo District in the year 1839 to the southwest of that district, towards the sea coast, in search of new country. Start from Maneroo. On the 20th of May, 1839, I left Caravan, a station of James McFarlane, Esquire, G.P., of the Manaru district, having heard from the natives of that district that a fine country existed near the sea coast to the southwest of Manaru, accompanied by one black only. I was accompanied in my expedition by Jemmy Gibber, the chief of the Manaru tribe. After five days' journey towards the southwest, I obtained a view of the sea from the top of a mountain near a hill known as the Haystack in the Buchan district, and also of the low country towards Wilson's promontory. On the sixth day after leaving Caravang, the black fellow who accompanied me became so frightened of the varigals, or wild blacks, that he tried to leave me and refused to proceed any further towards the new country. We pressed on until the evening, when we camped, and about twelve o'clock at night I woke up and found Jemmy Gibber in the act of raising his waddy or club to strike me, as he fancied that, if he succeeded in killing me, he would then be able to get back to Manaru. I presented a pistol at him, and he begged me not to shoot him, and excused himself by saying that he had dreamt that another blackfellow was taking away his gin, and that he did not mean to kill me. Omeo. Next morning we started from Omeo, where we arrived after four days' journey, over very broken country. There were three settlers at Omeo at this time, viz. Pender, Macfarlane, and Highland. Numblomanji. On the 16th September, 1839, I formed a cattle station at a place called Numblomanji, on the river Tambo, fifty miles to the south of Omeo, for Lachlan McAllister, Esquire, G.P. A Mr. Buckley had, previous to my arrival here, formed a station ten miles higher up the river Tambo from Nambi Manji. On the 26th of December, 1839, I formed a party consisting of Mr. Cameron, Mr. Matthew McAllister, Edward Bath, a stockman, and myself, with the view of proceeding towards and exploring the low country I had formerly obtained a view of, from the mountain in the Buchan district alluded to in my first trip from Maneru. After travelling for three days over a hilly and broken country, one of our horses met with a serious accident, tumbling down the side of one of the steep ranges, and staked itself in four or five places. In consequence of this accident we were compelled to return to Nambla Manji. On the 11th of January, 1840, the same party as before, with the addition of two Omeo blacks, Cobon Johnny and Boy Friday, started once more with the same object in view, namely, that of reaching the new country to the southwest, and, if possible, to penetrate as far as Cornet Inlet, where I was led to believe there existed an excellent harbor. Meet with the Aborigines After a fearful journey of four days, over some of the worst description of country I ever saw, we succeeded in crossing the coast range leading down into the low country. This day we were met by a tribe of the wild blacks who came up quite close to us and stared at us while on horseback, but the moment I dismounted they commenced yelling out and took to their heels, running away as fast as possible, and from the astonishment displayed at the circumstance of my dismounting from the horse, I fancied they took both man and horse to constitute one animal. Lake Victoria On Wednesday, the 15th of January, our little party encamped on the river Tambo, running towards the sea in a southeasterly direction. On the morning of the 16th, we started down the Tambo, in order, if possible, to get a sight of a lake we had previously seen when descending the ranges of the low country, and which I was certain must be in our immediate vicinity. The country passed through today consisted of open forest, well grassed, 
the timber consisting chiefly of red and white gum, box, he and she oak, and occasionally wattle. At six p.m. we made the lake, to which I gave the name of Lake Victoria. From the appearance of this beautiful sheet of water, I should say that it is fully twenty miles in length and about eight miles in width. On the north side of this lake, the country consists of beautiful open forest, and the grass was up to our stirrup irons as we rode along, and was absolutely swarming with kangaroos and emus. The lake was covered with wild ducks, swans, and pelicans. We used some of the lake water for tea, but found it quite brackish. We remained on the margin of the lake all night. The river Tambo was about one mile northeast of our camp. The river Tambo, where we first made it, appears to be very deep, and from twenty to thirty yards wide. The water is brackish for the distance of about five miles from its mouth, where it empties itself into Lake Victoria. Nicholson River On the 17th January started from the camp, and proceeded in a southwesterly direction. At 10 a.m. came upon another river, to which I gave the name of the Nicholson, after Dr. Nicholson of Sydney. This river seemed to be quite as large as the Tambo, and as deep. Finding we were not able to cross it in the low country, we made for the ranges, where, after encountering great difficulties, we succeeded in crossing it. But not until sundown, high up in the ranges, and encamped for the night. This evening we found that, from the great heat of the weather, our small supply of meat had been quite destroyed. We were, however, fortunate enough to obtain some wild ducks, upon which we made an excellent supper. River Mitchell, 18th January, started again upon our usual course, southwest, and after travelling about seven miles, came upon a large river, which I named the Mitchell, after Sir Thomas Mitchell, Surveyor General of New South Wales. Clifton's Morass We followed this river up until we came to a large morass, to which I gave the name of Clifton's Morass, from the circumstance of my having nearly lost in it, from its boggy nature, my favourite horse Clifton. General View of Country from a Hill Having crossed this morass, we again proceeded on our journey for three miles, when we came once more upon the Mitchell River higher up, and encamped for the night, the country improving at every step. In the evening, I ascended a hill near the camp, from the top of which I obtained a good view of the low country still before us, of the high mountains to the northwest, and the lakes stretching towards the seacoast in a south and southeasterly direction and from the general view of the country as I then stood, it put me more in mind of the scenery of Scotland than any other country I had hitherto seen, and therefore I named it at the moment Caledonia Australis. On the morning of the 19th January we crossed the Mitchell, and proceeded in a south-southwest course through fine open forest of she-oak and red and white gum, for about sixteen miles, and encamped upon a chain of ponds in the evening. 20th January. We proceeded in a southwest course, and at 10 a.m. came upon the border of a large lake, which I believed to be a continuation of the same lake we had been previously encamped upon. The Aborigines. While at dinner on the banks of the lake, a tribe of blacks were walking quietly up to where we were encamped, but as soon as they saw us on horseback, they left their rugs and spears and ran away. They never would make friends with us upon any occasion. The River Avon 21st January Started upon our usual course, southwest, and after travelling about four miles, came upon a river, flowing through a fine country of fine open forest, with high banks, to which I gave the name of the Avon. We followed this river up all day, and crossed it about twenty miles from the foot of the mountains. It appears to be a mountain stream, generally not very deep, and runs over a bed of shingle. The country around and beyond the place where we crossed the Avon consists of beautiful, rich, open plains, and appeared, as far as I could judge at the time, to extend as far as the mountains. We encamped upon these plains for the night. From our encampment, we had a splendid view of the mountains, 
the highest of which I named Mount Wellington, and also I named several others, which appear in the government maps, published at Gippsland. 22nd January Left the encampment on the plains, and proceeded on our usual course of southwest, and travelled over a beautiful country, consisting of fine, open plains, intersected by occasional narrow belts of open forest, extending as far as the lakes to the eastward, and stretching away west and northwest as far as the foot of the mountains. McAllister River After travelling about ten miles, we encamped in the evening on a large stream, which I named the McAllister. This river appears deep and rapid, and is about forty yards wide. Here we saw an immense number of fires of the natives. 23rd January Started early in the morning, and tried to cross the river, but could not succeed, and followed the river McAllister down to its junction with another, very large river called the La Trobe, which river is bounded on both sides by large morasses. Meet with Aborigines In the morass to northeast of the river we saw some hundred natives, who, upon our approach, burned their camps and took to the scrub. We managed to overtake one old man that could not walk, to whom I gave a knife and a pair of trousers, and endeavoured by every means in our power to open a communication with the other blacks, but without success. It was amusing to see the old man. After having shaken hands with us all, he thought it necessary to go through the same form with the horses, and shook the bridles very heartily. The only ornaments he wore were three hands of men and women, beautifully dried and preserved. We were busy all the evening endeavouring to cut a bark canoe, but did not succeed. On the morning of the 24th January, the provisions having become very short, and as some of the party were unwilling to prosecute the journey upon small allowance, I determined upon returning to the station and bringing down stock to the district. We then returned to Nambla Manji, which place we made in seven days from the 24th, and were the last two days without any provisions at all. I may add that I was the first person who discovered Gippsland, and when I started to explore that district, I had no guide but my pocket compass and a chart of Captain Flinders. We had not even a tent, but used to camp out and make rough ganyas wherever we remained for the night. On the 27th March, 1840, Counts Strzelecki and party left our station at Nambla Manji for Caledonia Australis. He was supplied with some provisions and a camp kettle, and Mr. Matthew McAllister, who was one of my party in January of the same year, accompanied them one day's journey, and after explaining the situation and nature of the country about the different crossing places, left them upon my tracks on the coast range leading to Gippsland, and which tracks Charlie, the Sydney blackfellow, who accompanied Count Streletsky, said he could easily follow. On my return to Nambla Manji on the 31st of January, after having discovered the country of Gippsland, as far as the Latrobe River, I proceeded immediately to Maneru, and reported my discovery to Mr. McAllister, who did not publish my report at the time. I had also written another letter to a friend of mine in Sydney, containing a description of my expedition. At the same time, I wrote to Mr. McAllister, but it unfortunately miscarried. In October 1840, I arrived in Gippsland with 500 head of cattle, and formed a station on the Avon River, after having been six weeks engaged in clearing a road over the mountains. After four attempts, I succeeded in discovering the present shipping place at Port Albert, and marked a road from thence to Nambla Manji, a distance of 130 miles. After having brought stock into the district, and formed the station in about the month of November 1840, the Aborigines attacked the station, drove the men from the hut, and took everything from them, compelling them to retreat back upon Nambla Manji. On the 22nd of December, 1840, I again came down and took possession of the station when the natives made a second attack. A. Macmillan End of chapter 51
Section 52 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers. Letter 52. From S. G. Henty, Portland. Portland, 16th January, 1854. My dear sir, I have allowed your circular of the 27th July last to remain much longer unanswered than I intended, but concluding that the information you required at my hands would be insufficient time if it reached you at any time previous to your departure, I have put it off from time to time, I am afraid, at the expense of taxing your good opinion of me. I fear you will not consider the very short narrative here with forwarded so full as you expected at my hands. I am, however, such a very indifferent hand at description, that I trust you will find what I have written answer your purpose. Accompanying my narrative, I beg to hand to you a copy of a statement prepared by my brother William, when laying our claims for compensation before the home government. I do not see that it will interest you, but it bears out my account of the early settlement of this part of the colony. The difficulties and trials of early settling are, perhaps, better known to myself and to other members of our family than to any other individual in the colony. I have not touched upon any description of the country either at Mount Gambier or Vannon and Glenel, simply because from your knowledge of these parts you are so much more able to do so than myself. I cannot, however, ever forget the pleasant rides that I have had the honour of accompanying you on, on several occasions, over a great deal of the above-named country, and I trust I may live to have an opportunity of doing so again in some other part of the world, as it is my intention, if spared, to visit the old country next year, and I am now making my arrangements accordingly. As another magistrate will be required here, and a friend of my own, Mr. Learmonth of Ettrick, near Portland, is about to join me in carrying on my business here. I hope you will not consider that I am taking too great a liberty in asking you to put him in the commission of the peace, as, having been some years a magistrate in Van Diemen's land, he is in every way qualified for such an appointment, and again, in begging your kind reconsideration of Dr. Hallett's case, for I really consider him very harshly used, by the two individuals who sat with me at the hearing of his case, both of whom had prejudged the case before it came on for hearing. But for my illness, my report would have been decidedly in his favour, for the only point on which any evidence was given directly rebutted the charge made by Mr. Malpas that Dr. Hallett returned his own servant as government office-keeper. There was no evidence whatever to bear out any other charge, but there is evidence now to prove that Mr. Blair wished the man to bear out Mr. Malpa's statement. But for the death of the unfortunate lady, the case would have been brought forward again. I am sorry to trouble you upon such a subject at a time, when I am sure you must be very much worried, but I feel it my duty to state to you my opinion in this case. Mrs. Henty unites with me in very kind remembrances to you, and may I beg you will convey the same to Mrs. Latrobe, whom I trust you will soon meet in perfect health. With every good wish for such a speedy consummation, and your future welfare, and happiness here and hereafter, believe me to remain, your sincere friend and admirer, S. G. Henty. To His Excellency C. J. Latrobe, Esquire, etc. 1833 the Henty family, residing in Launceston, Van Diemen's Land, being interested in a whaling company, whose operations were carried on along the coast from Portland Bay to Port Ferry, Edward Henty, accompanied by my father, visited Portland Bay during this year, and, finding the country well grassed and apparently very well adapted for grazing purposes, it was determined by the family, upon their return to Launceston, to send over stock and other necessaries for an establishment at Portland Bay forthwith, and accordingly 
Edward Henty accompanied it as manager, and after a most boisterous passage of four weeks, during which several of the stock died, he reached Portland Bay, 1834, and fixed his habitation on what is now Block No. 4 in the township of Portland, and now occupied by me. My father at this time applied to the home government for permission to exchange some portion of our large grant of land at Swan River for a smaller portion here, which, however, was refused. But what we considered a tacit permission was given for us to occupy and to claim such lands as we might improve by fencing or cultivation. Our subsequent operations bear out that we depended upon this concession. The sequel, however, shows that we were mistaken. 1834. In December of this year, my brother Frank joined the party at Portland, bringing over more stock and servants. 1835. Early in the following year, it was necessary for F. Henty to return to Van Diemen's Land. On his return to Portland in October of this year, the small sloop in which he was a passenger called on her way at Indented Head, where they found Batman's party waiting an opportunity to get further up the Bay of Port Phillip. He took advantage of this opportunity and proceeded with the party up the Yarra Yarra, when the party camped for the first time on the present town site of Melbourne. After remaining there for a fortnight, he proceeded on his voyage and reached Portland again in November 1835. At this time, the writer was residing at Swan River, to which colony he had emigrated from England, as one of the pioneers of that colony, at its earliest settlement in October 1829. Learning from my brothers at Portland that they had taken up their location there, and being urged by them to join them, I at once determined on doing so, and in order to effect this, I purchased a vessel of sixty tons called the Sally Ann, and embarked with my wife and servants, and reached Portland in June 1836. The vessel was afterwards employed as a tender upon the party, running regularly between Portland and Lausiston. At this time, we were entirely dependent upon ourselves, both for supplies from Van Diemen's land, and for protection against the natives, and the many runaway prisoners who were at large at and around the whaling establishment. 1836. It was in August of this year that a portion of Major Mitchell's party, headed by himself, visited our establishment, when, to his astonishment, he found our party comfortably settled, having, as he expressed himself, the only glass windows to our house that he had seen since he left the boundary of New South Wales. Not being aware of any settlement at this place, he supposed that we were a party of bush rangers or runaways from Van Diemen's land, and in approaching us he took the precaution to have his men ranged in order, with their arms ready for action. This led us to suppose that his party was what he supposed ours to be, and we were consequently as cautious before holding any intercourse with him. From Major Mitchell we learned that the country about fifty miles north was much more suitable for grazing purposes than where our stock was located, and as our sheep had accumulated to several thousands, it was considered advisable to push into the interior. To enable us to do this, we cut a trackway through the forest to Mount Eckersley, and there took up stations until we could get further inland. 1837 it was not until the 3rd of August in this year that we succeeded in driving our first flock on to the Merino Downs station, a day that will be memorable in the recollection of the family of the writer as the natal day of his first-born son, Richmond. The remainder of our stock was sent up as fast as possible, with which we occupied the stations known as Muntham, Cornell's Run, and Sanford. At this time, we had very great difficulty in retaining the services of any men, owing to the hostile disposition of the natives, to which many of our men's lives were sacrificed. 1838. In this year, Mr. Samuel Winter came over from Van Diemen's Land, and shortly afterwards took up a station called Tahara, 
adjoining our Merino Downs run. Shortly afterwards Mr. John Bryan came over, and when it became known in Van Diemen's land that we had opened up a road into the interior, many other gentlemen followed in our example. 1840 among others, in 1840, were Messrs. Pillou and Jones, McCulloch, Purbrick, Savage, A. G. Robertson, Coldham, McPherson, Ritchie, and many others, until all the country immediately around us was taken possession of. It was in October of this year that the first land sale took place, and which deprived us of some of that land upon which we had made improvements, at so much expense to ourselves some of it realizing at the rate of 1,600 pounds an acre. The South Australian government held out very great inducements for the selection of special surveys. This induced me to take a journey across the boundary of this colony in search of some suitable spot on the coast within the colony of South Australia, and for this purpose I prepared a party of two men and myself and took my departure from Merino Downs in June 1839, steering a direct course by compass for Mount Gambier, which I reached on the second day. To those who have not seen Mount Gambier, it may seem strange when I say that I ascended it by a very gentle slope on the northeast side, and was scarcely aware of my exact position until I reached the brink of the enormous eastern lake, a sight which I never can forget quite beyond my power of description. At this time I was not certain whether this beautiful country belonged to the South Australian colony, or I should at once have applied for a special survey in that locality, for at this time I believe no European had ever seen the country but my own party. Under this doubt I determined to push further on, and examine the coastline as far as Cape Jaffa, and therefore extended my search for twenty-eight days without success, and returned along the coast to Portland. We afterwards formed cattle stations at Mount Gambier, of which we were subsequently deprived by the chickenery of some unprincipled individuals, in search of sheep stations. This part of the country is now thickly settled. The export in wool alone from the port of Portland this season will reach to about twelve thousand bales, or in money value, nearly three hundred thousand pounds, and traffic consequent upon this is now very great. Port Ferry was, like Portland, but subsequently, settled, first by the formation of a whaling party, and afterwards stock was introduced from Van Diemen's land by Messrs. Connolly and Griffith, but, owing to the very great expense attending it, both these gentlemen were ruined. The trade to Portland from Great Britain is very considerable, no less than eight large vessels having arrived direct within the last twelve months fully laden with cargo, one of them, the Aberdeen clipper Francis Henty, belonging to the writer, besides some emigrant ships ranging from 1,350 tons down to 650 tons. S. G. Henty, Portland, January the 14th, 1854. End of section 52。section 53。of letters from victorian pioneers。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。letters from victorian pioneers。letter 53 from c j latrobe melbourne。Victoria, number 17, Executive, Melbourne, January 22, 1853. Sir, in the case of the decease of the great majority of officers employed by Her Majesty's Government in these colonies, usage at least would confine the official notification to a simple record of the fact, and of the arrangements which such occurrence might entail. 2. There are circumstances, however, connected with the career of Mr. Henry Pulteney Dana, whose premature death occurred in November last, which may fully justify more particular remark. His name, as Commandant of Native Police in this colony, will have often been brought, during the past twelve years, under the notice of Her Majesty's Government. 3. 
the raising of a police force from amongst the aboriginal tribes, which were found in occupation of the country upon the arrival of the first settlers, was a project of very early contemplation after the new settlement was formally recognized, and taken in charge by government in 1836. In fact, in obedience to special instructions, preparatory steps were taken to this end by the officer in charge of the new settlement as early as 1837. The objects were twofold, the civilization of the younger natives and the creation of a force which would be seemingly better adapted, in the then existing circumstances of the colony, than any other, to check, if not to prevent, the aggressions of the tribes upon the lives and property of the scattered European population. 5. Upon the appointment of the protectors of Aborigines in 1838, the carrying out of the scheme was somewhat injudiciously, for one reason or another, given into their hands, was pronounced a failure, and shortly after fell to the ground. However, after an interval, as the community grew and became dispersed over a larger extent of country, and collisions between the settlers and the Aborigines became unavoidably more serious and fatal, the absolute necessity of securing some such cooperation on the part of the natives became more and more evident, and forced itself upon the attention of the local government. 6. Many obstacles stood in the way. The most difficult of removal arose from the peculiarly unsettled habits of the race, the power which the older natives have over the young, and the steady opposition which they interposed to the scheme. However, in 1841 circumstances encouraged me to make the trial, and Mr. Henry P. Dana was, on his own urgent and repeated application, with but very moderate encouragement in many respects, authorized to undertake the task. 7. The result is known, and need not be here detailed at length. A corps of native police was gradually embodied, disciplined, and maintained under his sole management, which was acknowledged on all hands, to have fully answered the main purposes for which it was organized, and to have rendered the most important service to the colony in the position in which it was then placed. It at once formed a link between the native and the European, and gave many opportunities for the establishment of friendly relations. The marked success which, in numerous instances, followed its employment, gave confidence to the settler, removed the pretexts under which he would feel justified in taking redress into his own hands, and left no excuse for the vindictive reprisals which have been a blot upon the early years of the settlement. The native, on his side, soon saw that in yielding to his natural aggressive impulses he would be opposed to those who were not only his equals in savage cunning and endowment, but his superiors by alliance with the Europeans. 8. Such was the general result of the experiment, till within two years of the present time, when, with the cessation of the urgent necessity which had called it into existence, the native police was seen to be evidently on the decline. It had, in a great measure, attained the objects of its organization, and had outlived its time. Almost the entire number of the original members had died from accident or disease. The natural decay in numbers of the tribes in the colony, and their change of habits and character, particularly among the young, and many other causes, rendered the possibility of its further continuance by any exertion very questionable, and although provision for the funds requisite for its maintenance as a distinct branch of the police force was made by the Appropriation Act of the past year, it was soon seen that the gold discovery had its influence upon this service also, and that the native police was in fact becoming extinct. 9. Though I am anxious that the memory of the existence and services of this corps, which furnished the only example of success among the many schemes set on foot to raise the aboriginal native in this quarter of New Holland above its natural level, should not be lost, and am glad to seize the opportunity of making this record, yet my principal object is to do justice to the officer who from first to last was the mainspring of the whole. I have no hesitation in saying that the entire credit of the measure is due to Mr. Dana, for no one who did not bring to the work his tact, energy, firmness, and moral and physical powers of endurance could have succeeded. The service was a most peculiar one in every point of view, entailing much self-denial and many sacrifices, but it suited his natural temper and talents, and even ministered to his foibles. He may have had his failings but that he spent himself freely in the service with singleness of purpose, and that the hardships and the exposure which it inevitably entailed undermined his constitution and brought him to a premature grave, there can be no question. 10. Had Mr. Dana lived, there can be no doubt but that his claims, whenever incapacitated for active duties, to favorable consideration after services of so peculiar and important a character to the colony, would have been most readily conceded, 
and I think his untimely death should not debar his family from such consideration as it may be in the power of Her Majesty's government to show. The case, viewed in relation to the aboriginal inhabitants of the colony now rapidly disappearing from its surface, if in no other, is one which stands on its own ground and cannot be drawn into an inconvenient precedent. 11. Mr. Dana leaves a widow and four children of very tender years, and I am heartily supported by the recommendation of my executive council in praying that Her Majesty's government would concede that a gratuity at the rate of two hundred pounds for each year's service should be awarded to the children, and placed in the hands of the gentlemen named under his will to act as trustees and executors. Such gratuity to be held chargeable against that portion of the unappropriated moiety of the land fund which is set apart for the aborigines, a far larger proportion, it may be remarked, than can ever now be so employed. I have, etc., C. J. Latrobe. The Right Honourable Sir J. Packington, Bart. End of section 53《Section 54 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 54 Letter from Hugh Jameson, Esquire, to the Right Reverend the Lord Bishop of Melbourne on the Aboriginal Natives of Australia. Madura Station, River Murray, 10th October, 1853. My Lord, in compliance with your Lordship's request, I do myself the honor to furnish a few practical remarks upon the present and probable future condition of the Aboriginal natives of Australia, more particularly of the tribes inhabiting the districts of Murray and Darling. These remarks are the result of my own observations, and are expressive of opinions and convictions which have been matured by the experience of a residence in Victoria since the early days of its establishment. The almost universal opinion of the world seems to assign to the Aboriginal natives of Australia the very lowest place in the scale of civilization and of intellect. In this opinion I cannot agree. 2. The past experience, of upwards of sixty years, has abundantly shown that the Aboriginal natives of Australia are, even in the most uncultivated state of their faculties, possessed of a considerable amount of intelligence, observation, quickness of apprehension, and aptitude for instruction in both reading and writing. But, notwithstanding all these natural advantages, and which they have been found in all parts of the colony to possess, I think it indisputably proved that there is a very clearly defined limit to their civilization, amelioration of condition, and permanent improvement, either morally or physically. 3. Those who have gained experience in managing them on a proper system have found them capable of being civilized to a certain extent, and in many cases made useful in a short time without much trouble. How far they are capable of being brought to a higher and more permanent degree of civilization may very properly be considered worthy of inquiry. I fear the question may already be considered determined. 4. On this station, they have always been managed upon a uniform and rational system, they have ever been, both to my brother and myself, objects of interest. We have, for many years, endeavored to show them the advantages of permanent improvement and the general amelioration of their condition. We have exclusively employed them, and successfully, for some years in shepherding, and in the usual routine of the management of sheep on a station, in sheep washing, and also in sheep shearing to a limited extent. Their services have, during the recent scarcity of labor consequent on the gold discoveries of Australia, been to us and other settlers on the Murray and Darling of great value. The proper principle of managing them is founded on consistency, kindness, firmness, and decision. Following out this plan, we continue to secure their services for shepherding and some other descriptions of work. The prospect, however, of a continuance of their services I consider doubtful. I think it probable we shall resume, in part, the employment of European shepherds as soon as the state of the supply of labor will allow. Every year's experience clearly shows that there is a certain limit to their usefulness and general improvement. I use the word limit advisedly, as I much regret to say I feel quite satisfied at the correctness of my opinion. Beyond this limit we seem to have no encouragement to look for or to expect any advance. Our object and aim here is, at all times, 
to prevent a retrograde movement amongst those who have reached a certain state of usefulness and improvement. Very great difficulty is experienced in keeping them up to this given point, despite of every encouragement that can be offered. It, unfortunately, appears that we cannot impart to them a disposition for permanently improving their condition. They have now no more wish than formerly to adopt even the first elements of civilization and abandon their unsettled and roving life. In these districts, during the summer months, nearly all, from the oldest to the youngest of the various tribes, have the greatest desire to abandon every employment and indulge in the roving life of naked savages. The tribes on the lower Murray and Darling are, generally speaking, on friendly terms. They not unfrequently, during their annual migrations, travel over 200 or 300 miles of country, increasing in numbers as they proceed, alternately hunting, fishing, and levying contributions on both sheep and cattle, as they slowly and indolently saunter along the banks of the Murray and Darling. Such is the limited degree of civilization, which even the best of our blacks have reached, that during these migrations we always experience considerable difficulty in retaining out of the whole tribe the necessary number for shepherding alone. All the present and future advantages offered fail to compensate the savage for the disappointment of not being able to join in these wild and roving excursions of the tribes. 5. Hopes were, for many years, entertained that some of the younger blacks might be permanently reclaimed and easily civilized when separated from the older ones. I think the experiment may be looked upon as having been fairly and fully tried, the result, in nearly all cases, has been most discouraging. 6. As regards their religious opinions, they have none. They have no knowledge whatever of a supreme being, and their only idea of a future state of existence consists in some vague notion that after death they may be changed into whites. I do not at all consider this idea an original one. They have great superstitious dread of an evil spirit. All their ideas, however, are extremely vague and illusory. 7. Death is at all times by them attributed to human agency. When any black, whether old or young, dies, an enemy is supposed during the night to have made an incision in his side and removed his kidney fat. Even the most intelligent natives cannot be convinced that any death proceeds from natural causes. 8. With regard to the numbers in the tribes of the Murray and Darling, it is an extremely difficult matter to form even an approximate estimate. They are not nearly so numerous as has been generally supposed. I do not imagine that the numbers occupying the country, on both sides of the Murray from Swan Hill to the South Australian boundary, and the Darling from its junction with the Murray to Fort Bourke, 500 miles up the Darling, taken together, would amount to more than 1,500. During the past five or six years, the decrease in their numbers has been very marked, the increase extremely small, and bearing no proportion to the decrease, evidently showing that they are dying off whilst there are few indeed to replace them. Infanticide prevails to a great extent. I can obtain no satisfactory reason why it does so. They are, in general, fond of their children, and invariably appreciate any kindness that may be shown to them. Some years ago, the offspring only of white men and aboriginal women were destroyed. Of late, infanticide has, however, become so general, that even in these remote tribes, the greater number of the children is destroyed immediately after their birth. The supply of food of various sorts is here by no means precarious. During many months of the year, the waters of the Murray and Darling furnish an immense supply of fish. At other seasons of the year, edible roots in great variety are plentiful, even in the interior and more northern parts of the Darling. The occupation of the country by the stock of the settlers produces no apprehensions amongst any of the tribes of a deficiency of the necessary supply of food for themselves and their children. 10. They chiefly die here, either of pulmonary and rheumatic complaints, or of a cutaneous disease of a very loathsome description. Their physical sufferings, during their many long and lingering illnesses, are very great. I am not aware of any having as yet died from the evil effects of intercourse with Europeans. The debasing influence of spirits has, fortunately, not as yet extended to the lower Murray, and produced the baleful effects which may be seen on the miserable remnant of the race near Melbourne. In cases of sickness, much kindness and watchful attention is shown to male relatives. I have never seen a case in which they were neglected. When seriously unwell, they frequently express a wish to be removed from one place to another. The wish is complied with at all times, and they are removed either by means of a canoe or by a rude litter made for the occasion. In the case of sickness or death of a female, the attention paid is comparably slight. When death occurs, the lamentation and wailings are kept up during the night for some time. 
no allusion is ever afterwards made to the deceased, and from the oldest to the youngest of the tribe, all betray a decided aversion ever to speak of the deceased, or to mention his or her name. They also have a superstitious dread of hearing the name mentioned even by a European. The matter of disposing of the dead varies throughout the colony. Here they adopt a plan of immediate interment, some few feet under the ground, wood and grass being with some care piled over the grave. 11. Of the fact that they are cannibals, we have many conclusive proofs. It is, however, only under very extraordinary circumstances that I have ever heard of any of the tribe feasting on human flesh. In general, they very carefully extract and eat only the kidney fat of their victim. On other occasions, in accordance with superstitious rite, they carry about with them the legs, arms, and pieces of the skin of their victim, not for the purpose of eating these, but with the view of distribution as charms for fishing operations. 12. Although they do not live in any regularly formed society, and there are many tribes even without a chief, still their marriages are conducted in a systematic manner. The husbands and wives are generally from different tribes. A classification of families has always been adopted and rigidly adhered to. 13. With regard to the probable future condition of the aboriginal natives of the whole or any part of Australia, I have always been impressed with the idea that, in order to succeed in ameliorating the condition of savages and bringing about anything like civilization amongst them, concentration would be found necessary. Civilization is the result of a long social process. Those submit to civilization with the greatest difficulty who habitually live by roving and hunting. Everyone who understands the matter can easily foresee that the natives of Australia are most unlikely to conform to civilization. They are as obstinately attached as ever to all the superstitious prejudices, passions, customs, and habits of their forefathers. They have always been found totally destitute of the most essential preliminary of civilization, and I fear they will never acquire it. They exhibit great dislike to the restraint even of living at a particular place for any length of time, though they are found in abundance of food and clothing. 14. In confirmation of the opinion I have expressed, with respect to the improbability of any of the Australian tribes ever being civilized, and even few of their numbers ever being advanced beyond a limited extent, I would adduce some facts from which I think conclusive opinions may very fairly be drawn. Looking back on our very earliest intercourse with the aboriginal natives of New South Wales, and to the attempts, both public and private, which were even then made to ameliorate their condition, we have the well-known case of the Sydney native Benelong, who some sixty years ago was taken to England by the first governor of New South Wales. In England, Benelong remained for some time. Very soon after his return to the colony, however, he threw off all the clothes he had brought with him from England, and returning to the bush, rejoined his tribe as a native savage. This was, perhaps, the first most discouraging proof that the aboriginal natives of Australia seemed doomed to an animal and unimproving existence. Another and a well-known case occurred lately in Victoria. When the native police corps was broken up, after having been formed for many years, the fact was at once self-evident that, during these years of intercourse with Europeans and in various parts of the colony, the native troopers had acquired no indispensable taste for European comforts or civilization. On the other hand, they nearly all at once discarded the idea of future improvement or other employment, and, being dismounted, traveled on foot hundreds of miles to rejoin their respective tribes and resume their former habits of savage life. Several of these native police were recruited some years ago from this part of the colony. Having deserted prior to the breaking up of the corps, they returned here, having traveled on foot a distance of 400 miles. Since their return, I regret to say, they have too clearly shown that they have not improved by their absence from savage life. 15. Assuming the impracticability of any of the Australian tribes ever being civilized by means of concentration, and that further attempt to do so would only involve a useless expenditure of a large amount of money in a hopeless cause, the only question that remains is, can useful knowledge be diffused amongst them, or can anything be done towards improving their condition without controlling their wandering habits? Some attempts upon this principle were made many years ago in Canada by the Jesuits, but without success. I fear any attempts of this nature here would be equally fruitless. The Australian Aboriginal race seems doomed by Providence, like the Mohican and many other well-known Indian tribes, to disappear from their native soil before the progress of civilization, and they will, in a few years, only have an existence in the recollection of man. The race is so rapidly disappearing here and in all other parts of the colony with which I am acquainted, that I fear no other inference than the one I adopt can be deduced either from past experience or from present prospects. I have, etc., 
U. Jamison. The Right Reverend, the Bishop of Melbourne, etc., etc. End of Section 54 Recording by Todd Section 55 of Letters from Victorian Pioneers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Victorian Pioneers Letter 55 from Thomas Winter Notes on Port Phillip by Thomas Winter, Esquire, of Hobart Town In a letter to Mr. Swanston Perhaps you have heard that in 1802 two ships were dispatched from Sydney with prisoners, under sentence of transportation from that place, and a suitable guard, in order to form a settlement for the infliction of secondary punishment, and Port Phillip was the place appointed for it. The vessel arrived there, but strange to say the country being considered inhospitable and badly watered, the place was relinquished, and the party came, instead, to Van Diemen's Land, and formed the first settlement in this island. It appears that, from that time till about two years and a half ago, no one had visited that part of the coast adjacent to Port Phillip. Then some sailors, who had gone upon it by chance, described it in such terms as led Mr. Batman and one or two more to visit this new country. The result you know. A company of settlers was formed, and while they were petitioning the home government for the grant of a large tract, the place became notorious, and all eyes were set towards a country possessing what seemed to the Van Diemen's Land settler the source of unbounded wealth, namely, unlimited pasturage for sheep, and that of the finest kind. Great numbers of sheep were soon sent over, so great that now, within two years of the first shipment, the estimated number of sheep and lambs in that country is 250,000, a few only of which have been lately sent from Sydney outstations over land. Having mentioned a few interesting circumstances connected with the place, I will now describe the place itself. The entrance to Port Phillip lies about north of Circular Head, the northwest point of Van Diemen's Land, at a distance of 180 miles. The harbour resembles an inland sea and is from 40 to 50 miles across. The navigation is, however, intricate, the water being for the most part shallow, with but a narrow channel through the sand flats, these being covered for the most part with about two fathoms of water. At the northeast extremity of the harbour is the mouth of the Yarra Yarra River, upon which, at the distance of seven miles from the anchorage in the harbour, is the township of Melbourne. At the mouth of this river is a bar of mud, over which the water flows only nine feet. Consequently, small vessels alone can reach the town. Williamstown is formed opposite the anchorage, on the western side of the mouth of the Yarra, at Jellybrand's Point, and would be a thriving township but for the want of fresh water, of which none has been found, and the only supply at present is brought from Melbourne in boats. The situation of Williamstown is very pretty, and it consists of about ten houses and stores, chiefly for the reception of cargo from vessels. Melbourne is also beautifully situated on a gently sloping hill upon the banks of the Yarra, and surrounded by a lovely country, lightly covered with trees, chiefly eucalyptus and acacia. I think there are 150 built or in progress at the present time. For some miles round Melbourne the country bears the same beautiful character, grassy and luxuriant, with trees scattered over it, as in the least woody parts of old forests in England. There is, however, so great a scarcity of large, sound timber fit for building, that the greatest part of Melbourne is built with wood from Van Diemen's land. The want of good timber is generally felt throughout the colony, and although there is plenty in the interior, it is probable that many parts will always be more easily supplied from the island than from elsewhere. Almost every kind of natural scenery is to be met with at Port Phillip, though it is very rarely that we find the steep, thickly wooded hills which abound here. On the contrary, I would say that the largest quantity of land, perhaps one half the country already explored, is plain, generally without trees, nearly flat, and often stony. Some of these plains are lightly timbered and are then called forests. The hills vary very much, some resembling the Wiltshire Downs with the same short pasturage, others covered with rich long herbage and spotted with trees, while others are woody to the top. 
but few of them, however, are either too steep or too woody to prevent a horse trotting up to the top. About fifty miles west of the port is a beautiful fresh-water lake, the scenery around which is delightful. It is about ten miles round. Beyond this is a salt-water lake ninety miles in circumference, with numerous smaller ones or lagoons, all of which are salt. A singular feature of the country is the salt that abounds within a few yards of fresh-water rivers. Water rises into holes as salt as the sea. I found one lagoon, the water of which was nearly gone, with a thick crust of pure salt, and nearly all the wells hitherto dug yield the same briny fluid. There are no navigable rivers. Neither can the country be called well watered. I doubt not, however, that eventually wells will be bored or dug sufficiently deep to reach fresh water springs. The sheep, cattle and horses, and indeed every animal that has been sent over, thrives in an extraordinary manner. Lambs three months old weigh as much as their mothers while the cows are like fatted beasts. The natives are numerous and troublesome. Indeed, they are the greatest drawback to the colony, since they cannot be trusted. Several murders have been committed by them, but not lately, and they seem to fear the white man's revenge. The men are tall, well-made, and muscular, their hair long, black, and generally curly, such as might be coveted by an English dandy. Features very various, but often good, teeth particularly fine. The original clothing, both of men and women, seemed to be two mats made of skins joined together, the one hanging before, the other behind. Now most of them have some article of English clothing. Their natural food consists of the meat of the country when they can kill it, but chiefly roots, of which the favourite is that of a plant very much like dandelion. This they roast or eat raw. Their arms are spears, stone hatchets, and a sort of wooden tomahawk. The quadrupeds of the country are the kangaroo of the largest kind or forester only, opossum, bushy-tailed and ring-tailed, flying squirrels, which are, I fancy, opossums, having the membrane between the legs, these are various. The smallest, about as large as a full-sized cat, is a very beautiful animal, resembling the English squirrel in shape, the colour, slate, shaded off to white, the tail black, and the fur beautifully soft. The wombat, I believe, is the same as in Van Diemen's land. The holes are different and are remarkable, being always of one construction. A large funnel-shaped hole, perhaps six feet deep, and three in diameter at the bottom. The burrow then strikes off horizontally, invariably under a large slab of stone, which prevents the earth falling. How the great hall is formed puzzles me. It is generally covered with grass, except the path by which the animal descends. Rats are very numerous, rather smaller than the common English one. The native dog, a perfect fox, is the most destructive animal to sheep, on account of this sheep are folded every night. I hope to send you a head of one. The birds are the emu. I saw several but could not get one. My overseer found a nest with sixteen eggs. We left them, but the natives afterwards found and ate them. The native turkey, which is a bustard, and rather common, the native companion, a beautiful bird of the crane kind, apparently. I was told of a kind of bat with a body larger than a rat, but could not see one. Owls are numerous, and there is a great variety. So are eagles and hawks. White parrots abound. Indeed, there is a great variety of this tribe, some very beautiful. Quails are very plentiful, one species being very rare, their colour nearly black with red spots. I saw one at a distance, but could not put it up again. I saw but few insects. The weather was often rather cold, and I was seldom stationary in a good district. Cicardi are deafening. End of section 55 Recording by Jenny Bradshaw